This is Audible. Podium Audio presents Masters of Reality 2. Book 2 of Masters of Reality. Written by Aaron Crash. Performed by Gabriel Michael and Katana Jones. Chapter 1 Gem on His Way Jeremy Creed felt the fairy shift under his feet. He was on his way back to Paradisos Island. At the same time, he knew his real body lay in the bed of a clinic. The voice of the scientist still echoed through his head. Dr. Terry Deem's presence was oddly comforting. Participants 777, 778, and 779 will be sharing the same session. Scenario Delta. Ready for the dive into Erebos. Starting Genesis routines now. Countdown to dive. Ten seconds. Nine. Eight. Seven. As she hit one, Gem, Crystal, and Ruby were all back on the ferry, on their way back to Paradisos Island. Now, inside the Erebos experience, Gem needed a minute. He left the girls and went to stand outside. He felt the light rain on his face. Or was that spray from the boat carving its way through the water? He smelled the salt and the wet metal. He touched the railing and felt a bead of paint that the painters had failed to sand off. That detail made him pause. No one had painted the railing on the ferry. This was all simulated reality. According to Terry Deem, the woman running the Erebos project, it was a complex interplay between his mind and a computer program. Everything was encoded. He had input. Mrs. Deem had been careful not to call it a game or a simulation. She simply called it Erebos or the Erebos Experience. Strange. Jem inhaled. He could smell the world. It was real. All of this had to be real. Yet it wasn't. His body was in a facility, hooked into the computer. Mrs. Deem had assured him his body would be fine, though there was some danger involved. She had talked about the oddity, which seemed to be a piece of rogue code. Mrs. Deem had asked them to keep an eye out for anything unusual. But it was all unusual, right? He was literally living inside his imagination, augmented by a reactive algorithm directed by some form of artificial intelligence. The fairy lurched forward. Jem grabbed the railing. Was this normal? Or would a big sea monster come roaring out of the ocean? Paradisos Island had a definite Greek mythology theme. Well, if he was going to fight the Kraken, he needed his weapon, a bident called Decay. He hurried back into the main section of the ferry. It was empty except for Crystal and Ruby, who were deep in conversation. Crystal had short golden hair and green eyes that were so bright and aware and full of love. She'd lost some weight, so she was less chesty, but she'd kept her round hips. Ruby had dark skin, dark hair, and brown eyes. She was big, curvy, and kind of loud. It was the performer in her. She had the phoenix tattoo on her left arm. She'd been reborn after growing up in a Florida mafia family. Jim knew how that worked. He'd grown up with criminals, and he'd visited his father in prison regularly. And he had brothers in prison. Prison and the legal system had been like mac and cheese to him. The boat lurched again. Ruby looked nervous. Crystal, though, smiled. It's the Kraken. Betcha a million dollars it's the Kraken. The tall, thin ferry boat captain's voice echoed over the speakers. There's some chop, folks. No need to be worried. Ruby turned a big grain. Ugh, nothing like a message from Caron. Crystal patted the singer's leg. Actually, it's Earl Caron. I looked him up on my phone. He has a bit of a bio. Ruby closed her eyes. It's all just so real, but not. I know it's not. I'm kind of having a hard time. I think it might be easier if we didn't remember anything, like before. Jem took the singer's hand. I'm kind of blown away as well. All of this is here. Our senses can feel every bit of the place, but we're not really here. I mean, we are, but we're not. You guys! Crystal said loudly. Just don't think too hard about this. You're going to have so much fun this dive. I mean, I'm joining the fates right away. And I'm going to seduce Mrs. Deem. 
like right away. And Ruby, you weren't with us in the elevator with Elsie Dorans. <laughs> it was hot. Maybe this time we can do a concert with Nat and Nikki. No, really, we're going to have a great time. Ruby had the smile. I'm looking forward to playing all kinds of music. I'm not just going to be doing pop songs. It's funny, though. After spending the last session learning those songs, I still have the songs in my head. I can add to them. It's like getting nearly a whole year for free to practice, to try things out. Maybe write some new stuff of our own. Our own songs? Crystal giggled. Actually giggled. <laughs> See? This is awesome! Jem loved that his wife had dived into this whole experience wholeheartedly. He was a little more nervous. That last fight to get Ruby had felt dangerous. She'd nearly been lost when Sheriff Pluto grabbed her. And Jem had fought the god of the ocean. It made him wonder how things would be on the island. Would there be the chaos of monsters and mayhem, like those last few hours? Or would it be a full reset? So far, the fairy seemed normal enough. Ruby turned and kissed Jem. Her lips were soft on his cheek. Mm. Are you going to learn music and play with us? Jem shrugged. Not sure that's in the cards for me. Crystal was always the musician. Talking about music relaxed Ruby a little. Well, it might be your fate to be a fate. Ruby and the Fates, featuring Jeremy Strings and Crystal Creed. Jeremy Strings? Jem shook his head. Ah, no. <laughs> Jem Diamond, maybe, but no, I don't think so. During the last session, when I hacked into the Erebos network, I was able to copy and paste abilities. <sighs> we lost that when Erebos added the app on our phones. It's view only for now, though it seems if we level, we might be able to change that. It would be pretty cool to just get a music skill. Jem felt a coldness inside him, though, at the thought. Him? Up on stage? Ruby scowled. That wouldn't be fair. I spent years learning and sucking and embarrassing myself. If you could just download years of practice and work and then go up on stage and be awesome, I'd be pissed. I can't copy and paste just yet, Jem said. But could he be up on stage? He loved music. He loved it like air, but he'd never considered the possibility of him making music. His father would have called him a pussy for even thinking about it. His brothers would have teased him and tortured him about it until he stopped. But really, for most of his life, Jem had been focused on getting the fuck out of Frank Town and away from his family. And after growing up wondering if the fridge had food, he wanted a job that gave him a steady paycheck. Ruby still looked disturbed. Then she dropped her eyes and didn't say anything for a long time. What was she thinking about? Even outside in the real world, Ruby hadn't talked about her time stuck with Pluto before Mrs. Steam could pull her out. Jem and Crystal exchanged worried glances. Crystal cleared her throat. <clears throat> Let's change the subject. So, Jem, before you came in, Ruby and I were talking about our first ferry ride to Paradiso's Island. You remember what happened, right? The memories were still so fresh in Jem's head. Yeah, I got my first message from Mr. Oregon, and that led to you and I talking about our sex life, which led to the three of us getting together. He also remembered listening to Crystal play music. She had so much talent. He remembered the love he felt for his wife, the many memories they had together, years and years together. He'd seen Crystal at her best, and he'd seen her at her worst. Through it all, they'd been together. Most of the time, Crystal seemed more real than the concrete he walked. She was his foundation, and he was hers. The sky might fall, the earth might split, or it all just might be computer code, even in what they thought was the real world. It wouldn't matter. Crystal made life real. Ruby laughed, bringing Jem out of his reverie. <laughs> wow, the look on your face right now. <laughs> That's love right there. Jem chuckled a bit. <laughs> yeah, sorry. A lot happened right away. I guess that was one of the reasons why it took us a bit to realize that Paradiso's Island was a little too perfect. It was like this huge change. Ruby seemed less troubled. So Crystal talked about how you two have stayed faithful, though you were both tempted. Jem winced. 
We have our stories. But yeah, we were monogamous until you came along. Crystal's face was shining. And then there was that thing with Elsie Dorrance. I can't believe that happened. I'm dying to know if she's an NPC or not. Maybe she's real, but not Nikki are NPCs. I don't know. What should I do now? She paused. What we do here isn't real. So we can explore our fantasies, right? Ruby raised her hand. That's where I come in. I'm the fantasy. Bullshit. Jem shook his head. You're real. I've seen you in a hospital gown. Ruby wrinkled her nose. Does that make people real? Kind of like nothing else. Crystal nudged Ruby playfully. Ruby frowned. Yes, we can explore our fantasies, but we also need to be honest with each other and set limits. No other guys, Crystal said. And if there's more than kissing involved, we should all three talk about it. So anything goes, as long as we talk about it first. Jem nodded. Yeah, but it's funny. I like the sex part, don't get me wrong, but I want to explore other worlds. I want to see how much Paradisos Island has changed. And I guess, really, <laughs> there are all kinds of fantasies and not just sexual ones. That made Crystal laugh. Her voice echoed around the metal passenger deck of the ferry. <laughs> I love you, Jeremy Creed. Always keeping it real. Ruby sighed with a smile on her face. <sighs> so we agree. Just girls. But we talk about it first. Anything else on your minds? Jem did have something else. So, we're basically on our way to paradise, right? But this time, we know it's paradise. Do you think it'll get old? <laughs> no fucking way. Crystal said with certainty. I've waited my whole life for things to be perfect. I'm going to enjoy the hell out of the next 360 days. Jem took a moment to think. One minute out in the real world equaled one day inside the Erebos experience. They were going to be gone for six hours. Ruby frowned. Mm, it might get old. Talk to me after my first show. Part of the deal about playing music is the fear of failure. If you totally fuck up a gig and if the audience fucking hates you, well, it's an adrenaline rush. Just as much as a great show is an adrenaline rush. If I play knowing that people will like it, it might lose something. Jem thought about that. I guess for us, it's going to be weird being rich. We won't have to work, but I kind of want to. Talking with Faunus every day was fun. He's a good guy. Will you want to work, Crystal? His wife nodded. Yeah, I love teaching. And the idea of teaching AI? It's kind of strange. But I kind of like that it's strange. And remember, there are some actual people with us. Are you sure? Ruby asked. Jem took out his phone and started up the Erebos app. Our numbers are 777, 778, and 779. Let me see if I can get to the code. I can see if it's just a regular integer or if it's sequential. He scrolled through menus until he found his own character sheet. There was a badly pixelated image of himself and the clothes he was wearing. Under his picture was a basic description. View only mode. Level up to make adjustments. Name, Jeremy Creed. Alias, Gem. Level, 3. Character class, Hero. Original abilities, Knowledge of network security and information technologies. Street fighting, Basic criminality, Updated special abilities, Bulletproof, Healing, Strength, Wealth. He then toggled the code behind the stats and there he saw a field called Character ID. He was 777, Crystal was 778, Ruby was 779. He couldn't tell the data type of the field, so he didn't know if there were another 700 IDs out there. It could be that there were 7,000 people in the Erebos experience. At this point, there is no way to know. Jem laughed a little. <laughs> it's weird to have a Character ID. Kind of makes me wonder if we're not NPCs. Ruby was confused. We can't be NPCs. We were in the real world, right? Unless those memories were implanted, Jem shrugged. Crystal let out a little yell. Ugh, this is not helping us. We're real. We're going to live in heaven. It's going to be great, and this time, I'm going to seduce Mrs. Deem. Jem felt the lust in his belly. He loved that Crystal was embracing her sexuality. 
We just don't want to get put in jail for anything. Being locked in a cell in heaven would suck. Crystal leaned in close to him. We just break each other out. I mean, we're super strong, we have super healing, and we're bulletproof. Our enemies might not be using bullets. Jem thought of his bident. He'd used it to reduce the ocean god's heart to dust. And there's the oddity out there. Ruby squeezed her eyes shut. I'm scared, guys. At this point, I'm not having fun. Crystal held the musician close. You will, Ruby. I promise. He'll buy Jem a guitar, and he'll start practicing, and we'll get a band together. Jem wasn't worried about any monsters or fighting they'd done on Paradiso's Island, but the idea of going up on stage unnerved him like nothing else. There were worse things than death, even in a simulated heaven. Jem felt his phone vibrate. Right on time. Mr. Oregon was reaching out to him. Chapter 2 Mr. Oregon's First Message Jem was about to check the message on his phone when Crystal said something strange. Ten years, his wife said firmly. Jem had no idea what she was talking about. They were interrupted by the crackle of the fairy speakers. The sound echoed around the main chamber, and the captain cleared his throat. <clears throat> yes, is this thing on? Okay. We're about five minutes away from docking. Start grabbing your things, people, and have fun. Jem stood up and shouldered on his backpack. What was this about ten years? Crystal picked her saxophone case. I think I'd get tired of living in paradise after about ten years. Then I'd want some trouble, or something to go wrong, or just something difficult. But for those ten years, I'd be in bliss. Ruby held her guitar case. Yeah, I can see that. For example, if this were real life, I'd have to get right on booking gigs and practicing with the band. Instead, I'm going to sleep in for a week and eat whatever I want. And sex. We're gonna have sex, right? Crystal nodded. A lot of sex. If you're a good girl, I'll tell you about how Mrs. Wiseman almost kissed me. <laughs> so naughty! Ruby said loudly. The singer was feeling better about being inside Airbus. Hold up, Jem said. I got a message. I'm pretty sure I know who it's from. He turned on his phone and there it was, from the same Oregon number as before. The last message was there. The ruby armor protects a fragile heart. I'll get her back for you. This time, next time, we'll have so much fun. Too much fun. Mr. Oregon had been true to his word. Ruby had come out of her dive. Why did the rest sound so threatening? The new message was far cheerier. Welcome back to the fun. You'll get to the mystery, but why be a slave when you can be the master? Find your freedom. He read the cryptic message to the girls. Ruby shrugged. Fuck that guy. I'm not a slave. Crystal agreed. Yeah, we're fine. We're back in the fun, right? Jem shrugged. I don't know yet. At least he's not warning us about thugs trying to kidnap Ruby. He typed the message, asking if Mr. Oregon was someone called Gary Singva. In the real world, the number belonged to Gary. Jem wasn't surprised when he didn't get an answer. For Mr. Oregon, it was a one-way communication. Let's just go, Ruby said. And for the record, the cryptic fucking message is not helping me with my mood. They carried their stuff out to the bow of the ferry. It wasn't raining, but the clouds were thick in the sky, and it was cold. Before, Jem and Crystal had arrived in the fall. This time it was the end of January, and the ski season was in full swing. Paradiso's Island had everything. The view from the ferry was awesome. They could see the beach resort of the Delphine Hotel, along with the Burnwater Islands where there were hot springs. They could see the amusement park and Neptune's Pier. That was where they would dock. From there, they'd walk to Mrs. Deem's Breeze B&B. The main city on the island was Thessalonica, and while the north side was posh, the south side could get a little rough. That was where Ruby had lived, where she'd practice in a storage unit near a strip club called the Venus Kiss. They could see the ski resort, Paradise City up on top of Mount Narides, 
The pristine white peak rose above the green forests around it. To the south was another city. Corinth. Jim wondered if there would still be pirate ships and starships and tall elven ships in the southern city. He had a smile at the memories. While Paradisos Island was the more normal simulation, it seemed you could go to other types of places. While they waited the dock, Jem checked the Erebos app on his phone. He knew he wasn't seeing all of the hidden files and folders, so it took a minute to unhide everything. He finally found the folder names of the different realities. Far Wind, Neon Buzz, Bright Star, City Magic, Vengeance Creek. Far Wind was the name of the fantasy simulation. Neon Buzz was cyberpunk. Bright Star was more on the space, opera, sci-fi side. City Magic was urban fantasy. Lastly, there was an Old West simulator, Vengeance Creek. But then, Jem saw there was Res Publicus, which was for ancient Rome. Blossom Damio must be feudal Japan. There were others, a whole range of possibilities. Crystal had her phone out as well. Check out the bio of Earl Caron. Jem stayed in the code. He found the description. Earl Caron runs the weekday ferry that connects Portland to Paradisos Island. He's a likable sort and very capable, but he won't spend much time with the passengers. His true love is the sea. On the weekends, he likes beer, pretzels, and watching the Victoria's Secret channel on YouTube. He has two cats and is very good at origami. On the weekends, the ferry is run by Kiefer Caron. Note, he shouldn't be confused with the Caron, who runs the Corinthian ferry, which is an exit point. Did you see that note? Jem showed it to his wife. She shook her head. So, there's special notes in the code. You know, since we have so much time, we should see if we can take the ferry to one of these other worlds. It's not like Mrs. Deem said we had to stay on Paradisos Island. I had the same thought, Jem said. Ruby laughed a little. <laughs> How open world is this place? I mean, what if we try to go to Portland? Will we get the real version, the TV version, or our own preconceived notions? Why does that make me not want to go and want to go at the same time? Crystal put away her phone. It's an interesting concept. How much will our thoughts affect this place? Like, will fear make it more of a horror game? I do not want that. I want it to be sexy like last time. Ruby squeezed her eyes shut. <sighs> Don't even talk about a horror game. I fucking hate horror. Happy thoughts, Jem murmured. We're docking. The big fairy turned water and slowly drew up alongside the dock. Earl Caron himself came out and lowered the bridge to the wood of the pier. He looked painfully thin, but human. He smiled. You three have fun now. Jem, Crystal, and Ruby were the first off, but others joined them. A variety of people, families and skiers. They had their gear, and there was a big bustle of folks leaving. So far, there were no Greek mythologies brought to life. Jem was a bit disappointed. Jem felt his hands freezing and his face tingled from the cold. He could smell the comforting smells of wood smoke, though, and the sweet smells of cinnamon buns, cotton candy, and kettle corn. He also smelled funnel cakes. Crystal sniffed the air. Oh, we've got to get something to eat. All of that smells so good. They made their way down through the amusement park rides, games of chance, and food stalls. Jem got funnel cake because, when in doubt, funnel cake. He didn't know why Mr. Oregon was talking about slaves, masters, and freedom, but he also couldn't help but remember that the strange text messages had promised he could be the master of reality with the right upgrades. Jem found tons of cash in his wallet, a thousand dollars, mostly in hundreds, but he had some smaller bills as well. They bought the funnel cakes and then sat at one of many tables underneath umbrella heaters. Jem checked his banking app. It took a minute for him to count the zeros. So, I have ten million dollars in my checking account. I think we should buy Ruby a gun because we know there's going to be some action. And how do we know that? Ruby asked. I mean, if we keep our thoughts happy. Crystal sighed. Uh, I'll try. But Jem here, Jem has kind of a dark mind. Not that he's dark. It's more, he likes to prep for things. That's going to bring trouble. 
Ruby had bought a cup of hot chocolate. She sipped it. Mm. Yeah, and like last time, my fears about my family are bound to bring in goons. Fine, a gun. Maybe a magical gun? Crystal has her machine gun. The Ares rifle. Crystal tore off some of the funnel cake. But I agree. Maybe we can stumble upon a quest that might lead us to Bright Star. We could get Ruby a blaster. I'd want a laser sword. Jim liked the idea. Maybe we can go shopping in Corinth. If it's like it was in the last dive, there might be a store that gears you up for other realities. Wasn't that part of the glitch? Or the oddity, maybe? Crystal asked. Jem shrugged and then couldn't talk. He was eating funnel cake. His taste buds were thanking him profusely. Ruby tapped her cup on the table. Guys, I'm not sure I'm ready for us all to live together. You two have been a couple for a long time. And you're willing to put up with, like, roommate issues. I've been on my own. Yeah, I can live with people, but mixing romance and dishes doesn't work for me. Which brings up the question, where are we going to live? Jem checked his Breeze B&B app. We have the apartment at Mrs. Deem's, but if we wanted, we could live at the Delphine full-time. Unless King Theo respond, then that might not work. Jem was so curious about things on the island. What had changed? What remained the same? What would their life look like? Doing the simulation the second time was intriguing, like playing a video game again. How would things feel doing them the second time? Let's start at Mrs. Deem's, Crystal suggested. Jem and I can get our own apartment, and you can too, Ruby. Then we can move if things get weird. Because you're going to seduce her? Ruby glanced around at all the people. Mostly it was women. Pretty women of all ages, shapes, and sizes. Then again, there are a ton of ladies around for you to seduce. Why Mrs. Deem? Jem knew. Because she might be real. Mrs. Deem said she had a complicated relationship with Erebos. Crystal was blushing. <laughs> maybe. But maybe it was because she came on to me so much the last time we were here. I've had a ton of fantasies. Remember, Jem? We barely had the door closed before we got all excited talking about her. Jem remembered there was a lesbian couple living at the Breeze B&B, and they'd listened to Jem and Crystal having loud sex. Mrs. Deem had mentioned something about the couple enjoying the noise. Ruby grinned. <laughs> Speaking of excitement, how about you tell me more about Mrs. Wiseman? I know a little, but... I'd like to hear every single naughty detail. Here? Crystal asked. In public? A bit of Ruby's brazenness returned. Sure. It's not like we'll get locked up for talking dirty. And it's one of the best things about being in paradise. No consequences. There are consequences, Jem countered. Especially for us. I have a feeling that Sheriff Pluto isn't going to forget that I stole his Biden and that we crossed him. And he might remember you, Ruby. The singer gave him a glare. Ugh, please, Jem, don't fucking remind me about Sheriff Pluto. I'm finally getting over my fear a little and you're fucking it up. Jem raised his hands. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Crystal, go on. She glanced around. I'm going to keep my voice down. But okay, fine. I knew I might be able to change the conversation once with you horn dogs, But if pressed, you'd want to hear it. I'm a little nervous, though, about hurting Jem's feelings. Jem shook his head. You won't hurt my feelings. We're even, remember? And I know the perfect penance, Ruby said. Jem will tell us about Jasmine Kendrick. Crystal's mouth fell open. You remembered her name? Musician, remember? I have to have a good memory because songs have lyrics. But go on, Crystal. Jem couldn't help but get excited. Hearing about Crystal with another guy would piss him off like nothing else. But with the mother of one of her friends, that was a different deal altogether. He was afraid that if he did talk about that night with Jasmine, that Crystal would get hurt. But first things first, Crystal stood up. I need some coffee and some Kahlua. I'll be right back. Jem was left alone with Ruby. They were sitting across from each other, and he admired her beauty. Her dark hair, her dark eyes. 
the cold and their sexy talk had put roses in her cheeks. <laughs> I can't wait to hear about this. Ruby laughed. Okay, I'm getting into the spirit of this weirdness. This is fun. But if you have ten million dollars, and if we're going to buy me a gun, then I want you to get a guitar. Again, Jem felt the fear. <sighs> I never thought I'd have stage fright in heaven, he said. You shouldn't be afraid of the stage, baby. You should be afraid of calluses, Jem. I think you're going to play that guitar until your fingers bleed. Jem didn't know about that. Ruby got a strange look on her face. You know, at first, I wasn't sure why I'd let myself be a guinea pig for a big software company. But now, I can see myself signing up. Not that I remember that. Yeah, my memories of signing up are fuzzy. But go on. Ruby had finished her hot chocolate and was playing with the cup. I like adventure. I like fantasy. Music, in a lot of ways, is like a dream. This perfect place of rhythm, sounds, and words. I want to make Paradiso's Island a song. A good song. Let's do it, Jem said. Fuck stage fright and bleeding fingers. We'll make the next year a long, awesome song. Ruby nodded, reached out, and grabbed his hand. I love you, Jem. I love you too, Jem said. But something bothered him. Why couldn't he remember the process of signing up for the Erebos experience? Maybe it had to do with Mr. Oregon suggesting he find his freedom and become the master and not the slave. Crystal came back with three coffees. She set them down. I figured we could all use a drink. Jem sipped his. The alcohol in the coffee gave it a nice, sweet aftertaste. Crystal's eyes were bright. It's not that big of a deal. It was after I graduated from college. Jem and I were married. My friend's mom came on to me. Oh, this is so awkward to talk about. Crystal laughed a little. Her cheeks were red. <laughs> okay, liquid courage. She sipped more from her coffee. Ah, So, where to start? Give me a timeline. Ruby said. Jem did. Met at 17, sex at 18, married at 21. We're both 29. Crystal took over. So we'd been married a couple of years. I grew up with a lot of religion in my head. Totally puritanical stuff. But I don't want to really talk about that. Suffice to say, I wanted to be a good girl. But I've always been obsessed with sex. Ruby raised her hand. <laughs> Me too. Go on. Crystal set her cup down. Me and my friend, Kylie Wiseman, had another friend, Felicity Tomlinson, who was rich. I mean, like, three houses rich. They had a place in Aspen. We're talking next level of wealth. Felicity has this graduation party. We graduated from Denver University. <laughs> Expensive? Ruby asked. Jem squeezed his wife's shoulder. Full ride. She's a smart one. But Jem worked to pay all the bills the scholarship didn't. Crystal leaned into him. But DU was expensive. She paused. Jem, I love you. I never want anything to come between us. If all this had happened today, I would have called you. Jem patted her hand, and I would have answered. But we're on this journey together, Crystal. Me, you, and Ruby. Ruby nodded. And I feel honored to be here. I love you guys. Jem saw the love on her face. He pulled Crystal close and squeezed her. Tell us, baby. Turn us on. Crystal laughed. <laughs> okay. I'll tell you the reality. <laughs> Which is basically this middle-aged woman trying to kiss me in a hot tub and me putting up a hand to stop her. And then... I'll tell you the fantasy I had. I think that will help make the Erebos experience hotter than ever. Jem thought it was a good idea. If the experience was affected by their thoughts and feelings, talking about sexual fantasies was a great way to start off their year on Paradisos Island together. Chapter 3 Crystal Story they sat at the edge of the eating area, and there wasn't anyone at any of the wooden picnic tables around them. 
The heaters glowed red above them. The Ferris wheel squeaked. People cheered on the roller coaster as the cars clacked around the small wooden track. Sweet pine smoke hung in the air. Though they had their stuff with them at the table, Jem couldn't help but feel comfortable. Like they'd found home. Crystal looked at Jem sitting next to her, and then at Ruby across the table. Crystal kept her voice low. Anyway, Jem and I went to the party at Felicity's mansion in Cherry Creek. He leaves early, I stay. Kylie and her mom and I hang out, and it was super fun. I notice Mrs. Wiseman looking at me. She's friendly, like more than usual. Kylie and I were close, and I studied at their house a lot. Kylie didn't come from money, but they were doing okay. Mrs. Wiseman was divorced. She would always smile a lot at me and hug me, even kiss my cheek. I felt vibes from the start, but I never thought anything would happen. Did you fantasize about her? Ruby asked. Crystal's eyes widened as she nodded. Yeah, like right from the start. I didn't have a mom around growing up. My father dated some, but being a pastor of a small town church limits you. So you have mommy issues, Ruby said simply. Crystal gasped. <gasps> Don't say it like that. <sighs> but yeah, I guess I do. I must, right? I liked Mrs. Wiseman hugging me, kissing me, <laughs> making us snacks while we studied. It did feel good. But like I said, I never thought anything would happen. Especially since I was 23, married, the whole deal. At that point, I thought I was straight. How wrong I was there, puritanical, Ruby said. Crystal turned to Jem. How are you doing? Good so far? Jem felt the sexual tension in the air. He had to adjust his jeans. I'm fine. I'm not, Ruby shot back. I need a lot more details. What did Mrs. Wiseman look like? What did Kylie look like? Kylie was blonde like me. Mrs. Wiseman dyed hers, an ash blonde with highlights. Both were fit, but Mrs. Wiseman was thicker, right? I mean, I guess it gets harder the older you get. Did she have fake boobs? Ruby asked. Crystal winced. Yeah, how did you know? I know the type, the musician replied. Go on. Crystal fluttered her eyelashes. Okay, this is the hard part to talk about. But here goes. <laughs> it's funny, we're in a simulation or whatever, and I'm talking about a memory. In some ways, memories are just simulations of what happened. I mean, it was a long time ago. I'm probably making stuff up. Ruby smiled. No stalling. No stalling, right. Crystal inhaled deeply. We're drinking. It's this party, right? And we brought our swimsuits. Felicity told us to bring our swimsuits and our pajamas. We were going to stay over. Mrs. Wiseman became friends with Felicity's mother, and so it wasn't, like, weird or anything. So I remember changing with Kylie and her mom into our swimsuits. And Mrs. Wiseman caught me looking. Ruby grinned. You don't remember her first name, do you? Crystal was bright red by now. She giggled. <laughs> no! Oh, that is so embarrassing! Jem was hard. The idea of Crystal checking out this older woman had him nearly squirming in his seat. Crystal continued. Mrs. Wiseman smiled at me. I smiled back. And we had this moment... I mean, we both had our tits out, and we were both looking. Normally, with women, you don't look. But, like I said, Mrs. Wiseman and I had this connection. How old do you think she was? Ruby asked. Uh, late 40s, early 50s? Crystal shrugged. It's hard to tell. She kept herself in really good shape. But anyway, we change into our swimsuits, and we go to the hot tub. There were two. One was out in the backyard by the pool. The other was off the master suite. 
The master suite was empty. It was just me, Kylie, and Mrs. Wiseman. Crystal gulped in a breath. She touched my foot with hers. And I touched her back. There were bubbles, so Kylie couldn't see us play footsie. I knew right away it was wrong. Not only was I married, but this was my friend's mom. This was like something straight out of porn. Straight out of porn. Ruby agreed. But you two had been drinking. You were feeling uninhibited. It was a crazy night. Believe me, I've had those. Doing gigs, the whole point is to create that crazy feeling in your audience. You want your show to be remembered. But go on. Kylie leaves, doesn't she? Crystal nodded. At this point, touching each other, caressing each other's legs with our feet, sneaking long looks. Ugh, I'm dying. I'm so horny and I can't think straight. <laughs> Plus, I'm kind of drunk. And I'm scared. I mean, I just graduated from college and it felt like I was standing between my past and my future. Crystal laughed. <laughs> I guess we're always there, standing between our past and our future. For that moment, with this sexy older woman, who I genuinely liked and who liked me, I could forget all of that. Crystal's voice dropped. She shook her head. It's called being young, Ruby murmured. We don't really understand how long life is, unless it's not. But let's not get dark. I am loving this. Are you okay, Jem? He liked how both women were checking in with him. I'm good. I'm kind of swept up in the story. Crystal blew out a breath. Well, that's kind of the end of the story. I mean, the actual story of what happened. So Kylie gets up to go to the bathroom and get more drinks. Right then, I know what's going to happen. The minute Kylie is gone... Mrs. Wiseman comes over to me, gets close, and goes to kiss me. I can feel her hand on my shoulder, her breast pushing against my arm, and I can smell her perfume even with the hot tub steam. She goes to kiss me. I stop her. She looked sad for a minute, and then she smiled and said something like, You're probably right, Crystal. I'm sorry. It's okay, Mrs. Wiseman. It's just kind of a crazy night. <laughs> Something like that. Crystal closed her eyes and took a deep breath. <sighs> That's the story. Things were awkward with Kylie and me after that. And I felt horrible, even though I stopped the kiss. That led to another one of my puritanical phases where I tried to turn off my sexuality. And there you have it. Dumb old reality. In Erebos, I would have kissed her, and then called you two to come over. Jem grinned. I would have gone. Would you, Ruby? Ruby nodded. Yeah, I think I would. If you two were there, I'd just feel safe with you. That makes me want to do crazy things. Crystal got a mischievous look on her face. You heard the reality. Want to know the fantasy? Jem was dying to hear it. Tell us, Ruby said. Crystal made sure no one was around. She lowered her voice. In the fantasy, I let Mrs. Wiseman kiss me. When Kylie leaves, Mrs. Wiseman and I are all over each other. Our tops are off in seconds. I'm straddling her, kissing her, and not just like kissing, kissing but like frenching, moaning, and gasping. <laughs> our tits are pressed up against each other. It's like I can feel our nipples touching. I want to sit on her face. I want to eat her. Ruby was leaning forward to hear every one of Crystal's words. Jem squeezed his legs together and again had to adjust his jeans. Crystal put her hands on her face and then dropped them. Okay, so if you two want to hear it, I'll keep going. My heart was pounding. All the while we're kissing and feeling each other's tits. 
and then I rise up out of the water to let her suck on my nipples. Mm. First one, then the other. I'm holding her head against my chest, rubbing my clit on her leg while she's sucking on my tits. I almost come. Crystal stopped talking for a long time. More people had left the eating area. They had even more privacy. Go on, Ruby prodded. You can't stop there. Jem nodded. Yeah, I agree. Of course, the minute the story is over, we're going to our apartment and I'm going to fuck you hard. <sighs> You'd better. Crystal laughed nervously. <laughs> so, in the fantasy, Mrs. Wiseman and I don't want to get caught, right? So she gets out of the hot tub. She puts a chair under the door handle that leads to the master bedroom. So if Kylie comes back, she won't be able to come out to the back deck. She'd knock, and then we could, you know, stop what we were doing. There was a path to the hot tub, but it went around the house, and it was dark right then. It was late, like way after midnight, and we both think we'd see her coming. Jem was blown away by his wife's dirty imagination. Again, it was this whole sight of her he didn't know existed. Crystal continued. Mrs. Wiseman is topless, but before she gets in, she takes off her bottoms. I can see all of her now. Shaved or hairy? Ruby asked. Crystal furrowed her brow. Mm, sometimes it's shaved. Sometimes it's hairy. I'm pretty sure in real life she shaved. I was staring at her crotch a lot, and I didn't see any hair. Believe me, I was looking. I kind of like both. And Jem doesn't mind hair. I like all kinds of pussies, with all levels of hair. He agreed. So Mrs. Wiseman comes back, and by that time, I take off my bottoms. Then we're in the hot tub naked together. This time, Mrs. Wiseman stands over me and says something like, Suck on mommy's titties, baby. Crystal winced. <sighs> Was that too much? Ruby shook her head. We all have our thing. Keep going. So, I do what she asked. I suck on her tits, and I love her big nipples. In my fantasy, they feel completely natural. I love sucking on her and smelling her and cupping her naked tits. There's just something so wonderful and exciting about boobs. Without a doubt, for everyone, maybe. It's so sensual and primal. Ruby straightened and grabbed her own chest. Yes, sensual and primal. I've been turned on by my own tits, I'll admit it. And then what happens? Mrs. Wiseman gets up and makes me lick her. She's out of the hot tub, and I know she's trying to come fast so we don't get caught. I'm rubbing myself as well, and it's this whole risky situation. What if someone sees us? What happens if her daughter catches me? In some versions of the fantasy, we do get caught. Mostly, though, Mrs. Wiseman comes, and then I come. Sometimes we 69 in the grass. Sometimes Felicity Tomlinson's mom joins us. It definitely includes me sitting on the edge of the hot tub, with my legs spread and Mrs. Wiseman licking me until I come. Crystal paused. You know, that whole risky sex and getting caught stuff kind of scares me, but mostly just turns me on. I could see how that could get addictive really fast. Jem thought about it. On our last day here, we could do all sorts of crazy shit. I mean, if we get caught, we get out. No consequences. Crystal shot Jem a finger gun. <laughs> That's right. No consequences. With Mrs. Wiseman, there were consequences. I ended up ghosting both of them. And it wasn't even Kylie's fault. It was just odd. Really, it was me who couldn't handle it. I even felt guilty after the fantasies. Here on Paradisos Island, 
The stakes are lower, but there are stakes. With me, Jem, and with you, Ruby. I don't want to minimize that. Ruby got up and walked around the end of the table. She sat down and put an arm around Crystal. Jem was on the other side. Ruby pushed her face against Crystal's. There were consequences. And in the whole Wiseman scenario, it was a bad idea. You couldn't be lovers with Mrs. Wiseman and be friends with Kylie. Or maybe you could have. You don't know. But in a way, you created the consequences. Crystal turned and looked into the eyes of the other woman. I did, didn't I? You were young, though, and you got swept away. Lust is fucking powerful. Literally, fucking powerful. Crystal turned to Jem. It's kind of what I do, right? I live a secret life. I try to avoid talking about things. I just pretend everything is fine. Jem nodded. Yeah, but not anymore. We tell each other everything now. We take risks. We do this together. You and me and Ruby makes three. Ruby burst out laughing. <laughs> I fucking love that. We are going to say that all the time. Now, can we please get to our bedroom? Crystal's fantasy has me spinning. Without a doubt, it was one of the hottest things I've ever heard in my life. Crystal smiled shyly. You guys don't hate me? Never. Jem said seriously. Crystal got a mischievous look on her face. But just because I messed up with Mrs. Wiseman, I'm not going to make the same mistake with Mrs. Deem. For her, I'm going to take it slow. But I am going to seduce her. We can do it together. We have money now. And we have a ton of time. I'm going to enjoy myself here. Amen to that, girlfriend. Ruby breathed. I'm seeing the benefits of this place more and more. And I'm curious to see what's changed. Are you guys curious? Jem was. About all sorts of things. Then he saw an old familiar face at the funnel cake stand. It was Faunus Reno, Jem's old boss. Faunus owned and operated Pan's Tavern, a bar and restaurant where Ruby and the Fates had played. Before, Faunus had been a fat man, a bit on the greasy side with long sideburns. He'd looked pretty rough, but when he smiled, his whole face lit up. He had the hairiest arms and knuckles Jem had ever seen. This time, Faunus looked like he did near the end of their previous adventurers. This time, Faunus wasn't hiding his hooves and horns. It seemed this version of Paradiso's Island was playing by a brand new set of rules. Chapter 4 Mrs. Deem's Change Jem didn't point at Faunus, but he did amble over to say hi. He noticed other people in the crowd. Some had horns, others had wings. He saw a woman with fairy wings and delicate features with a guy in jeans and 90s grunge plaid. Another woman had a face like the bark on a tree. Then a family of your typical tourists walked by. Jem had to smile. He liked this new version of the island. Faunus turned, holding a funnel cake. The satyr looked Jem full in the face, and then went to walk on by. It was clear that Faunus didn't remember him. Jem avoided another satyr, this one a big-chested woman, and walked back to the table. By this time, Crystal and Ruby had caught on to what had changed. Crystal stood up. Oh my gosh, did you see the fairies? For the record, if we can get me fairy wings, I will totally use the hell out of them. Ruby squinted. I want Jem to become a satyr. If the Greek myths are right, satyrs can fuck really well. Jem grinned and grabbed his backpack and the long case holding the bident. I won't shave for a week. I can get hairy. I just don't see how I can manage hooves. Crystal laughed. <laughs> Let's see if Mrs. Deem grew a third boob. Ah, this is crazy. They carried their stuff down Neptune's pier and they passed Pan's Tavern. There was a poster for the band that night, a band called Trophy Wife. 
trophy had been one of the fates, as in Ruby and the fates. Ruby looked askance at the poster. We'll be coming back. For one, unless you're playing some Florida dive bar, Trophy Wife is a terrible name. You should name your yacht Trophy Wife, not a band. And should it be the Trophy Wives? I'm kind of dying to know. It was a short walk down to Mrs. Deem's house and the set of apartments behind it. Jem, Crystal, and Ruby all had their enhanced strength, so the walk was easy. The minute they were in front of the house, Mrs. Deem came out the front door. Ah, you two must be the new people. Jerry McCreed and Crystal, right? Terry Deem was wearing a blue gingham shirt, one she must like because they'd seen it on her before. Unlike before, it was buttoned up to hide all of her ample cleavage. She was a striking older woman. She wore those tight jeans well, showing a slim waist and curvy body. Her face was worn with wrinkles, but her nose and lips were so perfect, it was easy to only see the beauty. This time, she had long brown hair, and while it was clearly dyed, it still looked good. Crystal let out a surprised breath. She looks almost exactly like Mindy Mink, the porn star. Jem watched porn, but he didn't have anyone's name memorized. Oh, God. Ruby breathed. Then Mrs. Deem approached them, keeping a respectful distance. Are you a threesome? Oh, gosh, that came out wrong. Just glad you didn't say thruple, Jem said. I hate that word. I like it. Ruby protested. Mrs. Deem laughed nervously. <laughs> I'm so sorry. This is awkward. She was blushing. She was embarrassed by her gaffe. It seemed Faunus wasn't the only person who had changed. The woman tried to smooth things over by moving on to the reason why they were all there. I have Jeremy and Crystal renting a room. I have an open apartment, though, Miss... Ruby. The singer replied. Ruby Inc. Mrs. Deem's eyes went to Ruby's left arm. That is a wonderful tattoo. Thank you. Is Ruby Inc. some kind of stage name? It is. The singer said. So, yeah, another room would be great. Mrs. Deem nodded. Her eyes lingered on Ruby for a second and then moved to Crystal. But the older woman didn't stare. She smiled matronly, then turned to walk on her wedges to the apartments at the back of the house. Come on, guys. Sorry I can't chat much. I'm baking pumpkin bread for my prayer group. Ruby's mouth fell open. Crystal looked both confused and disappointed. Jem had to laugh. <laughs> You heard what she said. She has to get back to her baking. Crystal sighed. <laughs> but I wanted her to bake me. Jem shushed her. They followed Mrs. Deem, who was very professional with them. She didn't flirt any, not one bit, as she showed them their old apartment, and then had them walk up the steps to another apartment on the third floor. It was a one-bedroom. Both the kitchen and the living room were tiny, though the bedroom was a good size and it had a balcony overlooking the ocean. Since it was higher, it actually had a better view of the crashing waves below. Despite how small it was, Ruby was thrilled. Crystal was still disappointed. Mrs. Deem actually shook Crystal's hand before beating a hasty retreat out of the apartment. That left Jem and the two women alone in their old apartment, the same one they'd moved into originally. Jem stood at the door, reliving all the memories. The kitchen was on his right, and then a second bedroom was on the left. They still planned on using it as an office. Across the living room was the master bedroom, with the big bed and the balcony. It was Ruby who noticed he was being nostalgic. You're remembering all the kissing we did, right? Remember that night? It was so wild. I really did think we'd only kiss. I'm normally not so slutty. Nothing normal about this, right? Jem asked. You're right about that. Crystal was buzzing around the apartment, putting things away. She loved to unpack right away, while Jem dreaded it. Ruby sat Jem down at the table. Come on, big guy. Unpacking isn't so bad. Crystal set her saxophone on its stand next to the sofa. I think I know what happened with Mrs. Deem. What's that? Ruby asked. I kind of wanted to seduce her. I really did. So if Erebos is reacting to our desires, it would make sense. If Mrs. Deem would have just thrown me down, it wouldn't be as hot, I have to say. 
I mean, with Mrs. Wiseman, there was all this flirting beforehand. All these looks, touches. It was slow and hot. That made it feel more illicit. Ruby nodded. I get that. And watching you get her is going to get me so hot. Speaking of which, are we gonna, you know, break in the place? We also have to do it in my apartment, right? Oh, fuck yes! Crystal shouted. But we do need groceries. And I'm sorry, but I need to know about Sheriff Pluto and King Theo. I'm dying of curiosity. But yes, sex. <laughs> Lots of sex, please. Ruby sighed. <sighs> what if I don't want to wait? I mean, we're rich, we're in paradise, and I'm too fucking horny. So, uh, I say we get our groceries delivered, and you two take me up to my apartment, and Jem fucks the hell out of me while I lick Crystal's pussy. Crystal stopped her flurry of unpacking. Ugh, that sounds pretty much like heaven. Let's do it. I'll get my phone. For video? Ruby asked. Crystal rolled her eyes. <laughs> no, for food delivery. You two go start. I'll be along soon. I'm basically starving to death. Jem was curious about the island as well. But he wasn't going to say no to sex, especially since now he knew for sure that Ruby was real. He chased the singer up the stairs, and they burst into her apartment. He thought they might start in the tiny kitchen or the little living room, but no. <laughs> she pulled him into the bedroom, which was furnished, and then out onto the balcony. Ruby was stripping off her clothes as she went, her shoes, her pants, her shirts, until she was out on the balcony in a chair. She had goose flesh break out on her arms and legs. The nipples on her big tits were hard. Jem raised an eyebrow. Uh, isn't it a bit chilly? But I wanted to do a little bit in public. I mean, the people under us could come out any minute. It's not like we can get arrested, I don't think. And besides, I'm too horny to think. Ruby was impetuous. She was driven by her emotions and not her logic. At the same time, Jem had to remember what Mr. Oregon said. The ruby armor protects the fragile heart. Jem took off his boots. They faced the ocean, and there might be a boat out there, but no one on land would see them. She lived in the topmost apartment. She wasn't wrong about the two balconies below them, though. Someone might come out and hear them, or see what they were doing between the slats on the floor. Crystal's story totally turned me on. Ruby took off her panties. She spread herself to show a triangle of fur. It was dark and curly, not a bit clipped. Jem stripped off his shirt and felt the cold air hit him. He got down on his knees and widened Ruby's thick thighs. Then he bent and inhaled her scent. <sighs> Don't tease, Jem. Ruby complained. Just lick me. I can come before Crystal shows up, and then I can make her come. Jem licked her quickly, and she did come. Before he knew it, he was holding himself up on the arms of the chair as he slipped inside her. The deeper he went, the wetter and tighter she became, until she was fully wrapped around his rigid pole. Being outside, the cold air was sharp on his back, and yet, at the same time, holding himself upright had him sweating. I bet they know what we're doing. Ruby gasped. In the lab, I bet they can monitor our heart rates, and they know. It's like all the sex we're having is exhibitionism. Oh, it makes me hot. I bet the women watching get turned on. Jem didn't much care about any of that at the moment. Ruby was so hot under him, he liked kissing her and thrusting into her at the same time. Under them, they heard a sliding glass door open. Two women came out, talking and laughing. Stop, Ruby hissed. A bit later, she whispered. Let's go inside. I can't go through with it. It was the safer tactic. And it would save any number of awkward conversations. It seemed Ruby had some limits after all. Ruby didn't grab her clothes. She hurried into their room with her ass shaking. Jem started after her. But then he saw something in the trees below to the side of the house. 
something dark, with wings and a pale face. The clouds had blocked out the sun for a minute, and all he saw were eyes gazing up at him. Whatever was there had been there the entire time, watching him and Ruby together. A second later, the figure took off flying. It was a woman, but something was wrong with her body. Before he knew it, she had dived down into the waves. What the hell? Jem didn't like that particular voyeur. There was something about the flying woman that gave him a bad feeling. The two women talking below him didn't seem to notice. Jem left the balcony and closed the door behind him. The heat inside felt nice after the cold deck on his feet. Ruby blushed. <laughs> I know, I'm a big talker. But come on, those might be real people under us. Jem wasn't upset at all. He'd come to understand that Ruby was brave when it came to certain things and a little gun-shy when it came to others. There was this winged woman creature watching us, Jem said. I'm not sure where she went. Ruby squinted one eye shut. A winged woman creature? Like what? Like a bird woman? More like a demon, Jem said. A harpy, maybe? Or a fury? Both options sound pretty fucking scary. Ruby cursed. There was a knock on the door. Ruby looked terrified. Oh, we got reported, didn't we? Jem kissed her cheek. Don't worry about it, Ruby Ink. We'll be fine. He didn't have decay, his magical fork that was down in his room. But he did have his super strength, and he was bulletproof. If the winged woman creature came knocking, he'd deal with her. He had to slink back onto the porch to grab his jeans. When he did, he heard a woman's voice call up to him. Having fun up there? She was almost laughing. Tons of fun. He called down. Ruby was in bed under the covers. Oh my god, they totally knew. <laughs> totally, Jem laughed. He closed the bedroom door behind him as he hurried to the front door. He opened it up, shirtless, and he had to take a minute. There were no demon women. However, Crystal was there, along with a girl in a rain-spattered leather jacket, a tight sweater, jeans, and combat boots. She had green skin, snakes for hair, and she was currently kissing Crystal. Both had their hands on each other's asses. Next to them were a couple of bags of groceries. Jem cleared his throat. <clears> throat> uh, Crystal? Chapter 5 Crystal's Kiss Crystal stepped away from the Medusa. The blushing didn't go very well with her green skin. Even the faces of her snakes were blushing. Crystal gulped in a breath. Uh, yeah, this is Mags. That's short for Maggie. Her name is Maggie Medusa. The girl with the snake hair raised a green hand. Hi, uh, this is super awkward, but there's a logical explanation. She was young and cute, with a round face and cute round nose and nice lips. She was so cute that it didn't matter that she had snakes for hair. Those very bright green eyes were mesmerizing. For one terrifying moment, Jem wondered if they could turn him to stone. Without a hot blue singer under him, he was getting chilly. Let's talk inside. I want to hear this logical explanation. Jem stepped back to allow Mags to pass him. He smelled her perfume and her leather jacket. Both smelled good. He could also feel her heat. The snakes in her hair turned to look at him but they looked far more cartoony than like regular asps. They seemed as amused by him as he was by them. Crystal leaned in close. You're not mad, are you? As long as I don't open the door to catch you kissing some guy, we're fine. We're on Paradiso Island. Like we said, you can kiss girls. But if you want to do more than that, you, me, and Ruby have to talk. Mags turned around. She stood in the middle of the room, I forgot the groceries. I can- I got them. Jem picked up the bags and brought them in. He put them on the table. Okay, I'm ready for the logical explanation. Both Crystal and Mags started to talk at the same time. Mags giggled. 
you should go. Crystal gave the Medusa a little smile. Well, Mags dropped food off at our apartment first. Then I was wondering if anyone ever hit on her and how they did it. Mags said there were a few guys who hit on her, but if they got too out of control, she literally turned them to stone. Mags raised a hand. Her fingernails were painted pink. It was cute. <laughs> Guilty, but it wasn't like literally stone. I could just paralyze them for a bit. You know, like in the stories. Crystal nodded. Like in the stories. We hit it off. I loved Medusa growing up. I'm not the real Medusa, Mag said. I'm just like an offspring or whatever. But it's cool. So, the kiss. Jem heard Ruby go onto the balcony to get her clothes. He heard her talking to the women below. He could only imagine her blush. Crystal nodded. Mag said there's some women who get a little handsy when she drops off the groceries. Like they rub her back and they smile at her. And she just gets this vibe from them. So I uh, gave her the vibe. Mag squeezed her eyes shut. As did all the snakes on her head. <laughs> she did. It was sweet. And Crystal is so pretty. You guys are new to the island, and I wanted to, um, give you a big old Paradiso Island welcome. Ruby came out dressed, but her makeup was smeared and her hair was frizzy. She had a dizzy smile on her face. Hi, I'm Ruby. Hi, Ruby, Mag said exuberantly. I'm the food wheel girl. <laughs> Crystal said that you and Jem and her are together. You're like polyamorous or whatever. It's cool. It's actually hot. She pulled off her jacket and held it at her waist. She had on a tight ladies' t-shirt, white and thin, so that her pink bra showed through. Crystal's eyes went to Mag's tight little titties. The Medusa girl had hard nipples. She took in a deep breath. When she exhaled, it was shaky. So, there was the welcome kiss. And it was fun, but uh, I'm gonna go, or whatever, if that's cool. Ruby put her hands on her hips. Maggie Medusa. Your last name is Medusa? Mag's eyes darted to Crystal, then back at Ruby. I know, it's kind of dumb, but it's better than Medusa Gorgon, or Margaret Gorgon. I like the alliteration, or whatever. Jem had to smile. Crystal was jumping feet first into their new life. She was taking risks right away. And while Mag's Medusa might be a participant, with a name like that, she was probably just part of the Erebos experience. Crystal, though, wasn't going to seduce the Medusa into doing anything she didn't want to do. It was so nice meeting you, Mags. We were going to head over to see Trophy Wife at Pan's Tavern. Will we see you there? Mm, maybe. Mags blinked, as did her snakes. But text me if you get hungry. This is kind of my normal shift, and I like you guys. Maybe we can hang out sometime. Jem liked the idea of that. Mags left. Crystal immediately began to strip. Okay, have I mentioned how much I love it here? Well, I love it here. Jem's sex with the women went far faster than he would have thought. They wound up on Ruby's bed on her clean sheets. Ruby got on all fours and buried her face between Crystal's legs. Jem took care of the singer's needs as she took care of his cute blonde wife. It wasn't long before they were all orgasming. They wound up in a big pile on the bed, laughing. Mrs. Deem's chastity had been a surprise. But then, the Medusa was just as surprising. After some snacks, thanks to the food wheel delivery girl, Jem and Ruby found the motivation to unpack. Crystal was so excited to get everything in its place. Ruby didn't do a great job unpacking, but she did a good enough job by sprinkling her stuff around the place. The singer was soon in Jem's apartment, sitting on their balcony, smoking. They talked through the open sliding glass door. Smoking? Crystal asked, 
making a face. Ruby waved the cigarette at her. Yes, it's not like I'm destroying my lungs. And we're billionaires, right? I plan on smoking and drinking this time around. No lungs, no liver, no worries. Crystal frowned and her brow furrowed. But we have to kiss you. And I can't kiss someone who smokes. Ruby looked worried. Well, that is basically a huge reason to not smoke much. It is kind of dangerous. I mean, I quit a while back, and it was hard. Not the physical addiction. It's more of the mental addiction. It would make quitting in the real world a thousand times harder, but oh well. But no kisses for Crystal until I brush my teeth. And shower? Crystal folded one of her favorite t-shirts. Ruby gave Jem a pleading look. He shrugged. I had to quit, and I won't be smoking again. It was fucking awful quitting, never again. But I will be drinking lots of beer and eating donuts, because you're right. We don't have to worry about it. Ruby sighed happily. <sighs> it's 360 days of vacation. Of perfection. You know, I was nervous about this place, but I'm feeling better. Did Mags help with that? Crystal waggled her eyebrows. Ruby blushed a little. She was so pretty. For a minute, when she took off her coat, I thought she wanted to stay and watch us. That would have been interesting. I'd like to flex more of my exhibitionist muscles. But the women on the second floor came out, and I freaked. She did. Jem hung up a pair of his jeans. Ruby exhaled the plume of smoke. But with Mags, I think it would be different. I think she's part of the vacation now. I want to see her again. Someone got her number, right? Crystal nodded. I did. And yeah, I think she'll be discreet. Oh God, did I use the word discreet? <laughs> it's like I've become the pervy dowager. Too young to be a dowager. Jem pointed out. Crystal started putting away her underwear. Even if she's not, I don't care. I have you two. And I've worried about what other people think my whole life. Not anymore. Not here, at least. Ruby laughed a little. <laughs> my mom said a woman's reputation is as fragile as a glass ballerina. One slip and it shatters and it will never dance again. So, I understand that. Nice thing about being in rock and roll, a bad reputation can get you sales. <laughs> People expect it. For a girl, though, it comes with baggage. All the fucking guys at a show think they can bang you. And that can get exhausting. Fewer guys in Paradiso Island. Jem went out and sniffed. While he wouldn't smoke, not even in the pretend world of Erebos, he did still like the smell. And I'll be there. Any douchebag gets near you, and I will ruin them. There's my guy. Ruby got up and kissed him. She smelled like cigarettes, her perfume, and sex. Basically all the girls that Jem had kissed before Crystal. So? Jem patted Ruby's hip. Tonight, let's go out to dinner. We'll load up our weapons and go to the Delphine for dinner. If King Theo is there, we'll kill him again. No, let us catch up on the gossip on the island. What do you two say? Ruby stepped back. Wait, I have a couple of questions about how this place works. Or what we can change about ourselves. I don't think for a moment you're not going to try to fucking hack that Erebos app like you did with the computer our first time here. Jem wasn't sure it was their first time. However, he was intrigued by Ruby's questions. Hit me, he said. I'm looking to find freedom. Chapter 6 Jem's New Hack Ruby stepped away to stub out her cigarette. Then she grabbed Jem's hand and put it on her ass. I was thinking of redoing the old body. I am a bit hippie, and I'd like a tighter ass. We can do that, right? Jem shrugged. I would think so. If we can be bulletproof, I think we can have abs. But, Ruby, I like your body the way it is. Ruby searched his eyes. Really? Crystal came over. 
She grabbed Ruby's other ass cheek. Really? If you lost weight, you'd have less junk in your trunk. And you'd have smaller boobs. As we both know, weight loss hits the girls first. So, I have my own self-interest to consider. You could get yourself a huge pair of jugs, Ruby suggested. <laughs> then I'd never leave the house. Crystal laughed and then kissed Ruby on the mouth. Mm, uh, yuck, smoker. Jim would look into what kind of body modifications he might be able to do. It wouldn't be at third level. At this point, their character sheets were view only. Ruby hadn't been wrong. That sounded like a challenge to Jem. Either to level or to hack that shit. If we're going out, we are dressing up. Crystal proclaimed. Best outfits for everyone. And Jem? I might be able to accessorize a lot of things, but there is no way I'll be able to accessorize an assault rifle. I'll get working on that. Jem stripped off his shirt. Let me shower first. It won't take me long. Oh, so you're saying we'll take forever? Ruby asked. Jem winced. I'm not saying a word. He cleaned up quickly, found his suit and put it on. With a tie. He hated wearing the thing, but he knew that Crystal and Ruby would love to see him in it. He shaved, threw on some cologne, and then had to laugh. During their first time in Erebos, Jem had dressed his avatar in a leather jacket, and suddenly that jacket was on his body. If he could figure out how to make changes to their bodies and their wardrobes, they could literally shop for clothes online. Anything he clicked on would appear on him. That would be pretty wild. Jem hated shopping for clothes in real life. Jem opened the app and started going through the menus. All of it was pretty straightforward. The graphics were far better than the pixelated nightmare he'd seen before on Faunus's computer in the back office of Pan's Tavern. But now, everything was locked down pretty tightly. He sat at the table near the door. His giant fork, Decay, and Crystal's Ares rifle were propped up on the side of the couch. They needed to carry them around with them now that it was clear that Paradisos Island was embracing monsters and wasn't hiding its true nature. He considered the problem. He could get to the actual code of the Erebos app, but he didn't think he could change anything because all the files were locked down. He'd need an admin account, unless he could trick the app. He started the phone up in safe mode, then saw that he could make changes to the config files. He heard Crystal humming to herself as she stepped out of the shower and started on her makeup and perfume. He loved how their apartment smelled when his wife was getting ready to go out. It brought up so many happy memories. Women were so wonderful. Their ways and rituals that were so different from his own. Then Jem saw a setting for an extra-dimensional pocket called Inventex. At this point, he saw there were five slots. He added code for himself, and then he used the view option on the camera. He held his phone with the camera focused on Decay, the Biden he grabbed from the God of Death. He found the actual code for the weapon, and then it was easy to copy and paste that code into his Inventex inventory system. He recompiled the code. The fork disappeared from his living room and appeared in one of his storage slots. He realized the ability to shop online was possible. He could try it out. He went to the Big River website. He changed his browser to show him the Java code. He could then transfer that code to his Inventex. What to grab? He found champagne and three champagne glasses. By copying them over and recompiling, he got them in his Inventex slot. To access them. The phone had the digital assistant. He could add whatever word he wanted. He grinned. He might as well keep the Greek mythology going. Okay, Zeus, put the champagne and glasses from my Inventex on the table. The champagne bottle and glasses materialized on the table. It took a second. He'd have to see if he could speed that up. He added a couple of shortcuts for himself and Crystal. Crystal came out. She was in a black dress that showed a bit of cleavage. She was also wearing stockings and black heels. She looked amazing. Her eyes went to the table. Champagne? Where did you get that? Did Mags drop it off? I grabbed it off, Big River. She lifted an eyebrow. Uh, how does that work exactly? Is shipping that fast? 
not shipped, he said. I hacked the Erebos inventory system. Go grab your phone. Crystal looked mystified, but she brought him her phone. He focused the camera on the Ares rifle and added it to Crystal's Inventex system along with a shortcut. Then Jem showed her how it worked. Okay, Zeus, hand me decay. His bident appeared in his hand. Crystal had a big smile on her face. Oh my gosh, what do I say? Push your digital assistant button and say, Okay, Zeus, I'll be your huckleberry. Crystal sighed and shook her head. <sighs> you and that movie. She lifted her hand. I'll be your huckleberry. The rifle appeared in her hand. <gasps> well, now how do I put it away? Okay, Zeus, put decay in my inventex. As Biden disappeared and was back in his extra-dimensional storage slot. This is very cool. Crystal said. I won't have to carry so much stuff around in my purse. Jem shrugged. It's a good start. It's a great start. Crystal was all smiles. I get in the shower and you hack the system, so now shopping is a snap. We won't need groceries delivered. We can just grab them off the internet. But then we might not see Mags again. Ah, she was so cool. An actual Medusa? I have to say, she is cute even with the snake hair. I really like her. Me too. They heard a key in the door, and Ruby came in. She was in a leather miniskirt, stockings with a skull pattern on them, and big black boots. She wore a sweater and shirt set, unbuttoned to show most of her cleavage. She carried an actual cloak. Crystal would wear her big black coat. Jem felt himself get excited looking at both his women, all dressed up and looking perfect. Crystal couldn't keep Jem's work a secret. She showed Ruby how the Inventex system worked. Jem took a minute to add the same functionality to Ruby's phone. Now I just need a sword and a gun, the singer said. Sword and gun? Crystal asked. Ruby held up a hand. I know we said I was going to get a gun. I'm down with that. But I've been thinking. I also want a fucking sword, like in the pirate movies. I always thought that was kind of badass, how the pirates had those old-timey pistols and a curved sword. <laughs> Sign me up. Jem smiled. I think we can make a pirate out of you. That's kind of cool. Ruby exhaled. <sighs> Did you tell Crystal about the harpy? Not sure if it was a harpy or not, Jem said. Crystal wasn't worried. I'll have my Ares rifle. I'd kill a harpy. I'm not afraid. That's my girl, Jem said. Are you guys ready? Born, Born ready. ready, they both said. Jem realized that Ruby didn't need to wait to start her career as a pirate. With the harpy around, they all needed to protect themselves. Let me see your phone really quick. She gave it to him. Crystal rolled her eyes. <sighs> this might take a minute. Let's crack open the champagne. They poured three drinks and sat sipping, chatting about all the stuff they could get online. Meanwhile, Jem did a quick internet search for guns. He found another three fifty seven Magnum, a Colt Python. It would be a big gun for Ruby, but she had her augmented strength. She'd be fine. He added it to her inventory along with a box of shells. Okay, Ruby, like Crystal, if you want your gun, just say, Okay, Zeus, I'll be your huckleberry. <laughs> what in the hell does that mean? Ruby said laughing. Jem toasted the two girls. <laughs> it's an old saying, which basically meant, I'm the man for the job. Or the woman. More recently, it's from the movie Tombstone. <laughs> Crystal rolled her eyes. Ugh, all men automatically like that movie. It's in their bylaws. Ruby laughed and reached out with the hand not holding her champagne glass. <laughs> okay, Zeus, I'll be your huckleberry. The big pistol slowly appeared in her hand. She felt the heft. Wow, that's much heavier than our old gun. I can wait on the sword. I should probably take lessons. Or once I figure out how to upgrade our skills, I can just give you a fencing ability. Ruby sighed. <sighs> I kind of want to practice. There's some joy in practicing shit. But we'll see. Then she arched her eyebrows. Now I can buy you a guitar online. But now, there's a good music store in South Thessal. We'll go there and support the local economy. Jem didn't point out that there was no real local economy, but in the end, it didn't matter. 
With their weapons in their Inventax, they left the apartment. The night was cold, but the air smelled so good, and it was a nice walk to the Hotel Delphine. When they entered the grounds, they paused to take in the lights and the mystery. Jem had no idea what they would encounter. If King Thea was around, and if he remembered their fight, their dinner might turn into a bloodbath. Chapter 7 Jem's Mystery Dinner The walk up to the Delphine Hotel and Resort didn't take long. However, they were on high alert. If the harpy returned, they would see what she wanted. Then there were the gods to consider. The god of the sea and the god of death. They had made some pretty powerful enemies their first time around. Jem and the girls walked up the path by the pools. No one was in the pool itself, though there were people in the hot tubs. A few women with blue skin, a fish woman and another satyr who was playing a pan flute with some skill. They made their way to the Agora, which was the shopping mall in the hotel. There were all sorts of high-end stores and restaurants. Ruby wanted to eat at a place called Ambrosia, which was probably the best restaurant on the island. Up in Paradise City, there was a restaurant called Nectar, but it only had a dozen tables and was impossible to get into. Most people just ate at Z's place, called the Olympus Hearth. Jem and Crystal hadn't eaten out much during their first time around. They needed to save money. This time, they had all the money they could ever want. The guy at the front of Ambrosia said there was no way they could get a table. The restaurant was booked months out, but Jem had a plan. Let's go ask around at the hotel to see what's going on. They wandered up to the hotel lobby where they immediately saw King Theo. The big guy was in a suit. He had a big green beard and green hair, and while Jem had turned his leg and his heart to dust, he seemed to have recuperated well. He was talking to some of the concierges at a desk. Jem turned to Crystal and Ruby. You guys stay here. I don't want you getting hurt. Just let me go talk to him. Crystal rolled her eyes. <sighs> Whatever, Jem. Ruby looked afraid for a second. Then she put on attitude. We're going to be right here. If he tries anything, Annie will be fucking getting her gun. Both of us Annies will be. We're ready to be huckleberries. Deal, Jem said. He left the two girls and walked across the sumptuous lobby of the Delphine. There was no sign of the battle they'd had there. Jim approached the concierge desk. All the employees in their uniforms snapped to attention. Jem noticed the name tag on King Theo's chest. Theo, hotel manager. He was an employee. Jem nodded at the concierges, seemingly human boys and girls. He addressed the god of the sea. Hey, Theo, I don't suppose you remember me? I'm Jeremy Creed, most people call me Jem. Theo searched his face. Hello, Jim. I don't think we've met before, but welcome to the Delphine. How can we help you? So the god didn't remember him. Or was he a god? It didn't seem like it. We're trying to get a table at Ambrosia. Theo looked pained. I'm sorry, sir, but the place books up months ahead. There's not much I can do. Is there a private room for VIPs? Jim asked. I'm with Ruby Inc. From Ruby and the Fates. She's not used to being rejected. I think I've heard of them, one of the concierges said. He was probably just trying to be nice. Theo winced. Still, I'm so very sorry, but I can't call the owner and see if he can help. Who owns the Delphine now? Jem asked. When I was here last, it was run by someone named Theoi Halioi. That's kind of like Theo, now that I think about it. Theo grinned shyly. Oh, <laughs> the owner is a very private person. I can't even say if it's a man or a woman, it's just... The owner. The sea green eyes fell to the floor. But we don't really talk about it. I run the day-to-day -day operations. You seem like a nice young man. Let me make a call. Jem reached into his pocket and found his roll of hundred-dollar bills. He smoothly handed Theo the money, and the bearded man put it in his pocket immediately. Here's a little something for your efforts. Jem knew that he'd get a table, and he wasn't wrong. Fifteen minutes later, he was sitting at a corner table with a view of the waves breaking on the Burnwater Islands. Jem told them about Theo's new role as manager. Ruby drank from a big glass of red wine. Mm, so, 
The Delphine has a mysterious new owner. Why am I not surprised? Could it be Sheriff Bluto? Or maybe Z made enough money. <laughs> Z from the Olympus Hearth? Crystal laughed and sipped her white wine. <laughs> like, why don't we just call him Zeus at this stage? We should totally go and talk to him. I mean, now that Paradiso's Island is showing us her true colors, we should probably talk to the King of the Gods. Jem was drinking some German beer he'd forgotten the name of. It was rich, flavorful, probably the best beer he'd ever had. <sighs> it would be cool to talk to Z. He was the only god who didn't try to kill us, if you don't include Faunus. Not sure Faunus is a god, though. He just might be your everyday satyr. That made Jem laugh. <laughs> they were talking about all this like it was perfectly normal. Z was good to us. Ruby agreed. Me and the fates. We're going over to Pan's Tavern tonight to see Trophy Wife, right? She grimaced at the name. I'm hoping to get the band back together. As long as we can change the name. <laughs> they were so much fun to play with. Crystal waggled her eyebrows. Did you play a lot with them? Ruby shook her head. <laughs> Not like that. Never like that. Sex and bands don't mix. Unless you're Fleetwood Mac and in the process of breaking up. It's like what Buddha said. Don't shit where you eat. Or was that Yoda? No, it was Merle Haggard. Jem laughed. <laughs> it probably wasn't Merle Haggard. He said never have sex with anyone crazier than you are. But anyway, we don't need to mess around with the band. I think we'll have enough action from other women on the island. I'm just glad that Theo isn't trying to kill us this time. He took the bribe like he'd done it a thousand times before. So there doesn't seem to be bad blood there. And if we avoid the law, we should be okay with Sheriff Pluto. Their waitress came sauntering up, barefoot. She was a sea nymph, or that was Jem's guess. Her name was Kimothoe, but she wanted to be called Kim. She had blue skin and bright green hair. Her face was flawless with blue eyes, a wonderfully Greek nose, and full lips. After seeing their new Medusa friend and a bunch of other women on the island, Jem was getting used to women with all different colors of skin. White, brown, black, green, blue, or whatever. Kim was very chatty. Okay, guys, I see you're enjoying your drinks. What can I get for your main meal? Oh, and the appetizers. The calamari will change your life. Yes, calamari. Ruby said loudly. And more wine. Kim giggled. <laughs> I told you the red was good and strong. Jem ordered the steak and lobster. Ruby was going to have the paella, and Crystal went with the sea bass. <laughs> All good choices. Kim bubbled. Hey, you wouldn't happen to know who owns the Delphine, would you? Jem asked. Kim put her hand on her hip. She was wearing a cute little aquamarine suit with a tiny little tie. She was a chesty thing, and the front of her suit swelled. Oh, that's such a mystery. No one knows. There was a big change that happened like a month ago. That's when Theo became manager and the owner moved into the penthouse. It's a real island, Scuttlebutt. Do you want to hear some real gossip? Ruby's eyes were wide. <laughs> Always. Crystal nodded enthusiastically. Spill the tea, girl! Kim glanced around. Well, a month ago, Elsie Dorrance was staying at the hotel. She is not a very nice person at all. I don't mean to speak ill of the missing, but she was a nightmare to deal with. She ate here every night. Depending on her mood, she tipped huge. But there's more to life than tips. Like a lot more. Even with the extra money, no one wanted to deal with her. Crystal tilted her head. What about Natalie Mirage and Nikki Merchant? They were with her, right? I hear they're nice. Kim nodded enthusiastically. And Elsie totally changed when they were around. But guess what? All three disappeared a month ago, right when the new owner took over. There's been some talk that the three of them bought the Delphine and then have been having... She lowered her voice to a whisper. Orgies in the hotel's penthouse office suites. But some people think Elsie is being held prisoner here. Who can say? It's all just so much gossip. Something caught Kim's eye. Oh, we're so busy. I have to get to work, but I'll be back with yummies. The sea nymph hurried away. Jem thought of the text message from Mr. Oregon. You'll get to the mystery, 
but why be a slave when you can be the master? Find your freedom. Wow, they were getting to the mysteries. Crystal is all smiles. Okay, so this is all awesome. We have the disappearance of our bitchy celebrity and her dominatrix pop star friends. And is it me? Or was Kim your basic everyday NPC giving us a quest? I'm going to ask her for her number. Ruby blinked at Crystal. Why am I not surprised? Crystal smiled and blinked her eyes in a flirtatious way. I want her number just in case we need more information on the island, of course. At this point, I have my sights set on Mrs. Deem. Mags is on deck. She gave Jim a grin. How do you like that baseball analogy? It's good. Not sure we'll get Mags, though. We'll see. The calamari came and they all dug in. Kim looked a little less bubbly. Hey, I was just gossiping about island stuff. Don't take what I said seriously. Crystal wanted to reassure her. <sighs> no worries, Kim. We won't repeat what you said. We just appreciate the information. Kim looked relieved. <sighs> Thanks. I love this job. Enjoy the calamari! There was no way they couldn't. The pieces of squid were lightly breaded and fried to perfection. The spicy marinara sauce hit their taste buds just right. Did you notice that I didn't ask for her number? Crystal asked. Ruby leaned over and kissed her cheek. You are the essence of restraint. Crystal chewed and swallowed her squid. Hmm. <sighs> I think this owner business just might turn dangerous. And I don't want Kim getting hurt. I know she might not be real, but ask Jem. Even in video games, I hate it when NPCs get hurt. <laughs> I'm super sensitive. She is. Jem agreed. Ruby was buzzing hard. <laughs> you two are the cutest. <laughs> well, we have our work cut out for us. I kind of want to find the famous threesome. Both of you got to play around with them. I kind of want my turn. Jem remembered the quick oral sex they'd had in the elevator. He was curious to get more. And he was wondering if Elsie and the two pop stars were real people or not. He might be able to find out more once he further hacked the Erebos app. Even though they'd only been in Erebos less than 24 hours, Jem found himself with a list of things to investigate. But he didn't have any major concerns at this point. All of this was just fun. They could delve into the mysteries, or they could just wait. He was curious about Corinth, and what that place would be like now that Paradisos Island was showing its true colors. First, though, Ruby wanted to work on the band. Part of that work was going to be Jem learning to play the guitar. He wasn't sure why that scared him far more than any monsters. He could say no, but a part of him didn't want to. Their time on Paradisos Island might be full of pleasure, but Jem wasn't the kind of guy to waste a year of life. No. He wasn't that kind of guy at all. Chapter 8 Their First Week After dinner, they went to Pan's Tavern to check out Trophy Wife. And yes, like they thought, it was the fates playing with an older woman who couldn't sing all that well. Her name was Cinnamon Sugar, which somehow made her voice sound worse. But as luck would have it, thank you, Paradisos Island... Cinnamon Sugar was leaving the island in a couple of weeks, and the band was looking for a singer. That made Ruby smile. After their show, she talked with them, and they made plans to get together. Trophy, Letty, and Spin practice in the same storage unit as before. They were looking for a roommate. Ruby already had a place to live, though. Jim found himself a bit disappointed that Mags wasn't there. The petite Medusa was so pretty, he wanted a chance to kiss her. That first week in Paradiso's Island passed quickly. Before, Jem had driven around the island on Mrs. Deem's motorcycle. With the rains and snow, they needed something with a roof. So Jem bought a Jeepster Renegade, brand new. Paying cash felt both great and strange. Jem spent most of that first week either sleeping or having sex. They ordered food wheel for most every dinner, and Mags showed up here and there but she wasn't going to just dive into anything intimate. She and Crystal did text back and forth, however. The Medusa was just one of Crystal's projects. Jem's wife used every excuse in the book to talk with Mrs. Deem, but the MILF was shy. She didn't seem to be the same sex kitten that she'd been the year before. 
Crystal wasn't discouraged, though. She spent hours with Mrs. Deem, talking about the island, her experiences with the Breeze B&B, and funny stories from her life. This version of Mrs. Deem had been married three times, but had been widowed once and divorced twice. She adored her first husband, but he passed away five years after they were married. Then it was bad husband number one followed by bad husband number two. So she was gun-shy for any new romance. Crystal listened, drank tea, and helped Mrs. Dean with chores around both of her houses. The Victorian on the street, and the big house in the back with the ocean view. Mrs. Dean didn't know anything about the strange winged demon woman that Jem had seen. But the older woman had heard about the mysterious new owner of the Delphine and about the disappearance of the celebrity threesome. Ruby went out every night to practice with Trophy, Letty, and Spin. By the end of the week, Trophy Wife was dead, and they were Ruby and the Fates once more. Trophy was the quiet girl who played lead guitar. Letty was the oldest, and she played bass with fingers marked by tattoos turning green. The drummer, Spin, was a thick Hispanic girl who'd grown up rough in Mexico City. The Fates weren't against bringing in new members especially a beautiful girl who could play the saxophone. Ruby didn't mention that she wanted to bring someone else in, someone who was new to music. That would be Jem. He still wasn't sure he wanted to start learning guitar. How many people had he known that started strumming chords but soon dropped it? Too many to count. And yet, Friday morning he got another message from Mr. Oregon. His phone went off and it woke him up. Crystal was already gone She'd driven down to the community college in South Thessal to see about doing some tutoring there. Jem lifted his phone to read the message. The caged bird still sings unless the song becomes powerful enough to break the lock. The real mystery is in the music of the upgraded masters and not the whistling of the weak slaves. Jem closed his eyes. Damn it. It was a cryptic way of saying that music was going to be important in solving some of the mysteries they were facing during this dive. Mr. Oregon had helped him again and again. He'd just have to man up and play the game. Ruby was thrilled. That afternoon, she and Crystal took him to the local music store, The Dirty Liar, which sounded like a bar but wasn't. Phoebe Apollo sold instruments and offered lessons. When Jem walked in, the place felt right in a weird kind of way. Phoebe was a pretty blonde woman who had a timelessness about her. She could have been in her late thirties, or she might have been in her fifties. Both her blouse and her jeans were embroidered with flowers. She wore sandals that looked Greek. Of course, she had several toe rings. Phoebus Apollo had been the Greek god of music and the sun. Phoebe seemed to have some of his sunshine in her. She smiled with a bright look on her face. She had a guy working there as well named Orpheus who mostly wore dark sunglasses. They didn't hide the bruises on his face. Ruby held up a hand. Hey, Orf. The guy in sunglasses nodded and immediately went into one of the back rooms. That was where he did the music lessons. Jem lifted an eyebrow. What happened to him? Ruby smirked like the cool girl in a teen movie. Torn apart by maidens and thrice. He does get in fights a lot. Phoebe gave Jem a long look. But let's talk about you. Ruby and Crystal are musicians, but what about you? He's going to be great! Crystal called from where she was checking out the music store's brass section. What kind of guitar do you suggest I start with? Jem asked. Phoebe didn't answer. She walked around him, around and around, praising him. Why do you want to play music? She stood back and put a finger to her full red lips. No, don't answer that. You're a grown man. You're starting late. Why start at all? Jem didn't like this woman questioning him, though he had the same concerns. He hit back with a raised chin. I don't need to tell you a thing. I want a guitar. That's all you need to know. Oh, snap. Ruby breathed. Wrong way to start. Phoebe's hazel eyes flashed. No, I don't sell instruments to just anyone. And I don't work with just anyone. I don't have to. I didn't open this shop for money. I have money. And from what people are saying, you do too. Jem figured Theo might have talked about the bribe. Or maybe it was the fact that they'd eaten that ambrosia twice now. Or maybe Phoebe was the fucking goddess of music. It was probably that. Look, Jem snapped back. I could buy something on Big River. It was Ruby who suggested I come here and maybe sign up for lessons, but I don't need the shit. 
If you don't want to sell to me, fine, I'll leave. But I'm not going to be fucking interrogated. Crystal walked out into the aisle. She had a concerned look on her face. Jim knew. He'd blown it. He was being mean to the goddess of music. He wasn't playing the game. Ruby gave him a gentle shove. Jim, come on. It's fine. Phoebe retreated behind the front counter in the cash register. She took a seat on a stool. Not everyone is called to music. Actually, you're probably lucky, Jim, because music is a heartbreaker. Phoebe grabbed the book and opened it, turning pages casually. Jim walked up to the counter. Do you know why I'm just starting now? Because if I grabbed the guitar growing up or tried the piano or did anything like that, I'd have been seen as weak or trying to be better than I am. That my old man or my brothers would have handed my ass to me to keep me in my place. I love music. I mean, I fucking love music. But part of me is scared shitless of even trying because... He realized he'd started talking out of anger. And here he was trying not to cry. When had paradise become so tough? Phoebe snapped the book shut. Because what? The goddess asked. Jem swallowed some of his emotion down. Because if I suck... It might ruin music for me. Phoebe laughed. (laughs) Oh, you'll suck. You'll suck for a long time. And people will laugh at you. And they'll talk shit. You've done shows, Ruby, right? You know how people are. Ruby walked up and put a gentle hand on Jem's back. I've told you some of my stories. People literally threw stuff at me. Or threatened to beat the shit out of me and my band. Or said that I shouldn't quit my day job. All of that is part of the landscape. So why didn't you quit? Jem asked. Ruby looked him in the eye. Because I love it. Because music was my escape. It was my dream. But more, it was my reality. The real me is a musician. And look, I would be doing it even if I never made a dime. It's what I love. And you might find you love it too. (laughs) Then it won't matter. You'll play your music. You'll sing your song. It might suck, but it will be yours. He thought of the text message. The music of the upgraded masters and not the whistling of the weak-minded slaves. Crystal walked up on the other side of him. Everything she's saying is the truth. It was for me. There will come a time when you're not bad, but you're not good. And getting good feels like it will never happen. It's one thing to be new. It's another thing to really understand what it takes to get good. It can be heartbreaking. Most people quit, Phoebe said. It's only a rare few that commit after that, but I'll sell you gear. I'll sign you up for lessons. I'll take a risk on you, Jem, for those two girls, but more for the little boy you might have been if your situation had been different. Jem still felt afraid, but he also felt something else. He felt resolve. He'd had fantasies of being a rock star. Who didn't? but it was easier to learn skills that paid the bills. Living off tips or royalties was not something that Jem would have done. No, he'd learned technology so he could take care of Crystal. Any hobby felt like an extravagance. Dreams felt like they were for other people and never for him. But Jem understood something. Dreams were dangerous. Dreams could so easily be shattered. And the disappointment could be crushing. Dreams were a risk. Jem realized something else. He was in paradise, yes, but that didn't mean there wasn't risk. He thought of something Crystal said during their final fight the last time they'd been in the Erebos experience. She'd said that fighting monsters had been easier than going up on stage. At the time, he'd kind of thought she was being dramatic. Now he knew differently. Phoebe came around and gave him the book she was reading. It was her own book. The cover was a broken guitar covered in roses. It was called The Musical Mysteries of Life and Love. You can buy that copy, she said. And pick out a guitar that you like. You should like how it feels, yes. But you should also like the look of it as well. It should fire your imagination. He found something right away. It was an epiphone inspired by Gibson J45, made from solid mahogany with mother-of-pearl dot inlays. It felt solid in his grip, and he strummed it. It just felt right. Was he really doing this? Yes. Yes, he was. He signed up for lessons every day, either with Phoebe or with Orpheus. Might as well learn from the best, right? 
Ruby showed him things he could start trying right away. She also made that old joke. How do you get to Madison Square Garden? Practice, 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 and Jem was going to practice. He wasn't going to let his fear push him away. If he didn't like it, he'd stop. But if he loved it, nothing would stop him. Worst case scenario, he'd come out of his time on Paradisos Island knowing how to play the guitar. That night, they drove up to Paradise City to celebrate. They'd eat at the Olympus Hearth. Ruby wanted to check out another local band called Calliope. They did mostly pop metal covers, but had also written a couple of progressive rock songs. Ruby had listened to them on YouTube. There was no way they were going to try a ten-minute song at the local bar. That was a good way to lose a gig forever. The snow started on the highway that led up the side of the mountain, but the Jeep Sir Renegade was all-wheel drive with two four-by-four settings. The snow was falling in blinding sheets by the time they pulled up to the Olympus Hearth. The windshield wipers couldn't keep the glass clear. Jem turned and grinned at the two women. We should try to find a room tonight. I don't want to drive back down the hill in this mess. Before they could say a word, he laughed. <laughs> don't worry. I put my guitar in my Inventex slot. I can still practice. I'm going to do it every day. Crystal grabbed his hand. Thanks for being brave. Ruby mussed his hair from the back seat. Yeah, you're not letting your fucking shitty childhood define you. Fuck our families. We're going to do what we want, right? <laughs> fucking A! Crystal agreed. Jem bent and kissed his wife's cheek. They left their jeepster, and Crystal was already on her phone, looking for a room. The Olympus Hearth was at the center of the ski village, at the base of the three lifts that took skiers up the mountain. The main lodge was just down the road, but there were condos all over the place. Pushing through the doors, they were met with the smell of a fireplace mixed with the scent of alcohol and a crowd of sweet-smelling skiers. There were perfumes and colognes galore. The band was already playing, doing a medley of Def Leppard songs. They weren't bad, but Ruby was still rolling her eyes. A big man with long hair and a beard so black the color was almost blue was behind the bar. He was muscled, and his black eyes radiated power. That was Z. He caught Jem's eye and waved them over. Jem found that strange. He exchanged glances with both Ruby and Crystal. What was going on? They approached carefully. Z leaned over the bar. He was well over six feet tall, probably closer to seven. He had a shit-eating grin on his face. Well, look who's back. Not only do I have a ruby without her fates, but there's Jem and his lovely bride. What are you three troublemakers doing back on Paradiso's island? Jem didn't show the god his surprise. What do you mean? We're new to the island. We've only been here a week. Z shook his head. I remember you from before. I'm probably the only character who does. That rescue was epic. Good thing Pluto won't remember. <laughs> Otherwise, he'd be pissed and you three would be in big trouble. Suddenly, their night had gotten exponentially more interesting. Chapter 9 Zeus's Truth Jem couldn't hide the surprise on his face. Z laughed. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm one of the only things in the Erebos experience that has knowledge of past sessions, but I'm limited by what I can say. We were going to do an Oracle of Delphi, but what fun would that be? What can I get you three to drink? Crystal had a dizzy smile. Ruby frowned for a second and then broke out laughing. <laughs> I'll take a boiler maker, Z. So you'll let me and the fates play here, right? As much as you like. Z called out over the loud music of the band. They'd started in on 90s Def Leppard with way too much keyboard. But you have to promise me you'll bring in Crystal here. I was kicking myself that I didn't go to that legendary Delphine show you did the last time you were here. Crystal squinted one eye shut. I have so many questions. But I also have one very important answer. Make me a sex on the beach, Z. I'll take a Guinness. Jem shouted. Maybe we can talk somewhere quieter? You three should eat first. I can get you a table even though this is the busiest time of the night. Z glanced down at Crystal's phone. The Breeze b, b app was open. If you need a place for tonight, I have a house back in the forest. It'll be an adventure getting there, but it's nice. 
I'll rent it out to you cheap. Hell, if you like it, you can buy it from me. What do you mean an adventure? Jem figured he wasn't going to get an answer to the question. Z just grinned and served up their drinks. We'll talk more tonight. You three look more than ready for a little snow and questing tonight. Don't book anything else. You can stay at my house. I have to run. The hostess came and grabbed them. They wound up at a table on the second floor, overlooking the stage. Their waitress came around. Jem ordered the buffalo wings and the chips and queso as appetizers. The band, which consisted of five guys, took a break. More Def Leppard played overhead. Crystal's face glowed from her fruity drink. So, what the hell? Why does Z remember stuff? And can we trust him? Ruby asked. In the story, Zeus was a grade-A asshole. If he even tries to come at me as a swan or a white bull, I'm not fucking him. Me neither. Crystal laughed. But if Hera shows up, all bets are off. Her face was bright with excitement. Jem sipped his beer. Ugh, it kind of makes sense in some strange way. I mean, we have the Erebos app on our phones, so we already have inside information. He tried to look up the new owner of the Delphine, but the system information only said it was recently purchased by a property management company, Pure Dream Properties, LLC. That was kind of interesting, because Elsie Dorrance's father had owned real dream properties, which he later sold to Marriott for a bundle of money. He's not going to tell us much, Crystal said. I mean, we have a couple of quests going if we want them. So, as the next NPC we talk to, he'll give us some cryptic clues and maybe try to give us more quest information. We'll see. I can't wait to talk with him. What about this house he's offering? Ruby asked. Jem set his beer on their table. A little adventure might be cool. Let's see what happens. Their appetizers came and suddenly they had wings and queso dip to eat. Crystal dug in. Hmm. I'm not so sure I want to do the in-game quests. I mean, what happened with us in the elevator with our favorite celebrity threesome was hot. But I have my sights set on Mrs. Deem and Mags. Speaking of which, she just texted me. She's wondering if we wanted to hook up. I told her we were up in Paradise City and it's snowing like crazy. She says she understands. I don't. Mm -mm. I wish you were here with us. It was funny. But Jem kind of saw Mags as another quest in the game. The real quest, though, was learning music. At least that was what Mr. Organ had said. Crystal checked her phone and then put it back into her purse. Anyway, there's also the band to consider. When am I coming in for my first rehearsal? Tomorrow afternoon, Ruby said. We'll meet in the storage unit. Ruby only took a few bites off her wing. She left so much meat on it. Well, Jem wasn't shy and he and Ruby had shared every one of their virtual germs already. He picked it up and ate the rest of the meat off the bone. Ruby rolled her eyes at him. <sighs> You're such a barbarian. There are plenty of other wings, Jem. Waste not, want not. The three of them ordered dinner and ate, and it wasn't long until the band played one of their long progressive rock songs. It was really complex, and the bard chattered basically over the whole thing. Ruby grinned through it. They're losing their audience, and they totally don't care. I love it. That takes balls. It was nearly 11 when Z finally sank down at their table. He had a big mug of beer. He knocked his knuckles on the table. I have to say, Ruby, I admire your courage. And the last time King Theo wanted you to play the Delphine exclusively, I'm glad you didn't take that deal. Never! Ruby said a little too loudly. The band had taken a break, but she'd gotten used to yelling. <laughs> no one owns me, Z. Ever. What do you know about the Delphine? Jem asked. Z shrugged. Same as you, right? Mysterious new owner? Elsie Dorrance missing along with Nat and Nikki, but I do have some inside information. Crystal leaned forward. I am so listening. Z sipped his beer, then set his mug back onto the table. <laughs> ah, rumor has it, Pure Dream LLC is only holding the Delphine until someone claims it. They're going to do a little competition. Not sure what it is, but the person who wins will take ownership. The newly humbled Theo is doing a great job running it. Whoever owns it won't have to do much. They'll have a big cash cow, and they'll get the newly renovated penthouse. Nice digs. We stayed there the last time we were here, Jem said. But really, 
If we wanted it, I think we could buy it. It don't work that way, Z said. The Mrs. Deem out in the real world wants you to work for it. It's all part of the fun in the game you're playing, right? Like you're part of the game? Crystal asked. Z feigned hurt and touched his chest. Ouch, Crystal. Telling me I'm just an NPC is hurtful. But I'm more than that. He pointed a finger at Jem. And don't even think about calling me the oddity. I am not some random bit of bad programming, and I'm not some bloodthirsty AI. I'm just a rich guy who owns a bar and a ski resort on an impossible island. Jem laughed. <laughs> I wouldn't dream of calling you the oddity. I don't suppose you know about that, do you? Z's laughter was as deep as his voice. <laughs> One thing at a time. You three are here to have a good time. Let the powers that be worry about the bad stuff. I would suggest taking over the Delphine. Those rooms are nice, and you'll have more power, financial and otherwise. The father of the gods stood. Call me when you and the fates are ready to play up here. I'd love it if your debut show was here. I will pimp the shit out of it. He paused. But nothing artsy. Give the people covers of songs they like. Then when you get a following, you can take more chances. Ruby blew out a breath. <sighs> yeah, boss, I know how the game works. Why did you let Calliope go progressive rock tonight? Z grinned. Because I love progressive rock, that's why. When you own the place, you can do what you want. Within reason. You'll know how that feels if you win the Delphine. I would imagine the owner of the Delphine will announce something at the Winter Dreams Ball. That's this big, fancy thing the resort does every year. Anyway, this competition should be interesting. I just don't know what it is yet. He pulled a phone out of his pocket. I'll text you the GPS coordinates for the house. Sheila will show you where the snowmobiles are. Have fun on your little adventure. Ruby winced. But I hate the cold. Sounds like a you problem. Z left them. Jem wasn't going to waste any time. Let's pay the bill and get on with it. I think the most important part of the evening is over. Let's get on with the adventure. Crystal's thumbs went wild texting. Okay, just texting Mags. She just told me she's kind of a voyeur. She wants to, uh, watch us at some point. Jem felt his heart skip a beat. I'm okay with that. Ruby grinned. <laughs> well, that's fucking convenient since I'm wanting to be more of an exhibitionist. Do we all get a turn kissing her? I don't know. She, uh, <laughs> likes watching. Crystal's face was red. We texted a little about what she might be looking for. I, for one, am just fine with that. What do you guys think? Ruby rolled her eyes. Sure, she'll just watch, right? <laughs> like we were just going to kiss a little bit. I know what happens around you two. Us three, Jem corrected her. We're together now. Just don't call us a thruple. Ruby tapped the table. <laughs> I might need a whiskey. I'm not worried about Mags watching us. I am worried about this snowmobile trip to this house in the forest during a snowstorm. That's how horror movies start. Wrong genre, Crystal said. Let's make sure this is a porno movie. Jem's phone went off in his pocket. Why didn't he think it was good news? He checked, and it was from the organ number. Get ready for your first fight. But remember, the masters of reality understand what the true fight is. Good luck. Jem read it out loud. Ruby let out a sigh. Oh, fuck me. At least we have some warning. Maybe Mr. Oregon is wrong this time. Crystal smiled. Why am I excited to fight again? <laughs> this is going to be so much fun. Jem wasn't sure that was the right word. However, it would be interesting if nothing else. Chapter 10 Ruby's Aim Jem paid, and they went downstairs. They asked for Sheila and a giant woman with hairy arms and bulging biceps took them outside. She wasn't exactly human. She only had one central eye. Sheila was a cyclops. Behind the bar, in a heated garage, were two snowmobiles. Sheila showed them the basics. It's not too far to the Vauno house. That's the name of Z's other house. He must like you three to offer it. 
There are instructions there. You'll be fine. Well, you should be. We will be, Crystal said enthusiastically. Gem and I have snowmobiled before. Wonderful, Sheila grunted. Ruby was pale. Have there been any attacks near this house? Or trouble? Like evil motherfuckers with horns and hooves? Or maybe, you know, Batman or Fishman or some shit? Sheila eyed her with the one eye. Then she spoke to Jem. Does she always care so much? Not always, Jem lied. Crystal was far bolder. We were warned we might get attacked riding up to the Vono house. The Cyclops woman sighed. <sighs> I don't know nothing about nothing. Like a tex. What does that even mean? I'll tell Z I showed you what I was supposed to show you. It's just up the road. You'll be fine. With that, the big woman stormed off. Why am I not surprised that a giant Cyclops woman would be rude? Not surprised here, Crystal shrugged. She wasn't worried, so I'm not going to be worried. Ruby frowned. I'll fucking worry enough for the three of us. Jem and the girls stood in the heated garage next to the snowmobiles. They watched the snow fall. Uh, it's pretty cold, Ruby said. I'm not outdoorsy, not by any stretch. So, what do we do? Jem pulled out his phone. He did a little shopping on Big River, then stuck a hat, gloves, and a scarf into his Inventex slots. A second later, they were on him. Crystal laughed, eyes bright. Instant gear! They all outfitted themselves in snow gear. Then Crystal jumped on her machine and hit the electric ignition. The engine roared to life. A beam of light cut through the darkness. Get behind Jem, Ruby. I'll follow you guys. There's a little holder for your phone. If we have a battle on snowmobiles, I'll be so psyched. It's like James Bond, right? <laughs> so totally James Bond. Jem got on the snowmobile, and Ruby slid in behind him. He loved the thrum of the engine and the power of the tracks beneath him. His phone was in the holder, showing them the way to the GPS coordinates. It was just off the snow-covered road that cut through the trees. Not that you could tell it was a road. It was just empty snow, packed snow covered in a layer of powder, through the forest. Oh, fuck this. Ruby had her phone in her hand. Okay, Zeus, I'll be your huckleberry. The Colt Python appeared in her hands. Jem felt her turn. Crystal has the Ares rifle ready. Do you want to get decay? She asked. Maybe I won't need it. Jem said. As long as you two shoot well, we'll be fine. The machines roared through the dark trees. The smell of the gasoline engines filled Jem's nose. The wind would blow snowflakes into their eyes, which forced them to slow down. Something moved among the pines, and there was a flash of white. Something ran out in front of them. It was at least eight feet tall, with ice crusted to its hairy hide. Its hand had huge blue claws at the tips. But like Sheila, it only had one eye. It seemed like it was a yeti crossed with a cyclops. It let out a howl and charged them. Ruby opened fire. Either the bullets bounced off it or she missed, but the thing wasn't slowing down. Jem wasn't going to risk trying to run past the thing. He brought his machine to a stop. <sighs> okay, Zeus. Hand me decay. His bident was in his hands in an instant. He got off the snowmobile and charged the Cyclops Yeti. It roared. Its mouth was full of yellow fangs. Its one eye was crazed. Jem drove the fork into its chest, and the entire monster turned to dust. He heard the distinct ding of his phone going off in his pocket. Was that a notification or another message from Mr. Oregon? Behind him, he heard Crystal yell, Eat lead, fucker! Another Cyclops Yeti came out of the trees. Jem spun to see one round hit the Yeti and explode. Most of its chest was gone. White bone showed from under the gore. Crystal must have been using her explosive rounds. 
In the lull between gunshots, Jem heard his wife's phone tweet. She was getting a notification. Then Ruby fired into the trees. There's another one! And something else! Something else, indeed. A strange, croaking voice called to them. Your father will not be denied, Persephone. You will be returning home. Ruby let out a scream. Damn it! My family is still trying to get me? This isn't even real! A cyclops yeti roared and hurled a huge dead tree at them. It was like the world's biggest spear. It would kill them and destroy their snowmobiles. Jem hurled his fork and hit the tree. Only dust and snow blew into his face. At the same time, Crystal used her level three fire bullets. They not only acted as tracers, but they peppered the trees with flames that gave them light. The last Cyclops Yeti was exposed. Ruby took a fresh grip on her gun. She placed the butt on her palm to steady her shot. Then she used her last two bullets. Both shots hit the monster in the chest. Blood marked the white chest of the creature. It was bleeding and angry, and it charged them through the pines. Jem ran in front of it to retrieve his fork, and those claws would have torn him apart if not for another one of Crystal's explosive rounds. The bullet hit the yeti in the shoulder. There was a pause, and then the explosion blew the arm off the monster. Jem plucked his fork from the snow and rammed it into the body of the yeti. He was dusted immediately. From out of the forest appeared a naked woman with pale white flesh. She had leathery black wings, obsidian horns, and ebony eyes. Her forearms were covered in black feathers. Instead of feet, she had a crow's talons. She was the creature that Jem had seen before, watching them from the trees. The crow woman's laughter sounded like cawing before she croaked. You cannot escape your family, girl. You cannot escape me. The monster woman flew forward. Crystal tried to hit her with fire bullets, but the creature dodged the rounds. Jem leapt forward to ram the fork into the woman. She was too fast. However, Jem was able to grab her wings. He hauled her down to the ground, but she was up, biting at him and scratching at him with her clawed feet. He felt her beak rip into his skin. His jeans were shredded, along with the top layers of skin. He might be bulletproof, but he wasn't crazy fucking crowproof. The monster woman sprang to her feet. Jem scrambled up. He felt his blood gushing down his skin, but the pain felt distant. He was too involved in the fight. Thank you, Adrenaline. The creature girl smacked him in the face with her wings. Jem got pissed and started forward to rip those wings off. He never had the chance. Ruby was there. She'd reloaded the revolver. She shoved the big gun into the crow woman's face. Tell my family to fuck off! Ruby squeezed the trigger. The bullet took out most of the crow woman's face. Her brains went splashing onto the ground. When the monster hit the ground, she exploded into a pile of black feathers. There would be no sign of the body after a night of wind and snow. Jem noticed that the Cyclops Yeti with the destroyed thorax had turned into a large snowbank. All signs of the attack were gone. Ruby's phone dinged. She held her gun limply. <sighs> I'm so sorry, guys. I thought this time would be different. Crystal laughed. <laughs> oh, it's different, all right. Your father has literal monsters working for him now. But we took care of them. Are you okay, Jem? I'll heal. He said. Let's keep on going to the house. I'm going to call Z and tell him what happened. He better offer us a fucking discount. Jem didn't think Z was behind the attack, but he couldn't be sure. This Vouno house might be just another trap. They'd have to continue on more carefully. He was just glad they were so well armed. Chapter 11 Zeus's Vouno House 
Jem drove with his Biden across his lap. Ruby had one arm wrapped around his belly. The other held her Colt Python fully loaded. Jem was thinking he should try to copy and paste the abilities of the Ares rifle into the revolver. Then the bullets would do more damage. He'd have to spend some time on that project at some point. Getting a job again was feeling less and less like something he wanted to do. Was this how retirement felt? Behind them, Crystal zoomed on her snowmobile. Jim ignored the pain of his wounds until that pain turned into an itch. His healing ability was taking over and he was glad. It was another mile until they came to a house built over a half-frozen river. Most of the water was trapped in ice, but there were spots where the stream gurgled over the dark rocks underneath. Snow covered everything. Most of the eastern side of the house was windows. A few lamps glowed inside, giving them a glimpse of the comfortable living room inside. The porch light was on. They drove up and parked to the side of the front door. That was when Jem saw the ski lift rising out of the forest on the other side of the stream. There wasn't a bridge over the river. The house was the bridge. Crystal's face glowed in the light of her phone. <sighs> okay, the hard part is over. Let me just get the door code. Several beeps later, she opened the door. Jem and Ruby followed her inside. Jem inhaled, smelling the scent of the clean room. It was cold, however, almost as cold as the frigid night outside. To the left was a huge kitchen and eating area. To the right was another table in front of windows that showed the glittering lights of Paradise City. Jem could see the top of the Olympus hearth and several ski runs. Dominating the room was a fireplace. Through two archways, on either side of the stone, was the master bedroom and master bathroom. Crystal adjusted the thermostat. Jem, though, hurried forward to the fireplace. There were stacks of split pine logs, some smaller branches, and some good tinder to get the fire started. Jem soon had a blaze going. He tossed his clothes into the garbage since they were so torn and bloodied. And he grabbed new clothes off Big River's website. Ruby stood in the kitchen, bathed in the light of the fridge, smiling. <sighs> this place is perfect. There's food, there's wine, beer as well. Can I get you a beer, Jem? Crystal came out of the bedroom. The sheets are clean on the biggest bed you've ever seen. There's also a shower you have to see. I mean, it's something out of a movie. She knelt down next to Jem, lifting her hands to feel the warmth of the fire. So, I could get used to being rich, even if it's just for a year. Can you believe this place? Ruby made sure the front door was locked. The rest of the house was on stilts though there was a back door just off the master bedroom. Steps led down to a mudroom and the door to the outside. That was how you reached the ski lift. Ruby had poured herself and Crystal two big glasses of wine. Are we going to talk about the Cyclops Yetis? And there was the winged lady working for my father. <sighs> Fuck my life. That was fun, Crystal said. And Z did warn us that it would be an adventure getting here. As did Mr. Oregon. But I have a question. What's that? Jem asked. Crystal furrowed her brow. Was that a harpy ruby shot? I thought harpies would be less like crows and more like hags. Am I disappointed? Mm, kinda. I'm just glad we took her out. Let the adventure continue. Jem loved how positive his wife had become. Out in the real world, she could be such a worrier. But in the Erebos experience... She didn't seem to have a worry in the world. Ruby sat. She set the two glasses of wine on the table in front of her. <sighs> My father coming after me isn't an adventure. It's a nightmare. But it's not like we're on Earth. Crystal mused, sipping her wine. Your father isn't in the Erebos experience. I don't think. Ruby's eyes went to the fire. Oh, it's my own paranoia. Mrs. Deem said that Erebos was an interplay between our imagination and the program. I turned my father's goons into monsters. And a lady monster. Crystal pointed out. I would have thought she was cute if not for the crow's feet. <laughs> I don't mean wrinkles around the eyes. She had literal crow's feet. I've read some harem novels with monster girls and... I have to be honest. I'm a bit curious. Also, not sure if the wings would turn me on or not. Ruby rolled her eyes. Ugh, totally a turn off for me. Crystal cleared her throat. 
Ahem, uh, Ruby, next time, I'd like to order a harpy. Make your father's goons harpies, like with the ugly hag faces and big fangs. Less demony and crowy. Ruby didn't roll her eyes again, but she did twitch them a little. Crystal went over and caressed the singer's hair. Sorry to make light of this. Gemini managed to escape our crazy families, but yours is still around to make you miserable. Jem pulled out his phone. In other news, during the fight, we all received notifications. I'm wondering if Mr. Oregon reached out to all of us. Nope. Crystal said. At least he didn't reach out to me. I saw an Erebos app message while I was reading the text from Z. Jem opened his phone and saw the message. Congratulations, participant. We detected a major encounter. You survived, and so you have leveled up. Please review your character sheet and add an additional ability. Ruby lay back with her phone over her face. So, did you guys level up? I guess combat levels us, which is kind of basic. But, oh fucking well, better than not leveling at all. Crystal made a fist. Yes, we're going to get new skills. I'm so ready for skills. I hope we do. Jem opened his character sheet. View only mode. Level up to make adjustments. Name, Jeremy Creed. Alias, Jem. Level, four. New open slot available. Character class, hero. Original abilities. Knowledge of network security and information technologies. Street fighting. Basic criminality. New, updated special abilities. Bulletproof. Healing. Strength. Wealth. Open slot. Jem thought the notification was a bit strange. The fight with the Yeti and Crow Woman didn't feel like a major encounter. What constituted a major versus a minor encounter? And how did leveling work? It wasn't like he was tracking experience points or anything. He needed to understand the rules better. But the Erebos app wasn't too helpful. He'd have to go through the code to get more information. For now, he had a new ability to choose. I have a new skill to add. I'll give you two guesses about what I'm going to choose. Hold on, mister. Crystal read through her own updates. So I'm level four as well, and I see the open slot. I'm wondering where the list of abilities is. And I know you're already trying to figure out why the Yeti fight was a major encounter. He nodded. You know me so well. I'm just glad that we got the system message to give us that bit of information. You know, it would make sense for the messaging to get better and better as we're here longer. The system is responding to our input and anticipating what we need. But you're going to keep on hacking, aren't you, cowboy? Crystal asked. Digital outlaw. That's me. Jem grinned. Like a motherfucker. Ruby said. Crystal stared off into space. I think the encounters aren't going to be just combat. Erebos hasn't been your typical super fighty kind of game. It's more of an experience, right? Ruby laughed a little. <laughs> well, that might be true. But I'm still doing sword fighting as my skill. I know it might be cheating, but I have to have some kind of combat skill. Don't worry, I would imagine I'll still have to practice. I just don't know who on Paradisos Island I can get sword fighting lessons from. Fencing lessons, maybe. Crystal said. Where is the list of possible skills? Jem went back a few menus and then found a whole list of special abilities. It was like any kind of list in an RPG. Jem read through the first few. Acrobatics, aerobics, animal handling, athletic endurance, athletic intelligence, agriculture, arcana, arson. And the list went on and on and on. He found skills that had to do with music. Brass family instruments, keyboard and piano. Music theory. Percussion, rhythm, stringed instruments, woodwinds, ultra-musicality. Ruby raised her fist in the air. There's a swashbuckling skill! It's a combination fencing, pistol, and ropes course. I'm going to go with a swashbuckling skill. We are on an island. You guys were on a ghost pirate ship. Or is that pirate ghost ship? Either way. Crystal's smile was evil. I'm going to choose the seduction skill. I think encounters are going to include sexual encounters. And I am going to seduce Mrs. Deem. At least her.
Maybe Mags as well. Or our waitress at Ambrosia. Is it okay? This is your fantasy world, baby. Ruby said. I'll fucking swashbuckle, you'll fucking seduce. We'll have a great fucking time. Jem kept scrolling and saw something interesting. So the list is a mixture of supernatural abilities and basic skills. There's a cooking skill, a baking skill, advanced quilting. No, no, and no. Ruby said. We have food wheel for the food. And if you ever see me quilting or sewing, kill me. Both Jem and Crystal laughed. Jem slipped a fresh log on the fire. Not only was he in a swanky mountain lodge with two beautiful women, but he was upgrading his life in ways he'd never thought possible. He was having the time of his life. Chapter 12 Jem's Doubts Jem and Crystal sat on the couch directly in front of the fire. The flames crackled, taking away the chill and leaving the air smelling like pine smoke. Outside, the blizzard blew and blew, rocking the house, but inside, things were warm and perfect. Ruby had been sitting in the lounger off to the side, but she stood up and hurried over. She showed them her phone. I chose my new skill. Take a peek. View only mode. Level up to make adjustments. Name, Persephone Jennifer Mulvado. Alias, Ruby Inc. Level, three. Character class, musician. Original abilities, guitar proficiency. Lyricist, advanced criminality. New, updated special abilities. Bulletproof, healing, strength. Advanced vocal acuity. New, swashbuckling. Jem frowned. It's interesting the list of skills you have don't match the list we can pull from. But they might have upgraded the system with this dive, and we're basically playing the characters we were from our first dive. Not sure why you're level three and why your character class is musician. Crystal knocked him with an elbow. I know, she's a wonderful musician. Jem winced. Sorry, I didn't mean anything by it. Ruby didn't appear bothered. She sat back down on the lounger. It's okay. I think you guys were kind of jacks of all trades, and I was pretty focused. I can't lie, but I'm kind of concerned about that advanced criminality. Though, I do know the ins and outs of money laundering, so I guess that makes sense. Jem wasn't sure if that was the case. A participant's character class was important, and the fact that Ruby's class wasn't hero disturbed him. There were so many things they didn't know. He did know one thing. I get why you're only level three. The first time around, Crystal and I had more combat than you did since you got kidnapped by King Theo. And I think the rules this time around are different. I bet you'd have gotten encounter points if there is such a thing. For playing that concert at the Delphine, that was amazing. It was amazing. Crystal agreed. Want to see my updated character sheet? She showed it to him. View only mode. Level up to make adjustments. Name. Crystal Church Creed. Alias. None. Level. Four. Character class. Hero. Original abilities. Literature, composition, and rhetoric. Saxophone. Superior emotional intelligence. New, updated special abilities. Bulletproof. Healing. Strength. Wealth. New, seduction. Crystal was glowing. There are other sexual skills as well. BDSM proficiencies and even more specific things. I kind of don't need extra skills like that because, uh, my imagination works pretty well. Ruby's eyes were shining bright. She was a little drunk. On the lounger, she was close enough to caress Crystal with her foot. Just you saying those letters BTSM gets me excited. So, are we going to christen this place? I would love to fuck in front of the fireplace. Crystal leaned forward and gently lifted Ruby's foot. She kissed the singer's cute red toes. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. We're going to have a ton of sex tonight. But first, I'm wondering what skill my darling husband is going to choose. Watching the two women, Jem had to adjust his new jeans. Like I said, there are supernatural skills here as well. I see there's an invulnerability ability. 
After being ripped up by her friend, the Crow Woman, I'm thinking I should choose that. We don't want this little adventure to end with one of us dying. Ruby went white. Don't say that. I don't want to talk about death. Not ever. Jem smacked his forehead. I'm so sorry. Crystal grabbed Ruby and pulled the singer onto the couch with her and Jem. No dying, Crystal said. And like I said, this is about the experience, not the combat. Jem is probably right, though. We should get invulnerability next. Ruby wound up between them with Jem on her left and Crystal on her right. No, it's okay. It's just, when Sheriff Pluto grabbed me, it felt like dying. I've died, I know it. I think that was one of the reasons why the real world didn't seem real. Because I was already dead. Maybe my class should be dead musician because we all know how many there are of those. Jem kissed her head. <sighs> no, it was just a piece of bad code. You're not dead. We're here. We'll be fine. Ruby turned to him. I hope that's true. Sounds fishy, but I'm always waiting for the other shoe to drop. So, Jem, tell us what skill you're going to choose. And don't say invulnerability, Crystal said. We have super healing that works really well. Let's have fun. Remember, this is heaven, so let's treat it like heaven and not worry. Jem knew his next words were going to get him in trouble. Well, I found some app coding and some IT skills. Ugh, so boring, Crystal said loudly. Ruby chuckled. Is there a super boring skill? If so, you should choose that. Jem caught the singer's eyes. So, wouldn't it be cheating if I chose this ultra-musicality skill? You worked hard to get where you are. Should I just waltz in and be all perfect right off the bat? Ruby wrestled up and leaned forward on the couch, staring into the crackling fire. It doesn't work like that. I mean, natural talent is nice, don't get me wrong. But talent isn't everything. There's an old quote by a high school basketball coach, Tim Notke. Hard work beats talent when talent fails to work hard. <laughs> You're still going to have to practice, I would think. If nothing else, you need the muscle memory. But we're virtual. No muscles. Jem fell quiet. Ruby frowned. Still, this is all a fantasy, right? You literally get to be a rock star out of the gate. That's fucking awesome. Believe me, sucking for a long time isn't easy. It's like everything in you wants to quit. You just have to fight to believe you'll make it. Not that I made it out in the real world. Crystal touched Ruby's dark hair. But you made it here. And this is our reality right now. You're amazing, Ruby. Really. But do you get what I'm saying? Ruby asked. Crystal shrugged. Kind of. But I've been playing the saxophone basically all my life. I don't remember sucking. <laughs> I'm sure I did. But I loved how I could make this instrument sound happy or sad. And it just seemed like a part of me. That's one of the nice things about starting so young. And you have a lot more time. Especially if you're a dorky band kid and the daughter of the local minister. Ruby leaned forward. You might have been a dorky band kid, Crystal Creed. But now... You are a seductress with a rifle. A dirty girl who can blow men in all sorts of ways. Jem didn't think either woman had their new abilities yet, before they had to wait until midnight for the skills to kick in. Crystal chuckled, a little buzzed herself, and stared into Ruby's eyes. There was love there, and it warmed Jem's heart. Crystal had so much love to share, and he'd spent most of his life basking in that love. Crystal had stared at him with that same expression on her face, watching her give it to someone else, this beautiful singer. Well, he realized how lucky he was to receive such adoration. Jem wasn't sure what skill to pick. The thing was, if he could hack the Erebos app, he could just give them any abilities they needed. It was a big if. But did he want that? Jem realized he'd spent most of his life trying to game his life, to get ahead by any means and to control every aspect he could. It was one of the reasons why he'd gone into computers in the first place. He could create his own little empire of code. Now, he wanted to focus on enjoying his life. And that meant exploring music, 
all aspects of music. Why some songs worked and others didn't. How to write the songs he loved. To experience the wonder of music at a deeper level by actually playing it. Mr. Organ said that music was at the heart of the mystery. Jem so wanted to believe that. He wasn't going to make a decision that night. He'd sleep on it. But he had an idea of what he wanted. He'd go through the entire list first to make sure he wasn't missing anything. Then he'd choose carefully. He glanced up to see Crystal and Ruby kissing. His wife's hand cupped one of Ruby's big tits. Crystal's phone was on the end table. It lit up and vibrated. She was getting a phone call, but who could that be? Crystal went to get it. A second later, someone rang the doorbell. Ruby sighed. <sighs> it's Grand Central Station around here. What's going on again? And why am I not swashbuckling? You probably won't be able to until midnight, Jem said. He got up to go to the door, on high alert. Who could it be so late? Crystal answered her phone and smiled. Uh, hi, Max. What are you doing? Jem looked through the peephole and smiled. That interesting night had just gotten a lot more interesting. Chapter 13 Mags Watching Jem opened the door, and there was the Medusa girl, in a big white coat. Her car, a snow-encrusted Aki Sporta, sat out in front of the garage. Mags had her phone to her ear. She smiled at him. Hi, Jem. Is it cool if I come in or whatever? Rich people wanted truffles from Thessal, and I give rich people what they want. Crystal pushed Jem to the side and pulled the Medusa into the house. Come in, Mags. You'll catch your death of a cold. And I just saw your text. Of course you can stay over tonight. We were just about to have sex. You're welcome to watch. Mags giggled nervously. <laughs> well, Crystal, <laughs> you certainly aren't shy. I'm, uh, game. But let me get warm for a minute. Is that cool? That's fine. Jem took her coat, and suddenly, he had the smell of the new girl in his nose. She wore a sweet, girly perfume that had him tingling even more than he had been before she'd arrived. He hung the coat up. Mags wore a tight white sweater and tight jeans. Big snow boots covered her feet. She looked so cute. Even her snake hair looked cute. Ruby lounged back, a glass of wine in her hand. Her nipples were hard from when Crystal had been feeling her up. It's kind of convenient that you're up here. Mag smiled. Well, Crystal and I were texting, and I knew you were up here, so I took a delivery. She mentioned you were staying at Z's place, and she said if I needed a place to stay, I should come up here. She walked into the room and stood with her hands in front of the fireplace. She did sneak a peek into the bedroom. Crystal motioned to the place. Isn't it nice, Mags? It's so wonderful. I'm so glad you're here. And not just for the sex. You're so much fun. The Medusa's bright green eyes were sparkling. You're so much fun, Crystal. <laughs> so, uh, I feel like I interrupted something. Did I interrupt something? Jem stood near his wife. He was glad there wasn't going to be much chit-chat because he was already so turned on. Ruby set her wine on a coaster on the end table. I'm the only one sitting down, so let me stand up. And we can talk about what we want tonight to look like. Mags was clearly nervous. I know it's weird, but Crystal said you guys were pretty wild. I won't tell anyone, if that's what you're worried about. I trust her. Crystal went over and held Max's hand. Ruby had a definite exhibitionist side to her, which she'd been playing around with by running out to the balcony. This, though, was a way for Ruby to really let herself go wild. But standing there, bathed in the firelight and low light from the table lamps, Ruby looked doubtful. Let me get this straight. You just want to watch us and you won't tell anyone. You won't get creepy or stalkery either, right? Mags raised a hand. No creeping, no stalking. But 
it's a small island and we're bound to run into each other and it might be a little weird or whatever. But you guys seem cool. I'm cool. So let's be cool together. Ruby nodded, blushing. I'm in. Jem, it's up to you. Crystal had her hands clasped to her chest. Please say yes, please say yes, please say yes. That made Jem laugh. <laughs> How can I say no to all that? Okay, Mags. You can watch, but no turning us to stone. Never, Mag said. By the gods, good and bad, it's so hot in here. Mind if I get comfortable? She pulled her sweater over her head. Then she clutched it to her chest. I didn't ask if I could get naked while I watched you. Is that okay? Ruby chuckled. <laughs> it's fine with us. When I had my first time with Gem and Crystal, I said we were only going to kiss. That led to a lot more than just kissing. Crystal grabbed Ruby and kissed her. She made a show of licking Ruby's lips. We did let ourselves get out of control. But with Mags, it's only watching. I really want to give her a show. Mags threw her sweater onto the sofa. She stood there in a simple white bra that hid her little breasts. She was built far more like Crystal than Ruby. The Medusa went to the dining room table and grabbed one of the big dark wood chairs there. She was far stronger than she looked. Let's go into the bedroom. I'll stay on the chair. I'll move it if I can't see. <laughs> I can't believe this is happening. Crystal grabbed Jem and Ruby. Thanks, guys. I was hoping to get with someone new. When Mrs. Deem turned out to be harder to get than I thought, I reached out to Mags. Uh, Crystal, I reached out to you. The Medusa called from the other room. And yeah, Mrs. Deem is really uptight. She would never do anything like this. Or so I've heard. Ruby pulled against Crystal. The singer kept her voice down. Hold on. She's so cute and fun. Are we sure she's not real? Crystal was sweating a little. Her whisper came out choked with lust. <laughs> with a name like Maggie Medusa? <laughs> no, let's not overthink this. She's sweet. I think we can trust her. Even if we can't, it's not like we're going to be here forever. And none of us met her during our last trip, right? Jem didn't wait for an answer. I think this is pretty safe. You guys! Mags called from the other room. Of course I'm safe. I'm just some girl. And it's three against one. Yeah, but you could turn us to stone. Ruby called back. But I won't. I'm too horny to even think about using my powers. <laughs> Come on, please. And for the record, it's not like stone or whatever. It's more paralysis. I'm not the real Medusa. Crystal giggled. <laughs> This is too fucking weird. I love this. Ruby sighed and rolled her eyes. <sighs> if Crystal is country, I'm supposed to be the rock and roll in this relationship. I'm totally fucking that job up. Ruby got them moving back into the massive master bedroom. There was a gas fireplace to the right of the big king-sized bed. On the left was the entrance to the palatial bathroom. Mag sat in her chair between the fireplace and the big bed. She'd taken off her boots and jeans. She sat in plain white panties that matched her plain white bra. Okay, guys, I'm ready. <laughs> this is so cool. Ruby took control. She got Crystal onto the bed. Crystal turned with her hair in her eyes. She threw off her shirt and undid her bra. In seconds, she was pushing her small, firm breasts up her chest. Her pink nipples were hard. This is me, Max. What do you think? The Medusa watched with sparkling green eyes. Her snakes watched, too. Her left hand cupped one of her breasts over her bra. The other was shoved down the front of her white panties. There was a dark line that showed her excitement. I love your tits, Crystal. I just knew they'd be so cute. Ruby gently pushed Crystal down onto the bed on her hands and knees. The blonde's ass was in the air. Ruby stood at the end of the bed, 
I love Crystal's butt. It's so round and tight. Jem stood in his clothes. Getting out of his shirt and jeans would be easy since he wasn't wearing his boots. His feet were bare. Was he really going to get naked in front of this relative stranger? Yes. Yes, he was. Mags and her snake hair were taking in the sight of Ruby sliding Crystal's jeans over her hips. Ruby pulled them off. Do you want to see her pink pussy, Mags? How dirty of a girl are you? I'm dirty enough to love watching you guys, the Medusa said in a ragged voice. Don't tease, Ruby. I totally want to see what she looks like down there. I love how different girls are. Mags would have to wait. Jem came forward and took off Ruby's shirt. He also got her bra off. She had huge tits compared to both Crystal and the Medusa. Jem cupped them and felt her brown nipples harden against his palms. He sucked on her earlobe. Don't forget about me, Crystal complained. Ruby laughed quietly. <laughs> I could never. Ruby undid her jeans and dropped them. Jem helped her get her panties off. The singer was now naked. Mag still had her hand in her panties. The stain on her crotch darkened. Jem wondered if she was going to keep her bra and panties on the whole time. He hoped not. But he wasn't sure if he should ask or not. Then he didn't care much because Ruby was going for Crystal's panties, peeling them off. Jem would never get tired of seeing Crystal with her ass in the air. Her legs spread so she was fully exposed. Both of her holes were so pink. She kept her blonde bush trimmed down to a stubble so her full lips and big clit were completely visible. Now, both women were naked. Ruby smacked her ass. <sighs> Show Mags your pussy, Crystal. Show her everything. Crystal turned so she was perpendicular on the bed. She reached back and spread herself. Mags let out a gulp. <sighs> you two are so dirty. Jem didn't care that there was this strange girl in their room. He wanted to fuck Ruby. He swept off his shirt and pants. Ruby was still at the foot of the bed. He grabbed her and bent her over. Ruby glanced over her shoulder. Oh, fuck yeah, Jem. Fuck me. She clutched the sheets at the foot of the bed. Crystal smiled at him. Yeah, fuck her. Show Mags. I can see his cock, the new girl whispered. It's so big and sexy. Just let me look at it for a second. Jem showed it to her. He resisted the urge to stroke it. Mags nodded. Okay, yeah. Shit, okay, Ruby, can he fuck you now? The singer shook her ass at him. Mm, please. Jem was behind her. He split the brown lips of her sex. The insides of her thighs glistened with her girl cum. Then he was inside her heat. Her tight tunnel clutched him. He grabbed the pliant flesh of her shapely ass. Oh, she was so fucking soft and curvy. He slowly pushed himself deeper into her clinging hole. Crystal was still showing Mags her ass, but the blonde turned to lick Ruby's face, tonguing her mouth. Jem realized that with Mags, he could simply ask for what he wanted. This was a fantasy world after all, though it didn't feel like it. It felt completely and totally real. Jem drove himself all the way into Ruby and stopped. His thumb brushed the wrinkled brown skin of her pucker. He turned. I'd like to see your body, Max. Mind showing it to us? Crystal spun herself around and crawled up the bed. She laid back against the headboard with her legs spread. She started rubbing her pink clit. Uh, you don't have to, Max, but I'd like to see it. 
Me too. Ruby pushed herself back onto Jem. She was fucking back into him now. Mag stood up and peeled off her panties. I guess it's only fair. She dropped her underwear to the floor and then undid her bra and let it drop. She put her hands over her head. Here I am, guys. If she were going to turn them to stone, it would have been then. They all were staring at her. She didn't have any hair on her body whatsoever. Her armpits were smooth, no sign of stubble. Her tits were a little bigger than crystals, but nowhere near rubies. They were capped with puffy green nipples that were mostly areolas. She had a muscled abdomen and no pubic hair. Her green lips were puffy as well, and so gooey from her excitement. She sat back and showed them her hairless treasure. Her sex might be dark green, but inside was a bright pink. Mag slid two fingers into her juicy hole and then used her glistening fingers to rub her clit. Jem could smell the musk of the new green pussy. He started thrusting into Ruby harder. Crystal slid down the bed. Uh, lick my pussy, Ruby, and I'll show Mags how I come. I love coming. I love it so much. Ruby lowered her face to Crystal's sex. Jem wasn't sure which was hotter, watching his wife getting licked or the masturbating Medusa to his right. He slammed in and out of Ruby. With each thrust, his sex felt ever more sensitive. Ruby lifted her head and yelped, I love coming too. I'm coming now. I can't help it. Come with me, Crystal. Come with me. Crystal reached down and rubbed herself into an orgasm. I am, Ruby. I'm coming too. Oh, me too, the Medusa gasped. You guys are so hot, so fucking hot. Jem couldn't see his wife coming. Ruby's head was in the way, but he could see Mag's. He watched as her green pussy opened and closed, along with her dark green pucker, spasming as she climaxed. Her face was a mask of lust. Her eyes were closed with the wonder of her orgasm. The snakes on her head also had their eyes closed. The sight nearly pushed Jem over the edge, but he wanted their voyeur closer. Come closer, Max. Then you can watch me come. Mags was off her chair and standing next to him. She looked down at where he was connected to Ruby and then stared him in the face. <sighs> Can I kiss you, Jem? I kissed Crystal when you first got here. Now, I want to kiss you. You can. A second later, Mags was kissing him. He couldn't see her snakes, but he could hear them sighing as he drank in the Medusa's taste. She smelled so good, and her moans sounded so sexy. Kissing this new woman, feeling her tongue in his mouth, was enough to push him over the edge. <sighs> Watch me come, he growled. Mags dropped to her knees. Jem had just pulled out of Ruby's wet cunt when the orgasm started. A long line of cum painted one of Ruby's ass cheeks. The pleasure was so intense. It was like an unleashed storm inside of him. A splash of semen hit Ruby's rosebud. It dripped down the furrow of her sex and threatened to fall to the carpet. But Mags was quick. She caught it in her hand. Then she licked it off her palm and gave him a big smile. Looking is nice, but tasting you is nicer. My legs are dying, Ruby said. Let me get on the bed. Crystal moved as Ruby crawled onto the bed and collapsed. His wife came around to hug him and kiss him while Mags watched. 
Crystal then turned to the Medusa. Wait until we show you the shower. It's amazing. Care to come and watch us rinse off? The Medusa nodded enthusiastically. I would love that. Standing there in the room with three naked women, Jem knew he was going to love it too. In the end, Ruby joined them. And her mags did too. She brought her chair into the bathroom with them and watched as the two women sucked on him while he stood under a spray of water. That was only the beginning. Hours later, Mags went to the couch with a blanket. She'd stayed true. She'd watched them and masturbated. But there had been no touching, just the one kiss with Jem. The next morning, they all left the house at the same time. That was when Ruby got to kiss the Medusa. It had been quite a night. And to top it off, Jem, Crystal, and Ruby all had notifications on their phones. Congratulations, participant. We detected a minor encounter. You are, hidden percentage, closer to your next level. Jem had to laugh. It was a hell of a way to level up. Chapter 14 Jem's Two Weeks the next two weeks, Jem, Crystal, and Ruby were all riding high from their night with Mags. She and Crystal continued to text, but they were too busy to recreate the experience. At least the Medusa was, and she wanted to keep it casual. Jem was fine with that. The Erebos app had marked the encounter as minor, but that wasn't that big of a deal. The hidden percentage part of the message was, How much closer were they to getting to their next level and a new skill? Since Jem didn't know, he wasn't going to rush a choice. He'd keep his options open until he could get a sense of the best way forward. If the attacks from Ruby's family had continued, his hand would have been forced. As it was, nothing else showed up to snatch her away. It was all very peaceful. Even Mr. Oregon was quiet. Jem was bulletproof and he had super healing. He really could relax. He liked the slower pace of life this time and the healthy, sexual appetites of the women kept him busy. For the most part, they spent those two weeks at home, or taking lessons from various teachers on the island. Yes, Crystal had her seduction skill and Ruby had her swashbuckling ability, but it wasn't like they had intuitive knowledge of how to utilize them. There had been messages from the Erebos app sent to their phones at midnight after choosing their new skills. Congratulations, participant. Your new skill has been activated. Please find an instructor to improve this skill. Jem liked that particular game mechanic. You weren't just automatically gifted a new ability. You had to find a teacher to help you improve. It made the whole experience far more realistic, and it also made him lean into choosing the ultra-musicality skill. Speaking of music, Jem's lessons were going well. On top of that, he was learning more and more from Crystal and Ruby's band practice. Unlike their first time, Crystal was going to be up on stage for most of the songs. It was a testament to Ruby's musical genius that she could find different arrangements in various songs that included saxophone. They would be doing all the songs they did at the Big Delphine show during their first dive. But Ruby had some other ideas, including a version of Beyonce's Single Ladies. It was funky and soulful. Crystal was far more comfortable with the fates now, but she was looking for a seduction teacher. The obvious choice was the Venus Kiss, which was the strip club in South Thessal. At first, Ruby wasn't sure about going down there, but Crystal was too curious not to insist they go. There weren't that many men on Paradiso's Island to begin with, but they seemed to all be in the audience at the strip club. The women who came out to dance were human, satyrs, gorgons, and all manner of nymphs. There was even a snake girl, but for the life of him, Jem couldn't find her vagina in all those scales. She did have a huge set of green tits, lightly scaled with dark green nipples. Was your normal titty bar, with guys throwing dollar bills in Crystal's face, was shining with interest and lust. Ruby was more suspicious. Being in the music world, she'd played gentlemen's clubs before and knew about strip club politics. It had its own kind of ultra-drama. 
When Jem asked about the manager, he wasn't surprised when they said that Daiti Lovejoy would come out to say hello to them. Daiti Lovejoy had to be Venus herself. She was the most beautiful Greek woman that Jem had ever seen, older, with a wonderful face and curly black hair. Her skin was olive-colored and without a single blemish. Crystal's eyes went to her cleavage. But Crystal wasn't about to be intimidated. She asked if Didi would give her seduction classes, and Didi agreed. She even said she would drive to their house for the lessons. Crystal watched a few dancers, but she finally had them leave. She already had one hot woman she could play with, and she was going to get Mrs. Deem. They went home and had sex all night long. So, Crystal had her seduction lessons, Jim had his guitar lessons, and they found swashbuckling lessons for Ruby. At Arness Gun Shop, they talked with the owner, Arnie Arness, who basically looked like Ares. He knew a woman who did combat training, sword, gun, hand-to-hand. Her name was Patricia Pallas, and Jem met her. She was big, tall, and square-jawed. She looked more Slavic than Greek, with short black hair and flashing brown eyes. Jem could sense how smart she was. It took a quick internet search, but yeah, she was Pallas Athena. She had to be. It was fun watching Crystal flirt with the big woman. Patricia got a blush on her face and a smile on her lips, but Ruby put a stop to it. She didn't want Crystal screwing her potential teacher. There had to be some limits. Crystal agreed, because her real quarry was Mrs. Dame. Crystal figured that in a few months, her seduction skills would be so finely tuned that she could get anyone she wanted, so she could wait. So Crystal was having lessons with Didi, Ruby had Patricia, and Jem had Phoebe. Jem wasn't sure what to make of his music lessons. Phoebe was great, but she constantly questioned his commitment and his motivation. She was impressed that he had showed up for lessons on time, having practiced and ready to play. Orpheus was generally there with his sunglasses covering his bruised face. He always looked messed up. Jem was shy about practicing anywhere other than his house and the music shop, and he wasn't sure how he felt about going to band practice. He saw how easily Ruby played notes and chords, and Trophy always had a guitar in her hand. Letty, in her foul-mouthed way, was very supportive of Jem. Letty had blonde dreads, a ton of tattoos, and a nose ring. She mostly played bass, but she also took a turn on keyboards, and she could play the guitar. Letty was the Jill of all trades. Spin, the thick-bodied Mexican girl, said she had no real musical talent, so she played the drums. Of course, everyone in the band told her she was full of shit, especially Letty. You're like a fucking metronome, bitch! Letty shouted. Her voice was loud in the padded storage unit where they practiced, just like last time. I don't think you're fucking human! I am human! Spin protested. On Paradiso's Island, that was an important distinction to be made. A lot of people weren't. Ruby told Jem he should take his guitar everywhere and learn to play everywhere so he could always be practicing. That was easy thanks to his Inventex system. He didn't bother creating a shortcut because he didn't think he'd have to grab his guitar during combat. When he wasn't torturing his fingers playing the guitar, he studied music theory. Eventually, he saw that there was a lot of math in music. And there was physics as well. It took him two weeks of practice and intense study to realize that it would be stupid for him not to increase his natural skill if he could. And so, he chose Ultra Musicality for his updated special abilities. When the new skill kicked in, a whole new world opened up for him. Friday night, he went to band practice, and he could feel the music and hear subtle shifts. Best of all, he noticed mistakes that he wouldn't have noticed before. He could see why Spin might not be human. She could hold a rhythm steady, perfectly, and add flourishes that didn't hurt the beat. He could now see how the bass and drum supported the overlying melodies. But could he play fast enough to keep up? It didn't seem like it. That night, he found fresh motivation to practice his guitar in the balcony, playing the intro to Pink Floyd's Wish You Were Here. The rain came down in sheets, but he was protected. They had a propane heater that kept him perfectly warm. Playing there by himself, he felt connected to the guitar in a way he couldn't explain. The smell of the rain, the cool night. It was this perfect moment. He didn't care that he wasn't very good. 
and he wasn't thinking about becoming a rich and famous rock star. He was just in the moment, working on doing something hard, which just might be the most satisfying thing you can do in life. Ruby came out and sat down across from him. Okay, Mr. Man, this is where I tell you that you're improving, but I don't want you to burn out. We have a lot of time left. I can hear your fancy ultra-musicality ability working. There's just something instinctive to music, isn't there? Instinct and math, he laughed. <laughs> Why did you start playing guitar? Ruby shrugged. Hmm. There's all this mystery and magic around music, especially rock and roll. And I believed the hype. I lived in my own little fantasy world for a long time. She motioned around them. <laughs> Nothing like this, you understand. But I would put on skits and shows and take videos of my crazy brothers, sisters, and cousins. I loved being seen. That's still the case. Since I didn't have an instrument, I started with singing. You know, singing is harder. With an instrument, you can kind of hide behind it. Singing is just you. It can be intimidating. And I always get so afraid. Of being on stage? Jem asked in disbelief. Ruby shook her head. Of being invisible. That's probably one of the reasons why I left my crime lord family. Staying there as just some girl? I would have been ignored. Leaving? Being a musician? No, I would be seen. I'd rather people fucking hate my music than ignore me. Crystal came out with a tray of mugs for the three of them. She put the tray on the table and sat down in a chair. So I brought hot cocoa for us. What are you guys talking about? Music, fantasies, practicing. Ruby grabbed her mug. You know, the life here. Jem sipped his hot chocolate. Mm, I heard what you said. You'll never be invisible to us, Ruby. Never. We see you. Oh, that's not a problem anymore. And I know I can rock people's faces off. I'm awesome. But starting out was hard, because music goes from being fantasy to a reality. The difference stops a lot of people. Ruby pointed her mug at Crystal. But not dorky band girls who started playing before they could walk. <laughs> what are you learning in your seduction classes? Crystal colored. I've only had a few. There's a lot of touching, holding eye contact, and reading body language. It takes a lot of confidence. I'm not sure I can do it in the real world. I think I can do it here. <laughs> Speaking of which, uh, Mrs. Deem is coming over to make cookies tomorrow afternoon. If all goes well, I might be late to band practice. Ruby chuckled. <laughs> oh, really? I have lessons with Patricia tomorrow. We're doing some sword stuff, some gun stuff, and some balance training. So there's this term she loves, center of gravity. I kind of understand it, but not really. She also likes to say that I should punch with my entire body. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying. Jem nodded. There's this spinning motion that uses your entire body. I get it. Patricia sounds great. Crystal laughed. <laughs> she should be. She's a goddess of war. Jem smiled at her. Pallas Athena was more about strategy and wisdom in battle. She's like the Lao Tzu of ancient Greece. I think you're in good hands. I'm in the best hands. Ruby agreed. It really is like learning music. Repetition is key. You don't think, you just do. Mm, muscle memory is critical. Jem agreed, but he gave his wife a long look. I'll be around tomorrow afternoon. How close are you to seducing Mrs. Deem? Crystal shut her eyes and grinned. Well, I got her to come over and bake chocolate chip cookies after touching her arm and telling her how pretty I think she is. I thought I could see a shift in her. It's like she wasn't into it, but then something changed. I think it's my seduction ability. Ruby looked troubled. What if things get weird and we lose our breeze B&B here? I love this place. Crystal touched her leg. Then we move up to Z's place in the mountains. I'm thinking we move into the Delphine, Jem said. I've asked around, but no one has seen the owner. And no one has seen our three favorite kinky celebrities either. 
But yeah, I did swing by and ask Theo about the competition. He didn't know about it, but he said he wouldn't be surprised. He said things are strange there, and that he has had to make a lot of decisions that he shouldn't have to make. He told me that in the next few weeks, he thinks there will be a big announcement. Theo has my number. He said he'd call me. Crystal raised her eyebrows. Oh, so you're best friends with King Theo? Jem caught her gaze. You could say he had a change of heart. Ruby laughed. <laughs> oh, that's bad. <laughs> he doesn't have a heart at all after what you did to him. <laughs> I'm just wondering when Sheriff Pluto comes around asking for his magic fork. I haven't seen him. Have you? Crystal asked. Both Ruby and Jem shook their heads. Ruby sighed. <sighs> I never want to see him again. Ever. I remember dying. I remember. She stopped talking, and her face lost all expression. Then her eyes filled with tears. She blinked them away. <sighs> but let's not talk about that. We have new skills, and we're going to get more. Once we get more of these encounters. Whatever those are. I think we'll know soon. Crystal smiled. Hopefully, when I show up to band practice tomorrow night, both Jem and I will be one encounter closer to level five. Jem felt his heart beat faster. Could Crystal really seduce Mrs. Deem? Jem didn't know. But he knew his wife well enough to know that she was going to give it her best. Chapter 15 the Delphine's Winter Dreams Ball. It was a month later and Crystal was so disappointed. Yes, they baked cookies with Mrs. Deem, but they'd all kept their clothes on. It was as if Mrs. Deem had some kind of magic protecting her from Crystal's seduction ability. Luckily, they had Mags, who had come over two more times to watch Jem, Crystal, and Ruby have sex. That put them at three minor encounters. What did that mean for their progress toward their next level? Jem didn't know, and the Erebos app had installed a security update that made hacking it harder. It had become a full project, though Jem was kind of sick of doing technology work. He'd much rather play his guitar. He'd gone from learning basic notes and chords to practicing scales. He was progressing by leaps and bounds. Both Phoebe and Orpheus were impressed, and with each lesson, both were taking him more and more seriously. However, they said the real test would be six months to a year. That's when most people started to slack off. One interesting thing did happen with Mrs. Deem during one of the baking sessions. They were doing the big three cookies, chocolate chip, peanut butter, and sugar. Jem liked sugar cookies probably the best. He was in the minority, however. Jem had been sitting at the table practicing yesterday by the Beatles. Mrs. Deem, had been next to him, working the mixer. She'd worn a blouse that buttoned to her neck, and she had an apron on, but there was no hiding her chest. She cast him a little smile. You know, I was listening to this podcast with Bruce Springsteen, and he was talking about his career. Jim had forgotten that Mrs. Deem was a huge Springsteen fan. He'd taken a moment to wonder if the Mrs. Deem in front of him was the same Mrs. Deem overseeing their involvement in the Erebos experience. It could be that it was just code, but why insert herself in the simulation as a character? He didn't know, but she was so different than before and Jem couldn't explain that. It was a definite story question. Mrs. Deem had stopped, as had Crystal. Crystal came over and sidled up close to the older woman, touching hips. Their faces were close. Tell us, Mrs. Deem, about the podcast. You could see the temptation on Mrs. Deem's face. She didn't back up. She leaned forward, and one of her breasts brushed against Crystal's arm. Yes, well, Bruce said that he'd just been a kid who picked up a guitar and didn't put it down. And he started a band and didn't let it break up. Then he played with this band until he got a record contract. That he wrote songs with that record company. Until he found himself on stage with B.B. King at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He just didn't stop. Crystal put her finger into the mix and then sucked it off. She did this slowly, and she did it with a dirty little glint in her eye. But at the same time, he got lucky over and over. I think he'd even admit that. 
Most musicians, even really good ones, need a bit of luck. Jim watched his wife with the older woman, and it took him a minute to remember he shouldn't just stare at them. He exhaled. Yeah, Ruby says that all the time. But fortune favors the bold, Mrs. Deem said. Bruce persevered. He didn't stop when others would have. It could be that the true artists aren't necessarily the best, but they're the ones who keep at it when everyone is recommending that they quit. It's those that persevere beyond good sense. Crystal stepped back. But in the real world, not all artists succeed. Only a few do. A small, small number. Here is better, Mrs. Deem, because this is Paradiso's Island, and anything is possible. The sexy older woman smiled. Not everything, but most things are very, very possible. There was a moment of understanding between the two women that Jem had seen. There was an understanding that Mrs. Deem knew what Crystal wanted and that the older woman wasn't ready just yet. But there was still the possibility. It had been a win, just not the kind of win that Crystal wanted. Then weeks passed in a snap of guitar practice, food, sex, and fun. During that time, Jem kept thinking he'd go back to Pan's Tavern to help the satyr out. Faunus was a good guy. Though it was hard for Jem to get excited about a business that didn't necessarily exist. And the bottom line... Faunus was doing fine without an updated website or online marketing. Pan's Tavern was a staple. Yeah, he could pay Jem, but what was the point? It all seemed kind of pointless. Faunus was fine. Jem found himself obsessed with music, and with the ultra-musicality ability, he was making progress, real progress on a daily basis. He played until he had calluses. His fingers never bled, thanks to his healing ability, and he didn't have the pain a lot of people had. That really helped him. Jem did eventually visit Faunus and struck up a friendship, and they talked about Jem doing some contract work. But so far, that hadn't happened. Jem didn't want to waste his year in the Erebos experience doing IT work. He wanted to leave with a skill. Leaving the virtual world, he'd have a year of guitar under his belt, the knowledge, the muscle memory, something vital. It was a week after baking cookies with Mrs. Dean that the announcement came that there would be a special party at the Delphine around the pool area for locals as well as the elite. It was called the Delphine's Winter Dreams Ball, and there would be a ton of giveaways, an announcement about the future of the hotel and resort, as well as maybe a clue about the new owner. Jem knew that at the Winter Dreams Ball, they'd talk about the competition that Z had mentioned, and so he'd bought three tickets. He'd suggested Mags come, but the Medusa girl wasn't much interested in such a thing. On the days leading up to the Winter Dreams Ball, Crystal and Ruby spent hours in front of the mirror, with dresses and outfits pulled offline, trying them on, working on their look, before putting them back into their Inventex system, and then deleting them. The delete option made shopping at home easy. While the women obsessed about what they were going to wear, Jim had a simple solution for himself. He'd copy and paste a tux and be done with it. It was cool, feeling the tingle of the new clothes appearing on his body. Oh, so he'd have his tux. And he'd also shower and comb his hair. Maybe shave. Being a man was easy. The women, though, seemed to relish getting ready. Ruby was so good at makeup that Jem wondered why it didn't appear on her character sheet. By that time, it was mid-March. The snow was still falling up in Paradise City, and everyone was talking about how good the spring skiing was that year. On the night of the Winter Dreams Ball, Jem and his two women walked into the pool area of the Delphine. The pool itself was steaming, covered with black and white balloons. The whole place twinkled with lights. There was a mist in the air, and it would have been cold except there were heaters everywhere. The place wasn't too crowded, but everyone there seemed like they were rich and very important and there was security. Thessalonica police in their dress uniforms. For the first time during their dive, they saw Sheriff Pluto. He wore a dress uniform. He looked taller and broader than last time. He was completely bald. His big black and white beard looked waxed. Once Pluto's black eyes found Jem, they never seemed to leave him. There were waiters with trays of champagne, little puff pastries, and some steak on skewers, as well as fountains of shrimp. 
The whole thing must have cost a fortune. Yet the expensive snacks and free drinks paid off. Z had driven down from the Olympus hearth. Also, the mayor was there, an old man who seemed to have metal arms. He was bald, his beard was white, and the arms weren't the only thing about him that was metal. He also had metal wings. Theo drifted over to them. His green hair was slicked back, and his green beard had been trimmed down. That's Mayor Daedalus. He's a pretty smart guy. I'm glad you three made it. Wouldn't have missed it, Theo, Jem said. We've been curious about the owner for weeks now. Will we get some info tonight? Theo closed one eye. I can't say. But I think you'll find the entire night a surprise. Why does the sheriff hate you? I can see him glaring at you and I don't get it. I don't get it either, Jem lied. He was pretty sure Pluto hated him for stealing his Bident. Of course, he didn't say that. Theo was then called to help out with the catering and the music. They had a string quartet playing classical music. Jem had wondered who would be doing the music. They'd gone with an orchestra, instead of hiring rock and roll gig bands from the island. Jem and the girls grabbed some shrimp. Crystal sipped champagne at a little table. Did you ever think you and I would be at a legit black tie affair? This is like out of a movie. That's Mozart. They're playing fucking Mozart. Language. Ruby said with a smile. I grew up going to parties like this. The dress I have on is a bit more uncomfortable than what I wore back in the day. More cleavage. Crystal grinned evilly. Ruby wore a slinky black dress that did reveal quite a bit of the valley between her breasts. Crystal wore a dark blue dress that hugged her hips. Both women were gorgeous, easily two of the most beautiful women at the party. And that was saying something, since there were other goddesses there, including their teachers, Phoebe Apollo, Patricia Pallas, and Didi Lovejoy. Crystal couldn't keep her eyes off Ruby's swashbuckling instructor. Patricia wore a tight dress that gave her curves, but it was sleeveless so her muscled arms were exposed. Every bit of skin, every bit of flex, all the yowza. Ruby's own arms were getting more definition. Instead of grinding away at marketing her music business, she'd been focusing on improving her swashbuckling ability. She'd lost a bit of the fat on her stomach. But lucky girl, her tits and hips remained squeezably soft. If she kept at it, Ruby might get the perfect biceps and triceps of the goddess of war and wisdom. Jem didn't need to hack the system for Ruby to get the body she wanted. Ruby caught Crystal staring. Put your tongue back in your mouth, Crystal. You're not going to seduce my fighting teacher. What if I just lick her arms? Crystal asked. Ruby rolled her eyes. Ugh, you're incorrigible. And I never thought I'd ever say that like it was a bad thing. Great, I'm turning into my fucking mother. Let's not talk about fucking mothers. Crystal sighed. <sighs> I still can't believe I spent three entire afternoons with Mrs. Deem and all I got were cookies. Look on the bright side, Jem said. Those cookies were delicious. I wanted a different kind of cookie. Crystal complained. You do realize that the last week of the Erebos experience, I'm going to go full whore hobo. Ruby knit her brows together. And what's that? Jem knew. In an RPG, if you go around killing everything, you become a murder hobo because no one wants anything to do with you. Crystal is going to be the same way, except it will be just sex. 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 24-7. Crystal sighed. <sighs> Doesn't that sound wonderful? I hope we have groupies by then. Tons of sweet, hot groupies. Ruby laughed. <laughs> I think that same line was in the documentary about Motley Crue. So much dirt. <laughs> Not enough dirt. <laughs> Crystal laughed. Ruby sobered. You know, going full whore hobo would have consequences. Trying to book places can be iffy. And if people think we're flaky, they won't want us playing. Unless slutty is our brand. And I don't think we want slutty as our brand. Maybe we do. Crystal closed both eyes. Okay, no, we don't. I know we don't. I'll behave. Yeah, I want to play venues other than strip clubs. Ruby rubbed Crystal's shoulder. Theo stood over by a stage that had been set up 
so a portion of it was over the pool. There was a microphone there, but it didn't seem to be for the string quartet. Theo stood with his phone in his ear. He nodded, and he walked up onto the stage. The steam, the balloons, the light, the heaters, it had all created this ambiance that was undeniable. Theo stepped aside to let a giant of a man step forward. He was seven feet tall at least, with close-cropped hair and no beard. He seemed a million years old one moment, and a guy approaching forty the next. He wore a silver silk suit with a tie that had a star field on the front of it. No, the stars were shifting, spinning in the shape of a galaxy. It was a nice piece of magic, and it gave him another worldly appearance. He cleared his throat. <clears throat> I'm Kalis Oranos Dorrance, and while I've owned many hotels in my life, this hotel isn't one of them. <laughs> it's yours. It was Elsie Dorrance's father, and his eyes changed into a field of stars like his tie. Those starry eyes found Jem. You are the owner, the billionaire said with a little smile on his face. Or you could be, if you play things right. Chapter 16 Elsie's Disappearance Jem was confused. He thought about making a bid to become the owner of the Delphine, but at this point he didn't have any specific plans. Everyone in the place was quiet as Kalis or Rano Storrance commanded respect. It was hard to look away. Crystal laughed a little. <laughs> Oranos was the Greek sky god, Cronus's dad, and Zeus's granddad. Kalis is like the Roman name, I think. Okay, we're making our way up the food chain. His eyes are basically stars, Ruby said. Is this the oddity, or what? Mr. Kalis continued. Anyone here can be the owner. I've been up to the task for a bit, but I have greater concerns. As many of you know, my daughter Elsie has been missing for weeks now. I thought she'd come back, but alas, that is not the case. And so, I'm offering the Delphine to anyone who can return my daughter to me. You will own it, free and clear, and I must say, you'll have the best manager possible. Theo Hallioi here is a godsend. <laughs> Pun intended. Crystal whispered. People erupted into chattering, talking about the competition. Find Elsie, get the hotel. It was pretty simple. Jem had the smile. Well, we weren't taking any of the side quests, so it seems like the AI is just combining them. Find Elsie, win the hotel. But damn it, this is going to get in the way of my guitar practice. We don't have to do it. Crystal said. Though, Elsie Dorrance was super sexy. Jim remembered Z said there would be a competition to make things interesting. Well, he might as well play along. He stepped forward to the edge of the pool and raised his hand. Mr. Dorrance, I have a question. The sky god nodded at him. Yes, young man. I prefer to be called Mr. Kalis. I am taking questions. I will tell you everything I know. Are Nat and Nikki with her? Jem asked. I've heard they were friends. I would assume so, the sky god said. Last I knew, Elsie was staying here. This was during the trouble in December after the previous owner passed away, and my company purchased the property. It was upon my daughter's request. She was in the suite, there was a party where Nat and Nikki played, and that was the night she disappeared. What songs did they play? Ruby piped up. Can you get us a list? Mr. Kalis turned to Theo. Can you get us a list? The manager looked baffled. It was several months ago, I suppose I could ask around. Jem turned to give Ruby a questioning look. The singer gave him a pointed look. The music is the mystery. Or the mystery is the music. Or whatever Mr. Oregon said. The songs would be great. Mr. Kalis nodded at Theo. Good, please do that. We'll have a society cloud page where we will post all the clues we have. Crystal stepped up to stand next to Jem. Oh, great Skyfather. I have watched a fair amount of true crime. Who was the last person to see her alive? The god scowled. Mr. Kalis is fine, young lady. And she is not dead. I would know if she were dead. No, she's alive. But I fear she might have been kidnapped. 
She did send me a text that night, and she said that something about the Queen of Chains. Jem wasn't surprised by that, given the rough sex games that Elsie liked. The Queen of Chains did sound rather ominous. As for the last person to see her alive, it was a waitress from Ambrosia. Kimothoe Jones. Kim, would you like to add anything? The sea nymph with the blue skin and green hair came forward in a beautiful white dress that accented her skin color. And her hair color, for that matter. Yes, Mr. Kalis, the waitress said. I was coming out of the bathroom when I saw Elsie running. She had changed into a gown, like a princess gown. And she said that she was running away to become a princess. I think she had been drinking. She ran out the front door and got into a car. I don't know what kind. It was like just a black car. Like kind of long, maybe. I just don't know very much about cars. Sorry. Crystal frowned. And there was no security camera footage of the car? You couldn't get the license plate? No, Mr. Kalis said. It was as if the car knew how to avoid the cameras. We have her running into the car, and then the car leaves the driveway. That is all we know. Were Nat and Nikki still at the party? Jem asked. I don't think so, Kim said. No, no they weren't. We all assumed that Elsie would spend the night with those two. They were, uh, very close. Understatement of the year, Crystal hissed. Jem could only assume that Elsie, Nat, and Nikki had all been taken at the same time. Taken where? To this Queen of Chains, maybe? Mr. Kalis cleared his throat. <clears throat> if there are no more questions, I will take my leave. Please. I love my daughter very much, and I so want to see her return. I would give any amount of money to get her back, and believe me, I already have. Jem walked with Crystal and Ruby around the edge of the pool into the stage. They met Kim coming down. The sea nymph's eyes brightened. Oh, hi, guys. It's so good you're here. Something tells me that you're going to find Elsie. I know it. And not Nikki. Crystal said. Right. Kim nodded enthusiastically. She paused. You know, speaking of which... So, I'm a fan, right? Of Nat and Nikki? They played this really strange song. I mean, it wasn't a hit or anything. But I remember being super excited because I loved it. Crystal smiled. I bet you it was Cool Breeze Baby, wasn't it? Kim wrinkled her nose. That's right. How did you know? You weren't there, were you? Crystal shook her head. Now, lucky guess. How does that one part go? About the waves coming in forever? The waves come in forever from the sea, but there ain't gonna be a beach for you and me. Kim laughed. It's something like that. Something about the wind coming from far away. Far wind, Jem whispered. It suddenly made perfect sense. Since the AI of the place was combining quests, it was also giving Jem what he wanted, to explore worlds other than Paradiso's Island. What's far wind? Kim asked innocently. Just a song, Jem said. Not by Nat and Nikki. Don't worry about that. Do you have any idea about this Queen of Chains thing? Kim glanced around and then motioned for them to follow her. They didn't go too far, just out of earshot of the other party guests who were chattering away. Jem noticed that Sheriff Pluto had a bunch of his officers around him, along with Mr. Kalis. Again, Jem caught the Sheriff of Death giving him the stink eye. The sea nymph kept her voice low. Elsie was into BDSM. She and Nat and Nikki had this thing between them. They tried to keep it hushed up, but I caught them in the hallway of the hotel. Elsie was naked and on her knees, waiting to be caught. It was a humiliation thing. Crystal's eyes were sparkling. What did you do? Kim blushed, which turned her blue skin purple. She drew a nervous hand through her blue hair. I, uh, looked at her. Like, I walked around her, and I had to say what I liked about her. I mean, I didn't have to, but... It was probably why the security cameras were funny. Because they probably paid Theo to turn them off. Crystal smiled and didn't break eye contact with Kim. Was it hot? It sounds so hot. You know, me and Jem had a run-in with those three. In an elevator. 
Would you like to hear about it? Kim's mouth dropped open. She blinked. In an elevator? Yeah, that sounds like it. Kimotholi! A fat man snapped his fingers. I need you at work. Kim nodded. Sorry, Mr. Foda. Ruby burst out laughing but stopped herself, pushing her fingers against her lips. Kim gave her a weird look before grabbing Crystal's hands. Both of them. I can't talk long. I would like to hear about your sexy times in the elevator. You three are so pretty. I mean, Jem is more handsome than pretty. But you know what I mean. I think we could all have fun together. And then the sea nymph was walking away. Crystal fanned her face. Oh, I would love to get with Kim. But Ruby, why did you laugh? The singer tittered some more. Foda is fuck in Portuguese. Kim has a fuck for a boss, literally. They all stopped laughing when Sheriff Pluto came marching up. He was scowling. You three, I'd like to talk with you. Jim was ready to pull his weapon out of his Inventex slot. If this turned ugly, he wouldn't hesitate. However, he had to keep in mind what Ruby had said. If they wanted to be musicians on Paradiso's island, they had to be able to book gigs. They couldn't do that if they were wanted by the law. In the presence of the sheriff, Ruby stiffened. All her laughter and smiles were gone. She looked like she was five minutes from running away from the god who killed her. Crystal smiled nervously. Can we help you, officer? Pluto didn't talk to Crystal, he talked to Jem. This matter is for the police. I told Mr. Kalis this was a mistake. The last thing I need is junior detectives getting in my way. Most people here won't care. The rich know their money isn't going to find Elsie otherwise. That would have happened by now. The poor don't have the resources to do much. You three are the only ones who seem interested. Jim stayed quiet. Ruby stepped back. Crystal was going to be their spokesman. Officer. Is it officer? Or should I call you sheriff? Sheriff is fine, the gods said. Sheriff. Crystal continued. We want to help find Elsie. She's our friend. How about if we have a lead, we call you? Then we can work together. I mean, you don't want the hotel, do you? Pluto's eyes were dead. Of course. If I found her, I wouldn't lay claim to the Delphine. That would be inappropriate. And yet that was exactly what he wanted. Jem could tell. Was that his basic criminality skill working? Crystal laughed to take a bit of the tension out of the air. <laughs> so, if we help you find her, we could have the hotel, right? That's none of my concern, Pluto said sullenly. I'll just want to find the three girls. That's all I will ever want, and I'll do it on my own. Stay out of my way, and you won't get hurt. Jim couldn't stay quiet. What does that mean? Lots of graveyards on the island, the god of death said. You don't want to end up in one of them. Ruby walked away before she lost her temper. Jim struggled to keep control. He stayed near Crystal, if nothing else, to protect her. Crystal's smile faltered. She was playing the part. Why, Sheriff, that sounds like a threat. You wouldn't threaten us, would you? Pluto shook his head, not a trace of a smile on his face. This isn't a threat. If Elsie and her friends ran into bad people, those bad people might end up hurting you. That would be a shame. Though I have been known to bring people back from the dead. <laughs> what does that mean? Crystal laughed. Oh, right. Pluto, the god of death. I guess if anyone could, you could. Can we be frank with each other, Sheriff? I think we should be honest. Please. Crystal took hold of Jem's hand. I think you want the hotel. I think you'd like to run this island. But here's the thing. We are going to find Elsie first. Because this is fun, and beating you is going to be so satisfying. You shouldn't have threatened us, Sheriff. You had a chance before that. Now, when we own this hotel, you aren't going to take a single step inside.
law or not. Have a good night. Crystal then pulled Jim away, and they joined up with Ruby over by the bar, which was doing a ton of business. There were three big minotaurs drinking huge mugs of beer. They were as big as they were loud. And they were pretending to be drunker than they actually were. Jem could tell right away when someone was putting on an act. They looked pretty hardcore. Rings in their noses, metal hoops on their sharpened horns, and labyrinth tattoos on their necks and faces. They weren't harpies or cyclops yetis, but they looked like trouble. They kept giving Jem and his ladies looks that they were obviously trying to hide. No. Something was up with them. Minotaurs had worked for King Theo when he'd been evil. Were they working for the God of Death as undercover agents? Jem would keep an eye out for them. Ruby was furious. Ugh, I can't believe that fucker is trying to get the hotel. It's not right. And you do realize that even if we find Elsie, the fucking sheriff isn't going to just let us win the prize. We're going to have a fucking fight on our hands. Always, Jem agreed. But first things first, we need to find Elsie. And I think I know where we can find her. Crystal's cheeks were rosy. The mystery is in the song, right? Cool breeze, baby. It's all about the wind and beaches and, well, love. But they mention a queen in it, right? Like Nat and Nikki are queens and nobody better mess with them? Ruby closed her eyes. <sighs> we're going to Corinth tonight, aren't we? Jem felt his phone go off in the pocket of his suit coat. Why was he not surprised? Chapter 17 Jem's Old Friend Before they left the party, they talked with Z quickly about how bad Corinth might be. Z said it was as crazy as ever and that they should be careful. When asked about Far Wind, the god shrugged. It's another world. And it's a place I can't go, but I would imagine that's where you're headed. Good luck there. Bring gold. Then Z laughed. <laughs> I saw Sheriff Pluto over here giving you the third degree. I would imagine he wants the hotel. He always has been a greedy bastard. Jem hadn't been sure that Z was on their side, but it seemed he was. For now. Jem and the girls hurried back to their Breeze B&B to throw some things into their Inventex system. Jem also found gold to buy online. He bought actual coins. Fifty one-ounce American gold buffalo coins. Not that he bought them. He used his hack to copy and paste them into his Inventex system. He then transferred them into his bags. He and the girls changed out of their party clothes. They threw on adventure clothes, jeans, and boots and shirts. It was right around midnight when Jem drove the Jeepster out of the driveway. They drove through town heading for the highway that would take them to Corinth. Jim stepped on the accelerator. Read me the text again for Mr. Oregon. Crystal's voice was crisp. Follow the song and sing it as best you can. But remember, don't get lost in paper worlds. You must master reality. And the only way to do that is to write the song that will set you and everyone else free. Collect lyrics and abilities along the way. You'll need them to learn the truth. Crystal rode shotgun while Ruby was in the back. Jem smiled. That doesn't tell us much about where we're heading or how to get to Far Wind. I think we're on the right track, though. Then again, I don't know. Why are we leaving in the middle of the night? Ruby asked. Then she laughed. <laughs> oh, because we're on Sheriff Pluto's radar. I'm just wondering how we're going to get to another world. And didn't Mrs. Deem, the one out in the real world, mind you, say she didn't want us leaving? She never said we couldn't, Jem shrugged. But it's not like we're ever going to follow the rules. The game is leading us on this little adventure. Not a game, Crystal said. It's the Erebos experience. Jem laughed. <laughs> yeah, right, the experience. Well, finding passage to another world is going to be an experience. I want to find Elsie, clearly, but I also want to beat everyone else who might be searching for her. Those three minotaurs drinking at the bar didn't seem right to me. Okay, Ruby said from the back. I am finding hotels in Corinth. No chains, mind you, so don't get your heart set on a Marriott. There is the Sunrise Suites. Also, Bill Birkby's Bed and Bacon. Bacon is in the name, Jem asked. I think I know where I want to stay. Crystal also had her phone out. Strange, 
but I'm not finding any airports or ferries. Last time, we bought tickets at the actual ferry office. I don't imagine it will be open in the middle of the night. And it might not be open tomorrow either, since it's Sunday. How are we getting off this island again? And why are we going to Corinth since everyone says it's so dangerous? And what the fuck is my life here? I've only had a month of swashbuckling lessons. More like six weeks, Crystal said. And yay, we're going on an adventure. I don't imagine we'll be gone that long. But I do have my saxophone in my Inventex. Jem has his guitar so he can practice. Did you get a sword? A rapier, Ruby said. But it's not for actual fighting. It's for practice. I also have the Colt Python and ammunition, since we're going to be fighting. And you have your guitar? Jem asked. It sounds like we might have to write a song. Always. I never leave home without it. Jem's phone buzzed. Crystal picked it up. <laughs> oh, Mr. Oregon is chatty tonight. Here, I'll read the next message. He says, You're going to be gone for at least a month, if not two. Make sure you get all the doll stuff taken care of. For passage, go to Torchy and Salt's Tavern on the docks and look for a new face on an old friend. All worlds are paper to the flame, and the master holds the match. Crystal chuckled. <laughs> well, now he's chatty and cryptic. The worlds are paper, but it's easy to forget that. Are you excited to be going back to Corinth? I'm excited to be going back there. Oh, definitely. Ruby said sarcastically. It's going to be such a party. But who do you think our old friend is? Old friend with a new face, Jem said. That might make it harder to recognize him, but maybe not. Crystal was on her phone. I found Corinth on my society cloud map. There's traffic, though, on the main street. Some kind of accident. I guess we have to wonder what it might be early on a Sunday morning. Last time, Corinth had been a cross-genre madhouse of different times and places. It could be anything. They drove through the forest and topped the hill looking down on the city, which was bustling even though it was so late at night. The harbor looked fairly quiet, as did the airport. But there was a starport where a massive spaceship hung in the sky. It looked almost as big as the city under it. The weird vehicle started to appear about halfway down the switchbacks of the hill that took them to the first traffic light. There were hover vehicles mostly. Science fiction cars from the future, but there was also a steam-powered carriage that Jem had to pass. They drove past the city's sign. Welcome to Corinth. Travel here and there to anywhere. Around the words were pictures of pirate ships, starships, and some random carriages, along with hover cars, buses from the 1950s, and several impossibly shaped airplanes. At the first stoplight, there were five guys in lacquer armor riding mutant kangaroos. Ruby leaned forward between the seats. Okay, so that's not weird or anything. Crystal chuckled. <laughs> Armored men on marsupials? Nothing to see around here. They drove on past the outdoor market where the bars and restaurants were packed with people of all ages, shapes, and sizes, and species. Crystal pointed. <gasps> Bird people! I mean, they have beaks and feathers, but no wings. So, they're not like our crow friend. Uh, can't really call her a friend since we fucking killed her. Ruby pointed out. Good point. They took a left at the harbor. All of the big ships were out at sea, their lights twinkling. Several rowboats of various sizes were roped to the pier. Jem saw signs for long-term parking. He slid into his space and they got out. If they were going to be gone a month, they couldn't just park anywhere. He didn't want to get towed. But what kind of crazy contraption would tow them? The air was misty and cold, far colder than Thessalonica up north. It felt like it could rain, maybe even snow at any minute. Jem slammed his door shut. I brought a total of 50 coins. I'll keep 30, but we should divide up the cash. Jem kept 30 of the coins and gave 10 each to the girls. Then they walked over to the harbor. ADM music thumped from inside a dance club. All the signs done in neon. The Aeon Beat. Next door was a dive bar called the Blue Room. Two huge men in power armor went in with their heavy machine guns on their backs. There was a bridge that led to other spots down the way. But Torchy and Salts was unique. 
It had been built over the water of the harbor itself. There were a ton of boats all tied together around the rickety wood of the place. And unlike the other places, there didn't seem to be electricity there. There were lanterns and torchlight. That might have been just a gimmick. However, Jem liked the look. They walked down the walkway under the lanterns. Above them, winged figures flew through the sky. They were dressed in black and their bodies were dark. Jem couldn't see them clearly. With all the other strange creatures in Corinth, flying people were just part of the landscape. However, every now and again, green energy crackled across their bodies, giving them shape. After the energy dissipated in a shower of sparks, their eyes continued to glow green. There were at least twelve of the flying creatures. Jem readied himself for a fight, but the figures flew on. Ruby and Crystal turned to see where they'd gone. The dozen flew onward, heading for the Aeon Beat, or that's what it looked like to Jem. They continued their march down the wooden walkway toward the tavern. The sweet smell of wood smoke and ocean salt filled the air, along with the wet scent of rain. They heard music from inside the tavern. A drum beat, fiddles, guitars, someone singing. Ruby was smiling. Okay, there's music. I'm feeling better about this little adventure. From all the stories, I was always too afraid to come play Corinth. I think I was mistaken. I just might move down here. Crystal said with some excitement. It's so weird. I saw a princess on a unicorn driving in here. Kinda wanna know her story. No, princess is for us, Jem said. We're looking for the Queen of Chains. They pushed through a wooden door with cracked stained glass on the front. There was a stage off to the left. The bar was to the right. At the back was the fireplace they smelled on their way in. Tables were scattered around the place, filled with sailors of every description. From World War II seamen, to pirates missing limbs, to toothless fishermen in rags. The women wore tons of makeup. Obvious working girls that wouldn't have looked out of place in a 19th century Victorian brothel. The band was made up of four bearded zombies in various states of decay. The guy playing the balron, a traditional Celtic frame drum, was basically a skeleton. The others looked like refugees from a ZZ Top tribute band in hell. Ruby walked in like she owned the place. Finally, she seemed to be enjoying the adventure. Then again, she was in her environment. A drinking hole with a band. Sure, the musicians were undead but the sea shanties they were playing sounded good. She went to the bar and ordered them beers. Jem and Crystal started casing the place. Jem wasn't there to drink. He was looking for an old friend and a new face. In the back corner, he saw a group of men in porcelain masks. They either wore hats or hoods, but they were dressed like they might have just gotten off the set of Pirates of the Caribbean. The masks didn't quite fit with the rest of their outfits. Way too clean and white. Weirdly so giving them the look of haunted mannequins. They were laughing and talking, though, lifting their masks to sip their drinks. Crystal sniffed the air. <laughs> I'm recalling a certain smell. Yeah, the bathrooms haven't been cleaned in a while, but that's not what my nose is telling me. What? Smell? Where? Jem asked. Crystal waved him on. You'll see in a minute. He followed her to the corner. She walked up to the biggest of the masked pirates. His eyes looked black behind the mask. His beard was green. Crystal put a hand on her hip. I'm looking for Captain Solomon Reaper. We need the Midnight Wind to take us to Far Wind. Are you scallywags ready to cross worlds? Jem marveled at his wife. Yes, an old friend and a new face. The five pirates wore gloves, so Jem couldn't confirm they were skeletons. <sighs> they did smell like rotting seaweed. That was a good sign. The masked pirate stopped talking. None of them moved. The biggest one rose to his feet. His hand rested on the hilt of the curved cutlass at his side. His voice was as British and as crisp as it had been before. I am Captain Reaper, my darling gal. And here we were trying to enjoy a night on the town without the annoyance of adventure. You'd better be weighed down with gold, milady, for such a trip. Jem stepped in front of Crystal. We have gold, but we'd rather pay you in American dollars. Name your price, we can pay. The captain laughed. <laughs> oh, the currency of land. Yes, American dollars would be fine. 
I have a cash buddy account. Let's say $10,000 per person. Jim found it funny that the ghost pirate actually had a bank account. Well, he had to pay for their drink somehow. Solomon Reaper gestured at them. I would like your names before we proceed. <clears throat> I'm Jim Creed. Uh, this is my wife, Crystal. We're with a local musician named Ruby Inc. I'll pay twice your asking price if we can leave right now. No questions asked. We need our trip to be anonymous. So when Sheriff Pluto asks, you don't know a thing. I try to interact with the local authorities as little as possible. Though Corinth is mostly a lawless port, the god of death's reach is long. For obvious reasons. For death will grasp us all before the end. Even us poor wretches who have already felt the cold kiss of doom. Crystal laughed. <laughs> I love that you're so poetic, Captain. Can we leave right now? The captain lowered his mask to show his skeletal face and green seaweed beard. <laughs> of course, for the price you are offering is delicious. It will not be easy to reach far winds, you understand? For the way is fraught with beasts not of this ocean and not of this world. The cracking of far wind makes it treacherous even for us. Ruby came over with three beers and big stone mugs. She passed them out to Crystal and Jem. Lucky I have super strength, or I might have dropped these mugs. They weigh like a million fucking pounds each. Did you guys say there were sea monsters? Because I really don't want to fight sea monsters. Right then, the front door of the tavern was thrown open. A winged woman in rags with the face of a nightmare held an assault rifle almost as big as she was. Her eyes crackled with green energy. Persephone Malvado! It's time you come with us. The sheriff, as well as your father, would like to have a word with you. Jim thought it was strange that only one of the winged women stood at the door. Then the roof exploded. Chapter 18 Crystal's Wish Jem was caught off guard, but as the debris rained down and the smoke made him choke, he couldn't get the image of the nightmare woman's face out of his mind. Instead of a nose, she had a bleeding hole in the middle of her face. Pimples leaked pus down her face. She didn't have lips, only fangs. Her eyes glowed with a hellish green light. Instead of feet, she had dirty yellow talons. So the crow woman had been upgraded to full-on harpy. Even the wings were different and more grotesque. Then there was the machine gun to consider, as well as the fact that the harpies were working with the sheriff's office in addition to Ruby's father. That couldn't be good. Jem reached out a hand. Okay, Zeus, hand me decay. He heard both Crystal and Ruby shout. Okay, okay Zeus, Zeus, I'll, I'll be, be your huckleberry. huckleberry. Then the gunfire started. Women went running, screaming in terror. Others fled while cursing. One of the World War II sailors pulled out a forty-five and started firing at one of the harpies. Jem found one and jammed decay into the woman's belly. She immediately turned to dust. Next to him, Solomon Reaper had pulled a single-shot black powder pistol. It roared in an explosion of smoke and fire. The big ball hit one of the harpies, but it didn't stop it a bit. The winged woman had a slim sword wreathed in green fire. She darted forward, but Ruby was there with her own sword. She parried the harpy's attack before firing her revolver right in the face of the monster. The harpy roared in pain, but the bullet didn't pierce her skin. These harpies were bulletproof. Jem had to wonder if Crystal's Ares rifle might have rounds that would pierce their tough skin. A second later, he saw the results of Crystal's bullet. There was the throaty sound of the Ares rifle firing one of the level one armor-piercing rounds. A harpy had her chest blown out. Crystal laughed. <laughs> My wish for harpies came true. Ugh, these girls are completely disgusting. Good thing I can shoot them. Jem took charge. Ruby, follow Captain Reaper out the back. Crystal and I will hold them off. He dusted another of the harpies with a jab of his giant fork. 
Captain Reaper plucked a lantern off the wall. He waved it in the smoke. Follow me out the back indeed. Gem and Crystal formed a wall so that Reaper, Ruby, and the rest of the masked pirates could beat a hasty retreat. They burst out of the back door. Gem and Crystal killed a couple more of the harpies before they followed them out the door and down steps that led to all the boats tied up there. The skeletons hopped from one boat to another, making their way to the edge of the flotilla. Jem recognized the rowboat he and Crystal had rowed to the Delphine during their last dive. Ruby was able to hop from one boat to the next without tumbling in. That must have been her swashbuckling skill working for her. Crystal nearly tumbled into the water, but Jem grabbed her before she went in. She fired an explosive round that didn't kill the harpies, but disrupted their flight enough to send one tumbling into the black water. Another harpy swooped in, and Jem stuck his bident into the heart of the thing, turning it to dust, which covered him as the wind shifted. That was kind of gross. He and Crystal made it to the rowboat. Solomon Reaper had taken his mask off, but the other pirates hadn't, which made them look rather creepy. The captain's crew worked the oars on either side. There were four of them rowing. They took off from the flotilla. Only three of the harpies remained. Crystal had her rifle to her shoulder. She took out one with a very good shot. Hitting flying targets was nearly impossible. I totally got lucky. We probably don't want them flying away, though, because, well, you know, they're working for the sheriff. We don't want him knowing we're in Corinth and trying to get off world. Jem had his bident ready. Out of the two harpies left, one had a sword and the other had an assault rifle. The riflewoman strafed the boat with bullets. Rounds went through the skeletons and it sounded like sticks snapping. A few bullets punctured the bottom of their boat and the leaking started. Jem felt a bullet bounce off his shoulder. It would leave a bruise, but that was about it. They were bulletproof. Gotcha! Crystal fired and the riflewoman took a bullet to the brain. She fell from the sky. Got lucky again. I was aiming for the heart, and, uh, overshot. The last harpy came flying in. She aimed her glowing green sword at the boat. Green lightning crackled and struck two of the oarsmen. They shivered and shook as they were wreathed by the green lighting. One lost an arm, then a leg. One's head exploded. Well, that explained how they'd blown apart the roof. They had some sort of magic. The harpy flew over them. Crystal's rifle barked, and holes opened in the creature's wings, one after another. The monster fell, writhing into the boat. The minute she was in range, Jem stuck his bident into her. The next thing he knew, he was breathing in the dust. Ugh, that's so gross! He sneezed. It wasn't getting any less disgusting. One of the skeletons that hadn't been hit by the lightning offered him a stained handkerchief. Crystal saved him, once again, by pulling a tissue out of her purse. Here, big guy. Wipe up. So, that was fun, wasn't it? As Jem was blowing his nose, he felt his phone vibrate. Both Crystal's and Ruby's phones chirped. He fished out his phone and read the message. Congratulations, participant. We detected a major encounter. You survived, and so you have leveled up. Please review your character sheet and add an additional ability. Ruby was shivering. We're not going to be able to get our stuff. That might be a problem. For one, I had my warm clothes there. For another, what about our fucking phone chargers? Our phones are going to turn into bricks. Captain Reaper gingerly took hold of one of his fallen men and dragged the remains off the seat. He tucked both piles of bones in the bow. Good Master Jim, if you would be so kind as to help me all, I would appreciate it. We must get to the Midnight Wind as quickly as possible. It seems those harpies were working for the sheriff and your father, Mistress Ruby. <laughs> Just Ruby is fine she said with a chuckle. Mistress Ruby sounds like I'm either a dominatrix or I should be hosting a late night horror show on Shudder. Ruby it is, the skeleton captain said. He'd slipped his mask inside his jacket. The other two sailors did as well. Soon Jem was oaring with them, 
while Crystal and Ruby sat in the stern. Jem was thinking about their smartphone problem, as was Crystal. We're going to what I expect is like a fantasy world. <laughs> Not that Paradiso Island isn't a fantasy, but I'm thinking the place we're going to will have more of your classic elves, swords, and orcs type of thing. The Queen of Chains does sound promising. What's your point, Mistress Creed? Ruby asked. That's easier to say than Mistress Crystal. Crystal laughed. <laughs> Mistress Crystal sat on a thistle and scratched her little butt. Mistress Crystal had a squirrel sister who gave her a little brown nut. Captain Reaper turned his skull to regard Jem. Perhaps a stray bullet has knocked to daft. I'm not daft. I just like tongue twisters. Crystal got back to business. What I'm saying is that we'll have access to real magic. We shouldn't need our phones, I wouldn't think. Besides, even if we had our chargers, do you think we'll find outlets in your castle? I'm assuming we'll be living in a castle. With 50 gold pieces? Jem asked. Not likely. Once we get on the midnight wind, we'll have to do some upgrade work. And I'll need to add the attributes of the Ares rifle to your Colt Python. We need you to be able to hit magical creatures. Don't forget I need a sword, Ruby said. It would be cool to have this magical gun, but I thought the Erebos app added new security that you couldn't hack. I have some ideas to get around that, Jem said. Besides, I work best under pressure, and now I'm feeling pressured. All of this speak sounds like the darkest of sorceries, one of the skeletons muttered. Sodark, Jem said. You don't even want to hear about SSL certificates. It would damn your soul to hell. Too late for that. The stinky skeleton said. Hell is where I holiday. Captain Reaper laughed. <laughs> That's good, Jacko. Keep your sense of humor. When all is gone, a joke is a treasure to be sure. They made it to the midnight wind, and they climbed up the rope ladder and back onto the rotting decks. The place didn't smell any better than it had the last time they'd been there. Captain Reaper started shouting orders. Running lights now! Cast the magics, raise the anchor, and hoist the sails. We sail beyond the edge of the world. We're returning to far wind, oh, you damn souls of old. I'd rather be damned than bored, Captain, the skeleton named Jacko said. Where to in far wind? I'm assuming we'll be stopping at the city of Port Aden? Aye, Jacko, Port Aden on the eastern coast. For the newcomers, the Kingdom of Aden is the easternmost province of the Piyun Empire. Port Aden and the Piyun Empire? Crystal said with a giddy smile. Does this sound like a sword and sorcery thing or what? <laughs> Jem didn't know where to start. They were going to an entire new world, which was a lot of land to cover. We're searching for someone who might have been kidnapped by the Queen of Chains. Does that mean anything to you? Captain Reaper nodded. Sometimes Queen Oasis is called that. She freed the Abelarians. I think Port Aiden is your destination, for that is the seat of her queendom. Jem wasn't going to argue. Jacko got the other pirates working, and soon, bright lamps were shining on the bow and stern, lit by a flickering otherworldly light that was sometimes green, sometimes yellow, and sometimes darkened to a midnight blue. It was the prettiest when it was purple. One of the skeletons climbed the sails to keep watch from the crow's nest at the top of the rigging. He was a ghostly sight up there, bathed in moonlight. The captain came to Jem. Before you lose your cell signal, I'd like payment. You can use the email damnedadmin at undeaddarling.ded. That is $60,000. If we're paying that much, I'd like to stay in the VIP section, away from the smell. I'm hoping you have a nice captain's cabin. Captain Reaper chuckled. <laughs> I do at that. I am rarely there since it is my doom to travel the oceans of a thousand worlds, and the realms of the living as well as the realms of the dead. I will show you. Jem was escorted through a door at the back of the ship between two sets of stairs that led to the helm and the steering wheel. The captain's cabin was comfortable. It wasn't rotted like the rest of the ship, but instead, 
decorated in reds and golds. With a word, Captain Reaper lit the candles and a stick of incense started smoking. He retrieved a flagon of wine and three wine glasses with golden stems. Please make yourselves comfortable. I will be checking that your payment hits. He took out a new smartphone and gestured with it. Uh, how do you charge your phone? Jem asked. The captain chuckled. <laughs> Dead men tell no tales. You don't want my carrier. The damnable fees just might drive you insane. Then the captain left them. It was the early hours of a Sunday morning, but Jem felt wide awake. It had been a hell of a night. Chapter 19 Ruby Snakebite Jem sat at the table with Ruby. It was covered with various charts and navigation tools that Jem couldn't name on a bed. He was just careful not to put his glass on anything that looked important. Crystal went around the room, fiddling with pistols, swords, daggers, a long spyglass. She pulled down the comforter and smelled the sheets. I think they're fresh. That would make sense. I don't imagine Captain Reaper does much sleeping because, you know, he has to sail the oceans of a thousand welds. I'm going to look up his backstory before my phone dies. We should be careful how much we use our phones, Jem said. Ruby had a perplexed smile on her face. I know this room smells better than the ship, but I don't think I can have sex on a ghost ship. I could, Crystal breathed. She looked at Jem hopefully. Let's work first, baby. Then I think I can manage it. Ruby shook her head. You two are wonderful. Wonderful and slightly perverted. More than slightly, Jem said. First things first, he paid Captain Reaper for the ride to another world. Then they all sent messages to the people in their lives. Mrs. Deem, their various teachers, and of course, the fates. They were going to be gone for a while. They had to tell their friends not to worry. Also, they played up the fact that normally they weren't flaky. However, something had come up, and they couldn't get back to the island for a bit. Luckily, they were rich. Long-term parking in Corinth was going to set them back hundreds of dollars. Once that was done, Jem was able to log into Ruby's phone with a new admin account he'd created on the Erebos network. Since Ruby was third level, she would be able to use the three bullets that Crystal had for her Ares rifle. He'd have to create a whole new gun for her, but that wasn't a problem. He just needed a name. So, guys, we have the Colt Python, but I need a cool name. And don't say Ares Pistol because this is a revolver. What's a cool name for a gun? Snakebite, Ruby said simply. It's a Colt Python, right? So, Snakebite is what I'd like to go with. You want to give me a sword as well since you're working on it? He nodded. Good idea. Your battery still has about a 50% charge. I think we should keep our phones off in case we need to use them for something. We won't have internet, but I think we can still use them to access our character sheets and our Invintexes. I'll make local copies of everything, so we'll have the skills list. We're going to have to carry our weapons. Okay, so if we're keeping our phones off for the most part, buy me a sheath the singer said. Something like black and red. I'm hoping that far wind will have some kick-ass clothes. Jem chuckled. <laughs> we'll see. Crystal was also on her phone. I think we're going with invulnerability, right? Seeing those harpies use that green lightning on our skeleton friends made me kind of nervous. Sure, we're bulletproof. That's great in modern-day America. Not so great in the Piyun Empire. I would imagine arrows could do some real damage. I think you're right, Jem said. Ruby frowned. No magic? I was thinking about maybe becoming a badass sorceress. Like Arcana should give me something. It should, Jem agreed. Let's just become invulnerable first. Then we can worry about other skills. I would imagine that if Queen Oasis is the Queen of Chains... We'll have to fight to get to her. Queen Oasis? Crystal rolled her eyes. It's kind of on the nose. 
Like, if you wanted to name yourself something happy, that would be the thing to name yourself. Ruby nodded. And shouldn't it be Empress if it's an empire? Crystal had the answer. I think Aiden is part of the empire, so there's both a queen and maybe an empress or emperor, as the case may be. Jem found something interesting online. How about a sword cane? I found one with a polished wooden pommel, leather wrapped sheath and a cane. You could carry it around and no one would know. And it will have piercing and fire like the first and third level bullets. You don't want an exploding sword. And I don't think ice would work. Ruby grinned like she was the devil herself. No, I want an exploding sword. Jem found a sword that could be slid into a cane, or you could carry it around in a sheath. It looked like the perfect weapon. It had a skull in the pommel. Ruby would like that. Crystal sat back and thought for a minute. And ice would probably work. Cause wounds to freeze? Add them all, sweetie. We'll figure it out. Jem added the current magical properties of their other weapons to Ruby's new rapier. It had an edge, but it was mostly used for stabbing. What's the name of the sword? If we have snake bite, what about something like Fang? Ruby shook her head. Miss Kiss. Snake bite and kiss. A sword called Kiss? Crystal smiled. <laughs> it's just like Sting. No, it's like the loudest band in the Motor City. <laughs> Detroit Rock City? Kiss? It was clear that Ruby loved the name. Jem was glad she was finally getting into the spirit of the Erebos experience. Proof 43. Our weapons will be magical right away. However, we won't be invulnerable until tomorrow, so let's be careful. We have to survive the day. No dying, right? No, no dying. dying. Both Ruby and Crystal agreed. Jem remembered that as he leveled, he would be able to upgrade his Bident. But so far, there were no extra menus there. He didn't bother adding the three abilities to decay. It already reduced anything it touched to dust. He'd just have to wait to get to a level where he could add skills to it. He thought about what he would want. He'd like to be able to throw the weapon and retrieve it. But then, he wouldn't need to if he could shoot a disintegration ray out of the tip. He also thought about maybe an ability to increase the encounter points, if there was such a thing. For every encounter, that would also prove useful. While most of the time turning his enemies into dust was just fine, it might be nice to have a stun ability as well. He could see an area of attack ability where he slammed the butt onto the ground and it would radiate energy out. He wouldn't want to turn his friends to dust, but all of his enemies? Sure. But again, a non-lethal attack that affected multiple targets would be ideal. Jem wasn't sure if any of that was possible, and the weapon was already fairly OP as it was, so he didn't care all that much. They all chose invulnerability and added that to their character sheets. Jem pulled Decay out of his Inventex along with his guitar. He had a few extra clothes and some extra gear there, but he also wanted to buy some straps and carrying cases for their gear. Just in case their phones did die. Yes, they had phone chargers, but they probably wouldn't have electricity in far wind. By the time Jem was done working, they were far more mobile. Crystal had her saxophone, her Ares rifle, and her heavy coat. Ruby had her guitar, snake bite, and Miss Kiss. She didn't need the extra ammunition for her revolver. Like with the Ares rifle, Snakebite now didn't follow any reloading rules. It was like an infinite ammo cheat code in a video game. And with invulnerability, they were already in god mode. Talk about overpowered, but Jem wasn't too interested in dying or being hurt. He was in the Erebos experience to explore the world and have fun. He'd had enough life-or-death moments in real life. With their weapons and instruments out, Jem was about to turn off his phone when he got a message from the Oregon number. Ask about the doom. Remember there are many types of destruction and many ways to die, but also remember that death is not the end. There is the doom, but there is also life. Jem frowned. He didn't like this talk of doom. 
and he was pretty sure that Mr. Oregon wasn't talking about the video game. However, with how their lives were connected to the Erebos experience, that might not be the case. He let Ruby and Crystal read it. His wife's smile was uncertain. Well, some of that isn't great. Like, doom is bad, okay? <laughs> but life is good. We like life. No such thing, Ruby whispered. When you're dead, you're dead. Lose the brain, and you lose fucking everything. Gone. I had a great aunt. She came to our house to die. Hospice, the whole deal. I watched her lose her mind. I watched her die. I was in the room. I heard her death rattle. I've seen death. I've smelled it. There's nothing on the other side. Crystal went to her and just held the singer. It was the only real response. Jem, though, disagreed with her. He'd seen death as well. His experience had been bloody and violent, with adrenaline singing in his veins. He'd gone to a party with his friends, and their friend Scooter had been stabbed by these bikers getting revenge on a bad drug deal after Scooter had cheated them. They'd all been around Scooter as he gagged on his blood, as the light went out of his eyes. The next night, Jem and a few of his brothers had dreams where Scooter came around, saying goodbye and telling them not to worry. They all had the same dream. No, Jem believed in the afterlife. Let's shut off our phones to conserve battery power. Who knows? We might find a way to charge them. And there might be elven internets where we're going. Ruby laughed, shaking away her dark thoughts. <laughs> I sincerely doubt it. But who in the fuck knows? We'll be invulnerable soon. We're going to go there, rescue Elsie, and solve a mystery. Get a hotel? Probably fight Sheriff Pluto and more of my father's monstrous goons. See, good times, good times. Crystal had her phone out. Let me check one more thing. I found the bio for Solomon Reaper on the Erebos app. He said his story was tragic. It is. Jem read it over her shoulder, as did Ruby, who was sitting next to her. Name, Captain Solomon Richmond. Alias, Solomon Reaper. Non-player character task, Captain of the Midnight Wind. Description. Captain Solomon Richmond started from humble beginnings in the Grand Island Kingdom before becoming a commissioned officer in the Grand Island Navy. It was a proud moment in his life, but it also meant long months away from his wife, the fair Linnea, who was pregnant with their daughter. While working for the Grand Island Navy, he crossed a demigod of the sea, the Mad Corals Bag, and it was Mad Corals Bag who snatched away Linnea when she waded into the surf. The demigod took her down into the depths of the sea. Captain Richmond searched for his wife his entire life, for he knew that Coralsbeg could keep her alive, in just the way she was when she was kidnapped. Captain Reaper made a deal with the god of death that he would forever serve him if he could continue to look for his wife. That was when he became known as Captain Reaper. The crew of the Midnight Wind is made up of damned souls who also refuse to die because they searched for love. Crystal shut off her phone. So that explains why the captain has sailed every ocean. He's searching for his long-lost love. Yeah, fucking tragic, Ruby scowled. Why program him with such a tragic past? Genre expectations, Jem said. If you have ghost pirates, they have to have some kind of tragic backstory, or else why would they be here? Crystal sighed. <sighs> Maybe we can find Linnea for him. That might help him be happier. Then again, we'd have to find another way to get around between worlds. Not sure we could take Caron's ferry there. I think that would only take us back to the real world. Ruby stood up. In other news, I'm going to try to sleep some. It's been a long night doing all the adventuring things. You know... Maybe this is what Mr. Oregon meant about there being doom, but there also being life. You could live forever if you were a dead pirate. But if he made a deal with the god of death, 
Should we be worried? Jem didn't think so. It wasn't that good of a deal, right? I think we can trust Captain Reaper. Mrs. Deem sure did. Ruby let out a long breath. <sighs> okay, I'm just being paranoid. I heard that my father and Sheriff Pluto are suddenly in cahoots. It seems everyone is after me. Jem caressed the singer's arm. But they have to get through us first. Crystal stood and hugged Ruby and then kissed her. You're a trooper, Ruby Ink. The singer chuckled. <laughs> Kissing me like that. You want me to join you on that suspiciously clean bed right there, don't you? Crystal blushed a little. The idea did occur to me. Ruby took hold of Crystal and forced her across the room and onto the bed. Come on, Jem. I'll kiss her. You'll fuck her. And we'll take care of her lust a little. Crystal started taking off her jeans. Now, when someone asks me the craziest place I've ever had sex, I can tell them it was on a ghostly pirate ship. A skeleton pirate ship? <laughs> Something like that. Jem walked over, dropping his own jeans. He'd have sex, and then they'd sleep. Because in the morning, which was only a few short hours away, they might find themselves fighting the kraken that swam in the oceans of another world. Chapter 20 Jem's Surprise When the ship lurched to the side, Jem shot out of bed. He dressed after the sex because he thought maybe their arrival in the world of Far Wind might be rough. Rough was an understatement. Lightning flashed and thunder cracked. There was no rain yet, not that they could hear. The air stank of the ocean. Jim grabbed his bident and went through the door and out onto the deck. The sun was just rising on the eastern horizon, and they seemed to be running from it. Clouds dotted the dark sky and some of those clouds were filled with lightning. Captain Solomon was up at the helm, working the wheel. Picked up a beast, Master Jim. If you want to lay your eyes on an actual kraken, the beastie is under us. You might have felt it bumping us. Jim sped over to the railing. At first, he thought it was just the shadow of the ship, but no. There was a monster under them. He could see its scaled back and tentacles far bigger than even the biggest of the masts on the pirate ship. The shadowy beast rose and nudged the ship. The entire boat shuddered. Some of the skeletal pirates clung to the railings. Others worked ropes to keep the sails full of wind. Jem couldn't tell, but he thought the pirates were terrified. The winds were perfect, though, blowing out of the east and driving them toward a vast approaching coastline. Ruby and Crystal burst out of the captain's quarters. Both had their weapons, Crystal the big assault rifle, and Ruby her gun and sword. They ran to Jem at the railing. Ruby steadied herself on the railing. I don't want to look down, do I? Probably not, Jem said. Crystal, though, was at the railing, staring down at the monster. Wow, it's hard to get a sense of it. But it's super big. I'm wondering what would happen if you hit it with decay. <laughs> Do you want to try? We're not invulnerable yet, Jem said. Besides, even if we were, I might survive the chewing and the swallowing, but then I'd be trapped inside the thing's stomach. Crystal laughed. <laughs> you do not want to experience digestion, then. It probably wouldn't be very comfortable. Jem didn't even want to think about how digestion ended. Oh, wait! Ruby nearly shouted. You're not scared, Crystal Creed? There's a fucking sea monster under us. It's super weird and scary. Crystal agreed. But also kind of cool. Captain Reaper called from the helm. I think I can outrun it, Mistress Ruby. Excuse me, I forgot you are not comfortable with such a title. Miss Ink, I've outrun Bessie before, and I believe I can do such a task again. Jem wasn't about to dive overboard to try to dust the creature under them. They were pulling ahead, slowly but surely, with the masts creaking and the sails flapping, the bow knifed through the water getting closer to a sandy shoal. Towers had been built on the sand at intervals, probably marking the deeper channels through the sand. 
In the distance, there was a coastline, a city, with a towering castle built on mountain cliffs. In front of the city was a finger of land, with a fortress at its tip, guarding a bay. If we get past the good signs and the good sand towers, we'll be safe, Captain Reaper shouted. But Bessie isn't going to let us go so easily, Crystal grinned. See? Captain Reaper isn't worried. So why should I be? It's creepy, I grant you, having this huge monster under us. But, well, we're not captured yet. That's the spirit, gal, Jacko the skeleton encouraged. Ruby was not convinced. If I end up being pooped out by Bessie, I will not be happy. Don't go there, Jem said. Besides, I think if we die, we'd just wake up in the real world. Hopefully. At that moment, the winds dropped. It was just enough for Bessie to drive ahead of them. She breached the water with a huge splash. They were gigantic tentacles ready to latch onto the ship. Jem didn't see a face, but he did see one huge eye, the pupil contracting in the sunlight. The gray skin of the giant sea creature looked rubbery in the weak sunlight of the new day. The skeletal sailors adjusted the sails in a loud commotion of shouting and ropes buzzing through pulleys as the huge pieces of canvas caught a fresh breeze. At the same time, Captain Reaper cranked the wheel and the ship tilted to the left. He was trying to run around the monster to get to the safety of the shallower water on the other side of the sand shoals. They were so close. A tentacle rose up into the air. Crystal had turned her Ares rifle to her freezing round setting. The magazine gleamed with a cold white light. A second later, bullets hit the tentacle, freezing it, before it could fall onto the ship. Another tentacle reached to grab one of the masts, but not before Jem lunged forward and drove his fork into the gray skin. A good ten feet of the appendage turned to dust. A hunk of the tentacle dropped down and took out some railing on the other side. But the monster jerked back the stump, drawing it under the water. A roar shook the air. Ruby stood at the railing, hitting the huge red eye with freeze rounds until the thing was forced to submerge. A second later, Captain Reaper drove his vessel between two of the good sand towers. They were in safe waters. Bessie hadn't grabbed them. They continued to speed toward the city. Captain Reaper's voice boomed out above them. Never fear, my friends. We are safe now. And we shall soon have you at your destination. Before we lost our cell signal, I saw your payment, Master Jem. Thank you. Don't mention it, Jem said. He was just glad to get away from Bessie. He waited for his phone to ding, but no, it was turned off. That had to count as an encounter, right? Yeah, they were going to have to save their battery power for when they wanted to level up. We'll get you close, friends, the captain said. Then I'll have Jacko awe you the rest of the way. How does that sound? That sounds wonderful, Jem said. We'll get our gear ready. Returning to the captain's quarters, they gathered up their instruments and came out as many of the sails were coming down. Captain Reaper explained the landscape. That's the Finger Fortress, built on the Aiden Finger, which is the peninsula that juts out. It calms the waters of the bay. We're making the turn now. He cranked the wheel. Jem saw the crenellated battlements of the fortress and archers there, as well as other guard towers. They entered a wide bay of calm waters. There were docks in front of the city gates. However, many of the vessels were anchored around the bay. Tall ships, as well as what looked like Chinese junks and other bigger vessels like giant catamarans. Crystal pointed one out. <gasps> I think I saw that one in Moana. I'm pretty sure. Oh, guys, look! Past the docks were the walls of a medieval city. Beyond were a collection of buildings and twisting alleys all under the rocky peaks of a tall mountain that stretched down to the cliffs of the Aiden Finger. A gorgeous waterfall tumbled off the side of the mountain. A big white stone castle dominated the city, though there were any number of mansions, gardens, and markets surrounding it. The castle towers would have great views of the pristine waterfall. Jacko came up to them. That be Port Aiden. You'll be dropped off at the docks. There are inns that I have food, drink, and rooms. For a few silver a night, you'll be taken care of. 
Crystal had her saxophone slung over her shoulder. She gripped the Ares rifle. She was in her coat. The chill of the night and the sea hung in the air despite the dawn. What's the best place in town, Mr. Jacko? I mean, a place where a girl can really spend her gold. Jacko nodded. You want Heaven's Mile, which overlooks the palace market. If you can't get into the castle, then you stay there. Though, I'd start at a little place called the Wet Tail, run by a mermaid named Melinda. Well, rumor has it she's a mermaid. It's a brothel, but the food is good, the rooms are clean, and it's very close to the docks market. The poor people will have looser tongues than the rich ones, I can tell you that for a fact. Especially if you use your gold there. Jim was intrigued. Ruby rolled her eyes. We're going to be staying at a place called the Wet Tail. Good, great, wonderful, and it's a brothel. Jacko grinned to show all of the yellow teeth in his skull. Back when I still had skin, it was. That's where I met my Nancy. She was in a bad way. I took her away from there. But then she ran away, and I couldn't find her again. I won't go to my grave until I find her. Her name be Nancy Nighthouse. If you find her, you'd save me from an eternity of searching. How long ago was this? Crystal asked. It was a hundred years ago. That puts it at 1166 PD, it being 1266 PD now. Jim must have had a confused look on his face. Jacko chuckled. <laughs> Nancy never made it to the far shore. Heaven would be another word for it. I'd have known. She fled me and encountered something awful. Her spirit can't rest, and now neither can I. What's P.D.? Jem asked. post June, Captain Reaper said. He hustled them along. I don't like rushing you, but we must be off as soon as possible. We don't much like the daylight, and we make the living crews nervous. Besides, I'd like to brave Bessie while she's still wounded. Bessie attacks every ship coming to Port Aiden? Crystal asked. The captain shook his head. Only ones coming from other worlds, like we did. You missed our crossing last night. It's a pity, really, for there is nothing quite like it. When we return to Paradiso's Island, I'll make sure you see it. That's a deal, Crystal said happily. Jem focused on the logistics. When we're ready to return, how can we get in touch with you? I won't mind paying the $60,000 again. Did he really just say that? Being rich was weird. Captain Reaper laughed. <laughs> There's a tavern in Docktown called the Sailor's Stiffy. The owner is a one-eyed ex-pirate named Eason Price. He has an auxiliary enterprise managing funerals. Bring him thirty silver pieces and request he summon us. Jacko will be there with our yawl that same night at midnight, and we shall be anchored in the harbor. Jem made a mental note to find the sailors stiffy. So, it was as much of a funeral joke as it was an erection joke. Jem wasn't about to leave the midnight wind without talking about a certain issue first. We read a little biography of you, Captain Reaper. You aren't aligned with the god of death, are you? <laughs> we might be on his bad side. The pirate captain stroked his seaweed beard. I have no such alignment. The deal I made with the god was clear. I would not rest until I see my Linnea again. Then I shall find rest on the far shore. Crystal sighed. <sighs> if only we can find Linnea and Nancy for you guys. I'd like for you to find rest. She nuds Jacko with her elbow. Okay, we have our way back home. Let's get to Port Aiden. I'm ready to explore a whole new world. <laughs> Yay! In short order, they were down the rope ladder and on the yawl, which was a type of rowboat they'd used before. This time, Jacko and Jem oared them past more gorgeous ships toward the long dock. Jacko delivered exposition like a champ. The city is beautiful, but it took a thousand years to rebuild after the doom. What was the doom? Jem asked. Death from above, Jacko said. The sky was cracked open by an evil, 
and the land burned, and people were consumed with either flames or sickness, for the fire brought a terrible sickness with it. The fields were spoiled for a good long time, which caused famine. My Nancy loved stories and songs about the doom. If only I could see her again. Total side quest. Crystal murmured under her breath. Jim agreed. He wouldn't at all be surprised if they ran into this Nancy Nighthouse. What's the currency in the language? Crystal asked. I've traveled internationally. I know to ask these questions. Tijuana only kind of counts, Jem teased. The skeleton ignored their banter. Gold, silver, copper, a hundred copper to a silver, ten silver to a gold piece. They talked more, but Jem could feel that Jacko was holding some of the world's history back. Of course, because they didn't want to reveal it all at once. They'd get the history of Far Wind eventually. Several fishing boats had already left, and some were coming in. There weren't a ton of people around since it was still a bit early in the morning. They walked down the dock and saw that a huge market had been set up in front of the gates. There were wooden stalls selling all kinds of things, from fish to fruit to textiles. The women shopping there wore dresses and had their heads covered. The older women did. The younger women had their hair exposed. Most wore dresses, though a few did have big, poofy pantaloons on. There weren't just humans there, no. But people of a dozen different races, at least. Are we hungry? Crystal asked. She sniffed the air. Oh, I'm hungry, all right. Do I smell donuts? I think I smell donuts. They found a food stall where a big, beefy woman with a red face, hair covered, smiled at them. Come, come, travelers. I have fried dough that will sweeten your morning. In the end, it wasn't donuts. It was like old world funnel cake. The woman even had an ornate silver shaker to dust the funnel cakes with powdered sugar. The big woman seemed nice, so Jem figured she'd be a good person to try out their money on. I have money from a faraway place. He took out the gold coin and showed it to the friar woman. She took and felt the weight. Why, that's an ounce at least. Most of the queen's gold coins are half an ounce. If it's real, it should be worth 20 silver or 200 copper, whichever. But of course, I'd not be a good businesswoman if I just took your strange money like I trusted you. There's a money changer. Go tell them Big Bernice sent you and not to cheat you. Get at least 19 silver for that coin. If old Burdis is in the right mood, he might give you a deal. That made Jem laugh. <laughs> yeah, we can only hope. Old Burdis was in a good mood, and he only charged them a few silver pieces to exchange their money. He was a large, owl-like man with feathers instead of hair. He only had three fingers on each hand. Jem and the girls walked back to Bernice with the coin of the realm. It had taken nearly an hour, though because the money changer had several people look at Jem's gold piece. They were soon eating the funnel cake, served in what looked like old newsprint. It was English, which was nice, and it was dated March 16, 1266. Jem was feeling good, eating the funnel cake, which was hot and covered in powdered sugar that had clotted in the grease. His smile was bright enough to draw the attention of the two women. What are you so happy about? Ruby asked. Printing presses have been invented. That's huge. It will help us figure out what's going on in the city. And yeah, we can maybe even put out an ad looking for Elsie. This is great news. They didn't want to ask Big Bernice where the local mermaid run brothel was, but they soon found it. There were taverns and inns and warehouses built outside the main wall over the rocky beach. Cement pylons had been sunk into the beach and huge beams of wood had been placed over them. There was a whole city outside the wall built on the massive beams, and it seemed like the wilder, seamier areas. There were drunks left over from last night, and a few busty women in lots of makeup. Down the right side at the very end of the walkway was the wet tail. It was built both into the wall and into the rock of the cliffside, but stretched out to form the Aiden Finger, protecting the bay. The brothel was the nicest building they'd seen so far, made from metal 
with a greenish tint along with big windows in the front in the shape of a mermaid splashing around in the ocean. The sign for the place hung off a large iron bar. Imagine Jem's surprise to see a woman who looked exactly like Mrs. Deem. Another look? It was Mrs. Deem, and not just any version of her, but the version from the real world. She wore her lab coat, a white blouse, and tan slacks along with a pair of sensible shoes. She looked over the top of her glasses. What are you three doing here? Far Wind was not supposed to be a part of Scenario Delta. Chapter 21 Mrs. Deem's Warning Jem stood in front of the brothel holding his bident with his guitar on his back. Mrs. Deem had her hair pulled into a ponytail. But Jem noticed she was wearing makeup. Why would her avatar wear makeup? And how did her being in Port Aiden affect the woman running their Breeze B&B back on Paradisos Island? Ruby put her hand on the hilt of her rapier on her right side. The Colt Python was holstered on her left. Her guitar was on her back. Scenario Delta? Oh, right, this little round of guinea pig testing. Well, we went where the game took us. Not a game! Crystal laughed. She'd slung both her saxophone and her rifle back so she could rush over and throw her arms around the older woman. <laughs> it's so good to see you in the Erebos experience. You're really here, aren't you? Isn't this illegal? I mean, you're going to have to throw out the test results because you're now a variable. How long are you here anyway? Crystal stepped back, but kept holding Mrs. Deem's hand. The scientist sighed. <sighs> Any dives shorter than ten minutes come with risks. Hence, I am here for a week. As today is Sunday, I will be leaving next Sunday. I am hoping that in that time, you will find your way back on the midnight wind and back to your normal session. Were things not going well there? We know there was some trouble. Elevated heart rates not in alignment with sexual activities. You've seen combat, I think. Cyclops yetis. Crystal held the scientist's hand a bit longer, and then slowly let it drop. Then she reached out and squeezed the doctor's arm. Honestly, Mrs. Deem, we were just following the gameplay. We think Elsie Dorrance and her friends were kidnapped and brought here. We are going to find her, and rescue her, and take over the Delphine. The older woman frowned. Perhaps Dr. Deem would be more appropriate. I think we should have some professional distance between us. She paused and shook her head. This is very irregular. Why do you think they're in far wind? Songs and song lyrics? Ruby said. We've been getting messages from Mr. Oregon. Who very well might be the oddity. The scientist had the cutest frown lines. They accentuated her crow's feet. Jem leaned on his bident. It seems music is going to be very important in this dive. I mean, I'm learning music, so that might be why the experience is emphasizing it. You know, I didn't tell you before, but I wanted to leave Paradisos Island. This was the perfect reason. Before Dr. Deem could answer, the door was thrown open, and a hulking man with walrus tusks came out. He wore layers of chain mail and fur. He had a large club that looked like a pine tree he'd uprooted and then polished. Miranda say come out. She say, ask what your business is. You look strange and talk strange. I'm Eddie. Crystal opened her coat, undid a few buttons, and pushed her rifle into Jem's hands. Let me handle this. She went up to the huge monster man. Eddie! <laughs> I'm Crystal. It's so nice to meet you. You have such a big club. While she was talking, she leaned forward, showing the bruiser a bit of her cleavage. Jem didn't like that much, but Eddie stared at her. Ah, oh, you pretty. You nice. You want job? Ruby tried to keep her chuckles to herself. Do you, Crystal? Get paid a little to shake your moneymaker? That idea made Jem cringe, and it pissed him off. <laughs> no, silly Eddie. Crystal said with a little laugh. We'd like to talk to Miranda about purchasing your best room. We have money. Eddie motioned with his pine tree club. All right, come inside. Miranda likes rich people. 
Eddie went back inside, dragging his club after him. Dr. Deem winced. Jem, I don't suppose you can lend me some money for a room? And yes, I will want my own room. Crystal smiled at the older woman and kept eye contact. You don't have to, Mrs. Deem. Or can I call you Terry? Dr. Deem, remember? The older woman colored a little. We mustn't get too familiar. I have to admit I have been curious about how far the Erebos experience has progressed. I did a few dives during the beta testing. It has become perfect, hasn't it? Yeah. Crystal said. You can't tell the difference. As far as I'm concerned, this really is the real world. And we're free to do all sorts of things in it. Completely free. Dr. Deem had a worried look on her face, but she didn't say anything. Jem was kind of shocked that his wife was flirting with the older woman so shamelessly. Yes, they were in a virtual world, but Dr. Deem was very much a part of the real world. Ruby tapped the hilt of her sword. Let's just get inside and get to our room. I only got like 15 minutes of sleep last night, and I'm ready for either coffee or sleep. And this room better be clean. They entered the wet tail for the first, but not the last, time. The front room was a luxurious place with a stage, couches, and cushions, and more windows that showed the waters of the bay. On the left was a bar, where a tired-looking woman with frizzy hair stood bartending. Eddie, the walrus man, sat in a chair by the door with his club between his legs. A woman in gauzy pantaloons and a flimsy robe came out of a door near the big staircase that led to the upper rooms. The fragrances of spice candles and perfume drifted through the air. <sighs> that room smelled good at least. Miranda looked human enough, though her eyes were bright orange. She had dark blue hair and full red lips, even without makeup. Her teeth were even and bright white. She was gorgeous. And stern. She spoke with a subtle accent that sounded vaguely African. Our best rooms, no? Up at the top, we have our suite. The cleanest beds in Docktown, I tell you. A guaranteed, I tell you. It's a big room, and you pay good coin to stay there. But I'll need your real names in my book. Let's talk price first, Jem said. We heard it's five silver a night. For a normal room, no? Miranda said. But you want the suite. That's a gold piece a night. We could pay that, Jem said agreeably. But we were told it was five silver. I don't want to get cheated. How about we give you a gold piece for two nights? Mm, seven silver a night. Miranda narrowed her eyes. But food is extra. And? Her eyes traveled over the three women standing with Jem. Anything else you desire? Do I think you brought your own happy times with you? Jem chuckled. <laughs> Something like that. How many rooms are in your suite? Put another way, how many beds? Four beds. And it's quiet, no? You won't hear anyone else's happy times, I'll tell you. Just then, a petite blonde woman with pointed ears wearing only the skimpiest of negligees came down the steps. Miranda, can you order out for breakfast? I'm starving. It was a late, late, late night last night. I don't want Frizzy's cooking. Frizzy must be the bartender. The frizzy-haired woman sighed. <sighs> Just have the porridge, sweets. It's not bad. Don't make me fry up this sausage. The blonde elf's eyes found Jem. Mm, he's a good-looking one. Did he bring those girls to work for us? I like that older woman in the strange white coat. She looked like she studies things. I think she might like to study me. Miranda snapped her fingers. Sweets, I'm telling you to eat the porridge. These four will be our guests in the suite. Better not cause me no trouble, no? You have your sword and weapons. I have that and more. You'll hear stories. You best believe them. Sweets shrugged. Ah, oh, fine. I'll eat the porridge. But I want sugar, since I'm sweet. That's my name. That's also what I taste like. And it's what I like to eat. <laughs> She giggled a little. 
The little elf woman walked by Crystal, who was devouring sweets with eyes full of lust. Sweets noticed, of course, and gave Crystal the biggest, brightest smile possible. I like people who stay in the sweet. It means you're rich. I like rich people. I like rich, pretty women even more. Crystal's face was red, and she was sweating a little. Dr. Dean cleared her throat. throat) Yes, well, I would like to discuss the current situation sooner rather than later, though I'll be here for a week. Maybe the one sweet might be fine as long as I have my privacy and you respect my boundaries. Crystal couldn't take her eyes off sweets, who sat at the bar. Ruby elbowed Crystal. Ethics aside, we don't know if there are any social diseases here. And never fall in love with a pro. They'll break your heart every time. Crystal had enough shame to blush. I wasn't going to, you know. Anyway, yeah, let's see the room before we pay. Jim followed Miranda up to the suite. Other than her orange eyes and blue hair, she seemed human enough. She didn't have scales or a tail, but somehow Jem believed her when she said she'd have a bunch of rumors about her. She seemed like a woman who would draw gossip. As for the room, it was perfect, with a central living area and windows that faced the bay. The master bedroom had a bathtub off to the side. There were two other rooms, plenty of space for Dr. Deem to have her privacy. Miranda sat in one of the plush chairs and opened her big ledger on her lap. Now, if I could get your names and a local contact, and what you are doing here in Port Eden. I'm Jeremy Creed, Jem said. Our local contact is Solomon Reaper. He's the captain of a merchant ship, the Midnight Wind. As for our business, we are looking for three women. Elsie Dorrance, Natalie Mirage, and Nikki Merchant. Crystal added names. And Nancy Nighthouse, maybe Linnea Richmond? It's your basic rescue operation. I mean, we think they might need to be rescued. We think. Maybe. Miranda glanced up at them. This all sounds very suspicious. Very suspicious indeed, no? There was a girl named Nancy Nighthouse who once worked here, but that was a long time ago. That isn't so strange, but Captain Solomon Reaper is a ghost. And the rest of all those names sound like you made them up right here and right now. Ruby stepped forward. You have that stage down there. Well, we're traveling minstrels. We are here to entertain the people. And I recite Shakespeare. Crystal said loudly. <laughs> Theater troupe. My husband plays the guitar and sings. Jem did not sing. He didn't protest, at least not out loud. Miranda tapped her feathered pen on her chin. Hmm... Minstrel still isn't good. A lot of scoundrels come playing their music this and dancing to that. But I suppose that story is better than no story at all. I'll say I know you four. That should be worth a free show, no? The madam nodded at Dr. Deem. And what can you do? The older woman turned pale. Uh, a bit of tambourine. Percussion, mostly. I can sing as well. She had not been prepared for the question. It was kind of fun to watch her squirm. Ruby gave her a little smile. She's more band management and marketing, really. In a sense, you could say she's the genius behind Ruby Ink and Crystal Dream. Ink and Dream, that's us. Or maybe all of us together are Gem and his jewels, since I'm Ruby and she's Crystal. Miranda shrugged. Uh, we'll use both. Ink and Dream, Gem and his jewels. Can you play tonight? You bet we can, Ruby said, grinning. We'll have Jem go up first. What the hell? He frowned. This is not in the plan. Ruby widened her eyes at him. It was a definite don't rock the boat look. Jem didn't say another word. Where can we buy musical instruments? Ruby asked. We'll need a Balron. It's a type of frame drum, since Dr. Deem can drum. The older woman didn't say a word, though her shock had deepened. Ruby was throwing them all into the deep end of the musical pool. Miranda gave them some information about the city, where they could shop, and a place to buy the local newspaper. She took payment and rattled more information. The kitchen was usually open if they got hungry. Frizzy made soup daily. The wet tail had an Abelarian servant girl named Precious, who would bring them food, drinks, or anything else they wanted. 
Jem had no idea what an Abelarian was, but he loved that everything was falling into place so easily. That was the magic of the Erebos experience. He still had questions about why Dr. Deem had joined them in their dive, and why Crystal was flirting with a real woman from the real world. Chapter 22 Crystal's Flirting They met Precious right away. She was a thick-bodied girl who, as it turned out, was 19 winters old, though she looked younger. She was furry, with a tail and cute dog ears sticking out of the top of her chestnut hair. She wore a simple white tunic, which hugged her big hips and small chest. So, you're an Abelarian? Crystal asked. I'd like to learn more about your people. We're new. We've come from a place far, far away. Yes, ma'am. I am an Abelarian, she said softly. But I'd rather not talk about myself, if that's all right. Would you like me to bring you wine or tea? Maybe a little of both, Ruby said. I don't know if I need something to bring me up to plan tonight's show, or if I should have wine so I can sleep. I like the idea of a drum, and I can't wait to see what kind of instruments this world has. Yes, a drum, Dr. Deem gulped. Ah, I must warn you, I haven't been involved in music since high school, Ruby shrugged. It's like riding a bicycle, you'll do great. Precious was clearly torn if she should speak or not. Jem encouraged her. It's okay, Precious. We'll take both wine and tea. Precious curtsied. Then the chestnut dog girl left them. Crystal looked troubled for a minute. Wow, Precious was really submissive. Is it me, or does dog people being servants make a certain amount of sense? They're not slaves anymore, though. Jacko said that the Queen of Chains freed the Abelarians. Then Crystal launched into another topic of conversation. Her mind was clearly whirling. I wonder how many girls are working at this brothel because they want to be. Maybe some of the real people here had some kinky fantasies they wanted to experience. Ruby frowned. At least now we have someone to ask. What about it, Dr. Deem? Who's real and who is just computer code? The scientist looked shocked. That's just it. Far wind should be offline. This is all being generated on the fly. I suppose a brothel on the wharf would make sense. It fits the genre. But an enslaved race of dog people? We just can't know where that would come from. The Queen of Chains is an evocative phrase, Crystal said. Jacko mentioned the Abelarians. Our heads might have filled in the rest. But come on, Terry. Why are you really here? I told you. I came here to escort you back to Paradisos Island, she paused. However, now I see that far wind has become part of the narrative. Poor Elsie. Not that I'm saying Elsie is one of our participants. I can't. That would be unethical and it might damage the scenario even further. There's also the subject of privacy. Crystal gave the older woman a lingering smile. You're rambling a bit, ma'am. So, I won't ask if Nat and Nikki are real or not. And I won't suggest you aren't either. Because you could be code. We have no way of knowing. Jem watched as his wife's eyes dipped to take in the older woman's chest. Dr. Deem sat upright. Mrs. Creed, please, you have to stop flirting with me. There is no chance of you winning me over. Though I did notice on your character sheet you added a skill called seduction. Crystal grinned like the cat who ate the canary. This is my Erebos experience, doctor, and I'm going to enjoy every part of it. This isn't real. If you and I were to kiss, it wouldn't be real. I love that I have complete freedom here, and that I get to be so daring. What could be more daring than flirting with you? Dr. Deem was speechless for a moment. Ruby laughed a little. 
Damn, Crystal. <laughs> You're so fucking rock and roll. Damn straight. The two women bumped fists. Dr. Deem let out a breath. <sighs> Let's move on to a more polite topic of conversation. So, if you could get me caught up on the narrative, we can track parts of it, though yours is not the only story happening. There are other scenarios running with other participants. I can't say more. Jem told her about what Mr. Kalis had said at the Winter Dreams Ball, about Elsie's disappearance, and about the competition to become owner of the Delphine. Dr. Deem nodded. Yes, well, I will help you try to find these women. The faster you complete this quest, the faster you can return to Paradisos Island. This could be the oddity at work. We have no way of knowing. Nonetheless, we have to be careful. Precious returned with the wine and tea on a tray. She had milk and sugar for the tea. And when Crystal asked for a lesson on how to prepare it, the cute dog girl blushed. I like it very sweet. Like sweet stars. She's an elven girl who works here as a courtesan. Yes, we met her. Crystal smiled. Precious showed them how to mix the tea. Dr. Deem decided upon the wine to calm her nerves, while the rest of them drank the tea, which tasted like chai back on Earth. It was spicy, sweet, and delicious. Precious had a bowl of spices to add to the wine. Jem had a bit, and it was equally tasty. The tea was full of caffeine. Jem felt his pulse race. Then Precious knelt before them. If you would like anything else of me, I am here to serve you. Crystal stood up, walked over, and put out a hand. You don't need to kneel, Precious. You can just be yourself around us. The girl stood up. It will be strange for me, but I will try. Ma'am, you asked before about the Abelarians. I said I did not want to talk about it, but if you are a stranger to these lands, I will tell you some of our history. Only if you want to tell us, Crystal said. Precious nodded. I do. Abelaria was a forest kingdom. After the doom, we were one of the first kingdoms to be conquered by the Piyun Empire. We were enslaved, and after hundreds of years, we learned to enjoy our servitude. Then the Queen of Chains freed us. We are still trying to accept this change. There was the jingle of bells outside the door. Precious bowed. Thank you for being kind to me, but I must go now. Without another word, the dog girl left. Crystal wrinkled her nose. Is it bad that I wanted to pet her? She really is like this cocker spaniel a friend of mine had in elementary school. Dr. Deem shook her head. We need to focus on the task at hand. We need to find Elsie Dorrance. Do you have any leads? Not yet, Jem said. Ruby cut in. At this point, I'd like to focus on the music. We have the show tonight, and I don't want to suck. Also, if we make a name for ourselves, especially among the elite, we could get access to people who can help us. According to Mr. Oregon, we have like a month here. A month? Dr. Deem hit the roof. You can't be here a month. That's 40 minutes of real-time simulation data lost. You see, while we're here, you aren't being logged. We can't lose that much data. Crystal waved away the protests. I'm so loving this world. And Ruby is right. We need to get access to the queen. If we become superstar celebrity musicians, we can get a gig playing the palace. What do you all say? Ruby regarded her cop. What the hell, Terry? So I drink caffeine, and I feel the effects. But it's not like it's affecting my body, only it is. And now you're saying we're basically off the fucking grid and that the oddity might be in charge of this whole shit show? Why do I think at some point we're going to wind up in jail? We wouldn't be there long, Jem said. We have all kinds of weapons that explode, and being invulnerable helps. He got out his phone. Hold up. Let's see what our technology situation is. Crystal was also jittery from the strong tea. And don't mind Ruby, Terry. She's just a bit gun-shy from that other dive. I am wondering if you have a character sheet. What are your special abilities? The older woman swallowed nervously. I really do think you should call me Dr. Deem. 
And, well, like I said, I did some percussion in high school. But no, I don't necessarily have any special abilities. Not like you three. I probably should have added skills, I suppose. What do the kids call it? God modulations? Jem laughed. <laughs> God mode. Do you have a phone? The older woman shook her head. No. But if you die, you just wake up, right? Crystal asked. Dr. Deem didn't answer the question. I'd rather not die. Being here, in uncoded territory, we aren't certain about the repercussions. I would probably simply wake up, as you've said. Or my mental health might be permanently damaged. There have been some cases where trauma has occurred in the more violent scenarios. Welcome to my fucking world, Ruby said bitterly. But we're going to think happy thoughts. I want to walk up to the palace market, get some gear, and do a little practicing before tonight's show. Crystal, can you really do Shakespeare? She nodded. Yeah, I used to memorize soliloquies for fun in high school. She did, Jem agreed. And even after. Ruby wrinkled her nose. Probably shouldn't tell people that. It's disturbingly nerdy. Dr. Deem gave Jem a smile. You all certainly jump topics. So you three shall become famous musicians to win our way into the palace to get access to the queen. That is going to take some time, but I'll do my part in this. Just treat me like one of the girls. <laughs> I would gladly treat you just like how I treat Ruby, Crystal said, laughing. Jem's phone booted, and he was given a message. Congratulations, participant. We detected a major encounter. You are, hidden percentage, closer to your next level. Jem was happy. Hey, we all got an encounter. That's probably escaping the Kraken, so that's good. He saw he had 48% of his battery left. There was no cell signal and no internet. However, he did have access to the Erebos app, his character sheet, and his Inventex system. That was all great news. He did try to find configuration or information files on Far Wind. He couldn't find anything, which made sense since it was a new world. They'd just have to get a newspaper. Jem shut off his phone to save the battery. One more thing. What the hell, Ruby? I am not ready to go anywhere near a stage. Ruby only smiled. Sure you are. You've been practicing. You have your ultra musicality skill. You'll do great. Really, though, what you need is to start sucking. <laughs> you have to get the sucking over with sooner rather than later. Don't worry. Hopefully, the people will be too drunk to throw things. Why didn't that make Jem feel any better? Chapter 23 Jem's Day Shopping Not ten minutes later, they left the wet tail. They walked through Docktown and reached the Dock Market. A right turn took them through the city gates. They made their way up the main avenue, a wide stretch of cobblestone that zigzagged up the mountain that took them to the Palace Market, which had more higher-end stalls and shops. There they bought a frame drum and a drumstick. There were a ton of instruments, everything from strange violins to lutes to what looked like an accordion. Ruby would have spent the day there if she'd had the time. The man running the market stall was a Tuscalarian, the same species as Eddie back at the wet tail. He wasn't nearly as friendly as Eddie, though. He grumbled when Ruby asked him to show her how to play some of the stranger instruments. He did. The Tuscalarian had rather nimble fingers for such a big man. They bought Dr. Deem a new outfit, a dress that buttoned up the front and a pair of brown boots, that she said were the most comfortable thing she'd ever worn. Since Dr. Deem had new clothes, Ruby and Crystal wanted a new look that fit in more with the people of Port Aiden. Ruby bought leather pants and a silk shirt with a wide belt, as well as boots. Crystal had pantaloons that puffed out with a tighter top and vest. Crystal wanted to come back and spend more time finding just the right clothes for her adventures in Far Wind. Also, the women selling them promised to make custom outfits which Crystal wasn't going to pass up. It was a good thing they'd brought the 50 gold coins. They were going to go through them pretty fast. 
They saved money on Jem. He was fine in his jeans, boots, and leather jacket. While they shopped, Crystal still flirted with Dr. Deem, though she was doing it with far more subtlety. Some of it came off as being friendly, but other times, Jem felt the undercurrent of sexual tension there. Lots of touches, smiles, a little bit of innuendo, and lots of compliments. Jem could absolutely see how Dighty Lovejoy's classes had paid off. He was nervous about performing on stage that night. If he bombed, he wouldn't just be letting himself down. He'd be embarrassing his music teachers, and that included Ruby. He was only going to play a couple of songs. It was the singing that was the problem. He knew the lyrics, but to both play and sing at the same time? No, it felt like that would be impossible. They ate roasted bird meat, which wasn't quite chicken and wasn't quite turkey, for lunch. They also had Aiden potatoes, which were like thick home-style french fries. Really thick and really greasy, but with some really tasty spices. Dessert was cherries that were more tart than sweet. From what the people were saying, they wouldn't be really sweet for several weeks yet. They did see the Avalarian servants running errands for their masters here and there. And they did hear a few rumors from shopkeepers. Miranda seemed to have a secret life as a warrior queen, though there weren't many details. People were afraid of her, though, and from all accounts, she was a mermaid. They also heard more about Queen Oasis. It seemed the Queen of Chains was very proud of her harem of beautiful women. No men. Jim couldn't help but think maybe Elsie had joined the harem. If so, rescuing her wasn't going to be easy. One name kept coming up. Lady Natala. She was Queen Oasis's best friend and confidant, really, the second to the throne of her queendom. There was an emperor, far to the east, who ruled over all the kingdoms. His name was Emperor Shibalba, and supposedly he was due for a visit to Port Aden. Jem wasn't surprised. He figured he'd cross paths with the evil emperor at some point. Crystal bought the previous night's newspaper, the Far Wind Digest, in the morning edition of the Aden Inquiry. Returning to the wet tale, Crystal read through them. There was an article written by Lady Natala about the various gardens in Port Aiden, ranking them. She wondered aloud if Lady Natala was really Natalie Mirage. Or was she the queen? Queen Oasis instead of Queen Mirage? Natala instead of Nat or Natalie? Crystal put down the newspapers to practice. Up in the suite, there had to be some kind of magic because they couldn't hear a thing from the other rooms. Crystal was a bit disappointed. However, she wasn't going to be sleeping with any of the working girls in the wet tail. For one, Crystal didn't want to pay for it. The real reason, though, was that she was saving herself for something special later. Of course, she was staring at Dr. Deem when she said that. Dr. Deem rolled her eyes and laughed. <laughs> Keep dreaming, Crystal. It's not happening. I can dream, Crystal said loudly. I'm Crystal Dream, after all. Ruby wrote up a set list, something she referred to as an idiot sheet. She was going to try some folk songs she knew, and while she had the melody, she'd fudge the lyrics if she didn't get the words perfect. It wasn't like anyone in the audience would know the difference. Ruby was nervous, though, because she didn't know any of the local popular songs. She'd been successful before by taking pop songs and putting her own mark on them, she couldn't do that in this other world. Dr. Dean was actually pretty good on the frame drum. She held it in her left hand and used a double-sided drumstick to tap out the rhythm. It created this double beat that certainly was catchy. The scientist showed Jem how to do it. They had to get close for that to happen, and Jem couldn't help but smell the woman, her perfume, and her smell of walking around the city all day. It hadn't been that hot since, like in Paradiso's Island, it was still early spring in Far Wind. Dr. Deem kept smiling at him, and he kept smiling back. She was relaxing into her life and the Erebos experience and trying to have a good time. That meant joking around with Jem and the girls. Jem was going to play Yesterday by the Beatles and Wish You Were Here by Pink Floyd. He'd play the chords, but Ruby would be there with both her guitar and her voice if he needed help. The singer laughed. <laughs> Since we're doing acoustic sets. We'll have to do some Johnny Cash. I can't imagine Johnny wouldn't kill it here. 
He and Ruby practiced the two songs until they didn't sound half bad. Jem was amazed at how well Ruby could make up lyrics when she couldn't remember the actual words. He was also very glad that he'd practiced so much. And the lessons were critical, but he wouldn't have been able to go up on stage without his ultra-musicality ability. Miranda didn't do much promotion. Basically, she just sent out her girls to spread the word in the dock market that there would be live music at the wet tail, and she played up the ink and dream angle. Two lovely women with the voices of angels that would amaze people with their talent. Miranda also put a sign out front. Jem wasn't on it, but he thought that was probably for the best. At least for now. Ruby set up the stage with a table, chairs, and their guitars, as well as Crystal's saxophone. There were candelabras for light. All in all, it looked good. The tablecloths were red and gold, and with the candles flickering off the window, it was interesting to the eye. Frizzy worked behind the bar. Precious helped with serving customers along with three other women, all scantily dressed. The working girls were on the floor with a strange collection of men. There were some Tuscalarian sailors, some elven men in silk gowns, and a smattering of run-of-the-mill humans. A few bald, blue-skinned men showed up with swords, but Eddie confiscated them. No weapons were allowed in the wet tail, at least not if you weren't in the suites. There wasn't a green room for the musicians, but they set up a little table near the stage. They were sitting there at seven o'clock when Miranda led her parade of prostitutes up on the stage with suites leading the way. She was clearly very popular. Trailing suites were a variety of women including a large Tuscalarian woman with an enormous ass and huge tits half-covered with a gauzy fabric. There was a stately, cat-like woman, in sharp contrast to Precious and her hangdog ears. There was a shapely woman ten years older than Dr. Deem that Crystal couldn't stop staring at. All of the women seemed as happy as they were beautiful, and they appeared to revel in the attention. After standing on the stage and doing little twirls, the girls walked down and sat at tables, and the men sat with the one they liked the best. The room was filled with talking. It was eight o'clock when Ruby walked onto the stage. She didn't have a microphone, but she'd tested the acoustics. They weren't bad. She'd played in worse venues. Jem and Crystal sat near the stage, in chairs near the steps, so they could see both Ruby and the room. Ruby started out by playing a rocking rendition of Whiskey in the Jar, which was an old folk song that told a story. It was a big hit for Thin Lizzy in the 70s, but then later Metallica did a cover. She followed that up with an acoustic version of You Give Love a Bad Name. She didn't love that song, but she knew it backwards and forwards. At first, no one in the audience gave her a second look. The men were just looking at the girls, talking to them, laughing and drinking and eating. But halfway through the first song, people started throwing her glances. It was clear the women were enamored right away, but they had to be polite to their prospective Johns. Otherwise, they wouldn't get their money. At the end of the second song, people started nodding along without glancing away. That was when Ruby gestured to Crystal. Come on, Crystal Dream. Get up here. Crystal hopped to it, climbing onto the stage where she grabbed her saxophone. They played Domino, the old Van Morrison song. People were paying attention now. Jem could see that Ruby and Crystal captured the audience. He didn't blame them for looking because the two women were beautiful. They'd unbuttoned their blouses to reveal their cleavage. Dr. Dean noticed it. Sex sells on any world, it seems. Those two women are very, very talented. I can't believe I'm going to go up there. This can't end well. The scientist was clearly nervous. However, she would be a great addition to the stage. She was tall and busty, and that dress accented both her chest line and her hips. She scooted closer to him, and Jem felt the thrill of lust fill his belly. What was she playing at? She'd made it clear that nothing could happen between them, right? It seemed the good doctor might be changing her mind. Chapter 24 Jem's First Show Jem and the scientists sat close to one another at the table near the stage while Crystal and Ruby played. 
He leaned in closer so he could talk with Dr. Deem without disturbing anyone. Jim wanted to comfort her. You're gorgeous, Dr. Deem. The crowd is going to love you. I'm the poor son of a bitch that needs to worry. I'm not gorgeous. Compared to your wife and your girlfriend, I'm an old woman. The scientist laughed a little. Jem felt her hot breath against his cheek. Her smell filled his senses. Before he knew it, he was doing some flirting of his own. You are gorgeous. Besides, Crystal has a thing for older women. I guess I kind of do too. It wasn't an accident that our Mrs. Deem at our Breeze B&B was so good looking during our first dive. <laughs> it's funny, though. During this dive, she changed. I know why. Dr. Deem moved back a little to drink some of the spiced wine. Then she leaned forward so she was closer to him than ever. But of course, I can't tell you. Only I might. Later. Her brown eyes were blazing. She was breathing hard. <sighs> I'm about to go on stage. I never thought in a million years that I'd be using my music theory class and drumming stuff in a brothel on another world. Yeah, you at least had some musical training. I've only been playing guitar for like six weeks. Mrs. Dean touched his knee. But you have your magical skill. Tell me, did you feel the benefit right away, or did it take some time? Jim had to think back. He looked into her eyes. It was pretty immediate. I was surprised, actually. My music teacher noticed right away. How would that even work? Your brain is connected to a powerful AI, the older woman said. That AI has access to the math underneath the music, as well as all manner of music theory, so you get the best of both worlds. That information was fed into your brain and your muscle memory. I'm impressed Erebos insisted you get a teacher and that you learn the music so slowly. I think it could have made you a master right off the bat. A master? The word had taken new meaning for all sorts of reasons. Mr. Organ loved to remind him that he needed to master his reality and not be a slave. Jem's face was close to the scientist's. He felt like he could be kissing her at any minute. He had to smile. Did you know our dive would have so much music? She shook her head. Not with you. For Ruby and Crystal, sure. They were musicians before. Especially Ruby. Her class is musician. We didn't do that, by the way. It was Erebos. Jim had to wonder how much control the scientists had over the AI. More and more, it seemed that it had a mind of its own. Or was that just the oddity? Dr. Deem leaned forward and kissed Jim's cheek. Thanks for the pep talk. I'm on. Then Jem was sitting back, watching the scientist with her drum as she tapped out a beat. They played Whiskey in the Jar again, but this time it sounded like a different song. The drum beat added a whole new dynamic, as did Crystal's saxophone, and Ruby belted out the words with confidence now since she'd won over the room. Sure, some of the men left to go upstairs with their dates, but most stayed, eyes drinking in the three beautiful women up on stage as they played their hearts out. Next, they played Tequila, though Ruby had changed the single word lyric to La Quaza which was a strong spirit that was more like vodka. But it was a local word, and it had three syllables, so it worked perfectly. They did a few more songs, and then Ruby waved Jem up. We have a special guest star tonight. Jem Creed. His first show ever. Don't hold back, he's new. But he's good. Jem's guts were full of butterflies. His knees felt weak. He was sweating bullets. He got up to the stage and grabbed his guitar. It was like he'd never held it before in his life. All those eyes were on him. Dr. Deem and Crystal stood back, giving him all the encouragement they could with just their presence. Okay, here I go, Jem said. Ruby touched his back. You're going to be fine. The crowd started booing. One guy yelled, We don't want no dingleberry up there. Only women, only gals. Ruby laughed. <laughs> Just start, Jem. Play with confidence. Fuck that guy. Jem started out with yesterday, playing the intro notes before strumming the chords. 
The place got louder and louder as everyone saw how he wasn't very good. The best part of the show was over in their minds and now some random guy was up there. In the end, he was too nervous to sing. Ruby saved him. She kept her hand on his back while she sang. The minute she started singing, the place quieted. Talent was up there, and she was doing what she was born to do. All eyes were on her. Jem was forgotten. Damn, but he was kind of glad. The minute that song was done, Ruby had him start playing Wish You Were Here Right Away. This time, even with Ruby singing, the crowd slipped out of their grip. By the time they were done, the sound of the chatter eclipsed them. There were some weak applause, but that was it. More men left, some new men came in, but they didn't give a shit about the band on stage. While Jim thought Ruby would be sad about that, she was laughing. She seemed relieved. <sighs> what are you so happy about? He asked. Ruby was nearly giggling. <laughs> we can suck here. We can totally bomb. It raises the stakes, at least for me. Oh, thank God. We have to play this thing for real, or we'll get tomatoes thrown at us. Jem left the stage, and no one noticed. Okay, so he'd sucked. Or maybe it was the songs. Or maybe it was just a bad night. He didn't know. This was his first show. Ruby called out to the room. Thanks for giving Jem a chance. Now the ladies are back. And we're going to do a song I love, but half forgot I loved. Being here, I'm thinking of a lot of songs by the Pogues. I wish I had the internet, but oh well, we'll make do. Dr. Deem clicked the drumstick on the frame of the drum to get them started, and Crystal launched into a new song called If I Should Fall From Grace With God. Ruby's hand was a blur in her guitar. She sang out the lyrics. It was a ruckus party song, part folk, part punk, and Crystal played the notes fast on her saxophone, replacing the normal accordion. And just like that, Ruby had the crowd again. The slow bullshit was over. This was hello, let's hit the town music. In the end, Crystal didn't do any Shakespeare. <laughs> she didn't need to. Ruby was a firm believer in giving the people what they wanted, and she'd give them what they wanted, all right. That was what playing gigs was all about. Leave the fancy stuff to the artists that don't need to pay their fucking bills with music money. That night when they left the stage, Miranda was over the moon. They talked near the door to her office under the stairs, crowded together. Miranda was all smiles. I don't want Jem and his jewels, no. I want Ink and Dream and the mother drummer. I say yes to you, Tree. I say no to Jem and the jewels. Ink and Dream will play tomorrow night, won't you? Free room, free food, free fucking. You can fuck anyone you want here, including me. The place will be standing room only tomorrow night. Ruby only laughed. <laughs> and here I thought we'd have to do some busking. That will be Jem's lot in life. But fuck yeah, Miranda, we'll play. But we want to cut. Miranda lost her smile. Well, now, you're reaching into my pocket. She shrugged. But I'll tell you this. If you hadn't insisted, I wouldn't have respected you. So good. We can negotiate tomorrow. I'm too happy tonight. <laughs> Dr. Deem crossed her arms. We don't need money, madam. We need to find a woman named Elsie Dorrance. And we think Lady Natala might know something. She is Queen Oasis's friend. Can you get us in contact? The mermaid madam laughed brazenly. <laughs> As if we run in the same circles. It is impossible for me. But maybe not for you. There's a party in one month's time. A royal ball and feast. There will be minstrels playing at the spring feast and festival. If rumors are to be believed, Emperor Shibalba will be there. Both Queen Oasis and Lady Natala love music. That might be what you seek, my friends. That might be what you seek. Tomorrow, we talk. We have fun. Trust me. Jem wasn't sure he trusted the madam, but he thought they were on the right path. He was a little concerned at what Ruby had said. What was busking? 
It was feeling disappointed on the walk up the steps to their suite at the top of the brothel. Ruby must have seen the expression on his face. She drew near and gripped his hand. It's called paying your dues. If you would have gone out there and killed, then you might never know what it feels like to suck. Maybe I just don't have the talent, he said. <laughs> said every artist in the history of the fucking world except for like five guys. Ruby grabbed him and stopped him on the staircase. You know what? Talent gets some people to the top. But it's not talent that most people have. Most people, even super successful musicians, do it because they can't or won't do anything else. The music game is for people who do it, not for people who talk about it, or people who are gifted, or any of that shit. It's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll. But it's the people who do the climb that have any chance of making it. Dr. Deem and Crystal kept on walking up, carrying their instruments and some other stuff. It was just Ruby and Jem there on the staircase. They heard some muffled voices, and yes, they heard a bed hitting a wall rhythmically. They were in a whorehouse, after all. A cry of pleasure reached them. Have you made it? Jem asked. Ruby leaned back against the wall, arms crossed. <sighs> yeah, I have. Not because I have a record contract or a million monthly listeners on Spotify. I made it because I played an acoustic set in a fantasy brothel and I killed it. I was competing against Pussy and I won. And believe you me, boy, Pussy is stiff competition. <laughs> Pun intended. So yeah, I've made it. I can pay my bills. I mean, outside of this weirdness. That's making it. Most musicians can't. Or won't. The banging bed finally stopped. Someone is happy, Jem said with a smile. By the way, what's busking? Street musician work, she said. Playing for the crowds. We're going to set you up in the dock market and have you play for copper pieces. It's like getting paid to practice. I've done it some. Like any day in the life of an artist. It can be awesome. And it can suck, depending on the day. I've had great experiences. And I've had times when I figured the world would be better if every fucker on Earth just dropped dead. Of a doom, Jem muttered. <laughs> Whatever. Ruby grabbed his arm and squeezed. Some people get off treating buskers like crap. Oh well, you'll have a great time. And you'll get used to the shit. The music business isn't all just hotel rooms and drug-fueled ragers. Jem felt the fear keenly. Then he shrugged. <sighs> it doesn't fucking matter. Not a bit. I'm invulnerable and rich. You know what? Fuck it. This is all just a game. Life is but a dream. Ruby said softly. And just like that, life is over and we wake up. <laughs> Might as well enjoy it while we're here. We could leave Port Aiden if we don't like it. You know that, right? It's not like we have to stay here. We could go anywhere. We could go back to Corinth and get a spaceship to Venus. Why not? Ruby grinned at him. Yeah, this is all just fun and games. I'm feeling better about being here. Not completely great because something is off. I can feel it. Can you feel it? I'm not sure. However, the minute I knew that my memories had been messed with... I knew that trying to get to the bottom of the mystery was going to be tough. But I'm trying to see the Erebos experience as something to enjoy. I mean, if there is shit going on, we'll eventually find out what it is. Until then, I'm going to channel my wife and be daring and have fun as much as I can. <laughs> that is Crystal's view. Ruby took his hand and pulled him close. <sighs> Kiss me until I can't remember who I am. He took her in his arms and kissed her. Another bed in another part of the place started squeaking, and they heard the moans of pleasure. Ruby's lips were soft on his. She smelled good, sweaty, raw. Both of them were breathing hard. Ruby broke the kiss. <sighs> Let's get upstairs. I am beyond ready. They took each other's hands and went hurrying up the steps. When they opened the door to their room, they were shocked to see Crystal straddling Dr. Deem on one of the couches. 
The scientist's hair was out of her ponytail, framing her face. Crystal pushed a tendril behind the woman's ear. Gem, Ruby, you're just in time. I was just about to kiss Mrs. Deem. Finally. Chapter 25 Terry Deem's First Night Ruby stepped inside their room, and Jem closed the door. Dr. Deem, the scientist said thickly, we must maintain some distance. Or, that was what I thought at first. Scented candles flickered in holders on the tables around the room. There was a bottle of the spiced wine on the table, along with two half-full glasses. Crystal was staring into Dr. Deem's eyes. Is it okay if I kiss you while they watch? The scientist's face was flushed. Her mouth was half open. She gave Jem a quick glance, and then her eyes were back on Crystal. Yes, I believe so. No one can know. Oh, I knew coming here was risky. I knew something like this might happen. I tried to be. Crystal silenced her with a kiss. Their lips came together. Crystal lingered there before deepening the kiss, until both of them were breathing hard. Ruby cast a doubtful glance at Jem. He didn't know what to tell her. He was as confused as she was. Dr. Terry Deem had said she needed to keep things professional. She said that any involvement might spoil the results of the testing. And yet here she was, in their room on the first night, kissing his wife, and enjoying it. Her hands rested on Crystal's hips. Crystal retreated and caressed the older woman's face. I'm sorry, Terry, but I couldn't wait for you to finish. What were you about to say? I tried to be different this time. During your last dive, I came on too strong. Or my avatar did. Part of our observation process was to make avatars of ourselves in the Erebos experience, which is different from being a participant. Crystal laughed softly. <laughs> That's why this time my Mrs. Deem is playing hard to get. So... Why did you come on to me tonight? No one will know, the scientist whispered. The parameters of this whole scenario are now so different. This world isn't even supposed to exist. Not in any real way. I can blame my elevated bio patterns on the strange nature of this extemporaneous code anomaly. Ruby took Jem's hand and led him over to the couch. Can you dumb that down a bit for me? I am free to indulge in my own fantasies, the scientist said. If all of you can promise to be discreet. Jem remembered how close the scientist had sat to him, and how the energy between them had been full of sexual tension. If the Mrs. Deem from their previous dive had been based on the woman in front of him, she had a great many fantasies indeed. I won't say a word, Crystal said. You can trust me. You can trust me as well, Ruby added. The scientist took in Jem, and her eyes were begging him to agree. Your secret is safe with us, Jem said. And we don't have to do anything you're not completely comfortable with, Crystal purred. You can say no at any time. I won't, the woman whispered. This is too hot. I knew the minute I didn't get my own room this would happen. You three are so beautiful and perfect. Kiss me again, Crystal, and give me your tongue. Crystal did. She was devouring the scientist, sucking on her lips and sucking on her tongue. Jem couldn't believe how stiff he was, watching his wife finally get the woman she desired for so long. Ruby took a more active role. She went to Crystal and lifted her shirt off her, interrupting her, 
kissing. Then Ruby undid Crystal's bra, exposing her breasts. Dr. Deem's eyes lit up. Oh, this is happening. Oh, your breasts are beautiful. You smell so good. Would you like to suck on me, Mrs. Deem? Crystal asked innocently. Not Terry, the scientist asked with a little smile. How about mommy? Suck on my tits, mommy, Crystal purred. She gave the older woman a nipple to suck. Dr. Deem sucked on Crystal's left breast while she massaged her right. Crystal was shamelessly rubbing herself on the scientist, working her hips back and forth, getting more and more excited. Jem stripped off his shirt, as did Ruby. Dr. Deem caught the movement and turned her head. Oh, Crystal, I love sucking on you, but I want to kiss your friends, and I want both of you girls to suck on my breasts, while Jem fucks me, it's been so long since I've had a young man to make me feel good. Crystal got off and pushed off her pants. She was only in her panties. She helped Dr. Deem stand. Ruby came up behind the older woman and started undoing the buttons on her dress. You have far too many clothes on, Mrs. Deem. How about I help you? Yes, the older woman whispered. While Jem kisses me, Crystal drew him over. Yes, Jem, mommy needs lots of kisses. Jem couldn't believe how erotic his wife was being, so edgy and taboo. He pressed his body up against the scientist and his hands found her full hips. He gripped them before moving to feel the fullness of her ass. Dr. Deem's mouth was hungry when it found his. He could smell Crystal's perfume on her, and he could taste Crystal in the older woman's mouth. Dr. Deem's hand went down to cup his cock in his pants. She sighed. Oh, you're big. I wanted you to be big. Is it okay if you fuck me? Will Crystal mind? I won't mind at all, Crystal said. As long as I can taste it. Ruby, I'll get Jem naked. You work on Mrs. Deem. Oh, gosh, the scientist gulped. Are you going to all take turns licking me? Oh, I want that. I want to do everything with you all. Everything, Jem agreed. His tongue found Dr. Deem's, and she moaned. Jem thought his cock might shred his jeans. Crystal undid his pants and pulled them down to his knees. She got one leg off, then the other, and then he was naked. Better yet, Crystal's warm mouth found him. His wife sucked on his sex while Dr. Deem kissed him until she pulled back. Her eyes went to the topless girl in panties who was pleasuring his long, thick tool. Oh, she looks so sexy on her knees like that. You can tell she likes what she's doing. Crystal turned and smiled. I love sucking on Jem's cock, but I bet you do too. You're going to taste him. Just like I'm going to taste you. Ruby helped the MILF get the dress up and over her head. She was in a sensible bra and panties, both beige and lacy. Her nipples, though, were so big, poking through the bra. Crystal left him and got her panties off. She went over and took Ruby's head in her hand. It's your turn to kiss her, Ruby. I want to watch you two kiss. Dr. Deem moaned as her mouth found Ruby's. Jem came over, undid Dr. Deem's bra, and pulled it off her. 
Her breasts were big, so they sagged a little. But her big, grown areolas were the biggest he'd ever seen. The size of saucers. Crystal didn't pause. She bent and took one of those huge nipples into her mouth. Ruby went from kissing the woman to sucking on her other tit. The singer had dropped her pants, but she still had far too many clothes on. Dr. Deem noticed that. Take off your panties, Ruby. Get naked for me. <laughs> Gladly, the singer said, laughing a little. Ruby stopped sucking on the scientist to get her panties off. Her hairy pussy looked so sexy between her plump thighs. Crystal helped Dr. Deem get out of her panties. They were all naked now. Jem's eyes traveled down the MILF's body from her huge tits and huge nipples to the dark stubble that surrounded her wet sex. Her juices had dribbled down her inner thigh. Crystal stepped back to admire the older woman as well. Then she took Dr. Deem's hand and drew her over to Jem, making good on her promise. The scientist's eyes twinkled with lust as she took hold of Jem's curved direction. Oh, it's so hard and perfect, and it's still wet from your mouth, Crystal. Is it okay if I suck on it? I know he's your husband, but I want it. Fuck, Ruby breathed. I didn't see this coming. Crystal took hold of the woman's head and guided her to suck on Jem's sex. Another woman was sucking on him. An older woman who had made it clear that she couldn't have sex with them. And yet, that was exactly what was happening. The scientist was naked on the floor of their room, and she was taking him deep into her mouth. She gagged a bit and then sucked on him hard, and then jacked him off with her other hand. I want to taste all of him, she choked. Then she licked his balls, first one, then the other, all the while stroking him harder and harder. Her mouth went from his balls back to the head of his dick. Jem came dangerously close to coming, he grabbed her head to stop her for a minute, until the feeling passed. She kept her lips around him, though, waiting on his next cue. When the moment passed, Jem started fucking her mouth again. Meanwhile, Ruby and Crystal knelt on either side of the scientist, watching with glittering eyes. Both of them watched in fascination as this older woman worshipped his cock with her mouth. Then Crystal grabbed hold of the scientist's brown hair, shot with gray, and pulled her away. It's Ruby's turn, Terry. I'll let you suck on his cock again in a minute. Suck on my tongue instead. Ruby took over, making love to Jem's sex in her own special way. Spit dribbled onto her tits. Meanwhile... The older woman was licking Crystal's mouth. Then, it was Crystal's turn to suck on him. Ruby pulled Dr. Deem close. Both of them had such big tits. Their breasts were mashed together while they kissed. Their faces were slick from spit and sweat. Crystal knew her husband, and she stopped sucking on him and smiled at him. <laughs> You're giving me so much pre -cum, baby. I think you need to come, don't you? <sighs> what do you have in mind? Jem asked, wiping the sweat from his face. Crystal pulled Dr. Deem down until she was on her hands and knees. She got on her back under the woman. Ruby, suck on her other tit while Jem fucks her. I think this is exactly what she wanted. It was, the scientist sobbed. I wanted Jem to fuck me doggy style while you two sucked on my titties. 
Ruby pushed the couch back and cleared the area. Then she got under the woman. Both Crystal and Ruby were masturbating as they suckled on the older woman's massive nipples. That left Jem. Before he fucked her, he was going to taste her. He pulled open Dr. Deem's wet pussy and licked up from her clit, up her big lips, to the brown pucker of asshole. Then he sucked on her clit more, smelling her sex and tasting the depths of her hole with his tongue. Then he couldn't stop himself. On his knees behind her, he eased his stiffness into her overheating body. He'd wanted to have sex with Mags, but she'd only wanted to watch. Now, though, he was getting another pussy to add to his collection. He was inside this other woman, feeling the depths of her. She was so perfect, so warm, so wet. Her tunnel felt endlessly deep as he filled her completely. His pelvis was up against her ass. Fuck, Crystal. She's tight. She feels so good. I bet she's wanted this for a long, long time. Oh, you have no idea, the older woman wept. I saw video captures of you. I couldn't help but watch them. I shouldn't. I did. I rubbed myself, fantasizing about joining you and doing all sorts of dirty things with you. <laughs> Jem grabbed her big white ass and fucked her pussy as hard as he could. His eyes went to Crystal's fingers between her legs, across the sweaty back of the milf and on to Ruby, who was rubbing her clit. The singer lifted her hips as she came. Then Crystal stiffened, grunting as an orgasm found her. He knew his wife had wanted to suck on the older woman's big tits for months. With the two women coming, it was Jem's turn. That was easy. He grabbed Dr. Deem's ass to open her cheeks and stared at her wet pucker and the even wetter slit under it, stuffed full of his cock. Then he was coming. He didn't need to warn her, because it wasn't like she'd get pregnant. He didn't think. Crystal saw what was happening. Ugh, Jem fucked you good, didn't he, Mommy? And now he's coming in you. He's filling your horny cunt with cum. He is. I can feel it. Oh, I can feel him coming in me. The waves of pleasure throbbed through Jem's body, and he couldn't believe how good it all felt. Then he felt Crystal's fingers on Dr. Deem's clit, rubbing her. And it was enough. Oh, God. Crystal, I'm coming, baby girl. Oh, you're making me come. Jem felt the MILF's tight hole grip his cock as she came. The spasms milked new life into his sex. His first time with Dr. Terry Deem had been amazing. But he knew it was only the first night of many. She wouldn't be going home for another week. They could have a lot of fun during that time. A whole new world of fun in a whole new world. Chapter 26 Terry Deem's Breakfast Conversation At some point, they'd moved into the master bedroom, then back to the bed and then they'd all fallen asleep in a pile of bodies. Jem woke to find himself missing a woman. Terry had left them. He couldn't very well think of her as Mrs. Deem or even Dr. Deem, not after what they'd shared. He heard the front door quietly shut and lock. Where was she going? He got out of bed, not waking up Crystal and Ruby, who continued to snooze. It was daylight outside, but the light was red with dawn. He'd only slept a few hours, but he felt great. 
He dreamed of driving with his buddy Pete down a dirt road in eastern Colorado, throwing dust while they listened to Greta Van Fleet's Highway song, which sounded like a long, lost Led Zeppelin song. In the dream, the sky was blue, but there were dangerous black clouds on the horizon. Pete had changed into crystal at some point, as happens in dreams, and suddenly Ruby was in the back seat. The three of them were approaching Jem's old home, a junkyard in the sage. His house wasn't the crappy brown ram shackle ranch with the siding peeling off and the roof shedding tiles like ticks. No, it was a gleaming tower of steel and lights like something out of Star Wars. Inside was the oddity, and it both pissed Jem off and scared him. He turned to see if Crystal was all right, and she was gone. Ruby was as well. Jem was alone in the car, and not just the car. He was alone in the entire world. That lonely feeling had woken him up. Strange. He was living inside a simulated world, but still dreaming. How did that work? Jem got dressed. He wanted to see if Terry was all right, so he didn't have time to check his phone. He'd wanted to make sure their new invulnerability skill had been activated, but he was also curious to see if Mr. Oregon had sent him another message. Jem didn't think that would be possible. Not unless Mr. Oregon somehow had access to the Erebos app, which wasn't outside the realm of possibility. It was a Monday morning in a brothel, which was probably the quietest place in town. The place still had signs of the party from the night before. Frizzy was up, as was Miranda and the dog girl, precious, helping get things in order. Jem saw Terry at a table that had a view of the waters of the bay. She had a pile of fried dough and long strips of meat on the side, as well as a big fruit bowl and a cup with two handles. It was quite the feast, had she ordered all that. He went over and stood next to the table. If you want to be alone, I would totally understand. Just say the word and I'll take off. She smiled and it was kind of sad. No, I need help with all this food. They thought we were all coming down for breakfast. At first, I was rather annoyed at the misunderstanding. But then I realized, I can eat whatever I want and not worry about gaining weight. Another benefit of the Erebos experience. If you're sure it's okay. Please, sit. We have a lot to talk about. She was wearing the dress they'd taken off her the night before. Her hair was combed, yet still a little wild. Was there more gray? Maybe. Her experiences in far wind couldn't age her, could they? Jem sat, a bit curious. What do we have to talk about? Mm. The tea is as delicious as ever, and these little donuts are more like deep-fried French toast. Uh, it's all very good. The meat is like a combination of bacon and sausage, and the fruit, oh, it's as sweet as the donuts. Jem caught Frizzy's eye, pointed at the tea, then nodded. Frizzy gave him a weary look, then nodded herself. Jem took a bite of the meat. If we're here to talk about breakfast, I'm for it. This stuff tastes great. The scientist sighed. <sighs> no, it's more important than breakfast. Though breakfast is important. It's of a more sensitive nature. <sighs> it's about last night. Terry nodded. Yes, I lost control. It's important for me not to lose control, especially with how important the Erebos experience is to humanity. And yet, when I evaluated the consequences of joining you three, I couldn't help myself. No one will know. I trust that you and your ladies will be discreet, and that we can put this behind us. She smiled, and it was far less sad. Well, leave it behind once I leave at the end of the week. On Sunday morning, Captain Reaper will come to collect me. Until then, I think we are going to have a lot of fun. After last night, yeah, I'm sure of it. And we'd love your help trying to find Elsie. Precious dropped off a double-handed cup with Jem's chai already prepared. The spicy sweetness was nice after the breakfast meat's saltiness. I have some questions. Jem said after a minute. Terry was eating fruit, but she paused to nod. I cannot tell you as much as you'd like to know, I'm sure. Sex is one thing. The free flow of information is another thing. I'm sorry. 
but really, I can't jeopardize the testing. Even though Scenario Delta is already so messed up? We weren't even supposed to be here. You weren't? The woman agreed. This is the Erebos AI extrapolating on code we didn't write yet. But anything I say will affect your experience. I can't say much. Jem tilted his head. You said you watched video of us. So is there video of what is happening now? Not here. The scientist admitted. Here, we are cut off. And yes, we had to see what you were seeing. But it's not like a continuous video feed. We had to isolate different events. Most of the time, they weren't of an intimate nature. However, I got very curious. And I broke the rules. I couldn't help myself. She paused. In a lot of ways, I'm like your wife, Jem. I grew up in a very religious household. Sex was for procreation only. Every thought that was sinful brought you closer to hell. And yet, I was a very sexual person. I fought it, like your wife, my entire life. Unlike Crystal, I didn't have a supportive spouse. My husband was a cold man, with very little feeling. Part of me liked that, part of me hated it. He was a literal rocket scientist who worked at Lockheed. The marriage failed, and there I was at the twilight of my life, having followed the rules of chastity for all those long decades. I knew how important my work on Erebos was, and at the same time, I was afraid I'd die without truly living. My avatar during your first dive was a little show of my rebellion. I played her like I was in a video game. I wasn't in the dive, mind you. Just suggesting actions that I myself would never take. It was inappropriate and exciting. Why is the forbidden fruit the sweetest? Jem didn't know. He let the woman talk. During Scenario Delta, this dive... I changed the avatar, though in the back of my head, I knew that Crystal would try to seduce her. And then I came here, and I loved how I felt with your wife, and with you, Jem, and with Ruby. I was going to fully embrace this chance at rebelling, at being the naughty sexual creature I always wanted to be. The scientist blushed and smiled. The Erebos experience is meant to be heaven. It's meant to be the perfect experience. And so far, it is. For me, at least. I love being here. I love the food. And I'm in a band now. I've always dreamed of being in a band, you know? The normal fantasies of being loved and adored and being important. I wanted to be important. At my job, I am, and I revel in that. But here, I'm important. In a different way, I saw the men and women looking at me on the stage, and I knew the men were thinking I was a prostitute, and that they could pay to have sex with me. <laughs> the idea was thrilling. Better, though, was being with you three in the room last night. I love how your wife worshipped my body. Such adoration. We promised people paradise, and we have delivered. Jem listened carefully. It was a heavenly experience. And yet he'd bombed. So, if this is supposed to be heaven, how come I sucked last night? Because, just like in a good story, conflict is interesting. Progression is, in and of itself, interesting. I think you'll find that your audiences will get easier and easier as we spend more time here. Why is this place important? What is really the purpose of the Erebos experience? It's not a game. You made that clear. Then what is it? Terry pointed at him. And there is the question I can't answer. Not the nature of the experience, the purpose of it, nothing. Nor its possible applications. I can't tell you a thing. Only that it is vital to humanity. And that you will eventually know everything. Like in a good story, the mystery is part of the fun, don't you think? Just enjoy the ride. <laughs> you sound like my wife. 
Jem said, smiling. Terry rose and went over to him. She gathered up her dress and sat down on his lap. She ran her fingers through his hair and looked into his eyes. I love Crystal. I love you, Jem. You've been so important to me. You have no idea. From the very first moment I met you, you won my heart. I'm so glad that I can be myself here with you. She bent and kissed him. Her lips were soft. She smelled like perfume and all the sex from the night before. And he was thinking their morning was going to have a bunch of sex as well. He touched her hips and felt her breasts against him and felt her passion. This was a woman embracing life before age caught up with her and she lost everything. He felt the desperate need in her and he liked it. It was a fire. He'd known people who'd lost that fire. And it wasn't always age that extinguished it. Sometimes it was just life that did it. He'd known teenagers who were elderly inside. But not Terry Deem. She was dancing in the fires of life, sex, and adventure. She was a perfect fit for them. <laughs> Why don't you two get a room? Ruby said with a laugh. She and Crystal were there, dressed and holding their instruments. Crystal came over and touched both of their backs. <laughs> they have a room with us, Ruby. And oh my god, what is all that food? It looks so good. Okay, we are going to eat a quick breakfast because we have to get over to the dock market and set up our busking corner. We can't miss the morning rush. Miranda is going to print up flyers so we can pack the wet tail tonight. Terry laughed. <laughs> pack the wet tail? <laughs> That does sound lascivious, does it not? Very lascivious. Ruby grabbed some of the bacony sausage. But the morning rush is important. I want to see how Jem does out there. Your first day busking is always kind of interesting. Jem felt his heart fill his throat. Holy shit. Was he really going to play in front of strangers at a market? Yes, yes, he was, and he was going to try to enjoy every awkward second of it. Because this was his life, however odd. This was his life and lives, even strange lives, especially strange lives, were meant to be enjoyed. Chapter 27 Gems Market Set before they left the wet tail, Jem checked his phone. There weren't any messages from Mr. Oregon, but there were two new notifications on his Erebos app. Congratulations, participant. Your new skill, invulnerability, has been activated. Note, there are limits, magical in nature, that might affect this skill. Jem wasn't too surprised, because even invulnerable superheroes like the Hulk and Thor could be damaged if they face the right foe. The second message also wasn't surprising. Congratulations, participant. We detected two major encounters. You are, hidden percentages, closer to your next level. What were the two major encounters? One had to be having sex with Dr. Deem. The other was his first concert. And he was glad that it was categorized as a major encounter because it hadn't been easy. He told the women about the messages, and that they were closer than ever to leveling. They weren't exactly sure what that all meant, but they were going to embrace the fun. Crystal and Ruby turned on their phones, and they had similar messages. Then, they shut off their devices to conserve battery power. They were out the door and walking toward the dock market. All of them went, including Dr. Deem, who was as pretty as ever in her new dress. Ruby looked like a roguish pirate and Crystal looked like an innocent maiden in pantaloons. Jem was just in his normal clothes. Sticking out would be good. He wanted people to know he was from out of town. In the market, Jem could now pick out races by name. There were more Tuscalarians, but they were joined by blue-skinned fish people called the Pish Car. They wore sparkling gowns and carried barbed spears as well as swords. Unlike Miranda, who was supposedly a mermaid warrior queen, these did look like fish people. They had fins and everything. With them were some short, hairy men that were too skinny to be dwarves. Plus, they had horns like goats. 
They were known as the Hirsi, and they sold mostly produce. They had some purple citrus fruit that tasted exactly like oranges. There were some elves as well, along with some dog people who were their obvious servants. For whatever reason, the Monday dock market was the biggest day of the week and drew the most crowds. Jim was nervous, but Ruby found him a good corner and put a hat in front of him. She smiled at him. Play your favorite songs as best you can. Most people are going to ignore you. Some will throw money in your hat, and some will be assholes. Pro tip, ignore the assholes. Ruby, Crystal, and Terry were going to go hand out flyers and do a little shopping, but they'd be back to join him. Jim had to keep remembering that this wasn't real life. And yet all of it, the sights, the smells, the vendors shouting about their wares, felt so real. Jim was in the shade of a nearby fish vendor's awning. It was nice to be out of the heat, but the morning catch wasn't going to smell any better as the day progressed. He got warmed up, playing scales, his fingers dancing on the strings. He was very aware of people casting him glances, but they knew what was up. He was just another busker playing for his breakfast. Jem had his two perfected songs, Yesterday and Wish You Were Here, so he played both of those to get warmed up. He had another five songs in various stages. Two were Bon Jovi songs that he wasn't that big of a fan. Wanted, Dead or Alive, and Blaze of Glory were just cool songs. Country without being too country. He also had a couple of songs like I've Been Everywhere and Wanted Man that he knew from a Johnny Cash playlist he liked. Last but not least, he played Desperado by the Eagles. He needed stuff that was more up-tempo, but he wasn't good enough to play the fast stuff and he was trying to sing at the same time. He had zero interest in getting the lyrics right because no one on Far Wind would correct him. Like the night before, most people couldn't care less about some random busker. A few human sailors covered in tattoos with cutlasses at their side laughed at him, but they kept walking. Jem kept right on playing. He was surprised when two women in piecemeal chainmail tossed a couple of coppers into his hat. He figured this new experience was bound to give him at least a minor encounter and would put him that much closer to leveling. It was fun to play the same songs over and over in front of people because if he messed up for one group, he could try again for the next batch of people. And every time he played a song, he got better. The Fishmonger, a tall, thin old woman who seemed to have been selling fish there for centuries, kept smiling at him. Finally, she came over. She had a lot to say and a heavily accented voice, which sounded like she'd been making moonshine in a Kentucky holler. Good crackers, darling, but you do play that string box good. Those songs, though, no one ain't never heard of afore. How about you play Dirty Mary Done by Midnight, or Back Door to Heaven, or Johnny and Jenny? That last one is a sad one. It's about a man whose wife died, but she still visits him at night. And he don't know that she's dead until the end of the song. By this time, Ruby had come back to check on him. She saw that he was talking with the old woman while her servant, a dog man named Rexy, helped customers. Everything okay, Jim? Ruby asked. This kind woman is suggesting some songs to play, Jem said. I'm Adeline Sharkfin. I've been selling fish here for 50 years, and I always enjoy a good busker. And this boy ain't half bad. Playing all them strange songs ain't gonna feel that hat, though. Ruby grinned. I like playing popular songs. How about you sing some for us? Adeline nodded and grinned. You're damn right I will. I likes to sing. Nobody likes my voice, but I don't give a care. A woman my age with two dead husbands, nothing don't mean nothing. I'll sing ya, Dirty Mary Done by Midnight. Ruby got her guitar ready. Just sing the first verse in the chorus. Don't know what them words mean, but here I go. The old woman started to clap her fish stinky hands and her dress and blood-stained apron swung with the beat. She ended up singing the whole song. Dirty Mary Done by Midnight was about a party girl who had wowed a tavern full of sailors with promises of all sorts of sex acts. However, she never came through, swindled a fortune out of the patrons, and then disappeared. 
It wasn't clear if she'd been killed or not, or if she'd left town before her misdeeds caught up to her. Adeline Sharkfin sang hard, though she wasn't good. At all. Yet her squeaky, off-key voice made everyone happy. She drew a crowd and people were clapping along and singing. Ruby pulled out her phone, recorded that song, and the two others that Adeline knew by heart. Backdoor to Heaven was about a sinful woman who screwed her way through the pearly gates. Her kisses were so sweet, neither the angels nor saints minded. Lastly, Johnny and Jenny was a sad song. But also, body. If not downright pornographic, every night Johnny is visited by his wife Jenny, though she's gone in the morning. It went into detail about all the dirty things they did together, though the last verse was chilling. When Johnny finally asks his wife why every part of her is warm except for her hands, she tells him she's dead. She died in the doom. Jim wasn't sure if they should be wasting battery power recording the songs, but Ruby said this was going to be the secret to his success. The songs were infinitely catchy, interesting, and most of all, simple. Keeping songs simple was crucial and far more difficult than one might assume at first. One big Tuscalarian thundered laughter. <laughs> Adeline Sharkfin, teach this boy. He's playing these songs I don't know what they're about. But they ain't dirty. We like the dirty songs. Adeline bit her thumb at him. Oh, of course you do, Bobbo, because you Tuscalarians only do the dirty once a year. It's all that sexual frustration, as the more educated folks say. Crystal and Terry Deem came back and threaded their way through the crowd. Ruby waved them over. Perfect timing. I'm Ruby Ink, and this is Crystal Dream. We're Ink and Dream, and we're playing tonight at the Wet Tail. Bobbo grunted. Hmm, I heard you played music real good last night. Want a taste? Ruby asked. Terry had her frame drum. She started up a beat, and Crystal started her saxophone, and they played one of the songs from the night before, with Ruby on her guitar singing away. Jem took a step back and watched the women. They had something he'd never have. Beautiful faces, glowing with sweat and three pairs of glorious breasts. A few silver pieces wound up in that hat as well as a lot more copper. While Mrs. Sharkfin stood back to watch the seasoned musicians play. Jem found himself feeling a bit deflated. To think he'd thought giving himself the ultra-musicality skill would be unfair. But now he was thinking about doubling down on his music abilities because both Ruby and ACDC were right. It was a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll. After the impromptu concert, they passed out flyers. Both paid off. That night, the wet tail was packed. So much so that Miranda and Eddie had to turn people away. Ruby and the band played the same show as they had the night before, with basically the same results, though Ruby was working on changing that. She had a great idea to change Jem's songs to include places in Far Wind. That was what had happened with the old song, I've Been Everywhere. It had originally been an Australian song about places like Tullamore, Seymour, Lismore, and Mululaba. It had been changed to places in America, Reno, Chicago, Fargo, and Minnesota. Ruby also wanted to replace the geography of Wanted Man, which also included a list of places. He was a wanted man in Carolina. He was wanted in St. Paul, etc. That night, after the concert, Ruby got a whole bunch of the working girls to help her come up with different geographical places they could use for the two songs. A lot of the girls were local, but many came from all over the continent. Ruby also wanted Jem to really master the three Port Aiden songs but it was going to take a few days to nail them down. And he had some other nailing to do. Now that Dr. Terry Deem had been with them, she wanted to do everything with them, every single sex act possible. Jem and Crystal were up for anything. Ruby was as well. Adding a woman added a whole new dimension to their lovemaking, especially for Crystal, who had a thing for older women. One of the things Crystal liked best was to get on her hands and knees with her face between Terry's legs. Jem took her from behind. Ruby then sat on Dr. Deem's face. Another thing that Jem loved was having sex with the women while they 69 with each other. 
He liked looking down to see Crystal's mouth on Terry's clit while he thrust in and out of the older woman. The orgasms they had were thunderous. That night, Jem wasn't surprised to find they all leveled. They'd had three new minor encounters, the sex with Terry Deem, the busking, and the concert, which had rocked the entire dock almost literally. There had been a crowd outside of the wet tail who danced to the music being played inside. Miranda was looking to add a food and drink cart outside, but the real solution was finding a bigger venue. For now, though, the wet tail was going to work just fine. They could play in the market during the day to drum up business, and then at the wet tail at night for free room and food. They also got 5% of all the money the wet tail made during their shows. It was a nice source of income. Ruby had negotiated up from 2%. Miranda wasn't exactly happy about that. Gem and Crystal were level 5 now. Ruby was level 4. They debated the new skills they wanted to add. Gem added singing to his skill set. Ruby added a marksmanship ability, so she'd be a dead shot with her revolver. She was seeing the benefits of using her gun more than her sword. Shooting monsters was easier than stabbing them. As for Crystal, she wasn't sure what to add, and so she went with songwriting. Focusing on music seemed to be the logical choice at this point. The system said Crystal would have to have a teacher. Ruby was the perfect choice. Ruby had been writing songs for most of her life. Ruby would also act as Jem's voice coach. She was going to be doing double duty for a while. Jem spent some time with his phone, trying to find information on Dr. Terry Deem. Yeah, it drained the battery, but he was trying to figure out if the scientist could level up to get new skills. However, he couldn't find Dr. Deem in the app. Terry wasn't surprised. She'd had to keep her presence hidden for any number of reasons, one of which was the illicit sex they were having. Terry was rather shocked about one thing, however. The AI that was building far wind around them had come up with culture, history, and even original songs that were catchy without a doubt. Dirty Mary Done by Midnight sounded like an old Irish folk song that would have fit in with both Molly Malone and the Wild Rover. It took four days to practice, but by that Friday, Jem was ready to try out his new material. He had five new songs he could play perfectly. The Johnny Cash songs with the updated geography and the three popular songs that Adeline Sharkfin had sung. It all came together on that Friday when he was at his corner across from Adeline's stall. The fish was particularly odiferous that day. That was when Jem got his first look at Lady Natala. It wasn't some random character generated by the AI. No, it was Natalie Mirage. And she was looking at Jem with definite interest in her eyes. Chapter 28 Lady Natala's Tea Jem had heard rumors that Lady Natala would be visiting the dock market to hear the musicians taking the city by storm. When he saw the stately, dark-skinned woman, tall, slender, and muscled, wearing a red gown, walking with an armed retinue of rock-skinned warriors, a race called the Stanen, Jem knew the wrong move was to head over. He had to play the part of traveling minstrel until they could figure out if Lady Natala knew she was Natalie Mirage, one half of Nat and Nikki. So Jem just had to follow his plan and play the damn songs. Like before, Crystal, Ruby, and Terry were passing out flyers and talking to people. Under Lady Natala's watchful eyes, Jem started playing. He knew the three new songs perfectly, and they'd even added some verses to make them a little longer. Crystal had some ideas for other songs with similar themes, and she flexed her new songwriting ability working on them. But first, Jem wanted to have a positive experience with this music stuff. He was beginning to think it had been a mistake to waste his precious minutes in the Erebos experience on something that was proving to be harder than killing a god. Jem jumped right into the Mary song. Right away, the results were different than they had been. People came over to listen, and they were smiling as he belted out the lyrics, using breathing techniques Ruby had taught him. 
People were laughing, clapping, and yes, singing along, until he got to the new verse that Crystal had helped add. It was one more verse of Mary promising all sorts of nasty things to the sailors in the tavern. When he was done singing the chorus twice, the copper pieces jangled into his hat. It was the glorious sound of victory. Jem started the next song, and he found himself lost in the music. The swell of the energy of the crowd, the tapping boots, the smiles on faces. There was head bobbing, and even some dancing. Even when he switched to his two geography songs, I've Been Everywhere and Wanted Man, he had the crowd's full attention. A merchant in a turban nodded. Yes, I've been to my malice too, and Junsun is my hometown. He tossed a silver piece into Jem's hat. Lady Natala walked closer. She wore a tall red hat that had a wide brim, though it was more crown than hat. She nodded at him. So, you are Gemstone. Hello, Gemstone. She spoke in a different voice than Natalie Merchant had. It was far more proper, and every letter was pronounced. Jem didn't know where the nickname came from, Gemstone, but he'd just go along with it. Sure, Gemstone. Gem and his jewels. Or maybe you know us by the name of my wives, Ink and Dream. The woman nodded. Yes. I can hardly be seen at one of the dock taverns, but you have won my curiosity. I'm something of a musician myself. Jem cocked his head. Why did that sound like a meme? We'd love to do a show for you and the queen in the palace. <laughs> I bet you would. More laughter followed. Was that a slight American accent spilling through? I've heard many rumors of you. I was impressed. She snapped her fingers. One of her Stainen guards hurried forward and tossed two gold coins into his hat. So how can we get to play a show at the palace? Jem asked. Because if you liked my set, I think you'd love the Ink and Dream. Your wives, the lady said. She had some light makeup on, which reddened her cheeks and made them sparkle. Her eye makeup made her eyes pop. So you have two wives? Three, actually, he said with a grin. The drummer is my wife as well. What's her name? Jem had to think on his feet. Sari Dream. So it would be Ink and Dreams. Lady Natala gave him a questioning look. It seems you have your own harem, and that way you and the queen are similar. But then you can't possibly have the same kind of harem she has. Queen Oasis, yes, I've heard about her, uh... Desires. Jem shrugged. But you make it sound so mysterious. The Queen of Chains has a lot of mystery surrounding her, the lady agreed. I am honored to be her best friend and confidant. Let me tell you, she has any number of beautiful women at her disposal. I've even tasted some myself. And boy, they're as sweet as honey. Again. Jem wondered if this wasn't Natalie Merchant playing the part of Lady Natala. Well, milady, I suppose I'm lucky to have a harem at all, since I'm not a king or anything. I'm just a traveling adventurer. So you do things other than play music? The woman asked. Adventuring, yeah. Jem said. We've killed some monsters. We've freed some people. I might have killed a god at one point. <laughs> Did you really? The lady asked with eyebrows arched. And you're not just bragging, are you? Jem saw what role this woman wanted him to play. He'd play it. He didn't care. Not just bragging. I killed an ocean god. I turned his heart to dust. Well, first his leg and then his heart. We know some magic. Why do you ask? I have a bit of a problem, and I was wondering if you could take care of it. What do you know of the city? Not much, Jem admitted. This was feeling like a side quest. However, sometimes side quests were critical to the main quest. Working for Lady Natala might be a way into the palace. The lady kept talking. During the time of the doom, Port Aiden was the most important city in Far Wind. 
But afterwards, the world was a dark place for a long time, and Aiden lost some of its importance. Jem remembered that Mr. Oregon wanted him to ask about the doom. Now was his chance. Tell me more about the doom. I'm not a hundred percent sure I know what it is. Lady Natala gave him a curious look. Everyone knows about the doom. How could you not? Stranger from a strange land. The royal woman glanced around. I will be having tea in the water gardens this afternoon. Why don't you and your wives join me? We can discuss how you might be able to win my trust and that of the queen. Jem had heard of the water gardens. Many considered it to be the most beautiful part of the city. I'd like to see the gardens. What time? They agreed on 3.30 p.m. She'd send one of her carriages to pick them up at the dock market. Also, she gave him a written invitation in an envelope that would get him inside the gardens, since it was only for royalty and wealthy people. That would allow Jem to do another set, since the first one went so well. He found that he liked the attention of the crowd, especially the women. More than that, he liked the energy of the people. It was this happy feeling that he felt, and he knew they felt it too. It was like this agreement between them. He would play his best, and they would respond. In some ways, it felt like sunlight, available for all. His wives came back at the very end, as people applauded and threw more money into his hat. They bought some smoked fish sticks, actual smoked fish on actual sticks, from Mrs. Sharkfin. They paid her double to thank her for unlocking the secret of their three popular songs. Crystal was so excited to have afternoon tea with royalty. They bathed in their room, put on fresh clothes, and hurried back to the dock market. An afternoon fog had rolled in, so it was nice and cool. The carriage picked them up, a real carriage pulled by four white horses. It took about half an hour to get to the water gardens, which were outside of the palace walls, but near the northern mountain. It was a guarded section of town. They definitely needed Lady Natala's invitation to get in. However, once through the gate, there were green trees and fountains everywhere, as well as a waterfall that tumbled down off the mountain to be captured in any number of canals and basins. Flower beds perfumed the air. Along with the blossoms, there were balcony restaurants here and there. They went to Sebastian's Roses, one of the best places to eat in the city. They sat next to a canal underneath a leafy tree. The air temperature was perfect and moist. Lady Natala's guard stood nearby. After introductions were made, Jem and the women sat down. Tea and pastries were brought by cat girls in uniforms. The tea was the rich concoction they'd gotten used to. Lady Natala smiled at their scientist, who only had three days left before she had to leave. So, Terry Dream or Terry Deem? I thought it might be Terry Deem. She's a famous physician. Terry blushed. No, ma'am. I'm a simple musician. Jem said we were adventurers, but I can assure you I'm not. You've been adventurous in bed with us. Crystal said, waggling her eyebrows. The scientist looked scandalized. Oh my gosh! Please, Crystal, let's keep the things we do in private, private. It's okay, Doctor, Crystal said. I think I've heard rumors that Lady Natala is kind of kinky. Or maybe that's too shocking to say. Lady Natala had a small grin on her face. No, I have my appetites and desires. You aren't wrong there. I told Jem that I've even sampled some of the Queen's harem. I do enjoy ladies. And the occasional man, if I find him worthy. Her eyes went to Jem. There was lust there. Jem is worthy. Crystal held her hands apart as if measuring him. About that much worthy. <laughs> And thick. Mm, perhaps I might make my way down to the wet tail after all, the lady said. But first, I need a favor. I was telling Jem about the doom. 
It nearly destroyed our world. Sorcerers from Rogara found forbidden magic that brought fire to rain down from the sky. Other sorcerers found the same magic, and they meant to destroy Rogara, and so the world was covered in fire. What followed was a sky full of ash. It was called the Long Ash Winter. It was only because of a wizard, far smarter than the Rogara sorcerers, that anyone survived. He hid the survivors of the doom in ancient magic caves, underneath the earth, until it was safe to come out. Ruby listened carefully, but she had to laugh. <laughs> it was the doom that killed Jenny, like in the song Johnny and Jenny. Isn't that right? You are correct, the lady said. It's such a sad song, though I always wondered why Johnny didn't celebrate that his wife would come back to him every night. Yes, her hands were exceedingly cold, but she was warm where it counted. Death puts a damper on things, Jem said. Okay, so let me guess. These magical caves are still under Port Aiden, and you want us to go down there. What are we going down there for? For a golden relic, a priceless statue of a beautiful woman. The queen has sent her soldiers down into the depths of the city, but they never returned. I've sent a retinue of my Stainen guards, with the same results. There are monsters in dark places of the world, from before the doom. Surely if you've killed a god, you can kill a few ancient demons. You told them about King Theo? Ruby asked, flabbergasted. Crystal waved all that away. Sure, Jem can kill gods. We'll be fine going down into these magic caves. Not worried about that. I am wondering if part of our reward can be a little visit from you to our room in the wet tail. You know, a little conversation, a little kissing, some tea. Ruby rolled her eyes. <laughs> Don't let her fool you. Kissing is not just kissing with her. I mean, you can say no to her, but she's oddly persuasive. And that was without her seduction magic. Lady Natala's eyes were all over Crystal. Oh, so you are a hoory. I can see that. I would like to have a little conversation and kissing, though I do like to rule over my subjects, in and out of my bedroom. I can't very well consider you commoners, however, not with how uncommon you all seem. We're totally and completely and irrevocably special, Crystal said loudly. This is so much fun! We're going to do a dungeon dive? N not tonight, though. And you have to promise to make sure our show tomorrow night is full, since we won't be busking in the Docktown Market. Let's do the dungeon thing tomorrow. We'll grab your magical statue, but it's not like going to unleash an evil that will destroy the world, right? Lady Natala laughed a little. <laughs> you are a joy, Crystal Dream. Your name is very well chosen. Tomorrow morning, yes, I will have a carriage waiting for you at the Dock Market like we did today. I can get you close to where we lost our last group of Dungeoneers, and so you will be closer to the trouble as well as the reward. Do we have a deal? Uh, kind of, Ruby said. You know, we're here for a definite reason. Should we ask her? I think we should ask her. Terry nodded. Yes, milady. We're looking for our friend, Elsie Dorrance. She's a rich woman, very haughty, with red hair and freckles. Do you know of anyone like that? Lady Natala shook her head. I know all the rich women in Port Aiden. Some of them I know intimately. I think I would have remembered this rich, ginger-headed woman if I were to have met her. Jem wasn't sure he believed her. The royal woman sipped her tea and put it down on her saucer. Mm. I am sorry for your friend. I can ask around. But first, I would like to come to an understanding. If you rescued this ancient relic, I would pay you handsomely. I do have pull with the Queen of Chains. I could win you a spot on the stage at the upcoming spring feast and festival. 
We'd love to play the feast and festival, Crystal said. But we don't need money. We'd just like you to come to our show and our suite. <laughs> Would that be possible? Ruby laughed. <laughs> You're shameless. Terry was speechless. Lady Natala smiled. To your suite? Yes. But it will have to be under the cover of darkness. Perhaps I can witness your show from a private location, offering complete anonymity. Yes, I would enjoy that, I think. I would enjoy that a great deal. Those eyes went from Jem, to Crystal, to Ruby, to Terry, and then back to Jem. If I do indulge my desires, I would want to be your queen in your room. I would be the queen, and yet, I would want a king by my side. Would you be that king for me, Gemstone? He nodded. It would be my pleasure. Jem couldn't help but chuckle at his own joke. It would be his pleasure. Without a doubt. Chapter 29 Their First Dungeon Dive Saturday morning, Lady Natala and her staining guard took Jem and the gang to the entrance of what she called the Doom Caves. It was in the oldest part of Port Aiden on the south side, where the streets were narrow and the houses stacked on top of one another. Lady Natala's captain had to unlock several big iron gates to get them to the steps that led down through crumbling hallways to the natural caverns below. He'd also given them some dungeoneering supplies in a backpack, some torches, flint and steel, iron spikes and two kinds of rope, one that glowed and one that was jet black. The glowing rope could be used as a light source. Jim had wanted Terry to stay at the wet tail, but the scientist had refused. She wanted to see monsters in person. She also said something about wanting to see how the AI handled non-human NPCs, though they had plenty of experience with that, given the different races they'd seen in Port Aiden. Spend five minutes talking with Precious and you knew the AI handled non-human entities perfectly. Jem and Ruby were worried Terry might get hurt. Crystal wasn't, though. She maintained that the whole thing was a simulation anyway, and the worst thing that might happen was that Terry would wake up earlier than she had planned. Terry said that abrupt changes in consciousness could be problematic for participants, though they normally weren't fatal. Normally. Jem figured that meant there had been at least one fatality. He was going to keep Terry safe. All of his wives would. They'd left their instruments back in their room. Now they had their weapons. Jem walked with his bident held high. He'd wrapped the length of the glow rope around the handle near the tines of the fork. Crystal walked behind him. She wore glow ropes as bracelets. Then came Terry, who had bought some light chain mail armor and a shield along with a short sword. She tied glow rope around her shield. Ruby had chosen black leather armor, reinforced with lacquered plates. Neither Jem nor Crystal were wearing armor. They were just going to run the dungeon in jeans. Lady Natala wasn't about to hang out in that part of town. Instead, her captain of the guard would stay to secure the statue and to escort them back to Docktown. Jem crept down the cracked stone steps as water dripped around them. The staircase took them to a corridor that was half caved in. Someone had reinforced the ceiling with old wooden beams, though the place was creaking under the weight of the city above them. Terry laughed nervously. <sighs> well, I guess I'm dressed for combat, but not a cave-in. Let's, uh, proceed quickly. I'll be happier once we're in the caves themselves. We should be safe, right? Moans from the darkness disagreed with her. Moans, groans, a shriek, then insane laughter. Crystal laughed along with the sounds. <laughs> I'm going to love shooting whatever is making those noises. She'd found fuzzy earmuffs in a stall selling winter clothes. She would put them on to protect her ears from the noise of the gunfire in the enclosed space. It wasn't going to be quiet. Jem figured they'd all have a headache before the day was over. They slowly made their way underneath the wooden beams, which creaked precariously. Dust drifted down. More stairs took them to the natural cavern, a crack that went deep down into the bedrock of the world. 
A wooden staircase had been built on the side. Rusted steel anchors kept it from crashing down. Neither the wood nor the rust gave them much confidence. Jem tried the stairs first, and they held his weight. The whole staircase creaked and popped, sending his heart into his throat. The girls followed. Those precarious steps took them down to a landing. And that's where they met the first of the monsters. There were two skeletons in corroded armor holding rusted pole arms. Both shrieked laughter when they saw them. They moved with unnerving speed and agility. They clambered up the steps. Watching the dead things move was both fascinating and unnerving. They really were there, running a dungeon with actual skeletons. Jim leaned to the side and put his hands over his ears. Crystal put a bullet hole through their helmets and skulls, but they kept coming. Muzzle flashes dazzled them as the hammering gunfire thundered throughout the cavern. Well, whatever monsters were down here would now be on high alert. Crystal adjusted her aim and chose exploding bullets. She blew the legs off one skeleton and blew the top off the other. The legless skeleton ended up tumbling off the steps. The other one slid against the wall and tried to crawl toward them. Jem saw the problem right away. Let me take the lead. One miss and those explosive bullets might take out the staircase. We don't want that. It was a long way down. Jem stabbed the half of a skeleton and reduced him to dust. One down, a bunch more to go. Other skeletons were racing toward them on the stairs. A few had old bows, but their rotten arrows bounced off Jem's skin. His invulnerability skill was working. He dusted two skeletons right off the bat, ducked a rusted axe, and dusted another one. He did take a sword thrust to his belly, but it slid off without breaking the skin. It did hurt, though. Jem cleared the stairs easily. He could only imagine what his phone would say about the encounter. This was minor and... kind of fun. Even better, the dusted skeletons had a sweet smell to them, kind of like a musky perfume. It was nice. They continued until the stairs leveled off to a walkway that was missing boards. It was a bit of a game to jump from one section to another. They helped Terry, who had her shield slung over her back and her sword sheathed. She was sweating. <sighs> Good thing I did my high-intensity interval training to get through this. Your muscles aren't real, Jem pointed out. Crystal sighed. <sighs> no, her muscles are real. I love her big thighs. I love licking them. Terry blushed. Now, Mrs. Creed, let's keep it professional, at least for now. I'll let you lick them tonight. Crazy fucking bitches. Ruby cursed. She had her sword sheathed at her side, but she was carrying snake bite. From the glowing blue of the barrel, she had her ice bullets all loaded up and ready to go. Crystal had switched up ammo. Her magazine glowed red with flame rounds. Down below. At the center of the ravine ran a river of black water. They came to a place in the walkway where they could take a ladder carved out into the rock itself down to the water. Or they could go forward into more rooms filled with monsters and more loot. The thing was, the statue they wanted was in the crystal cavern at the heart of the Doom Cave. Or so Lady Natala had said. She'd mentioned the intersection, since her people had made it past the skeletons before. We go down from here. Jem pulled out his phone and put his Bident into an Inventex slot. He saw the notification that he'd had some minor encounters. Ready for the ladder? Good thing no one here is scared of heights, right? Terry asked. I don't love them. Ruby sighed. So, uh, this is going to be interesting. She holstered Snakebite on her side. She slung her sword belt over her shoulder so it dangled off her back. Jem went first again, though he'd not be able to fight with his Bident if they ran into trouble. He'd just have to take it on the chin. That wouldn't be so bad because his chin was so tough. He did feel exposed as he climbed down, however, the fall wouldn't kill him. It would, however, hurt a bunch. That sword thrust hadn't felt too good. There was a shriek of something flying through the cavern, a shriek of many things. It set him on edge. Winging their way were giant bats the size of men. Their wings were full of holes. The AI in the Erebos experience must have a bat fetish, because they'd fought bat-like men before. These were man-like bats, but undead. 
They stank like cemetery sewage. They fluttered toward them on the ladder. One monster got close. Ruby's snake bite boomed. The creature turned to ice and fell to the underground river below. The gunshot was loud, but it wasn't as loud as the rat a tat tat of Crystal's barrage. Tim's wife held the ladder with one hand and fired her rifle with the other. Fire rounds either burned the bats out of the air or turned their wings to ash. The fire bullets were so pretty in the darkness, looking almost like Star Wars blaster bolts. Ruby's revolver boomed seven more times. The cylinders turned with every shot, but it wasn't like she had to reload. The undead bats were soon either fried or frozen. They were no longer in danger. And yes, Jem heard his phone ding with an Erebos app notification. Another minor encounter under their belt. He figured all of these would be minor encounters. They descended the rest of the way until they reached the platform above the river. They heard the roar of rapids down the way that followed a hallway in the rock. The scent of the river cutting through the rocks filled the air. It was wet and cold. Far colder than Jem would have thought. He was envious of Ruby and Terry in their armor. Crystal had her hands near her magazine, which was glowing red. Nice to have a heater with me. Jem had an idea. He got a torch out of the backpack and lit it. He also pulled his biodent out of his Inventex slot. Okay, Zeus, hand me decay. The torch's flame made him feel a bit warmer, though that was just psychological. The cave systems chill air when bone deep. He was kind of jealous of Crystal's earmuffs. They walked through a passage on a ledge above the river. The walls were full of sculptures that showed the doom. Jem lifted the torch higher to get a better look. Yes, it did look like the sky was raining fire. People ran screaming as the world was destroyed. Everything was in ruins. Then darkness followed, during which people starved to death because there was no food. It was amazing that anyone survived at all. They moved into the caves that looked pretty magical. From the artwork, it seemed that the people were even happy there until the skies cleared and they left the caverns to rebuild cities and towns. All that looks horrible, Crystal said. Jem nodded. There were cloaked figures, which had to be the sorcerers who helped cause the apocalypse. And yet, when the people ran into the caves, there was a figure in pants, a shirt, and what looked like a mask, not unlike the mask that Captain Reaper had worn. Stranger, though. The masked figure then split into two people. One larger and cloaked, but in that same mask, and it seemed the pair of them created the magical caves. Jem couldn't look away. Something about that masked sorcerer and his bigger cloaked friend spoke to him on some deep level. With them was a musician who gripped a guitar. All three looked heroic. Ruby pointed to the musician. It was a woman in a dress. So at least they had music in the magical caves. That's something. The center of the caves looks like a temple or a tomb, maybe. Mm, something. Terry gestured at the temple. The goddess who lives there looks very important. It's beautiful, don't you think? And striking because this art was generated by the Erebos AI for this quest. Jem thought that good old Erebos was doing a great job. The artwork and the narrative were a nice touch. They heard a roar deeper in the dungeon. It was part scream part thunder. It almost sounded like Godzilla. It had that same world-ending sound. Crystal laughed. <laughs> oh, that's good sound design. Sounds scary, right? Am I wrong? No, I'm not wrong. So, I think Lady Natala's other troops got taken out by the undead bats. But if they did survive the ladder climb of Vertigo, then that beast in there probably put them down for good. Terry shook her head. I'm regretting coming. No! Crystal shouted. You would have missed getting all scared. And the artwork. The artwork is super duper impressive. Ruby frowned. Okay, so let's get this fucking over with. If we kill the big demon beast thing, then we can go through the upper rooms to find more loot. I think I like the looting part of Dungeon Dives and not the fighting. I loved shooting those bats. Crystal said. It's nice not to reload. And the bullets are like the 4th of July. <laughs> Ruby had finally lightened up. I can see that. 
Crystal likes all kinds of fireworks. You do love life. Crystal's smile was a mile wide. You bet I do. Okay, gonna kill the monster, gonna have some fun. Let's go do this thing. Jem turned to the women. Stay behind me. I don't want you getting hurt. <laughs> Funny, Ruby said. I don't want you getting hurt either. So yeah, no getting hurt. Jem threw Terry a worried look. You okay, Dr. Deem? She was sweating, but she nodded. <sighs> this is all very realistic. I am rather surprised at how visceral it all is. You know, I rather looked down on the participants for not understanding they were living in a virtual world. Now I realize, if I didn't know better, I too would lose myself in the illusion. There is no difference between reality and the Erebos experience. It really is remarkable. That's one word for it, Ruby hissed. Another is really, really, really fucked up. Crystal rolled her eyes. Come on, people. Let's go slay a dragon. How do you know it's a dragon? Jem asked. Crystal shrugged. Mm, it sounds like a dragon. And look, if I get the dungeon and not the dragon, I'll be very disappointed. That made them all laugh. Jem kind of hoped it would be a dragon as well. Everyone should slay a dragon at some point in their lives. Chapter 30 The Doom Cave's Relic The hallway led to the massive crystal cavern. It was well named. It was a huge cavern with crystals everywhere. White crystals, purple crystals, some massive crystals like mountains, and other slender and sharp crystals like spears. The crystals seemed to have grown over old stone houses and small castles in the massive room. It was a mile long and probably a half mile wide, and the ceiling was impossibly high. It was like a whole world under the city. Jim wasn't sure they'd gone down that deep, but they must have. Although, it wasn't as if the Erebos experience had to obey the laws of physics and geometry. They heard the roar of the beast again, and the crystals shimmered as the sound waves hit them. The result was beautiful and dramatic. Out of one of the buildings charged more skeletons but the bones of these poor bastards were covered in quartz. Their weapons were also weighed down with the mineral. That added extra spikes to their spears. They hurled them at Jem and he knocked them away. He chucked his torch to the side and started to advance with the decay in his hands. Crystal stopped him. Hold up, sweetie. I think I have the perfect weapon to take out these guys. She looked so cute wearing her earmuffs. She switched the Ares rifle to use the explosive rounds. They struck the skeletons and blasted them to pieces, one after another. The rifle's report wasn't as loud in the vast cavern, yet the sound vibration sent colors sweeping across the landscape. The scintillations lit up the place. More skeletons charged them, and arrows poured down. Terry managed to block the missiles with her shield. Jem got hit a few times, but they didn't pierce his invulnerability. Ruby was firing snakebite, with one hand under the butt to provide support. She was using her ice bullets, which froze the skeletons in place. She'd wait until they got close before icing them up. Jem could then dust the skeletons with a stab of his bident. They smelled as good as the skeletons on the stairs. The air was soon filled with bone and crystal dust. Another roar rocked the chamber again. This one was the loudest yet. The reverberations cracked off a huge finger of amethyst, sending it shattering to the floor. The music of the destruction was followed by the appearance of the creature. It was a skeletal dragon, which matched the theme of the Doom Caves, all right. And yet, its wings were made of rose quartz, as was the thing's skull. Both the wings and the skull glowed with a pink energy as the great worm took flight. It let out another scream. The various minerals gleamed. Crystal laughed brazenly. Is the light show just pretty, or does it have more strategic importance? We're about to find out. I'm just wondering what kind of breath attack this thing has, Jem murmured. The skeletal dragon soared down, coming straight at them. Terry stood behind him. He could feel her shaking. She was terrified. Ruby wasn't firing. She was too shocked. She stood mouth open, eyes wide. What in the actual fuck? 
Underneath the beast marched another legion of the crystal-covered skeletons. Speaking of crystals, Crystal Creed, also known as Crystal Dream, stood in front of them, opening fire. Round after round pounded into the chest of the dragon. The fire bullets did no damage. Neither did her ice rounds. Her armor-piercing bullets went right through the bone, but didn't seem to do a thing. But her explosive rounds hurt the thing. It screamed in pain as it flew through the explosions. But it wasn't like they were stopping it or causing it much damage. When it was in range, the thing opened its big crystal jaws and exhaled a mass of lavender crystals that struck the ground, throwing debris. A good-sized piece struck Jem's cheek with a sting. Another one hit Ruby in the side and she was sent spinning back. The crystalline breath then found Jem's wife. She winced in pain as the initial blast tried to kill her, but her invulnerability held. She did end up being covered in the purple minerals, completely covered, completely trapped. The dragon soared over them and wheeled around, coming in for another attack. The skeletons thundered across the stone floor, coming for them. Ruby took out the initial wave with her explosive bullets, shooting over and over. Meanwhile, Terry went out to engage one of the skeletons that broke through. Her sword hacked through bone, but it didn't do much damage. Terry's shield then saved her life. It was clear, though, Terry wasn't going to be much help in combat. Luckily, Ruby was there to ice up the skeleton attacking them. Jem carefully used decay to touch his wife's crystalline cage. All that amethyst vanished into dust. The smell of lavender filled the air. The blonde woman in earmuffs stepped forward, looking relieved and a bit scared. Jem felt the anger hit him. That motherfucking dragon freaked out his wife. Well, there was only one response to that. It needed to die. You help Ruby with the skeletons. The dragon is mine to slay! Crystal nodded and started hitting the skeleton army with her explosive rounds. It was like an automatic grenade launcher. There was the bullet's initial explosion, and then there was the debris of the quartz. Every bullet took out groups of the undead, two, three, four, five of the skeletons at once. Jem glanced around and saw a temple-like structure. He was reminded of the temple from the statues in the hallway. This was similar in some ways, but it clearly wasn't the same. Jem didn't much care. He needed to get high because the dragon wasn't going to come in low. Jem sprinted over to the temple. He saw that the crystals made a kind of staircase. This was like in a video game where the designers hid the path you needed to take to kill the boss. Jem scrambled up the crystal steps and got onto the roof. He was going to put his invulnerability to the test. The dragon soared down, but this time Crystal was ready. When he opened his mouth to breathe more of his crystalline death on them, she sent a dozen exploding bullets into his mouth. They stopped that breath attack in its tracks then soared down the cavern and right past Jem on the temple. He leapt off and felt gravity grab him. He plummeted toward the dragon as it slithered through the air around him. He didn't need to kill the thing on the first strike, but he did need to ground it. He slammed Decay into the dragon's quartz wing, which turned to dust. Jem then struck the ground like a ton of bricks. It felt like every bone in his legs wanted to shatter. But the important thing? He didn't even break a toe. No. But he did knock the wind out of himself. He staggered up, trying to breathe. He was out of the fight for a second. At the same time, he had the satisfaction of watching the one-winged dragon do a face plant into a building. There was a storm of destruction. Building debris, crystal fragments, and even some bone rained down. Pieces of the dragon had come loose and clattered down around Jem. Behind him? Crystal and Ruby were slaying skeletons with every bullet they fired. In front of him, the dragon charged, mouth open, breathing crystal pieces. Jem held decay out in front of him. Anything that came near turned to dust. The dragon didn't have eyes, but Jem could have sworn the beast had a moment of existential crisis right before it brought its fanged mouth down to bite Jem in half. With a stab, Jem disintegrated the lower jaw first. He then brought the fork, two-handed, against the rose quartz lip of the beast. The entire skull went whoosh. Suddenly, Jem couldn't see. He could hardly breathe. Unlike the skeleton warriors, the skeleton dragon stank. 
It smelled like mothballs and football locker rooms. The dragon wasn't killed by the loss of its head, but it was blinded. It started storming around, smashing things and trying to blindly strike out at anything it could kill. A sweep of its tail took out dozens of the skeletons. The remaining wing took out the side of the temple and showed what was inside. A golden statue sitting on an altar with any number of chests surrounding it. Jem was grateful for the help. Good dragon. He took out that massive tail first, followed by one leg and then another. The dragon flopped around on its remaining wing until Jem took that. What was left was a twitching spinal column that Jem found annoying, so he destroyed that as well. The job was done. The dragon was dead. Crystal Ruby and a very happy Terry Deem hurried up to him. They all had smiles on their faces. Jem shrugged. No big whoop. <laughs> Killed the dragon. Found the treasure. We're good. Crystal high-fived him. <laughs> we are good. This place is awesome. Ruby came over and caressed Crystal's hair. Are you okay, baby? I think when you got trapped in the pretty purple gem stuff, you got a little scared. Crystal held her finger and thumb a quarter inch apart. Eh, that was freaky, granted. I couldn't breathe for a second, and I was like, does invulnerability mean I don't need oxygen, or can lack of air kill me? Also, what about lightning? And what about diseases? I mean, shouldn't invulnerability work with viruses as well as swords? Jem glanced at Terry. She winced. I have no idea. But I would think so. The Erebos experience is supposed to be the most pleasurable experience one can imagine. This is a place of happiness and victory, not one of sickness and death. Jem thought of the doom, and wondered why the AI had created such a dark backstory. Well, it did make the world richer. And it wasn't like they were living through the doom. It was probably just good world building. Inside the temple, they opened the chests to find them full of gold, gems, and jewels. Getting them out was going to be a bear. Unless... Jem knew that a lot of gaming systems stopped you from packing your inventory slots with a single item that contained multiple items. Generally, it was a one-to-one -one relationship, not one-to-many. In the Erebos experience, in Farwind... The code made it easy on him. He was able to put an entire chest in a single slot. Crystal and Ruby turned on their phones to load up their Inventex system with loot. Terry went to pick up the statue. Jem stopped her. Hold up. There could be traps on the altar. He got everyone back and then picked up the statue. No traps. Jem took a long look at the golden statue. It was of a woman, wearing a pretty gown that showed her little chest. She did have nice nipples, though, and a nice round butt. Crystal noticed. So she was hot, whoever she was. Jem agreed. Maybe Lady Natala knows who it was. We can ask her, once we get out of here. Crystal set the Ares rifle on her shoulder. <sighs> First, we clear out those rooms we skipped. We killed the boss, but I'm having too much fun not to go after the bosslings. Bosslings are not a thing, Ruby said. You're just making shit up. Jem laughed. <laughs> she is, but I agree with Crystal. Let's see what other loot we can find. Terry laughed. <laughs> I can certainly see how this can be addicting. I can scarcely breathe, I'm so excited. Crystal waggled her eyebrows. <laughs> that is exactly what I like to hear from a gorgeous milf in armor. Jem had to give his wife a hug and a kiss. He loved her adventurous spirit. He loved her dirty mind. He just loved her so much with everything he had inside of him. They left the dragon's lair to take care of the easier parts of the dungeon, which turned out to be easy indeed. Jem had fun in the dungeon, but he was looking forward to the show that night. He was going to play with Ink and Dream. He couldn't wait. With any luck, Lady Natala would be there. It would be Terry's last night in Far Wind. Or so they thought. Chapter 31 The Band's Performance Saturday night, Jem walked up onto the stage for a set, which was right in the middle of Ink and Dream. Ruby, Crystal, and Terry had the house warmed up. The place was packed, 
and Lady Natala was there in a private room above the bar. He could see her half-hidden through a window. Everyone had come to hear the daring versions of the three most popular songs in town. Ruby and Crystal hadn't played them. No, everyone was waiting for Jem Stone to take the stage. He wasn't going to disappoint them. He felt the energy of the crowd, the breathlessness as he walked across the stage. He could have played them alone, like he'd done in the dock market, but he knew the songs were better with Ruby and Crystal joining in at just the right parts. Also, Terry's drumming filled out the sound. He heard people whispering his name. Gemstone. Gemstone. That's Gemstone. That's Gemstone. He's the one who sang in the market. He's a gift from the gods, he is. Oh, he is. Jem grinned at the crowd, and then his eyes went upstairs to their special secret guest. He could see Lady Natala up there. She'd taken the statue from them and promised there would be quite the spectacle at the spring feast concerning that statue. Jem didn't know what it was, but he was curious. He kind of had the idea that it would come alive and some beautiful goddess would be unleashed. He only hoped it wasn't some goddess of evil. If it was... They'd have to destroy her. That would be okay. Just another fun adventure. Lady Natala hadn't asked about any of the other treasures they found. And they'd found a lot. They'd killed roomfuls of ghouls, but there hadn't been much in those other passages. The real treasure chest had been in the Crystal Cavern. They'd come away with ten big diamonds, an emerald necklace, three ruby rings that may or may not be magical, and over five hundred gold pieces. That made them rich in Port Aiden. Jem liked being rich. A lot. Jem gazed out at the crowd. An equal number of men and women, of all races and ages. There were poor sailors just off the boat. There were several royals from far-off kingdoms. And he was surprised to see Adeline Sharkfin, the fishmonger from the market. She raised her glass. With her was her dog man-servant Rexy, who kept his eyes lowered. Frizzy shouted from the bar, You come here to play music, Gemstone? Or have you just come to smile us to death? No one is fucking dying tonight, Jem shouted. Have you all come to hear about Dirty Mary? The crowd thundered. There were whistles, there were hoots, fists were raised in the air. That wave of joyous energy swept over him, and he couldn't help but start playing. At the first sounds of the chords, the audience screamed. The women couldn't take their eyes off him. He could see how this music business could become an obsession. Terry joined in, slapping her frame drum and thumping out a beat to join him. He started singing, and a good portion of the crowd sang with him. It was a song everyone knew, and he didn't care that they couldn't hear him. He was just happy to get a reaction from them. Playing for a silent, scornful mob sucked ass. This was heaven. Everyone was fully engaged. Jem knew his voice hadn't been that good before he'd used the upgrade. Now, he might even give Jeff Tate from Queensryche a run for his money. And he had the chance to pick a new skill now after their dungeon run. They'd had five minor encounters and two major ones. That had pushed them to the next level. Crystal unleashed her saxophone, joining him as he sang the refrain. Ruby took the next verse and people had renewed vigor because Ruby had the voice of an angel. She sang the new stuff, and she sang it dirty, grinning and letting him play all the chords. She'd jump in for a solo during the bridge, something she'd added with Crystal's help, since Crystal had that songwriting ability. By the end of the song, they had the place jumping. Jem had chosen the wrong songs to start with. Most people didn't want the slow stuff, not when the party was going strong. They went into the next song, Back Door to Heaven. And... While it wasn't as good of a song as Dirty Mary Done by Midnight, it still was a definite crowd pleaser. But the real revelation was Johnny and Jenny. Crystal and Ruby had increased the tempo and added a whole revenge story. Johnny had been betrayed by a rich friend, and though he still had his nightly visits from his wife with cold hands, he wanted to get even. When he found out that Jenny was dead, he sent her to go and kill the rich friend because the rich friend had been such a dick. And because Johnny was the hero, the rich friend's wife fell in love with him. Yes, Johnny wound up with his own harem. The crowd loved the changes. 
It went from a chilling, sad song to something that had even more bite. Not only did Johnny have his wife, he also had the rich friend's wife, and the three of them lived happily ever after. There was no way Jem was leaving the stage. But he took a step back, playing rhythm guitar for Ruby as she sang Whiskey in the Jar, and then The Wild Rover, and then If I Should Fall from Grace with God. Then Ruby had them play a song called Fairy Tale of New York, which was a heartbreaker. It left the crowd breathless, and truly, it was one of the greatest songs that had ever been written. The first time Ruby played it for them, Jem's eyes had filled with tears. Crystal had broken down crying. Jem didn't have the lyrics memorized, but he had his phone, and he sang while reading the words on the screen. Ruby had transcribed the song. They played Wanted Man, and then finished off with I've Been Everywhere. Ruby had no trouble with all the different places in Farwind. They played it fast, and Jem made a thousand mistakes. Terry kept them together with her beat. Ruby and Crystal were so talented, they made up for it, and no one seemed to notice. The crowd was begging for more songs, and so they did the three big hits again. It was the right move, really. They could have played all night. Jem felt so connected to the three women on the stage. He'd loved Crystal his entire life, and he'd come to adore Ruby. Terry was new, but he loved that she had given herself over to the experience without any reservations. It was this perfect feeling that night. Creating this music, the four of them, Jem realized how special a band really was. Individuals being melded into a single unit through the power of rhythmic sound. When they finished, women came rushing onto the stage to hug him. There were some kisses. Crystal, Ruby, and Terry got their fair share of attention as well. It might have gotten out of hand, except Eddie the Tuscalarian was there to escort them through the crowd and up the stairs. They paused on the landing. Terry had tears streaming down her cheeks. <laughs> Can you believe what just happened? They loved us. They adored us. None of the statistics, none of the interviews I've done, none of the data can match the raw joy of this place. See, I told you it wasn't a game. This far transcends mere entertainment. This is amazing. Ruby grabbed the scientist and kissed her. Crystal threw her arms around Jem and hugged him tight. She kissed him as well and then looked into his eyes. <sighs> I love you, Jeremy Creed. You were amazing. I can't believe we get to do this together. I can't believe we're in a band together. And not only that, we rock. We totally and completely rock. They hurried upstairs. None of them were surprised to find Lady Natala already in their room. She was alone. She was dressed in a gown with nothing underneath. That was clear. No panty lines and the gown was open to reveal the bit of cleavage of her tall, lean, muscular body. Well, well, well. Ink and dreams and gemstone. All right here. I knew you were adventurers. That was clear when you won the relic. However good you were in the dungeon, you were far better on stage, if I can say that. And I believe I can. No one here tonight can argue that wasn't the case. Ruby laughed brazenly. <laughs> no, they can't. It was a good fucking show. She had a bottle of wine she brandished. I brought us a special vintage for later. For now, we'll drink the house wine. She motioned to the table. Crystal went over and poured them all glasses of wine. It seemed that Miranda had provided them a bottle for free. Jem wasn't any kind of connoisseur when it came to wine but he had to say it was the best he'd ever had. He figured that Lady Natala's bottle would be just as good. Lady Natala lifted her glass. A toast to you all. I can safely say that you have a place at the Spring Feast and Festival, but I hear that one of you is set to leave us tomorrow. Terry raised her glass. That would be me. They drank. Lady Natala smiled. Well, now, that would be a shame. You play the drum very well. On top of that, you are breathtakingly beautiful. 
Thank you, the scientist said, blushing. Lady Natala set her wine glass down and went to her. Let me see what I can do to get you to stay. The lady then eased the glass away from Terry's hand. They all inhaled because they knew what was coming. Jem watched as the tall woman took Terry's head in her strong hand. The two kissed, but it wasn't going to end there. It couldn't. There was far too much sexual energy in the air. Natala turned to smile at the awe-struck threesome. Now, I would like all the women on their knees. Jem felt himself get harder than Chinese algebra. Chapter 32 Lady Natala's Games Jem's eyes went from Crystal to Ruby to Terry. All three were on their knees in front of him and Lady Natala. Shouldn't they be naked? Natala smiled, her eyes half closed. Oh, we'll get to that, all right. First, though, I want to kiss you. And I want to see the magic wand that managed to keep all three of these powerful women so entranced. While we play this game, if it gets too intense, all one has to say is midnight, and we'll stop. Are we all in agreement? Uh, the safe word is midnight, Crystal gasped. Yes, mistress, we understand. Natala gave the blonde a quizzical look. Oh, so this isn't new for you, I see. Yes, it will be our safe word. Do you mind if I kiss your husband, Crystal? Jem's wife shook her head. No, mistress. As long as I get to kiss you as well. Natala walked up to Jem and put a hand on his crotch. I'm glad you and I are in agreement there, Crystal Dream. We'll kiss, you and I. But it will be the kind of kiss I want. Do you understand? Crystal nodded. Yes, mistress. I understand. Jem was dying. He was so hard, and he found this tall, dark woman so Fucking sexy. He wasn't going to just stand there. He grabbed Lady Natala and pressed himself against her. He grabbed her head like she'd grabbed Terry's. He kissed her. Savagely. She returned the kiss. He was lost in her musky scent. The softness of her lips. The taste of her. She offered him her tongue, and he took it. The kiss deepened until both of them were gasping for breath. He had both of her ass cheeks in his hands. He didn't want to just feel them through her gown. He wanted skin. He pulled up her dress until he could feel the warm, pliant flesh in his palms. He could feel the hard muscles underneath. It wasn't good enough for Natala, it seemed. She stepped back and pulled off her gown. She stood naked before him, her small, perfect tits pointing skyward. Her black nipples hardened from puffy tips into rigid nubs. She had clipped her bush to reveal her dark lips, wet with her need. The insides of her thighs gleamed. Crystal was wiggling on her knees, overcome with lust. Ruby glowed with desire. Terry looked like she might orgasm at any minute. Jem knew that Natala wasn't the only one in the room with a wet and swollen sex. Then, it got better. Natala went to her knees in front of him. She helped him out of his boots, his socks, his pants, and his underwear. Jem stripped off his shirt himself. Natala took his shaft in a soft hand. Well, now I can see the power of this particular magic wand. Look at how hard he is, and how sensitive, she turned. You don't mind if I 
suck his cock. Do you, Crystal? She shook her head. Jem had never been more grateful for his wife's dirty mind. Natala wasn't done getting permission from the slaves. Ruby, Terry, do you have any objections? Both shook their heads. Jem was dying. He needed to be touched. He needed to be sucked. Natala licked the shaft until she took his head into her mouth. Jem's hands went to her short, soft hair. Before he knew it, he was working his cock in and out of her mouth. He felt like he was dangerously close to coming. That couldn't happen. They had a whole night ahead of them. Luckily, they'd been having so much sex with Terry that he could pull himself back from the edge. Natala turned. I think our slaves can get naked now. You can admire their beauty while I pleasure you. Jem was back on the edge as he watched the three women shed their clothes. All the while, Natala sucked on him, working her hand up and down his shaft. Terry had such big, beautiful tits, even bigger than Ruby's, and that was saying something. His wife's breasts, though, had wonderful charms all of their own. He loved watching her pink nipples harden, and he wasn't surprised when she took them in her hands and pulled on the sensitive nips, making them even harder. Meanwhile, Natala hummed, clearly enjoying herself, and then she stopped. She stood up. Now, I think I should let Crystal kiss me. Would you agree, Jem? He nodded. I think so. Natala moved away from him and stood in front of the very naked kneeling blonde. Then Natala turned and reached back to spread her ass cheeks open. I would like my kiss now, Crystal, but not on the lips you might have expected. Oh, fuck, Crystal exploded. Can I kiss your Pussy lips, mistress. Can I kiss you everywhere? You may, slave, Natala said. And then Crystal leaned forward, her face lost in the ass of the stately woman, who managed to retain some of that stateliness even as the blonde licked and kissed every inch of her. Jem marched forward and stood in front of Ruby. I think you should kiss me, like Crystal is kissing Lady Nadala. Ruby couldn't even grin. She was too turned on. She leaned forward, and Jem's eyelids fluttered as he felt the warmth and softness of the singer's mouth. Natala groaned. Ugh, yes, she is such an eager lover. I took her to be shy, but no, there is no shyness in this room. Not an ounce of reserve. She threw a look over her shoulder. Slave Terry, I will be gracious and give you a choice. Do you want me or Jem? Jem, Terry nearly shouted. Oh, I can't help it. Please, mistress, can he fuck me? I need to be fucked hard. Please, mistress, please. Jem didn't wait for a response. He moved away from Ruby, got Terry on her hands and knees, and slid into her gripping, grasping hole. Mouths were fine, but Jem preferred pussies at the end of the day. He started to slam into her. Every time he thrust home, she grunted. Natala went from crystal to ruby. Here is your kiss, sweet Miss Ink. I enjoyed your mouth on stage. I do believe I'll like it even more now. Ruby didn't pause. Crystal looked on with lust. Her face glistened from Lady Natala's pussy juices.
Can I touch myself, mistress? Can I come? Lady Natala moved away from Ruby. Of course, an old slave. But I will show you some kindness. You can enjoy your husband while you lick me more. We'll take turns with you all. Natala sat on the couch, spread open. The three slaves will get on their knees and pleasure me while your king fucks you. But Jem, I want you to come inside of me when you are ready. I want to enjoy the power of your wand and the magic seed that will spill from it. Perhaps such a seed might find the room in me to grow. Jem knew what that meant. He wasn't sure he was ready to be a father, but he did like the idea of trying to get Lady Natala pregnant. The idea nearly made him lose it again. Fortunately, he pulled out of Terry before that could happen. He had to wait a minute. That was okay. He enjoyed the view. Crystal, Ruby, and Terry all got on their hands and knees in front of the black woman and took turns licking her. Jem moved from one warm, wet woman to another. It was a joy to touch Ruby's and Terry's round asses while he worked himself in and out of Crystal's tighter body. Then he would switch to Ruby, mixing their juices together, before knee walking over to Terry, who was so grateful for the attention. All the while, Lady Natala came closer and closer to coming in the mouths of one of the women. Jem's eyes were locked on the black woman's sexy body. Jem was inside a ruby when Lady Natala finally gave herself over to her orgasm. Her dark skin shone with sweat. Uh, 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 I'm coming. Oh, yes, you four are wonderful to include me. Oh, oh, I love it. I love it so much. Lady Natala's face was so beautiful as the ecstasy overwhelmed her. She then reached out to him. Oh, I want to feel you inside me, Jem. I want you to take me. Please. Jem's shaft was covered with the cream of three women. He was going to add a fourth. His wives withdrew, giving him access to the lady on the couch. Legs spread. She cupped her tits with her hands, waiting for him. Jem got on top of her, watching himself as he pushed the head of his sex into her welcoming body. She was so warm, soft, and tight. She felt perfect. He loved feeling himself in her, connected to her, and he looked down into her shining face. Her mouth was half open. He kissed that mouth, enjoying the soft, plump lips and inhaling her musky scent. Before he knew it, he felt her sex grip him. Oh, Jim, it's so good. Your wand has magic, all right. It's making me come already. That was a lovely surprise. Jim waited, enjoying the feel of her orgasm. But then he knew it was time for him to fill her up. He started slamming into her. Over and over, making her tits ride up and down her chest. For a second, his other wives were forgotten. Until Ruby and Terry settled in next to Lady Natala. Both the singer and scientist, one on either side, suckled on the lady's tits. Crystal stood behind the couch, touching Natala's face and giving the lady her fingers to suck on. Jem found himself kissing his blonde wife, enjoying her tongue as he enjoyed the scalding softness of the woman under him. Crystal pulled back. Her grin was evil. 
I heard what she said, Jim. She wants you to come in her. She wants you to breed her. Lady Natala blinked, shocked. Oh, yes, that's what I want. I want his come inside me. I want to feel him fill me. Ruby chuckled. <laughs> well, it seems our mistress has found herself at our mercy. I'm far too crazed with lust to care. Natala called out. I want it. I want him. Ruby and Terry took hold of the lady's legs and pulled them back. Jem could see the woman slit and her pucker, which was as creamy as the rest of her. For a minute, he was tempted to slip into her ass, but instead he drove himself back into her clutching sex. Terry then lowered her mouth to Natala's clit, licking it while Jem slid in and out of the lady's slit. Jem had to lean back a bit, but that gave him a view of Ruby sucking on her tits. Crystal licked the lady's face and then sucked on her earlobe, talking dirty. I can tell when my husband is about to come, and he's about to come in your cunt. Oh, you're such a slut to want his come. Uh, I am, Natala wailed. I'm a slut to want his come. Jem couldn't last through all that. With a final thrust, deep in the body of the horny woman, he let himself orgasm. The waves of heaven went through every part of him as he felt his body gush his seed into the woman. Yes, this was what he wanted. He wanted to have sex with all these women every night. And with Crystal's lust, he'd get a new woman every night. Terry was right. Erebos wasn't a game. It was a heavenly experience. Perfect in every way. Lady Natala moved to the floor. No, no. I want to taste all these women while they taste me, Jem. How long will it take you to find another erection? With how the four women were looking at him. It wouldn't take long, not long at all. Could he really get Lady Natala pregnant? He didn't know, but he assumed not. Having kids was on his list, but not in the virtual world. And the Erebus experience would know that. Not that he didn't want to keep on trying with them all. It was nearly dawn when they were all too tired to continue. That was when Natala opened the special bottle of wine she'd brought. This time, however, she didn't drink a drop. Too bad, because Jem felt the drugs in the wine hit him hard. He blinked. Oh, shit. She put something in the wine. Natala winced. I am so very sorry, my friends, but I can't let Terry Dean leave. In the end, I think you'll thank me, for we have such wonders to show you in the palace. This was the only way. Jem wasn't sure whether he believed that or not. Was he pissed that they'd been tricked? Not really. This was the Erebos experience, and he'd come to trust it to help him have the best time possible. Plus, he was curious to see what would happen next. Unlike in normal life, there were very few dull moments in the virtual world. Chapter 33 The Queen's Harem Jem woke slowly, taking in the room around him. The first thing he noticed was the sound of the fountain in the middle of the sumptuous apartment. A statue of a naked woman held up a pitcher and water gushed down into a basin. Marble floors were covered in blue and gold carpets. The windows were open, letting in the ocean breeze, though there were bars covering them. There were four alcoves with beds, a bed for each of them. Terry Deem had missed her way home. 
Jim wore a blue and gold tunic, no underwear. His clothes were folded nicely on a bench in front of the bed next to his guitar, dungeoneering supplies and smartphone. Of course, they'd let him keep his phone. To them, it was just a little toy. He scooted off the bed and turned his phone on. He had 19% of the battery left. His Inventex slots were full of treasure and his weapon. He read through the Erebos app messages. There were two major encounters added to the list. What were they? That was easy. The show counted as one of the major events, naturally. And then having sex with Lady Natala. That also counted. What better way to get experience points than to play killer shows and have mind-blowing sex? The Erebus experience certainly was awesome. He'd leveled again, which meant he had two abilities he could upgrade. With two options, Jem didn't need to consult with the women who were still sleeping. He upgraded Decay to include something called a corruption throw. Reading the description, it allowed him to dust stuff at a distance. That would definitely come in handy. He figured that both Crystal and Ruby could use their upgrades to add new skills to their bullets. Or would they choose something more music-related? With two skill slots to fill, they had any number of options. Jem was considering what he was going to do with his next choice. He needed something next level because they were now being held prisoner in the palace. It had been their goal to get there, but he hadn't counted on them getting drugged in the process. It was a nice cage, however. Expansive murals covered the walls, and there were candles the size of tables, water, wine, and a table full of snacks. Crystal popped up in the alcove next to him. Oh, oh my gosh! We got captured! I mean, that's kind of scary, but also kind of cool! I feel like I'm in a movie! Ruby, across the way, had a sour take on their situation. Let's hope it's an action movie, and not, you know, a horror movie. At least we have our phones, so that means we'll be well-armed. And we have so much treasure! Crystal said happily. We could bribe our way out. <gasps> no, I'll seduce the guard, make him fall in love with me, and then we'll kill him and have our daring escape. <laughs> this is totally an action fantasy adventure, with a dash of porn. Mm, more than a dash, I think. Terry said groggily. Then she bolted up. I have to get to the docks. I can't be here. I have to go. I have to go right now. She went to the huge set of double doors at the front of the room. They were locked, of course. She started hammering her fists on the wood. Let me out! Let me out! Jem ran to her. Just then, the door opened, and a huge female Tuscalarian with a battle axe the size of a stripper aggressively entered the room. No shouting. No escaping. Goethe, stop you. Goethe had to be her name. She had the tusks of a walrus, and she had a full head of shaggy hair. She was gigantic in all the places. Tits, hips, and butt with a big belly. Despite all that, she was kind of cute. Jem raised a hand. Easy, Goethe. We just need to talk with Lady Natala. The Tuscalarian female frowned. <sighs> Gotta send a message. But you stay here. No funny business. Goethe then slammed the door and locked it. Jem took Terry's hand. Easy, Terry. We can get out of here, but I don't think we should. Crystal was at the table with the drinks and food. She poured herself a glass of wine. <sighs> I agree with Jem. This is exactly what we wanted. We needed to get into the palace. Elsie has to be here, right? Ruby was still on the bed. Not necessarily. We only know that she talked about the Queen of Chains. Not that she'd actually be here. Gotta say, not a fan of being locked up. No matter how pretty the room is. And this room is super pretty! Crystal called out. And is it me? Or is Gerda kinda hot in like a BBW kinda way? Jem wanted to laugh at his wife's comment, but Terry was feeling way too upset. Terry, let's calm down. What will happen if you don't take the ferry? Terry backed away from him until her back hit the door. If I weren't in Far Wind, which isn't a finished product, they'd remove me manually. They can't, though. The techs will see my vitals, and they'll track my brainwaves, 
and they'll know I'm not anywhere near an extraction point. Not that we're talking about actual distances. The ships offer a kind of bridge moment that make resuscitation less risky. They can't remove me until I'm closer to Paradiso's Island. There'll be reports, though. So many reports. Ugh, so much extra paperwork. She sighed. Then she smiled. I get to finish out this part of the story. It's been so rewarding being here. It's been... Her eyes filled with tears. It's been the best time of my life. I don't want to leave. She relaxed enough to let Jem give her a hug. Ruby got off the bed to get herself some wine. Okay, so we're going to stay in this room for how long? And if we're trapped because the strangely attractive Gerda is there, how are we going to find Elsie? Jem could answer that last question. With decay, he could literally turn the door to ash, so leaving wasn't a problem. How long should they stay? If the Queen of Chains visited them that day, he'd be fine. If she didn't, he was going to get out, one way or another. Crystal went to talk, but the sound of the door being unlocked interrupted her. In walked Nikki Merchant, or this world's version of her. With her was Lady Natala. Both wore elegant gowns with a ton of jewelry. While Natala was tall and muscular, Nikki was shorter and rounder, with a big butt and even bigger breasts. This Nikki also wore a crown. Jem wasn't surprised. Queen Oasis, also known as the Queen of Chains, which is kind of an ironic name since you freed the Abelarians. The queen laughed. <laughs> Nicoletta is fine, Gemstone. Now, you all have been crazy successful since you came to our little city, and I had to meet you. Granted, it was kind of fucked up for me to have my girl drug you, but what you gonna do? Crystal's mouth dropped open. Nikki Merchant? Is that you? Not me, the queen said. I'm Nicoletta Goldrun. Queen Oasis is my royal name. The first, if you want to know the truth. Queen of Chains, well, that kind of came with the territory when you're like me and do things I like to do. Sure, freed the dog people. But sure, I have a big-ass harem of horny bitches. <laughs> That's me. Jem had to appraise the woman to see if she was lying. Did she really not know she was Nikki Merchant? It seems she didn't. Ruby laughed. <laughs> you talk like someone I know. I talk with a certain patois, now don't I? <laughs> Nicoletta said with a laugh. No, we haven't met. But you met Natala, all right. At least twice. Natala held up three fingers. Terry crossed her arms. I missed my fairy, and I want to leave. But first we, uh, we're here looking for someone named Elsie Dorrance. I don't suppose you've seen her? The queen shrugged. I see lots of people. That wasn't an answer. But Jem figured it wouldn't be so easy as to just waltz in, get Elsie, and waltz out. The queen walked into the room. Goethe was there with her axe. Lady Natala had a tall staff. She might have been able to use it as a weapon, but the three of them wouldn't stand a chance against Jem and his women. You're being awfully trusting, Jem said. We're powerful adventurers, and we don't really like being caged. Queen Nicoletta went up to him and gently pinched his cheek. Oh, don't go hurting me, big boy. I have a request for you, and I have a gig for you. How about you walk with me while we talk? I want you to see the palace. Especially my harem. It might just change your mind. Harem? Crystal asked in a loud voice. I'd love to see your harem. Ruby rolled her eyes. Uh-oh, now you've gone and done it. Terry colored. I too am uh, curious. The queen took Crystal's wine from her and sipped. Look, we started off on the wrong foot. But it wasn't like I could just invite you up here. For one, you might not have come. For two, if you said no, it would make me look bad. And we can't have that. Not with the emperor coming. He'll be here for a feast. 
For tree? Let's just say, I kind of like the dramatic quality of it. My best friend and my favourite nighttime companion sexing you up and taking you down. No offence. <laughs> Some taken. Crystal said with a grin. Come on, Nicoletta. The queen raised a hand. Do I really want you to call me Nicoletta? Or maybe Queen Nicoletta? I do have a lot of names. Maybe I should go with Majesty or Your Highness or some shit. <laughs> I don't know. But go on. Maybe Nicoletta is fine. We totally would have come here, Crystal said. You see, like my friend said, we are looking for our friend, Elsie Dorrance. Also, maybe Linnea Richmond. And if you have someone named Nancy Nighthouse, she might be dead. Do you have ghosts in your harem? The queen grinned. Uh, I think I'd know if I was sleeping with a dead girl. I ain't like Johnny and Johnny and Jenny. By the way, I caught your act in the dark market. I was in disguise because I'm a sorceress. I can shape change like a motherfucker. But can you change your voice? Crystal shot her a finger gun. I recognized your accent from when you were Nicky Merchant. Not Nicky Merchant, girl. We've covered that. And for the record, I can change my voice. Now, do you want to come with me or not? Crystal took her wine glass back from the queen. Sure, your highness. Let's do it. It'll be fun. Don't escape until you hear me out, okay? The queen asked. No fucking promises there, Ruby said. We're musicians and adventurers. We were born to be free. Free as a bird. The queen shrugged. Lots of ways of being free. Probably more ways of being locked up. But let's chat while we walk. Goethe, take up the rear. I believe you'll like it. Natala smiled slyly. <laughs> Anal sex joke. Crystal blinked and smiled coquettishly at Natala. I still can't believe you drugged us. So dramatic. They left the room and walked down a wide hallway with mirrors and paintings on the walls. There were any number of kings and queens in the frames. They came to a majestic central staircase that fell at least four levels below. Armed guards of all different races stood there. They took the stairs up a couple floors to just below the top. Queen Nicoletta unlocked another set of double doors, and immediately, two other Tuscalarian females were there in their armor. Each of them had a long pull arm ready for trouble. The queen raised a hand. Aggie, Helgi, stand back. It's me and my guests, and of course, Lady Natala. Natala gave them an arrogant nod. Aggie and Helgi retreated. The room was big. There were three fountains here. It was richly done in reds and golds, with tapestries on the walls and soft rugs on the marble floors. There were alcoves filled with beds, couches, and divans and a nice breeze blowing through the curtains of the open windows. There weren't any bars in this room. On the couches, on the beds, kicking lazily in the water, was every type of woman. Tall, thin, fat, and happy. Sour-faced Pishkari fishwomen, and grinning Kirsi, short and horned. There were dog women with cute tails below their dimpled asses. There were cat women purring on couches. There were blue-skinned women, smiling at the newcomers. What were the names of all them women you were looking for? The queen asked. Crystal repeated their names. Queen Nicoletta snapped her fingers. Delilah, can you check with your gossip network to see if you can find them? Delilah came forward. She was one of the hearsay, a wide little woman with goat horns and a nice smile. She was short, but she had assets that made up for her height. I can, madam. Those names aren't familiar to me, but I shall check. Have you come to show us off to ink and dreams? And that's Gemstone, isn't it? Oh, we know about his music. Everyone is now singing his version of the Dirty Mary song. That made Gem feel good. Though it was really Ruby who had done most of the work. The queen came right down to it. You four have treasure, I know. But I also know that you have certain appetites. Here's the deal. I'll give you more treasure, and I'll give you access to my harem, any woman or women you want. If you'll write a song for me, it needs to be new and it needs to be good. 
and it needs to be something that will impress the emperor. The emperor likes music. I gotta give him something good or he'll leave the spring feast with a bad impression of me. That could be fatal, because the emperor deals in life or death. Ruby cocked her head. You want us to write a song for this feast? And you locked us up thinking that will somehow fucking convince us? It was dramatic. The queen answered. Crystal seems to have liked that. The blonde nodded. I did, I do. But come on, you know we could just escape in a dramatic fashion. Unless... Unless what? The queen asked. Crystal went on an excited ramble. Unless you give us free reign to go anywhere in the palace we want. I want to see the gardens, I want to see the dungeons, I want to see your throne room. And yeah, food and that good wine and the wonderful tea that we got at the wet tail. Mm, then we'll stay and write you a song. Ruby brightened. The best song. What do you want it to be about? The queen paused dramatically. Eternal life, baby. Eternal life. Chapter 34 Ruby's Magnum Opus Jem spent the next three weeks living in the palace. Writing and playing music with three talented, beautiful, and wonderful women. Every meal was better than the last. It truly was three weeks of wine, women, and song. Word had traveled down to the wet tail that ink and dreams had been taken in by the queen, and that they and Gemstone were working on the greatest song ever written. When Emperor Shibalba came, Everyone was sure he would be very impressed. It was all building toward that moment. Crystal and Ruby had two skills each to choose from. For one of their open slots, they upgraded their weapons. Both gave their guns a non-lethal blast ability, which basically turned them into tasers, but tasers with a range of at least 50 yards. At one point, Ruby shot snake bite out the window. The electrical crackle of the blast looked like lightning. The new rounds were called shock rounds, and Jem could easily see them morphing into a more deadly electrical attack. Maybe even a chain lightning blast that would arc from enemy to enemy to completely ruin them. For their other skills, they went with combat options. Luckily, Queen Nicoletta and Lady Natulla had people to help them practice. It was kind of ironic, because most likely they were going to have to fight their way back to Paradiso's Island. Yes, they could have escaped at any time, but they were curious about Emperor Shibalba. From the rumors, he sounded like an asshole. He could replace rulers with a wave of his hand. For example, in the far-off kingdom of Minky, he'd gotten into a spat with King Sonim II, and by the weekend, a lesser prince had been put on the throne. The emperor had an elite guard made up of sorcerer knights who were deadly with both spells and swords. They could easily tear apart anyone who got in their way. Jem found the prospect of fighting them intriguing. Even more interesting, the emperor himself supposedly had the powers of life and death. He could point a finger and kill. Or so the stories went. Crystal loved the whole experience, though she was disappointed that they hadn't found any of the women who'd disappeared. It was pretty clear, though, that both Natalie Mirage and Nikki Merchant were NPCs that the system had taken from Paradiso's island and repurposed in Far Wind. Jem could see how that bit of code change would be easy, which is why he had a new ability in mind, something that really might help them. And not just in Far Wind, but in the whole Erebos experience. Jem wasn't stupid enough to think that after the spring feast, they could just leave the palace. That wasn't how the story would play out. But he had a plan, a crazy plan, that involved his phone and a glitch in the system. During those three weeks, Jem learned so much about music from sitting in with Ruby and Crystal while they crafted the song. Ruby knew what their audience would like. More songs about the doom and the magical caves and that whole thing. Crystal helped out by coming up with a catchy melody that haunted their dreams. The song was all about M. Jerry Dirk, 
the wizard who figured out the magical caves in the first place. He was a boy who'd grown up in a family that hated him, yet during the doom, he saved them by letting them inside the magic caves, only to have them betray him. They tortured and beat him, but he managed to escape, though he'd have a limp the rest of his life. In his darkest moment, the sorcerer found two women to help him, and through their love, he figured out a way to live forever. The three of them lived forever, while his evil family withered and died. It was moving, exciting, and the chorus had such a great hook that Jem found himself humming it all the time. It was called The Ballad of the Broken Master, or just Broken Master. Ruby was working with Crystal to improve the blonde songwriting skill, and yet, at times, the singer wanted to be alone. Ruby was an introvert, which was kind of ironic since she was also an exhibitionist. She loved to be the center of attention, yet she needed to be alone to recharge. She'd go across the way to a balcony that had a view of Mount Aiden and the Aiden Falls, a sparkling waterfall that cascaded down the rocks. She'd sit there, watching it for hours, while she smoked an elegant ivory pipe. It was the night before the spring feast when Jem found her there, alone, with her pipe and her guitar. She smiled at him. Hey, Jem. Hey, Ruby. He sat down on the cushioned chair next to her. The moon topped the mountain peak, giving them light and turning the waterfall silver. Ready for the big show tomorrow night? Ruby turned shy. I'm a bit nervous, if you want to know the truth. I just don't know if the new song is going to hit right. I'm so used to playing covers. This? This feels dangerous, she laughed. I keep thinking about what Crystal said that one time. How fighting monsters was easier than going up on stage. Or maybe you said it. <laughs> I don't know. I'm getting that vibe, though. I hear you. But you have real talent, Ruby. We're here because you took those songs everyone liked and added your own spin. She shrugged. Mm, I just did covers of them, like I do. This is different. This is me and your wife coming up with something new. The new is dangerous. Are you quoting Ratatouille? She gave him a sly look. Mm, maybe. And Crystal isn't just my wife. She's your wife as well. We had the honeymoon. Jem paused. You no, know, we should do a wedding. When we get back to Paradiso's Island, we should do a big concert, play the new stuff from this world, and do a wedding right in the middle. We'll have Z marry us. Ruby snorted. I don't think he's a priest. Even better. He's a god. That sounds wonderful, Jem. I'd like to say vows with you two. You've become... Her eyes glistened with tears. You've become the family I've always wanted. You've stood by me. You've protected me. I love you both. We love you too. Jem held her gaze. Ruby didn't glance away. She frowned. I'm worried they won't let us leave after the show. With how powerful this emperor guy sounds, we might not be able to fight him. Got a plan. Jem said. Bringing him back up. It might not work, but I think it will. We're not playing this by the rules of Far Wind because there are no rules here. It's all being made up on the fly. I'm going to use that. Backup? Ruby furrowed her brow. What kind of backup? You'll see, he said mysteriously. Ruby got up and crawled into his lap. He held her, stroking her hair. Then she said something that surprised him. I don't want to go back. To real life, I mean. This has become our real life. However unreal this all is. I've been thinking. Our bodies are back on Earth. But it doesn't even matter, right? This is real. This is all as real as it could be. Better than real. Jem said. Much better. Crystal and Terry showed up and sat down next to them. Feeling nervous? Crystal asked. I am. Ruby said. What if we bomb? Then we totally kill everyone and run away, Crystal said simply. Or not. We have our new shock rounds. We clear the room and then run. 
But, oh yeah, we kill the emperor first. He sounds like a real douchebag. Total douchebag. Jem agreed. Terry shook her head, chuckling. <laughs> I don't think we are going to bomb. I think we're going to be great. I just wish. What? Jem asked gently. Terry shrugged. I just wish I could stay. I wish I had a character sheet so that I could level up my skills. And vulnerability would be nice. I don't like the idea of dying. Not one bit. It means this place works, Jem said. Good work, Terry. The scientist smirked. It wasn't me. I was just brought in to organize the participants and to track data. No, I'm not the architect. Not like our Mjiri. <laughs> but I'd like to see your character sheets again. I really want to understand them, now that I'm having an in-game experience. I will go first, Crystal said happily. She brought up her character sheet and showed it to Terry. View only mode. Level up to make adjustments. Name. Crystal Church Creed. Alias. None. Level. Seven. Character class. Hero. Original abilities. Literature, composition, and rhetoric. Saxophone. Superior emotional intelligence. New, updated special abilities. Bulletproof. Healing. Strength. Wealth. Seduction. Invulnerability. Songwriting. Terry smiled. Intuitive dodge. Tell me more about that. A spidey sense, Crystal said with a grin. I can feel when things are about to hit me so I can dodge them. I got a little help with training from Gerda, who was oddly spry for a Tuscalarian. Even as she's oddly alluring. <laughs> so yeah, since I shoot at things, I want to be able to dodge bullets. Jem loved that she had chosen that ability. He wanted his wife safe. Ruby pulled up her character sheet. I kind of joined in the fun, but my trainer wasn't Gerda. It was actually Lady Natala. Remember when she came in with that staff? She can use it to do all sorts of things. She pointed at Crystal. No sex jokes. Crystal pantomimed, locking her lips. No sex jokes. Terry reviewed Ruby's skills. View only mode. Level up to make adjustments. Name. Persephone Jennifer Malvado. Alias. Ruby Inc. Level. Six. Character class. Musician. Original abilities. Guitar proficiency. Lyricist. Advanced criminality. New. Updated special abilities. Bulletproof. Healing. Strength. Advanced vocal acuity. Swashbuckling. Marksmanship. Invulnerability. Ruby sighed. It was a happy sound. Ah, <sighs> you know, I've not been as nimble on my feet as I would have liked. But with this, I can really move. It works well with my swashbuckling and marksmanship. So basically, I'm a superhero at this point. Take a ticket and stand in line. Crystal shot a finger gun at Ruby. The singer pretended to duck. Terry saw that Ruby had the advanced vocal acuity skill. No wonder you're such a wonderful singer. But doesn't Jem have a singing ability? Jem pulled up his character sheet. View only mode. Level up to make adjustments. Name, Jeremy Creed. Alias, Jem. Level, seven. Character class, hero. Original abilities. Knowledge of network security and information technologies. Street fighting. Basic criminality. New, updated special abilities. Bulletproof. Healing. Strength. Wealth. Ultra musicality. Invulnerability. Singing. New, weapon enhancement. Corruption throw. New, ASI. Advanced software infiltration. Jem spoke before Terry could comment on his ASI ability. Ruby was already a very accomplished singer when she entered the Erebos experience. For her, she needed jet fuel for her vocal skills, 
I just needed propane. It worked out pretty well, though. You are a very good singer, the scientist said. And a hacker, it seems. I noticed your ASI skill. Advanced software infiltration. You just can't leave the code alone, can you? She laughed. But this is all part of the Erebus experience. The joke is on you, Jem Creed. For every skill you get to hack the system, the system changes because you are in the system. Maybe, Jem said. But I was able to use it to bring in reinforcements. And the Erebos AI knows it. Terry's smile was beautiful. At some point, I really want to understand who is in charge at Erebos. Jem said. Another mystery, Crystal said happily. Ruby touched Crystal's hand. <laughs> That's my girl. Hey, speaking of mysteries, Lady Natala agreed to invite Miranda from the wet tail. It was the least the lady could do for drugging us. Besides, Natala knows who Miranda is. It seems the mermaid madam does actually have a secret identity. Anyway, I sent Miranda a letter along with the invitation with very specific instructions. Everything is set up on that end. Are you going to reveal who your special guest star is, Jem? Jem shook his head. No. I want to see your faces when they show up. Getting the ASI ability had been the right call. His bit of hackery just might save the day. The four of them talked until they were all yawning. They needed to get some good sleep. The next day was going to be very, very dramatic. One thing he didn't expect was to see the three minotaurs he'd seen back at the Delphine show up. Fucking minotaurs. Jem couldn't get away from them. The second he saw them, his heart fell. He could guess who they were working for. Chapter 35 The Emperor's Spring Feast Jem and Crystal stood in front of the buffet table at the very top of the auditorium. That spread of food was one of the best food orgies Jem had ever seen in his life. There was every kind of food. Fish, sausages, hunks of meat, roasts, vegetable dishes that actually looked good. A variety of cheeses, fruits, and so much pie. All the pie. Every pie. Crystal's eyes were as big as the empty plate she held in her hands. Oh my gosh, Jim. Here's the problem. If I start, if I eat one thing, I'm going to eat a plate full, and then we have to go on stage, and then there will probably be fighting. So much fighting, so... She slid her gold-rimmed plate on top of the others. Mm, can't do it. This is me, sighing and dying, because damn it, I can't buffet like I want a buffet. Jem wasn't going to pass up on the cherry pie. And there were urns of bitter tea that was close to coffee. In the same ballpark, at any rate. Crystal grabbed a fork. Mm, you're sharing, but only one piece. And don't fight me on this, Jeremy Creed. Never stand in the way of a woman and her food. I would never think of it. I'm not suicidal. They ate the pie, sipped the tea, and checked out the room. The three minotaurs in cloaks and black armor stood like pissed-off statues near the entrance. They had the same piercings and tattoos, the exact same, as the minotaurs he'd seen at the Delphine's Winter Dreams Ball. Funny, but they went from a winter ball to a spring feast. From the rumors, the badass minotaurs were part of the Emperor's elite guard. So, not only were they bullheaded, muscled warriors, but they were also sorcerers. They hadn't gone for Jem and his women, so like Nat and Nikki, they seemed to have been reprogrammed for Far Wind. They put Jem on edge. That didn't keep him from the joys of Pi. Ruby and Terry were up on stage, preparing things and chatting with Lady Natala. Between the buffet table and the stage were about 20 levels, where people sat at round tables, eating, drinking, and chatting. The drinking was the important part. Ruby knew from experience that as long as you could keep the beat... Playing for half-drunk people was far easier than playing for sober ones. The auditorium was on the western side of the castle, across the way from the throne room. It was massive, carved into the mountain by engineers to get the best sound possible. There was an aisle down the middle, 
ornate marble with gold candelabras. That would be where Queen Nicoletta would be walking down with Emperor Shibalba. The golden relic from the crystal cavern sat on a pedestal about halfway down the aisle. Magical light illuminated the statue, giving it an otherworldly appearance. A familiar face approached Crystal and Gem. It was Miranda. But she didn't look like the madam of a brothel. She wore an aquamarine gown and had sparkly makeup on, and her blue hair tumbled down her back in braids. She looked like a different person. She smiled at them. Fancy meeting you here. Crystal's eyes widened in surprise. Miranda! I'm so glad you could make it. Why wouldn't I, child? I'm Princess Miranda of Mertania, no? Third princess, actually. Little more than a lady in waiting, I tell you. Still, secret royalty. And don't spread no more rumors, no? Were you really held prisoner until you could play music for the ball? Jem cocked his head. Kind of? We ate well, and we've had the run of the castle. We have a new song. Oh, I can't wait to hear it, child. The mermaid princess touched Jem's arm and lowered her voice. I got word to Ethan Price at the sailor Stiffy. If you can get out of the palace, I can get you to your devil man. Good to hear it, Jem whispered. But will Jacko show up in the all? Before she could answer, Miranda was called away. She wasn't a warrior queen, but a princess. Still, it was rather surprising. Did she have other surprises up her sleeve? Ruby strummed her guitar, and the notes drifted across the tables. The place hushed. Ruby called up to them. The acoustics perfectly carried her voice. Hey, Gem and Crystal. You guys ready? Crystal took Gem's hand. Ready to wow them? You know it, baby. Let's give them a show. They walked down to the stage, but they weren't going to be starting just yet. The three minotaurs bellowed out across the room. They spoke in unison. People of Aiden, we, we present, present to you Emperor Shibal von Strindrangetta of the Pyunian Empire, Empire, ruler supreme of Avalaria, Arago, Aiden, Masalkir, Minki, Rogara. And the list of names went on and on. In walked Sheriff Pluto, flanked by nine other Minotaur guardians. It was a sheriff, all right. Big black beard shot with white, bald head and black eyes. It was weird not seeing him in his Paradisos Island police uniform. He wore black armor that matched the Minotaurs, and in his hand was a carbon copy of Decay. Jem felt a bit dizzy. This was literal worlds colliding. Crystal laughed and turned, letting her saxophone sit on her shoulder as she clapped joyfully. <laughs> Plot twist! Kind of saw it coming, but I wasn't going to say anything. When everyone said he supposedly had the powers of life and death, it was kind of a dead giveaway. Pun intended. The Emperor descended the steps with a full dozen minotaurs. Behind him walked the plump form of Queen Nicoletta, also known as the Queen of Chains. The pair descended with the minotaurs until they were standing there at the pedestal, where the light shone down from the ceiling. Ruby shot Jem a quizzical look. They're doing the ritual before the show? Great. At least we have an opening act. Hopefully it doesn't suck. Everyone in the palace was chattering until the emperor raised his bident. People of Port Aiden, your queen rejoices in the prosperity and pleasures of her people. But she also needs her distractions, and lo, we have an ancient relic of the beautiful Elsie Winterheart, a princess from the time of the doom. She was bound by many souls over time, but I will use my magic to awaken her. Jem's heart skipped a beat. Elsie Winterheart? Could it be another name for Elsie Dorrance? Had she been trapped in the gold statue the entire time? Crystal laughed loudly. <laughs> Another plot twist? Oh, I'm dying, I'm dying! Ruby rolled her eyes. Ugh, this is some bullshit, because you know if Elsie jack in the boxes out of that statue, we grab her and go. So we don't do the show, and we don't do the song, fuck! The Emperor raised his fork. Behold! Your Emperor has the power of life and death! The Biden glowed with a blinding light, and he touched the statue. 
The statue radiated so brightly that everyone had to turn their eyes away. Two figures appeared for a moment. Jem thought about the artwork they'd seen in the caves below the city. There were stories of the sorcerer Njiri Dirk splitting into two people. This seemed similar. The emperor touched one of the lights, and the womanly figure faded and grew smaller and smaller. The other figure hardened into a naked woman, small and slender, red-haired and freckled. Yes, there stood Elsie Dorrance. Around her wrists coalesced two golden bracelets. Right away, Jem knew those bracelets were going to be trouble. Jem clicked on his phone, as did Crystal and Ruby. They put their instruments away for this final run. A second later, Jem called out. Okay, Zeus, hand me the K. Crystal and Ruby echoed him. Okay, okay Zeus, Zeus, I'll, I'll be, be your huckleberry. huckleberry. Their weapons appeared. The Ares rifle on Crystal's shoulder and Snagbite in a shoulder holster and Ruby's rapier, Miss Kiss, sheathed at her side. Jem aimed decay and triggered his corruption throw. A burst of darkness streamed across the audience aimed right at Emperor Pluto's chest. Pluto knocked away the burst. What is this sorcery? Who is this musician? Wrong class, fucker. I'm a fucking hero. Jem raced down while Crystal and Ruby opened fire with their ice bursts. Elsie gave him a look of pure disgust and also pure shock. Jem Creed? What the fuck is all this fantasy shit? Where in the fuck am I? Jem couldn't answer because he found himself facing down two minotaurs. He figured he could dust them easily, but both took fresh grips on their spears as ghostly gray shields appeared in their hands. One bullman blocked Jem's thrust, whirled and tried to drive that spear into Jem, but Jem's invulnerability skill made his skin like stone. The weapon bounced off him. Jem managed to drive his fork into the foot of the Minotaur, which dusted a lower portion of the leg. As the Minotaur fell, Jem dusted him completely. Jem's phone dinged. He was getting encounter points for this little fight. The other Minotaur dropped his spear, and his hand glowed red. That hand came down on Jem's shoulder, burning him with a flash of pure pain. That pissed him off. Jem used his strength to punch the Minotaur in the face, which sent him reeling. Jem dusted him without another thought. These things were tough. Of course, they were the Emperor's elite guard. The other Minotaurs had their magical shields up, catching bullets. They were concentrating on staying alive, which let Jem race forward and catch hold of Elsie. He threw her behind him. The rest of the auditorium was screaming and making for the exits. It was pandemonium. And there... By the pedestal stood Queen Nicoletta and Lady Natala, shaking their heads and smiling. Jem figured they couldn't be too surprised they were dealing with adventurers after all. Jem also knew that if he killed Sheriff Pluto, they wouldn't have to worry about the Emperor anymore. That might be easier said than done. Pluto seemed to grow a foot taller and two feet wider. He charged forward, trying to skewer Jem. Their forks clashed. Jem wasn't sure if this other version of Decay might end him, but he wasn't going to risk anything. They were too close to escaping. One of the Minotaurs took an exploding round to his face. His head was reduced to a rotten pumpkin. Brains, bone, and blood rained down. Another Minotaur's shoulders ignited from a fiery round, which broke his concentration. Another round ended him with a perfect hole in his bovine head. Four dead Minotaurs and eight to go. But killing these things wasn't the goal. Jem had his prize, and now it was time to get out of the palace. Terry came forward, threw a cloak around Elsie and pulled her back. Jem hit the floor with his bident, dusting a hole underneath Pluto. The emperor faltered, and Jem drove his fork into the chest of the god. It pierced his flesh, but didn't disintegrate him. Jem's fork came out bloody. Pluto roared in pain. It was enough of a shock for Jem to retreat safely. He ran with Elsie and Terry back onto the stage. They were surrounded by fifty guards with halberds, eight pissed-off minotaurs, and one bleeding god. Crystal and Ruby switched to their new shock rounds and started picking off guards left and right, which made the entire legion pause to take note. Maybe they didn't want to attack the two beautiful women and the guy with the weapon of a god. The minotaurs and the god of death didn't much care and they started forward. 
Jim figured they would fight down to the last bull man. In the end, they didn't need to. Bursting out of the back of the stage with a pizza box hefted on her shoulder was their favorite food wheel delivery girl. Enter Maggie Medusa with a slight smile on her face. Oh, hey, Jim. Kind of weird you ordered a pepperoni pizza and wanted me to deliver it here, but it's cool or whatever. Kind of took a bit. <laughs> Hope I'm not late. No way! Mags? She's our secret guest star? <laughs> How did you pull that off? Crystal asked, laughing. Thanks to my ASI ability, I found a way to do a food wheel order. Put the palace as the destination point. I figured Erebos wouldn't deprive us of pizza. You're so smart. Crystal switched to explosives and pinned down the minotaurs in the seats. The god of death, however, only winced at the shrapnel as he jogged forward. Luckily, he was a big old boy and couldn't move too quickly. Jem drove Decay into the steps. The stairs, as well as a good portion of the stage, disintegrated. Pluto fell down into rooms below the stage. Was that the orchestra pit? Jem had learned something hanging out with musicians. Use your gaze! Jem called to the food wheel girl. We need all these assholes turned to stone! Mags dropped the pizza, thank goodness, and then raised her hands. Her snakes went rigid, and her eyes started to turn a really weird color, but already Jem was looking away. The guards and the minotaurs weren't as lucky. They went rigid, frozen in place. Mag shrugged. Uh, not stone, but they won't be able to move for a good long while. Kind of cool or whatever. Stop! Pluto leapt up from the orchestra pit and onto the stage. Stop right there! Crystal and Ruby. Freed from shooting up the guards, turned their muzzles on the god of death. Pluto took round after round of ice damage until most of him was frozen. He was on the stage, still coming after them, until Ruby stepped forward and aimed at the god right between the eyes. This is for fucking with me. She pulled the trigger. The bullet froze his entire skull, and he went to his knees, the only joints not stuck in place by the cold. That allowed Jem and the girls to flee the stage and out the back door. Their phones dinged as they got more encounter points. Firing shock rounds kept the hallways clear while they escaped out through the throne room and out the front door. And if the bullets failed them, Mags was there to freeze their adversaries in place with her terrifying stare. Just seeing her snake hair go rigid was enough to make Jem think twice about glancing her away. Normally, those snakes were kind of cute. Out the front door... Jem thought they might need to run the length of the city down to Docktown. However, a carriage pulled up and the doors banged open. Miranda was inside. Hello, troublemakers. It looks like you might need a ride, no? Didn't you miss your ferry, Mrs. Deem? It's Dr. Deem. And yes, yes, I did. Jem hustled the women inside. Just as he slammed the door, the carriage driver, a big man with scales and green hair, jerked on the reins connected to the four white horses. They went careening down through the village. Crystal wound up in Mag's lap. You were amazing. Thanks so much. Crystal kissed the green-skinned woman, and the little snakes kissed Crystal back, as did their mistress. Ruby had a grin for Jem. That was some shit right there. And we didn't get to play our song. Elsie wasn't grinning. Could someone fucking tell me what the fuck is going on? And ugh, does anyone else smell the horses? Ugh, they stink. <laughs> this is terrible. Ugh, cobblestones. Why does it always have to be cobblestones? Then she couldn't talk because her teeth were chattering so much. And they were being bounced around like a rock inside a tin can. They didn't have a chance to answer because the driver ran the horses through the dock market, which by that time of the evening was mostly empty. It was the taverns now that were crowded. The carriage came to a stop at the end of the dock. Miranda escorted them out of the carriage and onto what looked like a small version of Captain Reaper's ship. This one had a living crew. Pretty women, with flashing smiles, scales, and fishy skins. Crystal cast the mermaid madam a suspicious glance. Just a princess of Mertonia? Maybe a bit more than that. <laughs> Miranda smirked. I knew that the Eason Price at the Sailor Stiffy was a bad, bad man. He got word to Captain Reaper now. It gives me the shivers to think you'll be on that ship. 
I've seen it, I tell you. I've seen it and avoided it. Now, get on my lovely ship. We call her the Secret Queen, and I love her like I love all my girls. Miranda sailed them out of the harbor as the sun set on Mount Aden, on the castle, and on the entire town. Their adventures in Far Wind were coming to a close. Elsie stood miserably on the deck, shivering. She just didn't have that much body fat to keep her warm. <sighs> okay, now I'm cold, and I still don't know why I'm even here. She wasn't crying. Not yet, but that was coming. She had questions. Well, so did Jen. Chapter 36 Elsie's Breakdown Jem stood with Crystal while she tried to get Elsie up to speed. Terry also knew how to sail, and she was with Miranda up on the helm. The rest of the small crew were busy doing all sorts of sailor things. Ruby stood up on the bow with Mags, who looked rather calm given their situation. Miranda said that the wet tail had missed them for those three long weeks and Jem felt a little sad knowing they were leaving without getting a chance to say goodbye to Precious, Frizzy, and Sweets. However, they could probably come back once they delivered Elsie safely back to her father, Calus Oranus Dorrance, who may or may not be one of the Elder Gods. Why not come back in secret? It would be fun to duck the Emperor and his men. The Minotaur's burning hand had hurt, but Jem had already healed the damage. No sweat. Being an OP hero in a fantasy world was too much fun. You got all of the adrenaline and none of the death. Elsie snapped her fingers. <gasps> you're the girl in the elevator. Okay, you're married to Jem. I was a little drunk when we played Nat and Nikki's little game there. <laughs> I loved those two. But then they were like, let's go to a party and we can introduce you to the Queen of Chains. It was at that one fucking party after the owner of the Delphine died or whatever. And then there were all these monsters. Like, legit monsters. And then Nat and Nikki fucking drugged me, which was not part of our game. I woke up in the worst fucking venue I've ever seen with all that fantasy bullshit. Literally bulls. And I'm pretty sure there was literal shit, because did I mention the smell of the horses? Oh, I didn't? Let me say right now that I hate the way this world smells! Crystal tried to calm her. It's hard, Elsie, I know, but we'll get through this together. The two talked more, though talking was the wrong word. Elsie complained, cursed, and cried, while Crystal held her hand and rubbed her shoulder. Terry and Miranda steered the boat out past the Aiden Finger and toward the good sand towers, which were gleaming in the night. It was easy to see the best path through the good sand sandbars and out into the open ocean. Then Jem remembered the Kraken. He could only hope that they'd meet up with Captain Reaper before the gigantic sea creature caught up with them. They should have some time. They weren't in the waters between worlds just yet. Terry finally came down. Miranda suggested that we go inside the captain's quarters. We have a few hours until we rendezvous with Captain Reaper. She said the Kraken hasn't been seen in these waters for some time. We should be okay until we get there. Ruby and Mags walked over. Terry frowned at Ruby. I'm so sorry that we didn't get to play your song. I know it would have knocked them all dead. Ruby inhaled. There'll be other shows. Who knows? They might even try to play it at gigs on Parody So Silent. It probably won't have the same effect, though. <laughs> oh, no, Crystal said loudly. We'll just come back to Port Aiden. Clearly, Jem agreed. His wife flashed him a smile. <laughs> Good thing we're always so in sync. Elsie made a face. She was still wearing makeup, probably the same makeup she'd been wearing at the party back at the Delphine months before. Ugh, could we get... Out of the cold? Using wind to travel is like so old and stupid. And cold. And stupid. Jem didn't point out that she'd said it was stupid twice. They opened the door to the captain's quarters, which was far nicer than Captain Reaper's room. The sailing ship they were on was smaller, so the room was smaller. 
but it was clean and comfortable and smelled like candles and incense. There were no charts scattered around, no sailing mechanisms, just a clean room around a clean bed, with the ship creaking, rising up and down the waves. It was comfortable and warm. Elsie found a clean, poofy pirate shirt to put on, but none of the pants fit her. But between the pirate shirt and the cloak, she started to warm up. Miranda had even remembered the wine and grapes. They sat at the table in comfortable, cushioned chairs in front of the biggest candle of all, burning at the center of the table. All of their faces looked so good in the glow. Jem's eyes went from his wife, to Ruby, to Terry, to Mags, to Elsie, who was frowning while she ate grapes and drank wine. Okay, fine, you rescued me. But do we know why Nat and Nikki totally stole me away? I mean, I loved them. They loved me. But talk about a betrayal. They just played different characters in Far Wind, Crystal said. I mean, the whole scenario needed to be set up in a certain way, and they were the NPCs. Don't acronym me, Crystal Creed. If you acronym me, I swear to God, I'll scream. Ruby tilted her head. Okay, she's a nightmare. But she's a cute nightmare. Elsie looked disgusted. So cute. Such a nightmare. And so fucking betrayed. Damn it. Now, what are you talking about, bitch? Crystal tried to explain. Then she cast a glance at the scientist. So, Terry, it's pretty clear Nat and Nikki aren't real. But is Elsie? Somehow, I think she might be an NPC as well. Then Elsie screamed until Jem clapped his hands over his ears. Crystal winced. Ugh, sorry, non-player character. We don't think this is real. I mean, it's real, but it's a game. Not a game, Terry corrected. And I can't confirm nor deny if Elsie is a participant. Trying to convince her of any major truths about her situation won't be easy at this point. So let's move on. Elsie gulped down the last of her wine. I feel better. No more acronyms. Um, sure, I can believe this isn't real. I'm just, like, still feeling the after effects of the drugs they gave me. Jem thought about how the setup might have worked. Elsie could have been put inside the statue, then sealed away in the caves until the participant was ready to start the game again. It was clear that she didn't remember being put in the game in the first place. Or... Was she just more Erebos experience code? Once they got back to Paradiso's Island, Jem could try to find her ID, maybe her character sheet, to see if she was real or not. He had his new ASI skill. For some reason, Jem was pretty sure she was real. Unlike Nat, Nikki, and Pluto, who had shifted to play their Far Wind characters. But if she was a participant, she might be on a different time schedule than Jem and the women. She might have come in late, maybe, because if she were late, even a little, that was weeks of time in the Erebos experience. Crystal held up her hands. Wait, when you were released from the statue, there were two women. You became flesh and blood, but the second woman turned into, um, those bracelets. Elsie jingled them. <laughs> Let's talk about nightmare jewelry and the opposite of cute. The exact opposite of cute? These bracelets. I don't know what they mean, but... She let out a scream of pain and knocked over her wine. The gold bracelets gleamed. Words appeared on the gold. A soul to trap a soul? Only freed by her greatest joy. She must remain. Crystal put it together. She can't leave the realm. Not until she gets her greatest joy. Mags looked scared. Ruby found some compassion for the heiress. She helped Elsie sit while Terry looked on, mystified. A message dinged on Jem's phone. That was something he'd not heard in a long time. Of course, they would be getting encounter points for the fight and for writing the song. And rescuing Elsie had to be at least a minor encounter. Jem saw that he had less than 5% battery power. But he opened his phone and read the message from Mr. Oregon. 
A shiver went down Jem's spine as he read the words. Terry is about to leave, but Elsie has to stay in far wind waters until you answer the riddle. Better turn around until you can figure it out. It's not too hard. BTW, Nad and Nikki aren't real, but Elsie is. Jem nodded. Yeah, he'd expected as much. Terry staggered away from the table and onto the bed. She tried to sit down, but ended up sliding down onto her backside on the carpeted floor. I don't feel too good. I think... I think they're pulling me out manually. I'll see you all later. Then she turned into a shower of golden sparks that rose up into the air. In seconds, she was gone. Elsie let out another shriek. Ruby banged out of the room and shouted up to Miranda. Turn us around! We can't leave! It's killing Elsie! The mermaid madam turned pirate princess called out to her girls to reverse course. The whole ship creaked as they spun around, heading back toward the lights of the good sand towers. The minute they were away from the waters between worlds, Elsie calmed. Crystal mopped sweat off the heiress's forehead with a cloth napkin. I'm so sorry, Elsie. We didn't know. I guess Pluto let us go because we couldn't leave. But what does the riddle mean? Ruby returned and sat down. Uh, Elsie? What is your greatest joy? Elsie opened her mouth and closed it. Her eyes were wide with embarrassment. Jem knew about Elsie's king, but he wasn't sure how to talk about it. It was Crystal who laughed. <laughs> oh, I think we know exactly what Elsie's greatest joy is. And I bet you that Miranda has accoutrements that we can use to get her there. Elsie both blinked and blushed. Uh, you can't be... Seriously? I'm a girl who doesn't have much trouble getting in the mood, but switching gears isn't going to be easy, Crystal. Crystal stood up and grabbed her roughly by her red hair. What's my name, bitch? M mistress, Elsie said quietly. In a heartbeat, everything had changed. Freeing Elsie was going to be fun. But what did the ritual mean? How could a soul free a soul? Chapter 37 Elsie's Greatest Joy Jem was standing where his wife held the little redhead by her hair. Our safe word is midnight. Just say that, and we'll stop. Understood? Elsie nodded, eyes heavy with lust. Mags was over by the bed, watching with sparkling eyes. Ruby was still near the door. The deck shifted under them as a secret queen rode the waves back toward the good sand towers, to make sure Elsie wasn't torn apart by the bracelets trapping her soul in far wind. Crystal turned the redhead to face Mags. Elsie, this is our friend Mags. She likes to watch. Do you mind if she watches me treat you like a little slut? No, mistress. Elsie whined. I don't mind. Crystal addressed the Medusa. Do you want to watch? Mags nodded without saying a word. She shook off her jacket. Her nipples poked through her shirt. Then Crystal turned to Ruby. Do you mind helping me? The singer nodded. I don't mind a bit. I guess we need to hurry, though. I mean, the fucking Kraken might put an end to this little sex party. And we don't want that. Crystal yanked back Elsie's head. Kiss her, Ruby. Lick her mouth like it's her cunt. Ruby reached down Elsie's shirt to cup a small titty while she tongued Elsie's mouth. She had to bend over to do it, and Jem felt his cock harden at the sight of the singer's round ass. He went over and got Ruby's leather pants off her, and her underwear. While she kissed Elsie... He spread Ruby's ass cheeks and licked her slit. She smelled and tasted like the heart of sex itself. Crystal took off her shirt and bra to reveal her breasts, her nipples hard. 
She then took a turn licking Elsie's lips and shoving her tongue into the redhead's mouth. Jem felt his need keenly. He stood up and stripped. Ruby was right there, and he was able to stick his stiff sex into her tight tunnel. Ruby gripped the table next to where Elsie sat. Uh, yes, Jem. The singer gasped. Fuck me, fuck me, fuck me. Crystal forced Elsie off her chair. Help Ruby with her shirt and bra, slut. That'll give you a little present. You get to play with her big tits. Elsie wound up kneeling on the floor, naked, trying to kiss Ruby. Though the angle was wrong, and Jem couldn't see her very well. He thrust into Ruby a few more times before he drew back. Glancing up, he saw Mags was sitting on the bed with her fingers down her pants. She was still mostly dressed. He hoped she'd get undressed all the way. For now, he had a new little woman to play with. Ruby turned around, an evil grin on her face. I think you want a bit of the new stuff, don't you? He shrugged. A thought had crossed my mind. Elsie's eyes drank in his length, which gleamed from Ruby's juices. Crystal saw the look. You want to taste it, don't you, slut? Elsie nodded. Yeah, like before, in the elevator. Oh, I thought about that so much. I thought about you two so much. Crystal took hold of Elsie's head and jammed it down onto Jem's cock, driving it deep into the back of the new girl's throat. Elsie choked but didn't withdraw. Then she bobbed her head until he was going in and out of her mouth. She obviously loved being treated like a cock-sucking slut. It was too much for Jem and he nearly lost it. Ruby laughed a little. <laughs> she certainly can take it. But let's give Jem a break. Stand her up so we can have a look at her. Ruby helped Elsie up onto her feet. The little redhead had a freckled chest and barely any tits at all. She was mostly nipples and freckles. She had a nice tangle of strawberry fur between her legs. And that was what Jem wanted to see more closely. Get her on the table. Up on the table. Crystal tapped the wood while Ruby moved the candles. They were all naked now, except for the Medusa, rubbing herself underneath her pants. Elsie's bracelets jingled as she got on the table. On her hands and knees, she arched her back. She was so slender that her butt cheeks pulled apart, revealing her treasures. A tiny pink pussy and a tiny pink pucker. Her tits looked bigger dangling from her chest. Crystal licked Elsie's face. <sighs> Do you want my husband to lick your pussy? Elsie nodded. <laughs> yes, mistress, please. I'm so horny. I can feel the bracelets in this weird way. <laughs> We're dying to come, please, please. Jem grabbed her ass and then smacked it. Louder, Elsie, what do you want? Lick my pussy, lick my pussy. Jem grabbed her and drew her closer. Then he licked her clit and up her slit, experiencing the wonder and glory of a new woman and her own special sense and pleasures. He even gave her rosebud a few little licks, which had her gasping. Jem tongued her whole, feeling how tight it was and knowing that he'd be fucking it before the night was over. He withdrew and invited Ruby in for some fun. Ruby's tongue tasted Elsie's delicious sex. The heiress couldn't talk and could hardly breathe because Crystal was fucking her mouth with her fingers. Crystal would finger her pussy and then let the new girl suck her girl come off them. Holy shit. Mags whispered. Finally, she'd taken off her shirt. Her green nippled breasts were perfect, rising up from her muscle dabs. You guys, this is so hot. But I think you need to make her come now, because when she comes, I know I'm going to come. Crystal shrugged. Oh well, you both can fucking wait. I need to get fucked. She went around and set Jem on a chair. 
and she climbed up and slid her sheath onto him. She kissed him and smiled. <sighs> I can taste them on your mouth. Mm, Ruby and Elsie. Oh, Jem, this gets me so hot. She was moving up and down on him, and she loved the audience. His sweet little wife was quite the exhibitionist. But she was still in command. Uh, Elsie, lick my ass while I fuck my husband. If you do a good job, I just might let him fuck you. Ruby stood next to them, offering her tits for both Jem and Crystal to suck on. Jem found himself in boob heaven. While he sucked on her tit, his wife's sex tightened around him. He was getting closer and closer to coming. Crystal would suck on Ruby's nipple and then kiss Jem, and then go back to sucking on the big tit. Meanwhile, Crystal would stop fucking him to arch back into the new girl's mouth so Elsie had access to every part of her ass. Crystal stiffened and then gasped, sucking Jem's earlobe. It feels so good, baby. Oh, it all feels so good. Jem had to stop Crystal from moving until the need to come had passed. But Crystal knew they didn't have all night. She got off Jem. I have an idea. <laughs> Crystal said with a chuckle. Elsie, crawl over to Mag's feet. We're going to give her a little show. Lay down on the floor under her feet and spread your legs. Elsie crawled over and lay down on the carpet with her head near Mag's green feet. At some point, the Medusa had taken off her boots and socks. Elsie was spread eagle there, waiting like a good girl for what Mistress Crystal wanted next. Ruby wasn't going to miss a chance to ride Jem. She straddled him, and soon she was kissing him with her mouth and with her pussy. Her big tits, wet from their spit, pressed up against Jem's chest. He reached around grabbed her shapely ass to help her work her hole up and down. Again, he came dangerously close to coming. Jem peeked over Ruby's shoulder to see Mag stand up and take off her jeans and panties. There was her dark green sex, even darker with her juices and her pale green thighs. She sat down, staring at Elsie's body while the green girl rubbed her thick clit. Crystal straddled Elsie's face, holding onto Mags's knees, while she made Elsie lick her, which the heiress did. Ruby rode him a bit longer, and then she got off him. Uh, I think it's time you get the new girl. We need to get her off and get out of Dodge. Jem knew they were under a time crunch, but damn it, he wanted to take his time with these two new women. Maybe back on Paradiso's island. If they made it back there alive, they could play more. He and Ruby walked over. Jem got between Elsie's legs and smacked her clit with his cock. Elsie's moans of pleasure were muffled by crystal sex. The heiress was going to be tight. When he'd licked her, he'd hardly been able to get his tongue inside her, but she was so slippery and hot now. Crystal was looking at him over her shoulder. She eased her pussy off Elsie's face. Hmm, I think my husband wants to fuck your dirty pussy. <laughs> Not sure why. But do you want him inside you? Do you want to feel him fuck you? Yes, Mistress Crystal, please, please. Jem's wife gave him a nod. Do it, baby. Fuck the shit out of her. Jem slid into the tight pinkness, and it felt like heaven. It was impossibly hot, and he loved the idea he was getting to fuck a new girl, with Crystal, Ruby, and Mags watching. Jem's face was pushed up against his wife's back, and he took a moment to smell her skin and to enjoy the feel of her warm body against his cheek. He continued to piston in and out of the little redhead. She seemed to get a little looser with each thrust, but she was still so deliciously tight. Crystal made little noises, and then she was gasping. 
Oh, fuck her, Jem. Fuck her while I come on her face. Jem continued to slam into the little redhead. When Crystal's orgasm was over, she rose on shaky legs. Jem was able to look Elsie full in the face. Her cheeks, nose, and chin were covered in Crystal's juices. Then Ruby took over, riding Elsie's face while staring at Mags's lithe body. Jem kissed Ruby's back while he took care of Elsie's need. And he knew that Elsie loved being used like this. He'd seen it in the elevator. She might be a dominant monster out of the bedroom, but inside it, she was a submissive little minx. Ruby had her face on Mags's thigh when her orgasm took her. Jem could see her come, which again almost pushed him over the cliff. Elsie's voice was muffled by Ruby's thighs. Oh, you feel so good inside me, master. I feel like such a little slut. Oh, fuck me harder. Oh, please, fuck me harder. Ruby came, but so far Max hadn't. Ruby got off Elsie's face, spun around, and started sucking on her little tits and rubbing her pink clit lost in the forest of red hair. Crystal was on the other side. That meant Jem could see Mags's green pussy in Elsie's face. He continued to fuck her until Ruby's fingers did the trick. Elsie let them know she was on the edge of her greatest joy. I'm coming up. You are so nasty. You're making me come. Mags let out a yelp. Jem could see the Medusa's orgasm, and he could feel Elsie coming. So he gave himself over to all the sensations. He drove his cock deep into the spasming little redhead, and then he was spurting his load into her, over and over, riding away on the best feeling in the world. The bracelets on her wrists snapped open. Suddenly, there was a pretty brunette woman standing there, in a little nightgown. Mags laughed. <laughs> Gosh, guys, you just draw women to you all the time. Is this normal? This can't be normal, but it's cool. Ruby went over to her and gave the Medusa a big hug. Seeing the two together nearly gave Jem another erection. He heard their phones ding a couple of times. Were those major or minor encounters? He'd have to check with the last of his battery power. Elsie's eyelids were still fluttering from her greatest joy. <sighs> that was... Amazing. Fucking amazing. I don't care who this new bitch is. That orgasm has made me fall deeply, deeply in love with you all. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm not capable of love. Jim wasn't sure he heard that right. Incapable of love? Maybe. But the heiress was fun to play with. Crystal sat back on her knees. Nancy Nighthouse, I'll bet. The story only gave us so many characters, and I was wanting a happy ending for Jacko. A soul to enslave a soul. The Emperor talked about using souls to keep Elsie Winterheart trapped. The other souls must have escaped back into the afterlife. But not our Nancy Nighthouse. The confused brunette took a few steps back. That is my name, ma'am. But who are you? And where am I? And why are you all naked? Elsie got to her feet. Freeing your ass, bitch. Elsie then softened when she took Jem's hand. She kissed him. Thank you, master. Thank you for coming to rescue me. I think this is the beginning of a beautiful relationship. Jem hopes so. But they didn't have a moment to spare. They had a rendezvous with Captain Reaper by midnight. The second they were all dressed, the entire ship shivered, and then their stomachs dropped into their throats as the boat was lifted out of the water. The room tilted to the side, and they were all slammed into the wall. They weren't out of far wind yet. The Kraken had come out to play. Chapter 38 The Secret Queen's Battle Jem, Crystal, and Ruby went to retrieve their weapons from their phones, though putting them back might not work since their batteries were so low. 
or they might have been broken, since the contents of the entire room had been thrown against one wall. Nope. Their phones still worked. Max, Elsie, and Nancy Nighthouse were shaken up, but they were all okay for now. Nancy wasn't a ghost. She had warm skin and was perfumed, a sweet odor that Jim liked. Then again, he liked how all the women smelled in Far Wind. You three stay here, Jem ordered. We're going out there to see what's going on. The entire boat creaked and cracked as it tilted back to how it had been before. What was going on? Jem and his warrior women left the cabin. A bright full moon turned everything silver. Magic lanterns shone a yellow light on the mottled skin of the Kraken, who had found them after all. Huge tentacles surrounded them like a forest of awful. And from between the tentacles came Pluto, along with the remaining eight minotaurs and fishmen who weren't in any way mermaids. These were scaled Pishkari fish soldiers with odd eyes and slits for noses. Most of them were armed with swords and crossbows. Miranda and her crew had been gagged and bound to the masts. They looked on with wide eyes at the action. Pluto aimed his fork at Jem. You are not leaving, boy. Your head is going to decorate my mantle. Jem squinted at the god. He wasn't bleeding anymore. Yeah, being divine, he would have healed that wound quickly. How can you have power over the kraken? I know, right? Crystal shouted, clutching her rifle. He's the god of death, not the god of the ocean. Pluto's beard split as he laughed. <laughs> the god of death rules over all. The land, the sea, even the air. This animal follows my commands. And while I could have had it smash the ship into debris, I decided to take care of you in a more personal manner. He then threw a bolt of death energy like Jem's corruption throw right at Jem. Jem blocked the attack. Crystal and Ruby opened fire. This time, however, Ruby had both her sword and her gun. She had a swashbuckling skill and enhanced dexterity, and it was time she used them both. Two of the tentacles parted to give Jem a view of another ship plowing through the dark waters, coming toward them. It was the midnight wind with Captain Reaper at the helm. But there was no way those ghost pirates could help them. Not when they were fifty feet out of the water. Jim had to give it to Captain Reaper, though, for making the attempt. Already the skeleton pirates were battling the tentacles that snaked out to reach for them. Jim had to kill the god of death quickly. He called out, Mags and Elsie, we need you! Mags, freeze as many of the Pishkari you can. And Elsie, free Miranda and her crew. Then Jem went fork to fork against Pluto. Their weapons clanged off each other with bits of death energy circling them as they fought. The minotaurs hurled cold damage and fireballs lighting up the deck. But Pishkari warriors weren't going to be able to do much. Mags had broken out of the cabin and was freezing as many as she could with her stone gaze. Elsie, meanwhile, had hurried over and was freeing the captives with a slender knife she'd found somewhere. She wasn't quiet about it. So now I have to help you rescue me? That's not how it works, Jim. I'm like a fucking princess. I shouldn't have to do anything. Ugh, that girl. Such a nightmare. Jem knew how to fight. And so when Pluto let his guard down for just a second to grimace at the complaining heiress, Jem slammed the shaft of his fork into the god's face, driving him back for a minute. Then Jem sped over to the side and drove his bident into a tentacle which turned into fishy-smelling dust. He managed to also stab a section of the Kraken's body. The entire thing didn't disintegrate, but a section of it did. It was enough to free the secret queen. The ship went sliding down the opening Jem had made in the monster. Everyone was thrown off their feet, a few of the minotaurs were hurled into the sea, and there was a gush of water as the ship's hull found the sea once more. Jem spun just in time to catch Pluto's fork before it stabbed him. The god emperor was bleeding black blood down his face. How did you get my weapon, boy? How did you come to be here? <sighs> Long fucking story, Jem spat. The kraken had lost a tentacle and a good chunk of its body, but it wasn't attacking. 
It seemed to be waiting for something. Was that a good sign? Out of the corner of his eye, Jem saw that Miranda was back at the helm, and the sails had caught wind. They were racing toward Captain Reaper's ship, and his undead pirates were ready to swing over to help. There would be plenty of opportunity for Ruby to use her swashbuckling skills and her augmented ability, which she was already doing. She stabbed one minotaur through his belly, turned, and fired her gun across the deck and into the chest of another. Her marksmanship skill didn't let her down. The bullet went right through his heart. Crystal was also using her new ability. On the deck, she was gunning down assholes left and right. But when a fireball or a cold missile threatened to hit her, she dodged it with supernatural skill. Jem and Pluto continued to spar right up until the point the midnight wind rammed into the secret queen. The hulls squealed off one another and the skeleton pirates swung onto their ship with ropes to overwhelm the minotaurs. A few of the bony pirates were reduced to kindling, but not many. Jem saw the doubt in Pluto's eyes. Jem also saw a way out of this. Ruby came swinging around on a rope. Her increased strength allowed her to easily hold on with one hand as she fired with the other. An ice bullet hit Pluto's head. Ice started to creep toward his eyes, but he wiped it away with a hand glowing with black energy. He aimed his fork at the singer, throwing corruption. Ruby let go of the rope, did a somersault, and came down on her feet like a superhero. Jem tried to stab the god of death, but Pluto whirled his bident. Metal clanged on metal. When Ruby attacked with her sword, Pluto punched her away. Ruby wound up on her ass, but she was smiling. Jem saw why. She'd stabbed her sword into Pluto's side. The god of death grabbed it, pulling it out. Ugh, this little toothpick can't hurt me. Ruby laughed. <laughs> oh, really? The sword exploded, blowing off his arm from the elbow down. Ruby chuckled. <laughs> and you said I didn't need Miss Kiss to have all the goodies. For a second, Jem was confused. And then he remembered he'd copied and pasted all of the same magic from the Ares rifle to Miss Kiss, Ruby's sword. Pluto looked at his missing arm in wonder. That allowed Jem to finish the fight. He drove his fork into the god's chest right through his heart. Pluto fell to his knees, and his fork went sliding off the deck and into the water below. Too bad. Having two forks would have been a great help. The god emperor gasped. <gasps> and in strange eons, even death may die. I leave you now, but know that your doom has just begun, young hero. When you know the truth of yourself, you will be destroyed. Then the god emperor turned to ash completely. Jem found the emperor's last words chilling. But he'd add them to the pile of mysteries and prophecies. He wouldn't be destroyed. Not as long as he had crystal and ruby. He watched as his beautiful blonde wife killed the last two minotaurs with two more exploding bullets. A wail filled the air. Nancy! It was Jacko. The cursed sailor who had lost his love and couldn't rest until he had seen her again. Jacko ran into the arms of his love, and Nancy didn't show a bit of disgust on her face as she held the skeleton to her. They were reunited once more. The minute they touched, Jacko's bones fell apart onto the deck. Nancy went to her knees, weeping. Ruby stood watching with tears in her eyes. Crystal joined her. Both of them stood reverently over Nancy as she cried over the bones of her love. The two ships, the Midnight Wind and the Secret Queen, were now tied together. The sails had been dropped, and they bobbed together on the dark waters. The Kraken was still there. From some part of it, there came a roaring sound, shaking the decks. Jem went to the railing and swung his weapon, tossing corruption throws. Get out of here, Bessie! You're done here, or do you want to lose more tentacles? That did it. The monster sank beneath the waters, leaving them alone. Captain Reaper crossed the plank and stepped down onto the deck of the Secret Queen. He saw Nancy crying over Jacko's remains. And so, I have lost a crewman. But such a loss warms even my old dead heart. 
Would that I should see my Linnea again. I'd find my own release. Elsie stood there in her pirate shirt and bare legs. Ew! These guys smell so gross! I hate this fantasy shit so much! What the fuck, Jem? Jem smiled and went to her. He gave her a big hug. You did good, Elsie. You freed Miranda and her girls. Thanks for that. Elsie sighed. <sighs> uh, you're welcome, I guess. Can we go home now? Jem laughed. <laughs> That's the plan. Before leaving the Secret Queen, they all gave Miranda a long hug. Miranda held Jem's hand. You come back, no? You must, I tell you. I've already lost customers with you being gone three weeks. I hate losing customers. Hate it! The scented dust of the dead god hung in the air around them. With him gone, Jem wasn't too worried about Queen Nicoletta and Lady Natala. We'll be back. You can bet your sweet ass we'll be back, Crystal said. I want to go swimming with you. Are you really a mermaid? Miranda smiled mysteriously. I'll show you sometime all the things I can do, girl. So many things. Will you take care of Nancy? Crystal asked. Miranda nodded. I will. She's been through a lot, no? But we'll have room for her. We'll treat her like family. On that hopeful note, they left the Secret Queen. Back in the midnight wind, Elsie wasn't any happier. Uh, how does this thing even float? This can't be fucking safe. Aren't there rules against boats being too fucked up to sail? If not, there should be. But even the heiress was silenced by the crossing. Captain Reaper said it was something and he wasn't wrong. The dark water of the ocean turned into liquid light, lapping at the rotten wood of the ghost ship's hull. The midnight wind carved through that light until it found normal ocean again. They had left far wind behind them and were sailing toward Paradiso's island. Jem was glad. They had a five-star hotel worth millions to claim. Chapter 39 Jem's Odd Encounter A week later, Jem stood on the stage of the Delphine's Auditorium with a packed house. After Kalis or Ranos Dorrance had signed the hotel over to Jem, they all decided to put on a celebration show for everyone on Paradiso's Island. Ruby and the Fates were playing, along with special guests Crystal Dream and Jem Stone. It had been a good gig, not great and they were on their last song. The original plan had been for them to play Ruby's magnum opus, The Ballad of the Broken Master. But Ruby changed things up. They'd already done Whiskey in the Jar early in the set, and it hadn't done very well, so they were just going to end it with an ACDC song and go from there. Ruby sang and let Jem play rhythm guitar. The Fates were back, Trophy, Letty, and Spin, on lead guitar, bass, and drums, respectively. Playing with the full rhythm section was fun, and it did make their sound so much fuller. However, listening to Spin Play, Jem realized just how good Terry Deem had been. He missed her. To end the show, Ruby decided on doing Thunderstruck, which the crowd loved because audiences love the familiar with a twist. It was a good song, granted, but Jem was kind of sad that Ruby had bailed on playing her magnum opus. He trusted her, though. She was the pro, and he was just the new guy. Even before the show started, Ruby had warned them that playing the Port Aiden songs would be risky. And she was right. The crowd had been polite, but the music didn't charge up the place, not like back in the world of Far Wind. Still, Jem's first experience with amplified sound had been fun. He'd bought an electric guitar and played his normal songs. He'd sung into the mic, which took some getting used to. But all in all, it was cool to be on such a big stage. Ruby was already working on a song called Jacko and Nancy to go along with Johnny and Jenny. Ruby said that living your life would give you plenty of material for songs. Elsie was having trouble accepting the whole notion of the Erebos experience. Yes, she had to accept that it wasn't real. And yet, she was, if Mr. Oregon could be believed. Jem wasn't sure that was the case, since there was a good chance that Mr. Oregon was the oddity. 
the mystery man was right about one thing. Nat and Nikki probably weren't real. The pair hadn't come back from far wind. In the world of Paradisos Island, they were still missing. Could the Erebos experience not copy their code? As for Mrs. Deem, the owner of their Breeze B&B, she seemed like the same woman she'd been before. Though Crystal had given up seducing her. They now had Elsie in their lives, along with Mags, who still only wanted to watch. Sweaty. At the end of the show, Jem couldn't believe this was his life now. Playing concerts with super talented musicians. After that last song, they all did the link hands and bow thing. Was this really his life? Somehow, Jem wound up alone backstage in a long concrete corridor. That was when Mr. Kalis, Elsie's father, approached him. You did well, the big man said. Thank you for bringing back my daughter. But who kidnapped her? Where was she? The man had stars in his eyes as well as on his tie. It made reading his expressions difficult, to say the least. Jem didn't have a lie on hand, so he told the truth. Sheriff Pluto is actually the emperor of a far-off kingdom. He captured her, luring us in. He's not on the island anymore because I killed him. Mr. Kalis grinned. It's not the first time I've had trouble with the local authorities, and it won't be the last. You avenged my daughter. You returned her here to a place she loves. I thank you. He put out a big hand. Jem paused before taking it. He'd had problems with two gods now. Would Mr. Kalis be a third? But he shook the big hand. He thought about asking the man if he were real or not, but what good would that do? Jem wished Mr. Oregon would contact him again, but the mystery man wasn't sending any texts, and it was useless to try to reach out to him. Mr. Oregon never answered. Mr. Kayla stepped back and frowned. There is something odd on this island. Mm, an oddity, if you will. The oddity, Jem agreed. I've been looking for the source of the strangeness. You want to know anything about it, would you? The oddity? Mr. Kayla shook his head. No, but if I did, I probably wouldn't tell you, would I? <laughs> because I could very well be at the center of the mystery. I would lull you into a false sense of security, then, when the time was right, I would strike. Jem felt his heart go cold. That sounds like a threat. The man with stars in his eyes had no expression on his strange face. It's only a threat if I had more power than you. I'm not sure I do. I'm not sure anyone does. You have a shine to you, Jeremy Creed. I have that shine myself. We shall see who is brighter. Jem now had a new suspect. But he wasn't even sure if the man was Elsie's real father or not. Jem didn't know who was a participant and who was an NPC. There were still so many mysteries. Jem and the girls all wound up in the penthouse suite. The same place where Ruby and Jem had had their honeymoon during their previous dive. Jem poured wine. So, I'm assuming we're moving out of the Breeze B&B. The girls, all dressed to the nines in evening gowns, sat on couches while the fire burned in the fireplace. Mags had shown up for the show, but she left after congratulating them. Their Medusa food delivery girl was still a puzzle as well. So it was Crystal, Ruby, Elsie, and Jem in the suite. Elsie gave him a withering look over her glass of champagne. I am not staying in a breeze BNB. I have standards. Hotel Eris here. I need the best sweets possible. Who do you think you are in the real world? Crystal asked. Do you remember anything? No. The redhead said carefully. It seemed like she was lying because she got super defensive. I hope I'm not actually poor. Fuck my life if I am. I will not give up a single luxury, which are for me necessities. I have to have champagne on a regular basis or I will die. Ruby sighed. <sighs> Let's not talk about death, ever. It doesn't matter. We still have months and months left. Like, months and months. I'm enjoying all this craziness now. So, what are our plans? Crystal leaned forward. More sex, more music, more shows. Tonight was okay. 
but it wasn't like the last time we played the Delphine. That was all kinds of epic. Every kind of epic. Maybe we can write something along the lines of Mambo Number no. 5. Something catchy and fun. For our audience. Ruby let her head fall back. Ugh, when Whiskey in the Jar failed. I didn't even want to risk one of our far wind songs, especially not Broken Master. So yeah, I don't think I want to even play that song ever. Except if we're in Port Aiden. If we're in Port Aiden, that fucking song would kill it. Elsie was listening quietly, rubbing her champagne glass on her lips. What are you thinking? Jem asked. The heiress shrugged. Tell us, he urged. Well, you all are going to want to go back to Far Wend. I'm not sure I can go. But now that I know that Paradiso's Island is all weird as well, I mean, Mags is a monster girl, right? She has snakes for her hair. I just can't be uh, away from you three. I'm kind of scared. Elsie was being vulnerable. And she knew it. When no one said anything right away, she threw up her hands. It's fine. I can be alone. My supposed father has left, but between you and me, I don't know what kind of relationship was there at all. Not with how fucked our memories are. In the end, even if I'm some orphan girl, I don't need you. I'm ungodly rich. I'll be fine, so you go. Have fun fighting monsters or whatever and hanging out with weird fish people and stinky skeleton pirates and all that. I will be living my best life in this suite. Jim grinned. We don't know how to run a hotel. How about you help us? Elsie rolled her eyes. Ugh, that sounds like work. Do I look like I work? That made them all laugh. The heiress looked perplexed. I don't understand when I said that was so funny. I'm not working. But I can offer advice. You know, Theo runs the place just fine. He kept things going smoothly. Let's have him do all the work so I can work on my tan. It'll be summer soon. We'll have a great time. How are you at planning weddings? Crystal asked. More confusion on the heiress's face. Aren't you and Jem already married? We want to marry Ruby, Jem said. Elsie gave them one of her rare smiles. I can totally plan a wedding. <laughs> now that would be fun. If only we could find a band that doesn't suck to do the music. Ruby laughed the loudest. <laughs> I think I can get a band called Trophy Wife that might be able to play the Macarena. That night, the sex was fun, and Elsie turned from bitchy rich girl to submissive pet. She was willing to join them easily. It was strange. The longer he spent with her, the more he liked her. And so they spent the next eight months with her. The time passed both slowly and surely. And before he knew it, they were standing on the docks in Corinth with their bags packed and their phones fully charged. It had been quite a year. Only Elsie wasn't going with them. She just couldn't find the courage because a part of her, a big part of her, still thought that Paradisos Island was real. In the end, Jem thought she might be right. Chapter 40 Jem's Memories It was early January on the island. The sky was a solid block of gray. It wasn't raining right then, but it was so chilly that it might as well have been. A 747 jet flew overhead, having taken off from Corinth's airport. A second later, a starship floated above them, running lights blinking. A squad of Valkyrie and winged horses went careening up to a steampunk airship. Jem inhaled the salty, wet air and wondered if they would ever come back again. There were no guarantees. It could be that Terry Deem wouldn't want them back, not after their little excursion to Far Wind. Jem couldn't think about that. They'd come back, if only to study the effects on long-term Erebos use. Crystal had been trying not to cry on the drive down. Elsie had been even more difficult to deal with than usual because instead of sad, she just amped up the sarcasm and embraced the darkest reaches of her nightmare personality. 
Ruby kept giving Jem long looks of frustration. What were they going to do with these crazy bitches? The last eight months of his life in the Erebos experience seemed so vibrant. They were all these moments, seconds captured in time that glowed with life. Of course, there was the sex, a ton of it, but a few moments stood out. Alone with Ruby, staring into her face as she smiled at him. With Crystal, one morning, they were together while Elsie watched, and with Elsie, he'd had sex with her alone, without any power games. And she cried afterwards. He'd held her. He didn't ask why she was crying. It could have been any number of reasons, but he gave her that privacy. They'd all ended up kissing Mags, but that was all. She'd swing by to watch, but she was still pretty reserved. Crystal had wanted to go full whore hobo by the end of the year, but by that time they were so busy with playing shows and living their lives that Crystal had managed to get some control over her libido. There was one night with two groupies that were memorable, as well as a night with Dighty Lovejoy. Jem had enjoyed his time with both the groupies and the goddess of lust. The person most responsible for satiating Crystal's sexual desires was none other than Elsie herself. Elsie was obsessed with sex, and she kept Crystal busy during all that time. Elsie also kept Jem busy. He never did end up getting a job at Pan's Tavern. Why bother? He lived in a hotel suite, they had room service whenever they wanted it, and there were world-class restaurants a short elevator ride away. He practiced and practiced and practiced. At the music shop, Orpheus continued to come in with his face all bruised, and Phoebe Apollo continued to work with him. Both teachers came to their shows. Phoebe was amazed at his progress. She was more impressed with his dedication because of his success. According to ACDC, it was a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll, but the Scorpions had some bit of wisdom to add. Don't stop at the top. Phoebe said, that a lot of people lost their motivation once they got good. Jem hadn't, because he loved the work. He had so many memories of being on stage. He remembered catching Crystal's eye at a show they did at Pan's Tavern, as the sweat dripped down her face. Both of them were so happy to be sharing this life of music with each other. It had opened up a whole new world for them. And with Ruby, he loved watching her sing, especially Dark End of the Street. He loved how intense her face got, and how brave she was, brave and vulnerable. Of course, one of the memories that stuck out the most was their wedding. He and Crystal married Ruby out in the pool area, on the same stage where Elsie's father had promised the reward. Being on the island where gods and monsters walked freely, no one batted an eye at the idea of three people marrying. Mrs. Deem from the Breeze B&B was there, as were Mags and Faunus, as well as Z. He offered to cater the event, but Elsie wanted Ambrosia instead. Z, being the good-natured king of gods that he was, didn't seem to care a bit. The sea nymph Chemothoe was one of the servers, of course. Jem would never forget standing on the stage, seeing Elsie, and having her smile and nod at them, tears sparkling in her eyes. Then he turned and stared into the faces of Crystal and Ruby, both in wedding gowns both with their hair done and their makeup perfect. Their eyes were on him, and he loved both of them so much. After the wedding, there was music and more music, which went on all night long. Every two-bit band on the island was invited to play. It was a celebration of life as much as anything. Jem and the girls continued to practice their skills and add more abilities. But though he tried, Jem couldn't find Elsie's character sheet. That troubled him. Then again, the Erebos app kept adding security updates that blocked him, even with his ASI skills. Summer turned to fall, turned to winter. They had their Thanksgiving feast in Ambrosia with Chemothoe, who hadn't found a way into their bed just yet. For Christmas, they exchanged gifts and spent days together alone, just having fun. They planned a big New Year's Eve party where Ruby again said she didn't want to play Broken Master. That song had become this sacred thing. She hadn't even played it when they returned to Far Wind and Port Aiden. Like she promised, Elsie hadn't gone with them.
She made their lives before and after their trip difficult because that was just who she was. Crystal seemed to like how much of a prissy nightmare Elsie could be. Ruby had less patience. Ruby said she'd grown up with women like that and had had her fill. During their trip back to Far Wind, they didn't see Queen Nicoletta again. A lady Natala showed up at the wet tail one night. Natala said that with the death of the emperor, the lands were happier. Individual kingdoms could rule themselves without having to worry about some big empire forcing policies down their throat. In the end, the Queen of Chains was happy. Though Natala did say that Ink and Dreams owed them a show at the palace, Jem liked both Nicoletta and Natala, but he didn't trust them. As the unofficial manager of Ink and Dream, he'd have his girls stick to playing the wet tail. They stayed in Docktown in Port Aiden, though there was a whole world to be explored. Dungeons to plunder, lost cities on abandoned continents to see. Jem was tempted, but they returned to Paradisos Island to enjoy a quiet life of sex and music. A new sheriff was elected. Things were peaceful. And before he knew it, January had come around again. Jem and the girls drove their jeepster renegade down to Corinth to catch their special ferry home. Now, on the docks near the gangplank that led up to the ferry's entrance, Elsie stood with her arms in the pockets of her big coat. She didn't shed a single tear. She turned emotionless. Until Jem held her for a long time and then she sobbed against his chest. She pulled back from him. You'll come back, won't you? I'll see you again, won't I? He nodded. Yeah, you will. Then Elsie hugged Crystal and Ruby for a long time. I know I'm real. Elsie insisted. And I know I love you three. See you soon. See you soon, Jem whispered. He could only hope that would be the case. Then they were on the big ferry boat, piloted by Carone himself. From the back of the ferry, they waved at Elsie who stood there miserably in her fluffy pink coat. Jem had been so impatient to get back to Paradisos Island, but now he was equally curious to get back to the real world. How would Terry Deem react to them? And would he keep his musical skills? Jem's phone vibrated in his pocket. He knew what that meant. After months of silence, he'd finally gotten a message from Mr. Organ. Remember the song. The song will show you the truth. This won't be your last time on Paradisos Island. See you soon, friendo. FYI, Dr. Terry Deem isn't real. Jem felt his heart sink. What did that mean? What the hell? Before the ocean vanished, before he heard Dr. Deem's voice pulling them out of the dive, another message hit. There is the doom, but there is also life. That line had been in a message before. Why did Jem think it might sound a bit desperate? Chapter 41 Elsie's Story Jem smelled the antiseptic of the hospital, and he heard Dr. Deem's voice. Processing exodus routines for participants 777, 778, and 779. Starting countdown, bringing them out in 10, 9, 8... By that time, the ocean was gone, the sky was gone, and the ferry was stuck in a completely white space. The captain, Carone himself, stood on bony feet and lifted a skeletal hand. It was like the entire Erebos experience was saying goodbye. Then, Jem felt himself lying on the table, and his eyes flickered open. He turned and was relieved to see Crystal on his right and Ruby on his left. They'd gone in together and they'd come out six hours later. Dr. Dean nodded at them. Welcome back. I'd like a word with you three before we begin the official exit interview. In private, if you don't mind. Jim had been waiting for this moment. He had a few very important questions for her, without a doubt. It was strange. They'd been gone a year, yet only six hours had passed. It was the same day. They were all stiff from lying motionless, but it wasn't bad. In short order, Jim. Crystal and Ruby were taken down a hallway. This time they didn't find themselves in a conference room or break room. They were escorted to Dr. Deem's office. Inside were wooden filing cabinets, bookcases, and a nice desk. There were no windows, however. 
A painting on one wall showed a tropical island. It was the only greenery in the place. Dr. Dean motioned for them to sit in three folding chairs. She was in her lab coat, beige slacks and sensible shoes. A variety of emotions were on her face. A smile, a frown. She cleared her throat. Look, there is no record of our, uh, liaison in Far Wind. I'm so very glad that you managed to escape with Elsie back to Paradiso's Island, but I would like to ask that you not mention our encounter in the exit interview. Crystal smiled. Ah, uh, Dr. Deem. Terry. Can I call you Terry? I think I can. We have to know. Are you real? Is this real? Because Mr. Oregon said you weren't. And if you aren't real, this isn't real. Terry quirked an eyebrow. Is this a serious point of concern? Ruby's laughter came out nearly maniacal. <laughs> Fuck yeah, it is. Remember how I came out last time, pretty much convinced the whole world was bullshit? Well, I don't want to be right, but I think I might be. Terry looked concerned. I do remember that, Ruby. It was one of the reasons why you wanted to do another dive so soon. We made extensive notes. There will be exit interview questions about that very thing. Please, please discuss how such a simple idea as my not being real would affect your re-entry. I can assure you, I exist. I have a history and I have a future. You three will leave. I will go home to my cats. I have two, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, and I will probably use Meal Hub to have Thai food dropped off. Not Food Wheel? Jem asked. What's Food Wheel? Dr. Deem asked. Is that a competitor? Crystal and Ruby exchanged glances. Jem knew what they were thinking. This was some kind of glitch between the worlds. Jem answered her question. Something like that. So, are we going back in next weekend? Dr. Deem broke eye contact. We'll be in touch about that. There are several issues that we have to manage. We wanted you to do today's dive right away because your last experience was so traumatic. Now, things are a bit different. There are more variables at play. She stood up. Crystal looked shocked and Ruby looked amused, if sad. Jem felt a spike of fear pierce his heart. He found himself wanting to beg to go back in. However, he knew that any sort of desperation might be a red flag and get them banned. Ruby was the first to speak after the bombshell. It doesn't have anything to do with Far Wind, does it? Yes, we probably shouldn't have gone off the map. But you were there. You saw that we were just following the story. You have intimate knowledge of our activities. It was a subtle threat. Jem liked that Ruby went there. Dr. Deem heard the threat. Listen, I love you three. I want you back. However, there are certain realities about running an experiment like this. You three, Jem especially, are not normal research subjects. You wanted cognition inside the Erebos experience, and you had it. You chose hacking skills to get more power, which didn't work out all that well since the Erebos AI was able to redouble its security. Now we need to analyze and evaluate the data. I'm not saying you are barred from further dives. I am saying you are not scheduled. As always, you can reach out to me, day or night, if you are having significant issues. I'd like to hear from you, actually. She blushed. In a purely professional capacity. Now please, let's process you out and get you home. Jem wasn't going to give up so easily. What about the oddity? We didn't find anything on our end. Did you see anything? Oh, that. Dr. Dean paused. No, we're not sure if the oddity is in play, or if there ever was such a thing. All of Erebos is now running inside normal parameters. Why did Jem think that was so much bullshit? He wanted to trust the scientists, but she wasn't making that very easy. They left the office and continued down the hall. A door opened and a woman was pushed out of a room in a wheelchair. There were lab technicians with her, but there was also a man, a man who looked remarkably familiar. The woman's back was to them. The man faced them. It was Kalis Oranos Dorans, in a suit and tie with two mild brown eyes. At least there were no stars there. 
The man seemed to give Jem a rather long, studied look before turning away. Jem didn't care how shitty of a look that was. He hurried forward and called out, Elsie! Elsie Dorrance! Then he heard her voice. Dad? Wait! That was my game name. Jim was confused for a second. She'd not left on the ferry with them. However, it had taken quite a while to wake up, get dressed, and talk to Dr. Deem. It might have been another few weeks inside the Erebos experience. In that time, Elsie must have exited. Not that Elsie was her real name. The man didn't look happy as he stopped the wheelchair. Dr. Deem wasn't happy. Jem, it's not appropriate to interact with other participants, especially those who want privacy. Which we do. This, Mr. Doran said stiffly. Dr. Deem, this is an outrage. Oh, Daddy, don't be that way. The little redhead turned the chair herself until she was facing him. Jem couldn't help it. He surged forward, knelt in front of the wheelchair and grabbed her hand. Why are you in a... He didn't finish the question because he knew why. Elsie didn't have makeup on. Her hair was a bit less red. And her face was thin. Her legs, though, were far thinner. Withered, really. It was clear that she hadn't used them in a long, long time. If ever. Elsie saw where his eyes went. Don't you go pitying me, Jeremy Creed. I'm too much of a raw bitch to be pitied. Besides, I'm as rich out here as I am in the game. Not a game. Jem whispered. Oh, I know that. The little ginger said sharply. It's about the best thing that has ever happened to me. I am real, Jem. I was worried there for a minute, but I'm real. Jem couldn't help himself. He stood and hugged her. She didn't smell like she smelled in Erebos, out in the real world. Her perfume was far less sweet. He withdrew. Dr. Deem! The father thundered. We need to go. Now. I do not want my daughter being manhandled by this ruffian. Daddy! Elsie complained. He's fine. We're friends. Me and his wives are friends. Wives? Her father took hold of the wheelchair and pushed it away. I will not have my daughter subjected to such perversity. Ruby chuckled. If only that fucking guy knew how much of her perversity she subjected on us. Jem went to go after her, but Dr. Deem grabbed his arm. I'm sorry, Jem. I can't allow that. For a second, Jem thought about breaking away, running down the hall, and getting the full story. Elsie had lifted herself in her chair so she could turn around. Bye, guys. I love you. I'll miss you. I'll make it so we can do another dive together. I promise. I promise. And then she rounded the corner and was gone. Crystal came over and took his hand. It's okay, Jem. At least we know she wasn't a part of Erebos. She's real. And I think she's kind of wonderful. She is. Dr. Deem agreed. But I can't say more. There is funding to be considered. So, that made sense. The man who looked like Mr. Kalis had given them a ton of money so his daughter could be in a place where she could walk again. Jem was glad they'd met Elsie. Or whatever her real name was. Money talked, and if Elsie wanted them back on Paradisos Island with her, her father could make that happen. Only, Dr. Deem was still frowning, and Jem had the very real notion they might never do another dive again. Chapter 42 Ruby's Shocking Show The next two weeks passed without incident. Except that Ruby had moved in with him and Crystal. They were as inseparable in the real world as they had been in that heavenly other world. In some ways, going back to dumb old reality was harder. In some ways, it was easier. Jem couldn't help but think that the supposedly real world wasn't all that real. He had retained his musical skills. He bought a second-hand guitar from a pawn store, and he'd even gone to the 16th Street Mall to do some busking on the weekends. Most people ignored him, but he made about $50, which wasn't bad. More than that, he loved how the music fans would drift over to listen to him, nodding their heads in time to the song. That was better than even the money that got tossed into his hat. 
He also noticed that some of the crappier buskers made as much money as he did. That made it feel like begging, which it probably was. Still, it was strange. Playing in the real world was as easy as playing on Paradiso's Island. He wasn't sure if that should be possible. Could he really become a masterful musician after only six hours? And if Dr. Deem wasn't real, then the real world wasn't so real after all. That couldn't be, though. No. Crystal, at first, was so disappointed that they couldn't go back. They weren't rich anymore. There weren't any monsters to fight. They didn't have super strength, super healing, and invulnerability. In fact, she got a cold a couple days after their dive and had to miss work. At the same time, Crystal loved that Ruby was with them. She loved playing in front of people, and she wanted to play songs with Ruby at some open mic nights. Jem was all for joining them. They had a set list they could play. Crystal made it clear. She was going to live her life the way she wanted, no matter what world she found herself in. That meant taking risks, embracing the moment, and loving her life the way it was. Even if it was flawed, and they had to focus on making money, even if it wasn't nearly as exciting as their time in the Erebos experience. Jem was proud of her. Ruby seemed to be adjusting as well. But every day that Dr. Deem didn't call them, Jem grew more and more restless. He tried to find an heiress in a wheelchair, but he couldn't find anyone that matched Elsie's description. Maybe that wasn't so surprising, given the fact that there were so many rich people in the world who wanted to remain anonymous. Going around broadcasting your wealth probably wasn't a good idea for some of these guys. And like before, when he'd spent some time in the real world, he couldn't find anything on the Erebos experience, though it was run out of his company, Micro IT Systems Incorporated. It was like the Erebos experience didn't exist. It did, though. It had to. Jem found himself driving by the front gates every now and again and watching the security guard in the gate office. Then Jem would drive away, because he didn't want word getting back to Terry that one of the participants was hanging around like a stray puppy after being fed. Jem called the Oregon number again and talked to Gary Singva, who still had no idea why this random guy was calling him. Gary had no idea who Jem was, and he'd never heard of Erebos. The Oregon number was only good for getting information inside the experience itself. As time went on, Jem had to give up on the notion that Terry wasn't real. She was real. The world where they lived in a one-bedroom apartment was real. All of it was real. Which meant they would have to get a bigger place. Ruby was already putting job applications into various coffee shops across the Denver metro area. Even though Ruby's family was wealthy, she was not going to ask them for a dime. She'd rather work at Starbucks. She did get a paying gig at a little bar on Broadway, and she was going to invite Jem and Crystal up on stage for a few songs. They joked about inviting Terry to come drum for them. They could buy her a Balron. After some discussion, <laughs> they decided against it. Again, they wanted to give Dr. Deem some space. Crowder too much and they might never get a chance to do another dive. Thursday night, nearly three weeks after their last dive, Jem was helping Ruby carry in her stuff when he asked her, Are you going to finally play the Ballad of the Broken Master? I think you should, if only to get it out of your head. To be fair, I think all three of us have built it up to be this big issue. Ruby stopped and wiped sweat from her forehead. I don't know about that. It feels like a big issue, but maybe it's not. Remember Mr. Oregon said the mystery was the song? Or the song was the mystery? Let's just have a good show, okay? I might play it mid-set. It's easy to bury new stuff between a couple crowd pleasers. Jem saw the fear on her face. It's going to be okay. Ruby didn't look convinced. If it bombs, I'm going to be fucking devastated. There's this thing about art. When you're creating something, it can feel like this perfect thing that can change the world. But then, when you give it to actual people, 
the truth comes out. Sometimes it's amazing. Sometimes it sucks, and you've been deluding yourself the entire time. Jem could see how that would work. As long as you keep it in your head, it will always be amazing. The truth destroys things, Ruby said quietly. Jem didn't know how to respond. It came across oddly ominous. Crystal came up to them. Okay, my first show in the real world. We're going to do Baker Street, right? But a stripped down version, Domino and Tequila. And what about Broken Master? Ruby let out a yelp. Ugh, shut up! Then she kissed Crystal to keep her quiet. Jem sat with Crystal at a table near the front. Ruby was alone with her instruments up there. It was a Thursday night, so it wasn't packed. And the people in the bar ranged from clear bar flies to some random people off the street to some honest-to-goodness Ruby Ink fans. They'd caught some of her shows in Denver and had come to support her. That meant the world to her. Jem felt himself getting nervous. Busking was one thing, but being here, representing Ruby, he didn't want to ruin her night. Crystal was pale and sweating. He took her hand. On Paradisos Island, the stakes didn't feel so high. It was because they weren't. But Jem had to stop himself. So what if he went up there and embarrassed himself? He didn't know these people. He had a day job. He could do what he wanted. And what he wanted was to get up there and play music with his wives. Even if they never made another dive, Erebos had given him another wife and the ability to play music. <laughs> Plus, the best year of his life. And he'd gotten to slay a dragon. <laughs> How amazing was that? Ruby called them up on stage, and Jem didn't have time to feel shy or embarrassed. He was too busy keeping to the beat, which wasn't easy without a drummer. At the same time, when Crystal started playing her saxophone, the whole bar took notice. In seconds, they had everyone's attention. Something special was happening. After tequila, Ruby shot Jem a grin. Fuck it, let's do it. Let's get that song out in the world. <laughs> what do you say? Jem wasn't going to say no. Crystal drained her saxophone onto a towel. I love that song so much. I was so hoping to hear it tonight, with all of us playing it. Jem suddenly wished Elsie, Mags, and yes, Terry were there to hear it as well. Then he noticed something strange. The minute they started the song, the crowd went dead silent. Everyone stopped moving, including the bartenders who had seen thousands of shows. They all stopped to stare at them, and then Ruby sang the first notes. It started off as a slow, epic ballad, though it got faster as it went. In a lot of ways, it was similar to Stairway to Heaven. The crowd remained frozen even as a few people began to weep as Ruby sang. She seemed to have retained her advanced vocal acuity skill. The song wasn't just a hit. This was on a whole other level. Jem felt his phone vibrate in his pocket. It could have been a text from work. Or it might have been what? An Erebos app notification? <laughs> He didn't have the Erebos app on his phone in the real world. If this was the real world. Crystal played the bridge, and normally that might lose people. But not this time. Faster, 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 they moved into the last part of the song. Jem was hitting the chords while Ruby did her own guitar work and belted out the lyrics. She had the voice of an angel. She sang the song perfectly. About the doom, the magic caves, and the sorcerer who saved the world. They finished it off, and no one moved for a second. And then everyone leapt to their feet. The applause was universal, and already people were asking them to play it again. The owner of the bar was heading over, and Jem recognized the look on his face. Miranda the mermaid had it at the wet tail. It was a look that said he needed exclusive rights to such talent if he could. They had a moneymaker on their hands.
and he wasn't going to let that opportunity escape him. Ruby thanked the audience, but by that time, people were coming up on stage to shake her hand, to get pictures with her, to ask her questions. Ruby was the star, all right. However, women came up to Jem to talk to him as well. Crystal drew close to hold his hand while he talked with them. He knew that his lovely wife had her eyes on a few cute ones. Suddenly, the real world was full of opportunities. They were loading out the show that night, packing up their cars at two in the morning. Jem knew that work was going to be tough the next day. Missing a night of sleep wasn't awful, but it wasn't fun. Ruby was the one to spot it. Jem, look. At the sky. Up in the sky. Jem glanced up and saw the lights, like stars, slowly traveling down from the top of the sky to the horizon. Crystal's mouth dropped open. Those are night sparks, like we saw during our first dive. That means, uh, we're not in Kansas anymore. Were we ever in fucking Kansas? Ruby asked. If this place isn't real, then how do we get to the real fucking world? Jem wasn't sure he wanted that. What had Ruby said? The truth destroys things. He remembered that his phone had gone off during the ballad of the Broken Master. He got his phone out of his pocket, knowing that he'd gotten a message from the Mr. Oregon number. Yes, it was from Gary Singva, at least from that number. It hadn't been a call, only a text. There are many realities you need to master. Get back into the game, brother. Get back into the game and sing your song. Crystal and Ruby saw him looking at his phone. They came over to see the text message. Crystal laughed and kissed him, then kissed Ruby, then kissed Jem again. <laughs> Looks like I'm skipping work tomorrow, guys. This isn't real and neither is Terry Deem. The biggest question I have, how are we going to get out of this mess? Jem didn't know, but he found himself holding Crystal's and Ruby's hands. They were going to get to the bottom of the mystery once and for all. Ruby said the truth destroyed things. Jem had grown up hearing something else. The truth was going to set them free. This is the end of Masters of Reality 2, a Podium Audio production. If you enjoyed this audiobook, we would love for you to rate and review it. For more harem adventures, check us out at spicypodium.com and sign up for The Spice, our newsletter, and the place to be to find out where or with whom your next audio adventure will be. You have been listening to Masters of Reality 2, Book 2 of Masters of Reality, produced by Troy Odie, written by Aaron Crash. Performed by Gabriel Michael and Katana Jones. Text copyright 2023 by Aaron Crash and Shadow Alley Press. Production copyright 2023 by Podium Audio. All rights reserved. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.